Hello, and welcome to the audiobook rendition of Events of Origin, The Last Watcher, written by Lars, which is me. Hello, nice to meet you. How are you? I really enjoyed writing this book. It's very near and dear to my heart. So I call it Event Zero Origin because it's the first event within the origin of the series. And I hope you have as much fun listening to it as I had reading it for the first time after it was edited before it was published. Down in the description I'll link the map of the world which you could take a look at it before you start the book or take a look at it after you finish it and have a big surprise. So if you're cold, grab a blanket. If you're hungry, grab a snack. If you're thirsty, get a drink and prepare to drink. For Hazel Lynn B. Robles, wife, mother, best friend. Chapter 1. The Flow She was born with the ability to save the world, or destroy it. Which route she would choose fell on the shoulders of one lonely Nulian. Ramdelior never thought of himself as being special or even particularly liked around Elementana, a small town by the river. If he thought anything at all, it was that he wasn't well liked, and in some cases was even hated. The locals considered him something of a curse. He didn't know why people thought of him that way. He could only guess. It could be because he was a Nulian, and the people of Alamentana didn't really like flow users or creatures with more than a passing resemblance to monsters. There was also the possibility that it had to do with his name, but these were all just guesses. At first, when Randellior noticed the people of Alamentana treating him like an outcast, he tried his best to fit in, not to let it bother him. But as the daily whispers and insults got worse, it was hard for him not to notice. So, he did what he could to distance himself from the town, dropping his visits from once a day to once every several weeks. Today was one of those days when Ramdelior would have to visit the dreaded town. He was tired of having his meals without spices or any real flavour to them. On the bright side, spices were the only thing he needed to get from the town, so he wouldn't be there long. Well, it can't be helped said Ramdelior, as he stood up from all fours and headed to his door. I do wonder, though, if the old man has some new ones. Something exotic. Something rare. I've been craving something different. Ramdelior had taught himself to look on the bright side of things, even when there wasn't much to look at. He sighed as he walked out his door. Ramdelior lived in a cave on the outskirts of the small town. There was nothing special about his cave. There were a few wall paintings, a flowing stream ran through the centre, and the floors were covered in long, dry grass. The only thing that turned the cave into a home was its warmth. He had never known the cold since he moved in. As far as he knew, there wasn't another place like it in all of Ikra. The walk from his cave to the old man's shop in the vendor's marketplace was a short one only taking him about ten minutes. But those ten minutes were the longest ten minutes of his life, as he spent most of his walk trying to go unnoticed by the townspeople. Could it be, asked the old man, as Rem Delior approached, that my old friend has decided to visit me? Or is it just an oak tree, covered in grass and lemon zest coming this way? For a human, your sense of smell is kind of extraordinary. I still wonder how you are able to pick up my scent amid all this chaos. The vendor's market was the busiest place in town. Chickens ran wild, traders pulled their carts, filled to the brim with goods, and about a quarter of the town weaved in and out of the marketplace every hour. Smell and hearing are all I have, said the old man, as he stared directly at Ramdelior with his clear white eyes. I sharpen them every day. It's how I see the world. I'd be a fool not to use them to their highest potential. 
You know, sometimes I think you are just playing blind. How do you even know I'm coming from this side of the road? <sighs> You're just loud and clumsy. I've gotten used to your lazy steps. They're not at all what they used to be fifty years ago. You think you're hiding, but you're not. Ramdelior sighed as he stopped just a few steps away from the old man's spice shop. Time has a way of breaking us all. <laughs> Don't worry, said the old man. Time changes us all, that is true. Though we hardly know if it's for the best or worst. And we most definitely don't know what will happen tomorrow. Yeah, not unless you're a seer. Oh, no, not even they know what will happen. They can try to predict all they want. But it is us who make our own paths. The choices we make are always ours. <laughs> but enough sour talk. It's like you have a constant rain cloud over your head. What brings you here? It will rain eventually. And when it does, I'd like to be ready for it. The old man grunted. Ram Delior had always listened to the old man's advice, often taking it to heart. The usual. I want my food to have some flavour. But say, do you have something new? Something I haven't tried? The old man turned around and began mumbling, looking through his stockpile of spices, every now and then smelling the tips of his fingers as he worked his way around the sacks in his shop. Ah, here it is said the old man, as he stopped and reached just above the sack of spices for an empty bag. Oh, that's some strong stuff. I can smell the garlic all the way from here. The old man began to fill the bag, but he did so in the most delicate of manners, taking his time and stopping to hand away the bag every other serving. What you meant to say is that you can smell the good stuff from all the way over there. This isn't your ordinary garlic, by the way. It comes from far outside of Ikra. From where? Ah, that's a shop owner's secret. But don't worry, you'll get to experience it and the rest of the ingredients when you toss them into the pan with that river fish of yours. Oh, I hope you're right. I'm already s started Ramdelior before he was interrupted by a child speaking loudly. Look, mother, look, said the child as she fiddled with a leather ball across the road. There's that monster from the cave you were talking about. His horns are even bigger than I imagined, but... The mother shushed the child. Ramdelio had heard this sort of talk about him before, and as much as he tried not to pay attention to the child about something he had heard hundreds of times before, it struck deep. Not because what the child was saying was particularly hurtful. No, he could forgive her for that. It had more to do with how Ramdelior was feeling before he was reminded of how the world viewed him. Just as he was beginning to feel normal, to enjoy the old man's small talk, there it was again, a vivid reminder that he did not belong. Don't mind her, said the old man. She doesn't know any better. I don't mind her at all. What I do mind is this place. Ah. I guess I'd better get going. It's just that long name of yours you carry. The old man handed Ramdelior the small bag of spices. I do think changing it might benefit you. Other flow users get about just fine in this town with little to no trouble. And you hardly even practice flow anymore. I don't mean to say that I know everything. I just lived a long time. Ramdelior's full name had been a huge burden on his shoulders from the moment he discovered it from none other than a wary. His name, Ramdelior, Fury and Scorcher of Worlds, the Last Watcher. Since he'd learned his name, it had struck fear in those around him. But as three hundred years had gone by, he had learned to ignore it altogether. To him it meant next to nothing, though rumours of him bringing about the end of the world persisted. I don't know. Any one person nosy enough can just buy a wish and make my real identity appear. Then just cover yourself up with a spout or two of your own. Surely a simple wish from the wish store can't break one of your spouts. What's the point? asked Gremdelior as he began to draw a circle in midair with the tip of one of his claws. As he traced the circle, an incandescent blue line appeared. 
A few seconds later, a clear image of his cave became visible. For something like that to work in this good-for-nothing old town, I'd have to cast a spout that would erase everyone's memories of me. He moved the portal around until it was close to the rock slab he used to prepare his fish. He then put his front leg into the portal before placing his sack right on the rock slab. As he removed his front leg, the portal disappeared. Not to mention there's a huge possibility that it won't work. And as soon as someone remembers me, everyone else will too. I'd need to move far away from here and start over. But again, what's the point? I shouldn't hide from who I am. That last bit right there. You've never spoken truer words. Ramdelior smirked. As Ramdelior was getting ready to leave, something was stirring at the edges of the market. People began running as the ground shook at short intervals. They haven't been around in quite some time, said the old man. For at least ten years, said Ramdelior, as he focused in on the group of giants that were entering the market. Tartarans. Three of them. I wonder what brings them here this time. Well, I guess this is as good as a time as any to get going. Everyone else at the market seems to be doing so. Remdelior focused on the approaching giants, and right away he could see they did not come in peace. The three of them were wearing heavy armour and carrying an array of weapons on their hips, backs and shoulders. A sight to behold, considering the smallest of the Tartarans was already larger than one of the town's huts. For the most part, the people from the market got out of the way of the giants. But whoever or whatever remained, mostly carts and barrels, was smashed out of existence with a swing of their weapons. You ought to close shop, Ramdelior said, as he saw that the giants were heading straight to the nearest town gate, which was on the same road as the old man's shop. Granted, the old man's shop was far enough away from the edge of the road that it wouldn't be in the way, but he wanted the old man to be safe. He cared for the old man, and in many ways the old man was like a father to him, even though Ramdelior was much, much older. Tartarans aren't known for being well behaved. I'll be damned if I have to close every time a newcomer comes by. Let them go about their business. I have no business with them, and they have no business with me. This time is not like other times, old man. They are armed and carrying weapons. They come looking for something, or someone. It's better if you close. Listen to me very carefully. I'm not going to close. Not going to happen in this lifetime. Ramdelior knew better than to continue trying to convince the old man of anything. If that's the case, I'll have to stay here with you. Make sure you stay out of trouble. Please don't start shouting at them as they pass by. Despite their size, their skin can be deceptively thin. The old man snickered. <laughs> this shop is imbued with 23 different spouts. I'd be surprised if a speck of dust could get through. This is as impenetrable as it gets. Wait, what? Ramdelia asked as he took a few steps back from the shop. Who even stood here and cast them for you? I have connections, the old man smiled, letting his imperfect teeth show. Ramdelior took a deep breath, closed his eyes and attempted to ease his mind in order to try and observe the spouts cast on the spice shop. When he opened his eyes, there they were, layer upon layer of spouts. They were of all different shapes, textures and colours, but most of them resembled a slimy net covering the shop though as he counted them, he saw there were no more than ten. Not very powerful connections, said Ramdelior as he switched back to his normal vision. I only see ten of them. That conniving spoutcaster! He promised me that the spouts would last a lifetime. Wait until I see him again. See him? Well, said the old man, before being interrupted by a loud bang coming from just down the road. One of the giants had sent a cart flying out of its way, splintering into a million pieces in the process. Ramdelior's heart began to beat just a bit harder than usual. Normally, he wouldn't care about what happened in the town that almost unanimously disliked him. But this time, something was different. 
he was beginning to feel a sense of duty. A path he had never thought would be for him began to make itself visible. He hated the idea and tried to calm down. There goes the baker's cart, said Ramdelior. Which one was it? The larger one or one of the small ones? I wouldn't be able to recognise it now, even if I tried. They can always make another one. As the giants neared the spice shop, the one closest to them stared at Ramdelior. The giant's expression was filled with scorn, but Ramdelior stood his ground and stared back at the giant. The giant seemed to become increasingly irritated with Ramdelior's defiance, going as far as reaching for the weapon strapped to his hip. The giant said something in its language. Its voice was strange and deep. The other two giants responded with some sort of laughter. Don't taunt them, said the old man. They'll look for any excuse to attack. I'm definitely not trying to do that, Ramdelior said as he continued to stare. I don't know what's happening. As the Tartarans were passing the spy shop, the giant holding its weapon hocked loudly and spat towards Ramdelior. The glob of whatever he had in his mouth landed near Ramdelior, but instead of backing down or breaking his stare, he took a step towards the giants. The three giants stopped and began to turn towards him. What do you think you're doing? asked the old man. I have no idea. Ramdelior couldn't fathom why he felt a deep urge to act this way. Any other day he would have ignored the situation altogether. He'd have gone back into his cave and let the town burn. But now he was facing down giants. What was wrong with him? The giants spoke to each other in their native tongue, sounding perplexed, but most importantly, angry and ready to attack. Stand down now, said the old man in a tone that he had never heard before. You need not take part in any of this. I agree with the old man. I don't need any part of this. Why am I doing this in the first place? This isn't like me. Or is it? He looked away from the giant, breaking his gaze, and took two steps back. If this is who I am, why haven't I done something like this before? There have been plenty of instances where I could have done something about a local bully, but didn't. The three giants laughed in unison, turned away from Ramdelior, and began walking away. No, 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 come here, screamed a woman from across the street. It was the child from earlier who had called Ramdelior a monster, chasing her ball into the middle of the street and straight into the giant's path. Without showing any restraint, the giant carrying a weapon on his back reached for it and took a hard swing at the child. Ramdelior saw the events in slow motion as his instincts kicked in, urging him to save the child from the extremely heavy mallet. The giant strike sent debris and large slabs of stone flying across the market. Ramdelior delivered the child to her mother via his long tail. His tail was as long as a rope, extending almost three times his body length. Give me back my child, monster, said the lady angrily, grabbing her child from Ramdelior's tail. I'm sorry, what? said Ramdelior incredulously. He had saved that woman's child and she was still calling him a monster. A crowd was gathering around the commotion, many of them murmuring, Flow user. What have I done? asked Ramdelior as he looked around and saw nothing but angry faces. Yulian! yelled one of the giants. As Ramdelior turned to face them, he saw that all three of them had their weapons drawn. Aside from the mallet, he stood face to face with two long, curved swords. The giant who had screamed earlier took out a minute pouch from his waistband and began to rub it between his fingers. A barely visible haze began to form all around them. At once, Ramdelior knew what it was. It was some form of speech spout. He could tell by the way it smelled of mushrooms and ancient olives. Can you understand me, you insignificant creature? asked the giant. The crowd broke into a frenzy when they were able to understand the giant. That was a spout! Cover your noses! See, that's why we don't like flow users! Yeah, nothing but trouble! The comments trailed off as Ramdelior focused back on the giants. 
Unfortunately, yes. I understand you, said Ramdelior. With whom do I have the disgust of speaking? Watch your mouth, dog, said the giant with the mallet. I am Tarkless Lear, and this is Kra and Sha. He gestured to his left and right. Kra was the one who had spat earlier. But our names matter not. As today, you'll die. Okay, play it cool. Don't say anything stupid. They might just leave you alone and be on their way. Or they'll just go berserk and destroy half the town and blame it on me if I manage to survive. Ramdelior stopped to imagine both scenarios and concluded that the first one was highly unlikely. Listen, said Ramdelior as he took a few steps towards the giants and away from the crowd. He wanted to avoid any unnecessary casualties. I don't want any more problems. I was simply moving the child away from your path, that's all. I wasn't challenging you or trying to disrespect you in any way. But if my words don't matter to you, then at least we can move away from the town. He turned towards the mother and her child. You might want to get out of here or cover your child's eyes. Things might get ugly. The mother and child remained silent. Ramdeliel knew that he could easily outrun the giants by quite some distance if they were to go out into the open. I'll say it one more time. Let's move away from the town, said Ramdelior as he gestured towards the town gate with his tail. You can kill me out there. You die here, and you die now, said Kra as he sprang at Ramdelior, sword in hand. Ramdelior saw it all. Compared to his, their movements were slow and stiff. He moved out of the way, but in the process he opened a portal with his tail, big enough for Kra's hand. Ramdelia saw the giant's hand clash against the portal's edge, but its momentum was too great for the giant to control. Once it was stuck more than halfway inside the portal, Ramdelia closed the portal, cutting off the giant's hand in the process. Kra fell to his knees, cradling what was left of his arm as he screamed his lungs out. Quiet! yelled Tak to Kra. You're the Tartaran! Kra managed to stop screaming though it was obvious he was still in pain. You bring shame to our name, said Tack. To lose in battle to a dog, a simpleton floor user. Many a time I've warned you about rushing into battle. This is exactly why. Look, I'll say it a third time, said Ramdelior. I don't want any problems. But if we keep at it, you know what will happen. There's no way you will win. Dog said Tack, as he reached for his weapon. Do you think life stream portals scare us? Do you think we've never seen one before, or that we don't know how to deal with it? we fought real floor users before, floor users with powers you can only dream of, and they are no longer with us in this world. Tack took out a small flask and flung it into the middle of the street, where fumes began to expand from the shattered fragments. As the fumes reached Ramdelior, he instantly knew that he wouldn't be able to use his portal again and the rest of his live stream would be severely limited. Great, this is just what I needed. More limitations. I was already feeling weak in the whole flow area. I don't have spouts or spills in a flask like they do. What the heck am I supposed to do now? If they manage to get hold of me, that would be the last anyone sees or hears of me. Though this can't be the end of me. Not here, not now. The more he thought about it, the more determined he was to win the battle. It was almost as if something was telling him that a lot more awaited him. Sha, ja, finish our weak brother, said Tak as he moved towards Ramdelior. He no longer has the capacity to remain within the ranks of the great and mighty. Please don't, pleaded Kra. I can go to a blacksmith. They will fix me up real nice. I'll be better than ever, please. Sorry, brother, said Shah as he moved towards Kra and decapitated the giant with one swing of his sword. Without any show of emotion, Shah turned towards Ramdelior. Your next, dog. The two giants sprang at Ramdelior, swinging their weapons with all their might. But he was too fast for them. As the giants swung and missed, their movements became sloppy and less coordinated, 
and soon they began getting in each other's way. Just let me do it, said Tack with frustration. Ramdelio was barely able to understand the giant. This meant that the speech spout was starting to wear off. It wouldn't be long before the flow inhibitor spill wore off too. It was just a matter of time. But time wasn't on his side. Ramdelio was beginning to slip and misstep as he dodged strike after strike. Ramdelio saw an opening in one of Tack's swings and went for it. He ran with all the strength he had left, climbing up the giant, holding on to whatever he could, belt, placard, breastplate, until he headbutted Tack with the back of his head. Ramdelio's horns had no problem injecting themselves into the giant's underjaw. Its thick skin felt like butter. Ramdelio pushed up until Tack stopped moving and began to fall. He jumped off the giant before the limp body hit the floor. But it wasn't over yet. There was one remaining. Ramdelio shook himself dry of any spilled blood, gathered himself and turned to face the last giant. His breathing was heavy, but he was ready to face anything that came his way. He had found part of himself once again. Are you just going to stand there? said Ramdelior. Or are we going to give it a go? Shah looked shocked. Watcher, he managed in the common tongue. What? asked Ramdelior. Instead of saying anything, Shah turned around and began to run back the way he had come. Is this really happening? A Tartaran running away from a fight? They basically live to fight. As the giant fled, the gathered crowd began to turn on Ramdelior and mutter things about him that he hadn't heard before. I knew he was a monster from the moment I saw him, the damn Nulian. Gah! We should burn down his cave like you'll burn down our city. Just look at that! What have you done? We don't want you here. Haven't we made that clear? Ramdelior took a second to look at the two giants piled up in the middle of the road and noticed a light emanating from his back. He couldn't see it himself but he saw the shadows it was making on the ground. The light disappeared almost as soon as he saw it. Was that his fire crown? He hadn't seen it appear while using flow in hundreds of years. It was then that Ramdelior had the sinking feeling that his life was about to change. I was only trying to help, yelled Ramdelior. They were about to crush a child. I didn't ask for your help, said the mother of the child. They would have just passed by. How come they didn't crush any other child on the way here? If you hadn't intervened, none of this would have happened. If I hadn't helped, your child wouldn't be here, said Ramdelior. We'll never know that, will we? said the mother angrily. Now you've killed two Tartarans, and what? You think they are peaceful folk? They're going to descend on this town and tear it to the ground. You didn't save my child. You brought war to us. Ramdelior sighed in defeat. He knew that she was somewhat right, and he also knew that there would be no way of getting through to her, or any of them. He turned to try and find the old man behind the crowd of people, knowing that it would probably be the last time he would see him. The old man looked like he was having a heated conversation with the people around the spice shop, probably trying to defend Ramdelior. He decided to just let it go, drop any attachment he had to the small town, and leave. As he walked away, the people around the market began screaming insults at the top of their lungs. Ramdelior did whatever he could to ignore it, lowering his gaze and concentrating hard on other things, going as far as to cast a spout on himself. But his attempts were futile. His spout was weak as he hadn't practiced it before. He had known that it was possible to inhibit hearing through spouts, but that was the extent of it. His hearing was too acute to block out what the people were saying, no matter how much he tried to cover his ears. He heard it all, insult after insult, and all the bad wishes the people had to offer him. He heard it all, until he exited the town. Now you've really done it, Ramdelior thought as he walked back to his cave. Now they really have a reason to hate you. Maybe I should listen to the old man. Change my name and go start somewhere new. Maybe I'll get to experience happiness for a little while, even if it's just for a bit. Chapter 2 Power 
Nulians are powerful creatures, endowed with their own direct connection to the flow. Among them, none is more powerful than the one entrusted with the child. Ramdelior made it to his cave hours later, as the sun was beginning to set. He hadn't gone straight to his cave from the market. Instead, he had gone for a walk in the nearby woods. He had attempted to clear his mind, to relax, but it just wasn't happening. The fight with the giants had triggered something in him. He didn't yet know what it was, but it scared him. Hello there, good old faithful, said Ramdelior as he reached the wooden door at the entrance of the cave. You never let me down. Always there for me when I need you the most. He opened the door with his tail, without having to move the rest of his body. As the door opened, he saw a clear reminder of the events that had transpired earlier that day. The giant's hand was resting there, stretched out from end to end. The hand had made a mess inside the cave as it entered via the portal. The little furniture he had was knocked out of place, and there was a pool of giant's blood underneath the hand. Dried rivers. Spoke too soon, I see. One of the downfalls of Ramdelior's livestream portal, or at least the way he was using it, was that every portal led back to his cave. No matter where he was, any portal that he opened up at any time would lead back to his cave. This was by his own design. He had engraved the receiving part of the portal on one of the walls in his cave. He himself couldn't pass through the portal, as he was on the receiving end. That way, whenever he wanted to open a portal, he could do it in an instant, without thinking about it, without casting a spout. It was almost automatic. As clever as this was, his sole reason for doing so was laziness. Most of the time he used the livestream portal to transport food he caught or brought back to his cave. Should I even bother cleaning this up? I can just grab my stuff and leave. Or I can just leave without grabbing my stuff. It's not like I own anything important. No, I can't do this to my cave. Even if it's going to take me the rest of the night to clean this up. I'll clean it up, go to sleep, and sleep until I forget about the world, or the world forgets about me. It was well past midday the next day, when Ramdelior's stomach had finally had enough. He woke up hungry and ready to eat, though the thought of yesterday's events still lingered. No, 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 he thought as he got up. I'm not going to think about it. It's not like I'm staying for much longer. I could have been the cause of the town's demise. He made his way to the fire pit, where he did all his cooking. Then again, those giants were up to no good. Last time giants visited Alimentana, they weren't wearing war gear. I wonder what they came looking for, or what their business was. But I'm willing to bet there is a horde of giants somewhere in Ikra already. As he lit the fire and began cooking, his thoughts of all the stress he was carrying began to fade away. It was just him and the food. Nothing distracted him quite like a good meal. He enjoyed everything about food. The hunting, the ingredients, and even preparing it. He made himself three pieces of char-broiled fish on a stick, each seasoned with the old man's latest spice. The savoury and mildly spicy aroma of the fish, charred to crispy perfection, filled his cave. He felt himself salivating. He dug in, and in a matter of minutes, the fish, including the bones, was all gone. Once he was finished, he went to the stream that passed through the cave and gulped down water until he felt full. That was too good, said Ramdelior, as he found a comfortable place on the floor to lie down. Maybe I should visit the old man before I go. It's the least I can do. His voice trailed off as he began to feel sleepy. Out of all the people in that wretched town, he was the only one who ever treated me with dignity. Yeah, I should visit. Ramdelio dozed off, and as the world around him disappeared, he began dreaming of a place he had never seen before. It was covered in flowers of all shapes and sizes, 
but their colours were predominantly blues. As he looked around, a road appeared under his feet that led to the edge of a cliff where a roundish hut, also made of flowers, hung off a bridge made of vines. Ramdelior had never seen a place so beautiful before, and he had seen many places throughout his long life. He took a deep breath, trying to smell his surroundings. But as he did so, the odour stung him. It didn't smell like nectar and perfumed flowers at all. It smelled like putrid flesh. Then screams echoed all around him. The place made of flowers began to fade, and he started to wake up. When he opened his eyes, he realised it was already nightfall. He got up right away, feeling that something was wrong. Something had descended on the town, and it wasn't giants. The screams he had heard earlier hadn't come from his dreams. They were coming from the town. As he stood still and opened himself to the world around him to try and see what was going on, that's when it hit him. The burning buildings, the stench of rotting flesh, people screaming for their lives surrounded him. Ramdelior's first instinct was to go straight to the town and help. But the years of animosity he had experienced began to make themselves heard. Now, why would I go there? thought Ramdelior as he went to sit by the floor of the cave. I can go and save a few of them, but then what? They'll turn right back around and say that I caused the whole thing. Yeah, that's not happening, not tonight. But what about the old man? I hope he's not in any kind of trouble. Well, if anyone is going to survive this, it will be him, with all the spouts cast on his shop and all. I should just seal this place and leave. There's nothing for me in that town. He turned around and began walking away from the door. But as he did so, something about it felt wrong. His heart began to beat faster and faster with every step he took, and the urge to go and save at least one person from the town got stronger and stronger. What in blazes is this? asked Remdelior under his breath. There's nothing for me here, absolutely nothing. He fought the urge with logic, but he was turning around to face the door. It was as if something was trying to tell him that he was made for this, that his entire life of loneliness had led up to this day. His body shivered as his breathing intensified. The child of power has been born, said a passing breeze from within the cave. Save that child. Watch over her. Fulfill your duty as the last of us, so that we may rest. Without giving it a second thought, Ramdelior ran towards the town. As he ran, he couldn't believe his eyes. People were fleeing across the field, being chased by what looked like undead people. No, not ordinary civilians, but undead soldiers, if the torn uniforms they wore was any indication. Luckily for the people, they were a lot faster, and Ramdelior was confident they would survive. But the undead soldiers weren't just chasing people across the fields of Alamantana. Flames engulfed the town, and screams rose from all over the town. What are they doing here? asked Ramdelior as he approached the town through the marketplace. He had heard of a legion of dead soldiers before, but they were from a faraway place near the end of the world, Etrania, the frozen land. Even with the Pasok doors, it would be impossible to transport an entire legion from so far away. They must have been making their way to this town for quite some time, three or four months at least. The Pasok doors were as old as flow and time itself. No one knew who or what had built the doors, but there were fourteen of them scattered across the world. The doors granted their user the ability to cross vast distances in a matter of moments. However, the user would only be able to use the Pasok doors 14 times throughout their lifetime. As Remdelior entered the marketplace, he saw that things were much worse than he had imagined. Almost every stall or shop was flipped upside down and inside out. The undead were searching for something. But not all was lost. For every 10 shops, there was one still standing. It was flow spouts that had kept those shops intact. Among the shops that weren't touched was the old man's spice shop. But it wasn't for lack of trying. 
Outside stood a group of five undead attempting to get in, but with every attempt there was a pushback from the spouts. Be gone! bellowed Ramdelior as he neared the shop. The undead barely reacted to his presence, too fixated on the task at hand. Ramdelior thought about cutting them down with his claws, but he thought better of it as a gust of wind blew his way. He settled on using his life stream. Embers began jumping around Ramdelio's body. He planted his paws firmly on the ground and unleashed a stream of fire. The group of undead squealed and made an unholy noise as his attack charred them to dust. It's too soon to be using so much life stream, muttered Ramdelio as he took in a deep breath. He knew that the night was just starting and the thought of being unprepared for the upcoming events crept into his mind. No, I can't start thinking this way. Whatever happens tonight, I have to see it through. I just have to be smart about how I use the live stream in my reservoir. Control is everything. Control your body. Ramdelior took a deep breath. Control. Control is everything. Everything is control. Old man, open up, said Ramdelior as he knocked on the shop windows. Is that you, Ramdelio? We have to get you out of here. This town will fall tonight. The window opened slightly. The old man was behind it, trying to sniff. It stinks out there. The old man covered his nose. How can I ever make sure it's you? Old man, we don't have time for this. I need to get you to a safe place. The town will fall. I'm not going anywhere. I'm perfectly fine here. Especially not with a face shifter. Though I never knew that face shifters could imitate voices that well. Now leave. Why are you so stubborn? Ramdelior felt like pulling out his mane. Listen to me. If I don't get you to leave, more of those undead will come here. And they will not stop until they see what's inside your shop. Do you want your shop destroyed? And face shifters can't duplicate voices. That's exactly what a face shifter would say. Would a face shifter know that I was here yesterday and got into a fight with three giants all because some ungrateful mother wouldn't take care of her child? Maybe. Okay, would a face shifter know you're my only friend in the world? Ah, so it is you. The old man opened his shop window fully, turning part of it into a counter. What brings you here? I'm trying to save you. Doesn't this thing have a door or something? The old man folded part of the counter onto itself and unhinged a section of the wall. Ramdelior went inside the spice shop as soon as he was able to fit. Unlike the outside air, the air inside the spice shop was fragrant, almost refreshing, if not a bit spicy. Look, I don't know what's happening or why, but I do know you aren't safe here. Ramdelior began to make a large portal with his tail until it was wide enough for the old man to comfortably walk through. So I need to get you over to my cave. I'm sure you'll be safe there. Is this one of your portals? Is that what it is? And since when do you get to order me around? Old man, I've never asked for anything in all the years I've known you. I just need you to be safe. Oh, all right, all right, said the old man and he walked towards where he thought the portal was. He was close, but not close enough to fully walk through by himself. Ramdelior had to guide him with his tail. It's getting too late for all this. Where will you go, Ramdelior? I need you to stay inside the cave until you can't hear or smell them any more. There's enough food there for a few days, if need be. Don't worry about me, said the old man as he took a step inside the portal. But you haven't answered. What about you? Where will you go? I'm going to find out why someone decided to name me the Last Watcher. The old man snickered from inside Ramdelior's cave. I hope to see you again, old man, said Ramdelior as he closed the portal. It's about time, you know. The old man's voice made it through the portal before the last of it closed. It's about time. What does he mean by that? Ramdelio thought as he left the spice shop and climbed onto the roof. 
but the train of thought left him as soon as he looked around and saw the condition the town was in. Half the town was in flames by now. People were running everywhere, chased by the undead. And he noticed two-headed lizard-like creatures hopping from roof to roof. The creatures were looking for something. That much was obvious. He was running out of time. Where am I supposed to go? asked Ramdelior as he climbed higher, moving from one structure to the next. Where? He looked around desperately for the answer. Then he saw it. There was an area of the town that was surprisingly intact and with little movement. It wasn't coincidence. It was an outpouring of life stream, he was sure. Ramdelior gathered his strength and began jumping from roof to roof, avoiding the lizard creatures wherever he could. But even when he got near them, they ignored him. It was almost as if he wasn't there. The lizards were laser-focused on the task at hand, carving holes in the roofs and crawling in and out of the structures. I have to hurry. It's near. I can feel it. But so much power from a child. How is it possible? Ramdelia thought, as he neared the quiet area of town. He moved without making a sound. He didn't want to be spotted by anyone lurking in the shadows. As he entered the quiet area, calm washed over him, making him feel as if nothing was happening there. He was sure that those were the effects of a powerful life stream cloak. Who could be doing this? Is it the child? No, no, this is way beyond that. I'd be hard-pressed to find a powerful Nahar that could do this. A few moments later, he saw what he was looking for in the form of a young couple carrying a newborn. He was sure it was them, or rather, he was sure that was the child. Ramdelio couldn't explain why exactly, but the child's connection to the flow was pulling him in. It was as if his life finally had purpose. The couple walked in the shadows of the buildings, minding every step they took. They weren't too far away from one of the town's rear exits. If they kept going just a little longer, they'd be able to reach the outside of town and surely escape the chaos. Ramdelior followed them closely, trying to remain hidden. He was using every buffer spout he knew to hide his presence. That's when Ramdelior felt it. The complete opposite of the force emanating from the child. A dark entity was approaching. A man wearing a dark cloak was walking towards the fleeing couple in a nonchalant manner, without a care in the world. That man was dangerous, dangerous beyond anything Ramdelio had ever felt before. Come on, come on, just a little more, thought Ramdelio as he observed the couple's progress through town. As Ramdelio took one last look at the cloaked man, he saw the man was staring back at him with a smile. In that moment, Ramdelio knew that he would die by this man's hands. Ramdelio leaped and ran as fast as he could to intercept the couple. He got in front of them within seconds. He towered over the young couple. Beast, stay back, I warn you, yelled the young man as he pulled out a knife and stepped forward to defend the child and his other half. Tears were already forming in his eyes. I am Ramdelio, fury and scorcher of worlds, the last watcher and I will give everything I have, including my life, to protect your child. A man approaches, the one responsible for all of this. Against him, I cannot guarantee protection for your child, but I can take the child and go to a faraway land where she will be safe. The choice is yours. Either I leave now with your child, or we all die here and now. A slow clap could be heard from the nearest alley. Here he comes, said Ramdelio as he changed his stance into a crouch, ready for a fight. Moments later, they were being surrounded by the lizard-like creatures climbing over the rooftops, and the stench of the dead soldiers made it clear that the streets would be blocked at any moment. Demon, said the cloaked man as he exited the alleyway. Born from the fire of the flow itself, you dare get in my way. Do you even understand what results your actions will wield? How much pain and suffering you will bring to the world? It's now or never, muttered Ramdelio to the couple. The young woman took a step closer and handed her child over to Ramdelio. Tears 
already rolling down her cheeks. <laughs> her name is Bliss. Ramdelior took Bliss in one of his paws as he made a portal big enough for the couple to fit through. I will take good care of her, said Ramdelior as gently as he could. Now get in and listen to the old man. The couple walked through the portal, and as soon as they had finished crossing into Ramdelior's cave, he closed it. Ramdelior then placed Bliss on his tail, which he coiled to form a basket. Bliss floated within the tail basket. Try and escape if you will, the cloak man said. Make no mistake, I will find you, I will find her, and I will end you both. Ramdelio took one deep breath and ran towards the nearest town exit. Get them! yelled the cloak man. The creatures surrounding them began chasing them, but they were no match for his speed. He was giving it everything he had. Even as the undead soldiers tried to form a barrier, he climbed back up to the rooftops and leaped over the wall that surrounded the town. He kept running at full speed without looking back. Many times he felt the presence of the cloaked man near him, but just as many times he pushed harder still. Run, said a faint voice, as if it was being carried by the wind. Know the name of the man who will hunt you for the rest of your life. I am Gavril, archer of night. Never forget that. Don't worry, little one, said Ramdelior, as he tried to control his breathing. I'll keep you safe. Chapter 3 Purpose Those who go against the flow chose well when they chose Gavril, for he was truly hardened. None posed more of a threat, was more tenacious, or possessed such ability to prevail against all odds. This makes it easy to think of the world coming to an end. This makes it easy to think that we've already lost. Gavril, neither Nulian nor human, had been in shackles before, but he had never been escorted by actual dragons. Granted, the dragons were medium-sized and wingless, with hundreds of horns protruding from the back of their heads and down their backs. Not a clan kind of dragon, or the larger winged kind, but still, he considered it a sign of respect. As the most powerful man alive was about to see the ruler of all Ikra, dragons seemed fitting. Not to belittle anyone. There were also no fewer than twenty-two high guards and the ruler's very own Nord surrounding Gavril as they walked. Gavril's legion of the undead, as well as the hundreds of sentinel seekers, followed behind the ruler's powerful army. This would mark the first time Gavril had been summoned to a ruler's domain. Looks like I'm moving up in rank, said Gavril to no one in particular. Quiet, inhuman, said the Nord. Save it for when you're in front of our ruler. What's the matter? asked Gavril with an almost sarcastic tone. Can't a man talk? I said quiet, the Nord half turned and pointed his staff at Gavril or I will make your tongue disappear from your mouth. Do it, said Gavril, staring directly at the Nord. Let's see just how much flow you've learned. Mehia Kensia, chanted the Nord with his staff pointed at Gavril's mouth. Moments later, a powdery but fast-moving substance left the staff and disappeared into Gavril's mouth. Gavril felt the spout enter his body but it didn't do much other than tickle. The Nord was weak. Hundreds of years would have to pass before the Nord's life stream could so much as scratch him. Gavril knew there were some powerful Nords out there, but this was not one of them. To the vast many, Flo was not equal in strength. Not being able to help himself, Gavril pretended to have succumbed to the Nord's spout. There was no conversation to be had after all. He was simply evaluating the field. Inhuman, can you still speak? asked the Nord haughtily, head held high. Gavril pretended to struggle as he tried to open his mouth. Do you see that? asked the Nord. 
That, my friends, is the great and unmatched power of a Nord. Nothing is more powerful. The ruler would be proud, said a nearby female high guard. Other high guards stared blankly at Gavril. A young and naive Nord, two retired dragons, and an army of soldiers just waiting to overthrow their ruler. The world hasn't heard enough about me yet. I'll need to change that. Call off your legion, said the Nord, as he half turned towards Gavril. We don't want them marching any further into our sacred land. Your mutts, too. Gavril shook his head, refusing. The Nord stopped walking and so did the rest of the convoy. Call off your legion, said the Nord imperiously as he turned towards Gabriel, or this will be as far as you get in the Seven Worlds. He nodded at one of the nearby high guards. The high guard stepped towards Gabriel, unsheathing his sword. Do it now! Gabriel stared at the high guard, making him take a step back. Do not fear this inhuman! said the Nord as he took a step towards Gavril and slapped him across the face. You see, compared to the might of a Nord, he is meaningless. Gavril didn't feel anything when the Nord slapped him, but he had to pretend that he did and even jerked his head to one side. It's your last chance, said the Nord. On behalf of the ruler, I order the death of the Inhuman. Gavril made a pleading gesture with his shackled hands and then fell to his knees. He gestured back at the Legion to stop the march. They stopped at once, including his sentinel seekers. He pretended to plead for his life once again, and the Nord bought it. Very well, said the Nord. Obedient as you should be. You should know no one is above the ruler's law. We may proceed. Gavril did everything he could not to roll his eyes as he got back up and continued walking. They headed into the large town of Kep, towards the central tower where the ruler would be. The town was perhaps three times as large as Alamantana and had five times as many people. The streets were bustling with activity, though most people stayed clear of the convoy. Gavril wondered how many times the ruler had summoned someone in this manner. It had to be a handful of times at least. As they approached the central tower, the building began to look bigger. The town was well maintained and lavish drapes hung off the side of every building, but nothing compared to the sight of this building. Be prepared to meet your ruler, said the Nord as they entered the central tower. You will only speak when spoken to and if the ruler desires. You will not talk back in any way, shape or form. At all times you will keep your head down. Do you understand, inhuman? Gavril nodded once. As they got deeper into the central tower, the convoy of guards dwindled, and by the time they reached the power room, there were only ten high guards, the two dragons and the Nord. The ruler of all Ikra sat in a lavishly adorned chair at the end of the room. He wore a leather coat with gold charms hanging from his shoulders, he had a handful of guards on each side of him. His expression was lifeless, filled with disdain. This is far enough, said the Nord, as he thumped his staff on the floor. The sound thundered around the room. A cheap trick in Gavril's eyes. Keep your head down, inhuman. Gavril did as the Nord said. That's all right, said the ruler. Let his eyes feast upon greatness. Let him find meaning in his life. Let him see the face of his executioner. Gavril, archer of night, of the cold mountain, the forsaken one, the inhuman. Step forth. Gavril again did as he was told. Wendell, has this pest been muted? Asked the ruler, directing himself at the Nord. Gavril sneered at the mention of the Nord's name. Be reminded of your place, inhuman, said the Nord, addressing Gavril's mockery before answering the ruler. Then he turned towards the ruler and stood up as straight as he could. Yes, my ruler, I hit him with one of the greatest tongue-binding spouts in my arsenal. 
Unmute the inhuman, said the ruler. You know, said Gavril, before the Nord had a chance to chant a spout, I'm really starting to get tired of that word, inhuman. It doesn't fit me. I hope your vocabulary is not that limited. The Nord looked at Gavril with wide eyes. Wendell? asked the ruler. I'm not, said Wendell, looking back and forth between Gavril and the ruler. I'm not sure what happened, my ruler. I consider myself, said Gavril, as he looked past the Nord to the ruler, the most human of all humans, the one with an actual cause worth fighting for, worth dying for. And you? Are you human enough, ruler? Or do you consider yourself above humans, chosen by the flow itself to rule the poor people of Ikra? What's the difference between you and them? Whispers flew across the room. Insolence! yelled the ruler as he stood up. How dare you question your ruler! Let me remind you where you are. You're in the great world of Ikra, where my word is law. There's not a more prosperous world in the seven worlds, and you, inhuman, marched into my lands, killed dozens of people, and burned half a town down, and you have the audacity to question me. My ruler, said Wendell, should I mute the inhuman? Call me inhuman again, said Gavril as he looked at both the Nord and the ruler. I dare you. That didn't work before, said the ruler. Why would it work now? But I am interested in hearing the brute's last words. I came here to prevent a dark future, said Gavril. Massive wars. Genocides, famine, pandemics, life lost on a scale that has never been seen and will never be seen again within the seven worlds and no worlds. The child of power was born into this world yesterday, and I must see that she never reaches her 18th day of birth. The world will prosper without her in ways you cannot begin to imagine. The ruler chuckled. <laughs> You're more lost than I thought said the ruler. The seven worlds are at peace with one another. No other ruler is seeking to take what is rightfully mine. Newlians and humans live in harmony, for the most part. The worlds are progressing now. The flow has never stopped flourishing since the beginning of recorded time. The things that you speak of will never come to pass. So this so-called cause of yours gives you the right to kill innocent people? I have a few heavy-handed helpers, sure, said Gavril. Though I can assure you, those who died deserved to. The many layers of spouts in the town's buildings made it impossible to search quickly, so they had to burn. But in the end, the needs of the few, the very few, do not outweigh the needs of the seven worlds. I've heard enough, said the ruler as he sat back down. I've answered your questions said Gavril. Now why don't you answer mine? I don't answer to anyone. The ruler lifted his head and turned away from Gavril. Do away with the prisoner. Executioner's choice. You think so much of yourself, said Gavril as he took off the shackles as if they were made of paper. The Nord pointed his staff at him while the high guards unsheathed their swords and even the two dragons on each side of Gavril got ready to attack. Yet half the people in this town don't know what they will eat tomorrow, while you and those around you feast on lavish banquets day after day until there's no room left. Do you think I'm scared of you, brute? The ruler got up from his seat and walked over to Gavril. What if I had refused to come here? said Gavril as he cracked his neck. What would have happened then? A battle would have ensued between those who cannot die and those who can. Who do you think would have won in the end? And it's funny, I didn't see you there in the fields, willing to give up your own life to bring me here, to bring me to so-called justice. What a farciful ruler you are! The ruler didn't say anything. Instead, he kept walking towards Gavril with his head held high. The problem with all of this, Gavril said, is that you aren't scared of me because you think the thousands of spouts that have been cast on you will actually protect you from me. In one swift movement, 
Gavril took the staff from the Nor's hand and swung it at the ruler's head. The staff shattered into a million pieces on impact. Everyone on the ruler's side launched themselves at Gavril, but he paid no attention to the high guards. Their weapons wouldn't be able to scratch his hardened skin. As for the dragons in the room, they were in a league of their own, capable of demolishing anything and anyone in their path. These kinds of dragons could produce fire, though Gavril wasn't sure they'd do so inside the power room. And even though they were medium-sized and wingless, he knew he had to be careful. Gavril got out of the way and started looking for an opening on the dragons. With their backs covered in horns, the front was the only option. But it wasn't a good option. Gavril had to get rid of the dragons quick, before they turned berserk. If they go into their berserker state, they are going to rage out of control and kill everything in sight. Out of control? That's it. Gavril launched at one of them, hoping he was fast enough to evade the dragon's grip. Once he was close enough, he jabbed the dragon everywhere he thought it would hurt the most. Under the jaw, in arms, ribcage. The dragon didn't ignore Gavril's blows. They hurt, he was sure of it. Many times the dragon attempted to grab Gavril, but he was just too fast for the larger beast. The rest of the room stayed clear of the scuffle, apart from the other dragon, which was watching within reach. Without warning, the dragon he was attacking turned around and swatted him with his spiky tail. It was a direct hit that shattered most, if not all, of the spikes on the dragon's tail, as it sent Gavril flying across the room and into the back wall. That was quite a warm-up, Gavril snickered as he unstuck himself from the thick wall. He had managed to hold on to a shard of one of the dragon's own spikes. I haven't had this much fun in years. Both dragons roared as they faced Gavril and assumed a fire-spitting pose. He knew this pose all too well. If a dragon held on firmly to the floor with all four limbs, its tail up and its mouth pointed at something, that something was about to be incinerated. Gavril doubled down on his speed advantage and launched at the dragon he had already been aggravating. He continued the barrage of attacks, and before falling into the dragon's grasp, he plunged the shard into the right side of the dragon's neck. The shard was barely able to pierce the skin, but pierce it did. The dragon roared at Gavril. It was already drooling, showing its teeth, pounding the floor with excessive force. The dragon was enraged. Just a little more. Gavril thought as he turned his attention to the second dragon to keep it from spitting fire. But the second dragon wasn't as slow as the first, and it managed to get hold of Gavril. This was going to hurt. The second dragon took Gavril in its claw and swatted him across the floor, cracking the ground underneath him. The dragon then grabbed Gavril's feet and threw him towards the ceiling, where Gavril got stuck once again. Both dragons were staring at him but he saw that his plan was working. The dragon with the shard in its neck was having a hard time looking up. Gavril wiggled himself free and pushed against the ceiling with force, careful to position his body so he'd be able to reach the injured dragon. As he neared, he booted the area where the shard had pierced, further aggravating it. The dragon roared and chased after Gavril as he landed. Gavril kept running circles around the injured dragon until it happened. It went berserk. The dragon stopped all movement and began to transform into its final indomitable form. More spikes began to protrude from its limbs, while the horns on the back of its head grew larger and flames began spewing from its mouth. Gavril smiled while the rest of the room retreated. Even the second dragon took a step back. I'll tell you, said Gavril with a smile. It's about time. Every Nulian has a final form. It's just a matter of bringing it to light. Now, witness a dragon's rage. Gavril taunted the enraged dragon with a simple, come here, hand gesture. The dragon destroyed everything in front of it and ran towards him at unbelievable speed. Gavril was able to move out of the way by only the smallest of margins. As the dragon kept trying to attack Gavril and he kept dodging, its rage grew stronger. I have you where I want you, Gavril thought, as he kept evading the berserker dragon and making his way to the second dragon. I'm going to deliver you one crazy, angry dragon. 
The second dragon didn't hesitate to grab Gavril as he came within reach. But this time he got serious, and the dragon wasn't able to move Gavril around. The dragon looked perplexed, but it was too late. The berserker dragon was already charging at them. Gavril simply got out of the way as the two dragons collided. The second dragon tried to escape the first one's rage, but it wasn't long before the second dragon went berserk as well. The two dragons turned on each other and became a giant ball of fire. Within seconds, they broke through one of the walls and continued their fight outside. At that point, Gavril stopped paying attention to them and focused on the people in the room. So where were we? asked Gavril as he shook some dirt from his clothes. Ah yes, the part where you didn't fear me. He walked up to the ruler. Does that still hold true? You cannot harm me, said the ruler, as his Adam's apple bobbed. Gavril took one step closer, and the ruler took yet another step back. Doesn't seem like it to me, said Gavril. I just want to take a closer look at all those spouts you carry. The ruler turned to Wendell. Wendell, take care of the inhuman. Gavril snapped a look at Wendell. Master, said Wendell, as he knelt on the floor and bowed his head. How dare you betray your ruler! You swore an oath to me! You swore to protect your ruler! Any other takers? asked Gavril, as he stopped just a few steps away from the ruler. The rest of the high guards in the room dropped their weapons. <gasps> Blasphemy, said the ruler. Yeah, could be. But this is nothing worse than what you do on a daily basis to the people of Ikra. You betrayed them as well. You know nothing of what I've done, said the ruler as he kept inching away slowly. I don't need to know what you've done to know what I need to do. I just need to be here as I am now, to make a difference. Gavril knew the child of power would be born in the run-down, damaged and corrupt world. The only world out of the seven that was on the brink of losing its flow. Instead of uniting the people, said Gavril, as he ran up to the ruler and grabbed him by his throat. You have divided them. Nulians and humans are not one in this world. They are enemies. Instead of using flow to help its people, you've sold it to the highest bidder. Instead of feeding the people, you've consumed and thrown away riches, given them to those who need them the least. Perversion and malice have consumed you. You're not worthy to be ruler. And what does that make you? The only being that can save this world, Gavril said as he picked up the ruler single-handedly, even though the many layers of spouts made the ruler weigh several tons. You will pay! Everyone pays in the end, said Gavril as he slammed the ruler into the floor, cracking it and sending fragments of thick stone flying across the room as the layers of spouts tried to deflect the hit. And for you, this is your end. You'll rule not a single day more. Gavril repeated the process a few more times until the layers of spouts had been destroyed. Are there any other takers? roared Gavril as he walked away from the fading ruler's corpse. The room had fallen silent. There was a part of Gavril that felt bad for what he'd just done. It wasn't as if he didn't feel. He did, and in many ways he felt stronger emotions than humans did. Analyzing the consequences of his actions, the long-term effect they would have on the Seven Worlds, was the only thing that brought him comfort. Pick yourself a just ruler this time, said Gavril as he dusted off his clothes and began making his way out of the room. Or I will. Gavril chose to walk out of the room through the hole the dragons had made. There wasn't a high guard or soldier in sight as he walked through the large bailey. Only the dragons were there, no longer entangled in a ball of fire. They were unconscious, heavily wounded, but not dead. He was sure they would survive. He heard a puffing sound next to him, but he didn't bother to look, as he already knew who it was. 
It took you long enough, Ipaphus, said Gavril. Forgive me, my lord, said Ipaphus, as he tried to catch up with Gavril's long strides. The scene in Alimentana was quite confusing. So much power was going around in a single night. Ipaphus was a Nulian Yurachi, a small race of strange creatures, mischievous and clever by nature. The Yurachi attire was simple, consisting of uncomplicated leather garments, though in their heads they typically wore an elaborate oversized bone. Yurachi is sought out for their innate ability to smell flow, to look into it like no other Nulian can. They're able to smell flow through time and thus deduce events of the past, present, and sometimes future. Among other things, Yurachi are known to live for thousands of years, only dying after their purpose ceases to exist. There weren't many Yurachi left throughout the Seven Worlds and No Worlds. Gavril guessed their total number was within a few hundred. Unlike other species that needed to reproduce to continue to exist, Yurachi had no such need. Whenever a Yurachi died, another would emerge from its carcass. Were you able to find something out? said Gavril as he walked back towards Alamantana. Was that really the child of power? Yes, my lord, there's no mistaking it. That's the child we've been searching for. Where did they head? asked Gavril as he stopped and looked at Ipaphus. They headed to the North Pasok of Ikra. Or at least that's where their flow trail leads. Then that's where we are headed, said Gavril, as he turned to his right and started walking again. Will you be able to track them even if they took a Pasok to another world? If it were anyone else, absolutely not. But the child possesses great power. Flow pours out of her unlike anything I've seen before. It may be possible, but I can't guarantee it. We will try. My lord, said Ipaphus, hesitant. What is it? There's one thing that you must be aware of. Gavril looked at Ipaphus as they walked, but didn't say anything. The one that carries the child, said Ipaphus as he fidgeted with his hands. He was clearly nervous. He is an immense threat. We've dealt with threats before. We'll deal with him as well. This time is different, my lord. He's not your ordinary Nulian. He possesses power far beyond your own at the moment. Perhaps he himself is not yet aware of the extent of his power. But that Nulian is dangerous. I believe he is the child's watcher. Appointed by none other than the flow itself to guard the child, said Gavril airily, finishing Ipaphus's sentence. Gavril had always appreciated Ipaphus's undeniable honesty. It was one of the main reasons he kept him around. Yes, my lord. I fear that getting through him will be impossible. And all the while, your life will be at risk, my lord. We will fight harder, said Gavril, as he looked away from Ipaphus, getting ready to jump the wall that surrounded the central tower. You're almost at the limit of your power now. Worry not, my friend said Gavril, as he leaped over the wall without a problem. Limits are meant to be broken. Ipaphus simply puffed his way back to Gavril's side and continued walking. I hear your warning loud and clear, continued Gavril, and I will not take it lightly. But I must do what I have to do to save this world from what's coming. Chapter 4 Passage Life stream, an ever-flowing source of power for all flow users. For most, controlling life stream takes years of practice and patience. The more life stream a flow user has, the harder it is to control. Though no one was prepared for the amount of life stream bliss would bring into the world. After traveling for three days and four nights, Ramdelior and Bliss had finally reached the vicinity of the North Pasok of Ikra. Ramdelior had not tired in the least during what normally would have been an arduous journey. It was as if tiny Bliss had been emanating life. Bliss had been sleeping throughout, not even waking up for food or when he cleaned her cloth. Her life stream, her sense of preservation 
even at this age, was taking care of her, Ramdelior was sure. Even though it was the dead of night and heavy fog surrounded them, Ramdelior felt a sense of relief upon gazing at the Pasok structure. For the first time, his heart had gone back to beating normally again. They were almost out of harm's way. The Pasok was an arc-like structure, made from several elaborate carved stones, with a larger keystone at its centre. The whole structure was about three times the size of the old man's spice shop, though giants would have had a hard time fitting through it. Nobody knew who or what had built the Pasok doorways, or for what purpose, and only a few knew how they worked. Not even the Pasok's guardians knew who had built them. One of the few things that was known, and that was apparent just by looking at one, was that it used old and powerful life stream. We're almost there, murmured Ramdelior, as he neared the half-hidden structure with the utmost caution. He was on the lookout for the guardian. Bliss kept sucking on her thumb as she slept. As Ramdelior stepped towards the structure, its guardian appeared, standing above the arch. It was a winged creature, probably as old as the structure itself. Its beak was jagged, its long feathers unkempt, and its talons had already carved into the stone it stood on. Strings of spouts no thicker than a strand of hair swirled around the guardian, becoming visible as the faintest light hit them. But its most powerful spout was on its forehead in the form of a seal, a powerful being in the flow world, no doubt. Watcher, said the guardian slowly, you have come, and to the herald of flow, my utmost respect. The guardian bowed. I'm the Pasok's guardian, Egerian. What does he mean by that? Anyway, now is not the time to ask. If that man is still on our trail, I have to move fast. We seek safe passage, said Ramdelior. Egerian stared at Ramdelior. From the corner of his eye, Ramdelior saw fourteen symbols begin to appear around his neck, glowing in a faint red light. Ramdelior had never seen the Pasok symbols before, though he knew they existed and had heard others describing their appearance. Each symbol was made up of many straight lines that formed a circle, with the numbers from one to fourteen in the centre of each one. The symbols rotated slowly around his neck. You have fourteen keys, said Adurian, as the spouts around him became more visible. That will grant you fourteen safe passages within the seven worlds, one through each of the fourteen gates. Will you be using one of your keys? Ramdelion knew full well that there was no other way to get through the Pasok, but even so, he couldn't suppress the urge to ask. There isn't any other way, is there? There is not. Ramdelior sighed. What about her? Asked Ramdelior as he brought Tiny Bliss forward, using only his tail. How many keys does she have? The Herald of Flow, said Egerian as he bowed once more. She can pass as many times as she needs to. Do you mean she has more than fourteen keys? The stream of flow will bend to her will. A key is not required of her. Ramdelio shook his head, trying to make sense of it all. Okay, I want to use one of my keys, and she can just come along with me, right? That's correct. Send me to the furthest pass up from here. Very well said Adurian, as the structure began to light up with flow, and a clear view of where they were headed appeared. It was daytime in a high-up place, perhaps near a mountain. The Kapas South Pasok. Once you pass, you'll have thirteen keys left. Do you agree? Yes. Safe passage is yours. Knowing it would be cold on the other side, Ramdelior did his best to keep Bliss warm. He wrapped his tail around her once more and moved her closer to his body, 
tucking her in near his neck. He then walked towards the passock and entered it slowly. Once he was fully in, the passock took hold of him, pulling him towards his new destination. To Ramdelior, being inside the passock felt like falling while on solid ground. There were no smells, no colours. It was just him and Bliss. In moments, he emerged on the other side, though he had to jump down as the passock was floating in mid-air, just a few body lengths off the ground. Capus South was unlike anything he had ever seen before. But then again, Ramdelio had not travelled much in his long life. He had gotten to see parts of Tartarin, which was south of Ikra, and even lesser parts of Arelum, which was to the north. But even those had some resemblance to the world he had grown up in. Capus South was entirely different. The land went from rich greens and blues to pale and dark browns. The temperature was also a shock. Ikra was by no means the warmest place he'd ever been. But Capus South was pushing boundaries. It was cold. Too cold for a baby. I guess we won't be staying here either murmured Ramdelior as he turned right around, looking for the Passock's guardian. It wasn't long before he found this Passock's guardian. He wasn't much different from a durian. Only the colour of his feathers had changed, and perhaps the shape of his beak. Ramdelior wasn't sure, as he hadn't paid it much attention. This time, the guardian was directly below the floating Passock, leaning against a rock formation. Watcher and the Herald of Flo said the guardian, as he bowed his head, just like a durian had done. I am Osto, the guardian of this passock. At least they don't have the same name, even if they have the same greeting, Ramdelia thought. We seek safe passage, said Ramdelior. You have thirteen keys remaining, said Osto, as the keys around Ramdelior's neck appeared once more. She has no limit. Can you send us somewhere warm? The South Passock of Pantheus, said Osto, as a bright blue ocean appeared, with no land in sight. Somewhere that has land, perhaps? There is land in the surrounding area. The last thing I want is to be swimming somewhere in a sea filled with predators while holding a child. That's not going to work. Very well said Osto, as the scenery inside the Passock changed once again. The new place was green, covered in plants and trees. The South Passock of Rafelin. That will suffice, said Ramdelior, getting ready to jump back up into the Passock. Will you be using one of your keys? Yes. Safe passage is yours. Ramdelior jumped up to the Passock and it wasn't long before they emerged on the other side. This time, instead of cold, dry air, Ramdelior felt warmth and a bit of humidity. It wasn't something he particularly minded. He knew that a warm place would be best for Bliss. As he looked around, he saw that they had the perfect place to stay. Fruit trees surrounded him. He could see a waterfall in the distance along a rushing river, and the noises of a thousand animals filled the area. It was a lavish and beautiful place. Whoa, managed Ramdelior, as he moved Bliss away from his body and relaxed his tail to try and make her more comfortable. I guess this is where we'll be staying. As he said that, he remembered that they hadn't travelled here for their own leisure. They were being pursued, and not by just anyone. It was a dangerous man who was after them. He wouldn't put it past that man to be capable of following them here, or at least he didn't want to take the risk. I will find you, I will find her, and I will end you both, the man had said. Even the simple act of remembering the presence of that man gave Ramdelio the chills. Who was that man in Alimentana? I'd better not take any risks. I'm not sure that I'm strong enough to defend Bliss against him. Even if they can track us through one Passock, they can't possibly track us through all of them. Ramdelio turned right back around to look for the Guardian. It wasn't long before he found him. They talked, and once again Ramdelio agreed to use his key. 
Ramdelio repeated this action ten more times, going from Pasok to Pasok, before turning right back around to go through a new one. He did this in an effort to erase and cover up their trail. He felt confident that no flow tracking would be able to follow them through so many Pasoks. It was on the twelfth key that he decided to go back to the warmth that the South Pasok of Rafelin had to offer. Once he emerged back into the warmth, he plunged deep into the rainforest. A few hours later, he finally stopped to tend to Bliss. And for the first time since offering to take care of her, he felt like he could stop running. That's how he knew that they had found their home. We've made it to our new home, murmured Ramdelio as he cleaned Bliss's cloth. Ramdelio had learned the washing spout from the merchant clothes cleaners of Alamantana as they washed clothes by the river. All the spout did was vibrate the fabric in such a way that it made the stain or soil fall off. It came at a cost. Usually fabric didn't last through too many of those spouts. I'd better make some form of bed for her, Ramdelio thought. With Bliss still sleeping, he silently gathered whatever soft things he could find and formed them into a little bed. He tested the bed with the side of his face before attempting to place Bliss there. This is good enough. With exaggerated care, he placed Bliss on the makeshift bed. Bliss didn't last long on the bed. Mere moments later, she was floating back to Remdelior. She settled on his back, floating just a few potato lengths above it. He sighed. Rather than trying to put Bliss back into her bed, he decided that he would go and do a little exploring around their new home. At the same time, perhaps he'd be able to find himself some lunch though he hadn't the slightest idea what Bliss would eat, or if she needed to eat at all. Before going for a walk, he scooped Bliss into his tail. Let's just make sure you aren't too hot, said Ramdelior. With the most delicate movement he could manage, using the tip of his nail, he uncovered Bliss's head, revealing her rich violet hair. Now that's something I wasn't expecting. As he moved Bliss onto his back using his long tail, she began to awaken from her long sleep. Her tender eyes opened, slowly looking for something to focus on. Ramdelior could not help but smile, although he tried to keep his grin to a minimum and not show all of his razor-sharp teeth. Ramdelior saw the moment when he came into focus, but instead of crying and screaming, Bliss's face lit up with delight. Almost instantly, she extended her tiny hands towards him, trying to grab him. Ramdelior moved closer to Bliss and allowed her to touch his head, which seemed giant compared to her tiny newborn human size. It was in that moment that Ramdelior experienced something he had never felt before in his long life. Unconditional affection. An unbreakable bond began to form. Ramdelior felt within himself that he would do everything possible to keep this child from harm. His life was now hers. For the first few days, Ramdelior searched far and wide for something for Bliss to eat. He even went as far as getting milk from the nearby goats, something that had nearly killed both Ramdelior and the mother goat. It turned out he didn't have a good sense of balance at the edge of the cliffs. Though it was all in vain because no matter what Ramdelior brought near Bliss's mouth, she would simply turn the other way. Ramdelior worried for days on end, until he realised that there was nothing to worry about. Bliss seemed healthy and happy just floating around on Ramdelior's back, as if she was always full. It was as if she was feeding off her own life stream without even knowing it. So, I think I've figured it out said Ramdelior as he walked to the nearby river with Bliss on his back. I think your flow is taking care of you for now. That's why no matter what I try to give you, you don't feel like eating. Isn't that right? Unintelligible noises. I knew it. I knew it all along. I was just worried, you know. I wanted to make sure I was doing the right thing. It's not every day that such a responsibility falls on my shoulders. Literally. So does that mean that I can start looking for my own food? Like, real food, not just whatever I can find? 
unintelligible noises. Ramdelior hadn't been eating very well lately, and worrying about Bliss had taken a toll on his nutrition. All right, hold on tight. Try not to wander too far from my back. We are going to catch some giant fish, I hope. Unintelligible noises. Catching fish in a river was second nature for Ramdelior. However, catching fish with Bliss on his back, falling off or floating away half the time, made things much more complicated. A few hours later, Ramdelior was roasting a good-sized bottom feeder. Bliss floated around the fire as Ramdelior cooked, seemingly uninterested in the wonderful aromas wafting from the roasting fish. Three months passed this way, and slowly Bliss got closer and closer to the food Ramdelior cooked, until one day she was staring at him as he ate. You want some? asked Ramdelior as he pointed at the freshly steamed vegetables with a side of fish. Bliss looked at the food and back at him. Okay, here, said Ramdelior as he mashed some vegetables together using the tip of his nail. You can't have whole pieces because you don't know how to chew yet, but this should work. He scooped a small portion up and held it near Bliss's mouth. Bliss's face showed pure delight as she tasted the vegetables, and she looked around for some more as soon as she was done with the first bite. So, you do like food, murmured Ramdelior as he mashed more vegetables together. I was beginning to worry that I'd be the only one eating around here. From there on out, she developed an appetite for real food. She spent the next few weeks trying to put everything she could find in her mouth, though Ramdelior's eyes never missed a thing. He used his long tail to move dangerous animals and plants away from Bliss and her newfound curiosity. Bliss didn't seem to care if the sting of a scorpion could kill a beast within seconds, or if the black mushrooms could leave a human paralysed for years. She simply wanted to taste life, and in many ways, as far as Ramdelio could see, she did. He had successfully protected her from harm, and only allowed her to taste things that wouldn't harm her like sour berries, wild flowers, and even grass. Her curiosity had lessened after several bad experiences, and she had become more hesitant about what she put in her mouth. When the days turned into night and sleep was required, Ramdelia would find a comfortable place for them to rest. Each night was different. Sometimes he would rest underneath a tree, other days on a tree's branches, and on hot days next to a pond or a waterfall. Nevertheless, it didn't matter where he decided to rest, as Bliss would always follow, floating on his back. Wherever he decided to rest, she would rest too, all the while floating on his back. Ramdelior didn't mind the slightest bit. If anything, he enjoyed tiny Bliss's company. Frequently, Bliss got off of Ramdelior's back and wandered around the forest, floating just above the ground, but she always remained within his sight. Just days after settling into their routine, Bliss floated towards the nearby flowers, as she always did just after noon. As she played with the flowers, she would stop floating and just sit in front of them, pulling and touching them. Ramdelior used the time to snooze underneath the shadow of a nearby tree, waking up every few minutes to check on what Bliss was doing. As he closed his eyes and got ready for his second nap, he heard Bliss's breathing increase in speed. She sounded just like the kids in the market sounded after they fell or got hit by one of their toys. She was about to cry. Ramdelio got up and headed towards Bliss to see what had happened. And that's when he saw it. A bee was buzzing away from the small patch of flowers Bliss had been playing in. She had gotten stung. The rest of the wildlife around the area also began to flee. It looked like they were able to sense what Ramdelior felt. Something big was about to happen. Oh no, Bliss, said Ramdelior as he tried to run towards Bliss, but was forcefully stopped midway there. Her flow wasn't letting him get any closer. Bliss, it's all right, it's all right. It, it's only going to hurt for a little while. Ramdelior tried to push past her live stream, but it was an impossible feat. He felt like he was trying to push a mountain out of the way. His claws dug into the ground as he tried to reach her. Hey, little one, said Ramdelio as calmly as he could. Look over here. Let's go get some food. Or let's go watch the waterfall. 
You like that, remember? It was too late. The ground around them was beginning to crack, and the patch of flowers was ripped from its roots and shredded into a thousand pieces, all before Bliss cried. With the first tear that made its way down her cheek, life stream poured out of her with the power of a raging river, destroying everything in its path. Ramdelior knew that he only had seconds to get away. He turned around and began running as fast as he could. As he ran, the ground in front of him fissured and ruptured, making it harder for him to reach his full speed. Then he heard it. Bliss's first cry. Her voice was amplified by her powerful life stream, and it made itself heard even through the noise of the breaking rock as it echoed all around Ramdelior. Just how much life stream does she have? Ramdelior thought as he looked around for the easiest path. It all looked the same. Everything around him was being destroyed. He crawled across the trembling earth and jumped onto slab after slab of rock as they were unearthed from the ground. He did everything he could to try to get away. Ramdelior inadvertently got the answer to his question when things got a whole lot worse. Thunderous black clouds began to blanket the sky and the wind picked up as it began to rain. The rumble of thunder matched Bliss's bellow. Bliss, come on, don't kill me, gasped Ramdelior as he made his way to the waterfall. Control your life stream, control your power, Bliss. Come on, you can do it, I have faith in you. The world behind Ramdelior turned black as the sky fell. Come on, Bliss, yelled Ramdelior with frustration. The darkness was half a body length away from him. Control your power! Then there was silence. Complete and utter silence. For a moment, Ramdelior thought that he was dead. Ramdelior turned around as the slab of rock he was standing on landed softly on the ground. In the distance, he could see the small figure of Bliss in the middle of a newly formed crater. Debris was falling from above, hitting the ground slowly while some remained in the air. Without giving it a second thought, Ramdelior ran back towards Bliss. As he got closer, he saw that she was still crying, but gently. She rubbed her eyes with both hands. Bliss, it's all right, said Ramdelior in a soft tone as he approached slowly. Sometimes we experience pain. I guess it's a part of living but it's only for a little while. It'll go away as fast as it came. Bliss stopped rubbing her eyes and looked up at Ramdelior as her sobs abated. Her large eyes were still watery and her lips trembled. I'm here. I'll always be here, said Ramdelior as he took one more step before stopping. No matter what. Bliss extended her arms towards Ramdelior and he scooped her up with his tail, bringing her close to him. Bliss's tiny arms twined around his neck, only reaching about a quarter of the way. Soon her breathing evened out, and he felt her falling asleep. Sleep, little one, murmured Ramdelior. Bliss reacted to his voice by burrowing deeper into his fur. It was as if his voice calmed her. We just have to make it through one day at a time. One more day is all we need. Then we'll figure out a way to control that immense life stream of yours. Ramdelior looked around him as the last of the debris and stone slabs landed softly on the ground. Bliss had levelled a landmass equivalent to the size of a large town. For now, sleep. This wasn't your fault. I need to find a way to help you control your flow soon, Ramdelior thought, as he felt Bliss fall deeper into sleep. This can't happen every time something goes wrong. I can only imagine what would happen if you fell and scraped your knee. No, no, we have to fix this problem as soon as we can. But how? Ramdelior felt overwhelmed at the sight of so much power. He felt ill-equipped to handle the things that would surely come to light. But at the same time, something inside of him told him that whatever obstacles they faced, whatever setbacks they experienced, and whatever difficulties they encountered, he would find a way to get through it. 
and he would do it for her. Chapter 5 The Fallen Hardened are those who know that no matter how many times they fall, they will get back up. Gavril and Ipaphus had successfully followed the Watcher and the Child of Power through three Pasok doors. It wasn't until the fourth Pasok that they lost track of Bliss's flow. So we've lost them, is that right? said Gavril as he stared at Ipaphus. You look indecisive all of a sudden. This isn't like you, my friend. Forgive me, my lord, but I won't be able to point you in the right direction. Gavril had used the Pasok doors many years ago, but even with his usage, he still had six more unused keys. Gavril felt the urge to keep going. He felt as if he could do more, even if he had to guess and lose his keys in the process. What's your best guess? asked Gavril. My lord, I wouldn't dare cost you a key. Keys aren't the only way we can get around the Seven Worlds. I have more than enough to take a chance. And you still have ten, right? We only need to get it right once, even if we have to guess again and again. I do, said Epiphus, as he nodded. But I wouldn't dare. And you, said Gavril, as he turned towards the Guardian. What about you? What would it take to let us know where they went? The Guardian glared at Gavril, the spouts around him intensifying, making themselves visible to Gavril. Well then, said Gavril as he cracked his neck. We'll just have to find out how strong you are. My lord, you must not, said Epiphus as he bobbed from Gavril's side and into his path, blocking his view of the Guardian. If you kill the Guardian, you'll destroy the Pasok and all are connected throughout the Seven Worlds. I'll say it again, said Gavril, as he took one step to the side and began walking towards the Guardian. Keys aren't the only way to travel. They are not, but once we find the child, these doors will come in handy. Gavril stopped and tried to control his frustration. He didn't want to wait. He knew that now was the time to strike. Now was when the Watcher, and especially the child, was more vulnerable. So what do you propose? asked Gavril. We'll send scouts to the Seven Worlds, thousands of them, and to the No Worlds if we have to. Sooner rather than later, we will find them, no matter where they hide. The Seven Worlds are vast, but with a little flow, they're not vast enough. And in the meantime? You build your army, my lord. You find the deadliest creatures and bind them to your will. We will need all the help we can get. I'll remind you, the fate of the world depends on whether we succeed. Gavril had never been above heeding good advice, especially from the one being he trusted fully. As powerful and as dangerous as Gavril was, he hadn't always been that way. In fact, he had been close to death in the past. Gavril was a middle-aged man who cultivated the fields to the south of the tiny village of Kari, near the cold mountain in the world of Etrania. He was a respected, hard-working farmer who employed dozens of Nulians and humans. He didn't think much about life and what he was meant to do. All he cared about at the time was growing his crops. It was nearly impossible to grow anything in the cold weather, but Gavril made it work, making a name for himself in the process. Carry was the only town in the cold mountain that actually traded produce. He'd had a few romantic interests around the tiny village, but nothing really stood out to him or made him want to settle down. He figured he still had time to get his life together, as the people of Carry often didn't marry until well into their middle age. But that all changed when he met Elioina. From the moment he set eyes on her, he knew that she was the one. He didn't know much about her, except that she was around his age. But everything around her made his heart race. Her scent, her smile, the way she talked, and how unaware she was of her own beauty. Pardon me, miss, said Gavril, as he approached the beautiful woman. She was coming out of a local food shop with a basket in her hand. May I have your name? You may, 
There's nothing wrong with knowing what another person is called, is there? My name is Elioina Lavenshard. I live north of the town. Gavril said nothing as he stared into her round, hazel eyes. So that's all? said Elioina as she shifted the basket of food forward. You're going to ask me my name and not tell me yours? Forgive me, said Gavril as he reached for her food basket. May I help you with this? You certainly may not, said Elioina as she slapped Gavril's hand to one side. At least not until I know your name. Forgive me once again, said Gavril as he straightened up. I'm Gavril Darkenforth. He adjusted his voice to a softer tone as he stared into Elioina's eyes. I farm the lands to the south of here. And, uh, I believe I've died a few times since we've met. I've died in the form of knowing that my life would be a total and utter waste if I don't get to know you. I am done dying. <laughs> How poetic of you, Sir Darkenforth, she blushed. And quite forthcoming. But I would be lying if I said I haven't noticed you before. Please, call me Gavril. Would it be okay if I walked you home? Perhaps rid you of the burden of carrying a basket? Very well, Sir Gavril. I welcome your company. But you may not take my basket from me. I can carry it myself. Thank you very much. Some day I may allow you to do so. But not today. Just Gavril is fine. Then I'll take that as an exchange, said Elioina as she began walking. Gavril followed next to her. Now that we're getting to know each other, I'd like you to call me by my first name as well. Elioina it is, said Gavril, as he felt a smile forming. Madame Lavenshard doesn't quite fit you. And why not? She half smiled. I don't know. The thing about names is that they have a certain look on people. Lavenshard just doesn't suit you. They smiled at each other. As they walked at a slower than usual pace, they enjoyed light-hearted conversation. Elioina's home wasn't too far away from the food shop, and all too soon Gavril found himself having to say goodbye. Well, I guess this is it for me, Elioina said as she fiddled with her basket. I'm sorry to ask, but when may I see you again? Soon, perhaps. We do live in the same town. Are you free tonight? Perhaps we can go and eat some bread by the creek. Watch the moon light up the night. It's not often that we get to experience this kind of weather. Wouldn't that be quite soon? Only if you don't want to. Then, yeah, it would be soon. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> but if I may add, I don't see why we should wait to be happy. If my company would bring any happiness to you, then there's no need to wait. Very well. I will see you here at twilight. Bring bread. She smiled as she turned around and started walking towards her home. Gavril stood there, staring for a few seconds before turning around and walking towards his farm. For the first time in his life, he was beginning to feel warmth. A warmth that no cold could take from him. He spent the rest of the day thinking about how his life was about to change. He went as far as letting the powerful oxen Nulians that worked his vast land finish early for the day. He didn't want to put anything in between him and Elioina. Just the thought of her name sent chills down his spine. Is this really happening? Gavril thought as he put on his best clothes. Am I really going to talk to a beautiful woman by the creek? But wait, what if I don't know what to say? Worse yet, what if she finds me plain? No, 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 that can't happen. You can't let that happen, Gavril. Come on, get it together. As the sun began to make its way below the horizon, Gavril left his farmhouse and headed back into town. He headed straight to the bakery, where he knew he would find the evening's first batch of freshly baked bread. May I have two pieces of your finest bread? asked Gavril as he approached the counter. It's all the finest bread you'll ever have, son, said the baker without looking away from the oven. All right. Well, I'll take two. Two of the finest pieces of bread you'll ever have coming right up, said the baker 
as he turned around, and his jaw half fell. Sir Darkenforth, my apologies. I didn't know you were stopping by. Here, I'll add some more bread. Gavril stopped to think for a moment. He wasn't expecting the baker to react like that once he saw him. Sir Darkenforth. That could be right, but I don't get out often enough to know if that's what an older gentleman should call me. Then he remembered that the bake shop itself and the land it was in were part of his land, and the baker was years behind on his payments. Gavril had sold it for not even a quarter of the price it was worth in order to help the small town progress. He had done so for several other people, but he never did it to gain wealth. No, two is fine, said Gavril. Anything more than that and I'm afraid it will be a waste. Save your fine bread for those that are hungry tonight. Very well, Sir Darkenforth, said the baker as he sealed the sheet of paper he had placed the bread in. This is free of charge. I know that I'm a little behind on payments. Say no more, interrupted Gavril. Forget about those for now. I know one day you'll get around to it. What do I owe you for this fine bread? I would not, I insist, said Gavril with a smile. Good things are about to happen tonight, and it's a cause for celebration. Consider it an extended gift. The baker looked hesitant, but if he knew Gavril at all, he knew that he had to have his way. It will be one copper coin, Sir Darkenforth, the baker said as he stiffened. One copper coin, said Gavril, as he felt around the right-hand pocket of his jacket for coins. The copper coins weren't hard to find. Out of the four common coins, gold, silver, bronze and copper, they were the smoothest ones. Ah, here we go. He pulled out one coin. Just the one I needed. He placed the coin on the counter and then grabbed the bread. I'll see you around. These smell delicious. Gavril could have given the baker a lot more for the two pieces of bread, but decided not to. He didn't want to make the baker feel low in any kind of way. The baker grabbed the coin and nodded. Thank you, Sir Darkenforth. No, no, please, Gavril said as he walked out. As he made his way towards Elioina's home, his nervousness increased. He kept thinking that he wouldn't have anything to talk to her about, or that she wouldn't find him interesting enough. However, from the moment he saw her once again, standing outside her home, all his fears melted away. It was just him and Eloina. Am I late? asked Gavril, doubling his stride. No, I wouldn't say that per se, said Eloina as she turned to look at the horizon. There's still some light left, perhaps just enough to make it to the creek, but you're cutting it close. Let's waste no time. Gavril raised the parcel of bread. I got us some delicious bread. Did you bring the milk? Gavril felt his knees turn to mud at the mention of milk. How are we supposed to eat the bread without milk? Especially this bread. It's the thick and chewy kind. What was I thinking? How could I forget the milk? Out of all the things... I kid, said Eloina, with a grin on her face. What did you think I was going to bring? She raised a large flask in front of her. You almost gave me an illness. I know. You turned as pale as the milk itself. Both chuckled, and they headed to the creek. Gavril felt his heart thumping heavily on the way there, but he tried not to heed it and focused on the conversation they were having. Unsurprisingly, it was about how easily Gavril got scared. Once they got to the creek, they chose a convenient fallen tree trunk to sit on. The moonlight reflected off the serene water from the creek, illuminating the surroundings immaculately. The light was so bright, that no detail got lost. Gavril was able to see Eloina's beauty perfectly. So, Gavril, can you tell me exactly why we haven't met before? This is not a trading town, not one of those huge towns near the ruler's domain. So I wonder, where have you been all this time? I mean, I always go out to the store or for a walk, and yet I haven't seen you around. How do you know I haven't been around? Maybe you weren't paying attention. Oh, no. If you had been around, I would have noticed. I had already kind of heard about you. 
Gavriel's heart threatened to rip his chest open and show itself to Elioina. He didn't expect someone he liked to be so forthcoming with him. What was happening? Why was everything aligning so well all of a sudden? Whatever it was, his insides were twisting and twirling. He was elated, or scared. He couldn't tell the two apart. What did they say about me? asked Gavril, trying to sound nonchalant. Don't worry, they were good things. So tell me, why don't you venture into the town more often? I'm not sure. Gavril unfolded the bread from the paper and gave a piece to Elioina. I guess all this time I've been so dedicated to my farm and doing the best I can. I guess I've been focused on helping people. Draining, I bet. No, not at all. Somehow, the more I gave, the more I had. Leave, said a faint whisper. Sorry, did you say something? asked Gabriel. No, I was listening to your story. You were saying? Leave now, the faint voice said once again. You're in danger. She is in danger. Sorry, I think someone else is here with us, said Gavril as he stood up and looked around. Are you trying to scare me, Gavril? I warn you, it's not going to... Elioina's voice was interrupted by the whooshing sound of an object hitting the ground behind her. Seconds later, Elioina's limp body fell onto the tree trunk. Gavril ran to her and tried to shake her awake. But she was gone. She was no longer breathing, and blood was staining the clothes on her chest. Gavril felt his entire world fall apart right in front of him. He held her close to him, closing his eyes and trying to believe that it was a nightmare. But no matter how many times he attempted to make himself believe it, Elioina was gone. As he sobbed, he looked around for the person who had warned them to leave, or for the object that had caused Elioina's death. He found the object. It glowed bright red in the small crater it had created. The object called to Gavril, overwhelming him. He let go of Elioina, letting her rest back on the trunk, and made his way to the object. The object's red glow increased as Gavril drew closer. He felt the pain of losing Elioina clearly, but he wanted to see what had caused her death. Don't do it, the voice said. It will only bring you suffering. That's an embodiment of evil. An ancient evil. Gavril looked around and saw nothing. But then he saw two eyes in the dark field approaching him slowly. What are you? Show yourself. I can sense something akin to flow coming from that rock, said a small Yurachi as he floated above the tall grass. This is what my kind does. We sense all flow. Gavril knew about the Yurachi Nulians and their innate ability to seek out flow but at the time he paid little attention to what it was saying. The red rock was calling, taking hold of his senses, and he was doing little to stop it. Please, don't do it, said the Urachi, as Gavril knelt in front of the rock. It's only pain. It's dark, darker than anything I've ever sensed before. Weakened by the intense calling, Gavril reached out for the rock. And as he held it, he felt a jolt of power pulling his body apart and putting it back together. Times that had not yet come to pass flashed through his head. Drought, hunger, poverty, disease, endless and senseless war, the loss of life in unimaginable numbers. Pain was making its way to this world. Gavril felt his body collapse to the ground. There was no more pain, only his thoughts. And the thoughts, no, not thoughts, commands of something else. A faint voice began to speak with him in languages that he didn't understand, until he did. Can you understand me? said the voice in his head. I can. You've seen it with your mind's eye, the pain, the suffering that's coming to this world. You can stop it all from happening. You can stop countless people from dying, countless loved ones from feeling what you felt, from feeling what you still feel, from feeling what you will feel. How? Years from now, a child of power will be born in a corrupt, sad, 
hate-filled place. Kill the child before it gains full command of the flow. If you do, you get to keep the world as is. You want me to kill a child? That child will bring forth more death than you can imagine. Its powers are too great, too vast to comprehend. The needs of the countless outweigh the needs of the one. The choice is in your hands. Perhaps, if you're successful, you'll get to see your loved one once again. But if you refuse, your life ends now. Gavril felt his heart slow, along with his breathing. The surge of power he had felt just moments ago was leaving him. His life was dwindling out of existence. He had to make up his mind. I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll rid the world of the child. Like night giving way to day, life poured back into his body. But do you mean you'll bring her back if I succeed? There was only silence as Gavril regained the feeling in his body. No, no, said Gavril as he stood up abruptly. Don't go yet. Answer my question. It's too late, said the Urachi. Whatever you held, it's already scattered across your body. You're now connected to the flow, though in a way I've yet to see. Instead of allowing flow into your body, you're taking it. His eyes widened. Archer of night. Answer my question, yelled Gavril as he stood up to his full height. His booming voice echoed all around him. He felt brand new. He felt as though he didn't know the meaning of the tired body. He felt strong and agile. And he now felt the flow and just how much he could take from it. He had turned into a flow user. The town will hear you, said the Urachi. Then the pain of losing Elioina struck him once again, and he found himself back on his knees, defeated. Creature, managed Gavril. What is your name? I'm Ipophus, a Urachi from the Northern Tribe. You've been truthful to me. I should have listened. Now the weight of the world rests on my shoulders, and my heart is made out of pain. What should I do now? I suggest we leave, said Ipophus. There's a stir in the town. People are starting to look for Elioina. They won't understand. Blood will be shed. How long have we been here? asked Gavril. You've been standing silently for quite some time now, said Ipophus. For a moment I thought you'd been frozen. If it wasn't for the tempest thrashing inside you, I'd believe that. Half the night has gone by. There are only a few hours left till sunrise. I already made the mistake of not listening to you, said Gavril, as he got back up and walked to where Elioina's body rested. He picked up her limp body with care. It won't happen again. They left. As Gavril stood down, so did the guardian of the Passock. Ipophus puffed back to Gavril's side. We will do as you say, my old friend, said Gavril as he turned to look at Ipophus. Where do you want to start? said Ipophus. We'll start by visiting the Tartaran ruler. I have a complaint about the useless giants he sent on our behalf. Perhaps they need a reminder of who they are dealing with. From there we'll head to Pantheus. You say there are strange flow users to be found there, right? Yes, strange and old flow, powerful. That world is filled with warriors. There are also many wearies and old spirits we need to watch out for. Sounds like a perfect place to start recruiting. You'll only have four keys left after that. Three if we use a Passock to go back to Noheart. Noheart was the name of the structure Gavril had built over the last ten years, since he had lost Elioina. That's more than enough, but we'll make the last trek on foot, just in case. Gavril turned to face the Guardian with a non-combative posture. So, where were we? Can I still use this? Chapter 6 Serene How can a child make that much of a difference in the world? And yet, it can. 
by turning the lives of those around it inside out and upside down. It's easy to think you have it all figured out until a child comes into your life. Ram Delior told Bliss stories every night before she fell asleep. It was his way of trying to teach her about the world. Every night, after a long day of meandering through the rainforest, catching and gathering food, Bliss would hurriedly get into position for Ram Delior's stories. She liked to float on his back, facing up towards the stars. The stories ranged from stories he had heard as a pup to old myths and legends. Sometimes he thought that she actually understood what he was saying, since her face would change when he was telling her a scary story. She seemed brighter than most children her age. She was as aware of the world as Ramdelia was aware of her. Six months passed this way, and Bliss was already showing signs of trying to speak. She would try to imitate words Ramdelia used in his stories, but nothing was coherent. You know what? said Ramdelio, after listening to Bliss's baby talk for a few hours straight. I really should start trying to teach you how to speak properly. Gibberish. That's it, said Ramdelio, as he made his way to a larger patch of shade underneath the tree. He grabbed Bliss with his tail and slid her in front of him. By then she was no longer floating. She babbled more gibberish as she looked at Ramdelio. Ramdelio sat her in front of her, while he thought of her first lesson. He had no idea what he was doing, but he knew that he had to give it a try. The last thing he wanted was for the Herald of Flo to grow up uninformed of the world and the way it worked. Ramdelio had grown up without immediate family or a teacher. Everything he knew was self-taught through trial and error, or gleaned from the few scripts that he'd managed to get his paws on. He'd learned how to read and write when he'd observed other Nulians and humans doing just that. He liked to observe the world and how things worked. He was well aware of his limitations and what was possible. Bliss would grow up learning this as well. OK, Bliss, listen up. This will be your first lesson. Gibberish, followed by an attempt of a word. Ast. Ramdelior braced himself for what would possibly be a long first lesson. My name is Ramdelior. Your name is Bliss. Ramdelior gestured towards each of them as he said their names. Ramdelior, Bliss. Ramdelior, Bliss. Bliss looked at Ramdelior with a confused expression on her face. Ramdelior, Bliss said Ramdelior slowly as he gestured to himself and then at Bliss. Bliss furrowed her tiny eyebrows. It was as if she knew something was expected from her. Ramdelior Bliss, said Ramdelior as he paused at every syllable and held his gesture for longer. Bliss smiled and clapped as if she understood. OK, now your turn said Ramdelior, as he gestured to himself. Am, mumbled Bliss. No, no, Ram. Am. Ram. Ram. Yes, said Ramdelior, feeling excited. Then he gestured towards Bliss. Bliss. Is. No, no, ba, ba, Bliss. Bliss. Is. Bliss's answer strained Ramdelior's patience, but he quickly brushed it aside. He was ready to be as patient as Bliss needed him to be, regardless of how much time and effort that would require of him. The back and forth went on for quite some time, until Bliss stopped paying attention completely. Ramdelior had gotten her to say her name correctly, but she was still calling him Ram. Bliss refused to say his long name, even though he suspected that she understood it fully. For the next five years, Ramdelio kept teaching Bliss how to speak, read and write, and patiently explain to her how the world and flow worked. Learning about the world came naturally to Bliss, with every lesson clinging to her like tree roots to the ground. Ramdelio was reasonably sure that it was her connection to the flow that allowed her to progress so rapidly. Bliss excelled in all of Ramdelio's lessons except one, the flow. 
even though she was more connected to the flow than most, using it was an entirely different matter. Bliss had developed an unhealthy relationship with flow and the use of life stream. Now, instead of being able to command life stream with ease, she felt pain every time she used it. The only thing Bliss seemed to be able to do with little effort was float on Ramdelior's back. Today we'll talk about it again, said Ramdelior as he sauntered along one of his usual paths while Bliss floated on his back. Bliss groaned. Even her attitude was that of a child two or three years older than her. It was at times like this that Ram missed the good-natured, docile baby Bliss. You have to be able to control your flow. But why? I don't need it, Ram, said Bliss as she crossed her arms. I'm perfectly fine without it. And don't give me that Herald of Flow story again. Seems fair, said Ram Delior as he changed his path. Where are we going? We're going to see just one of the reasons why you should learn to control your live stream. I doubt a visual example is going to change my mind. We'll see. Keep in mind that at any given time, everything could change. They made their way to the crater Bliss had created when she was just a few months old. Life had returned to the once barren crater. Now it was half covered by trees, fungi and traces of wildlife. Here it is said Ramdelior as he stopped on the edge of a slope. Just one of the reasons why you should learn how to use your live stream. I don't see it. All I see is a giant hole in the ground. Exactly. This place, as far as you can see, used to be flat, at the level we're standing on now. Really? This big hole used to be level with us? Yes. And you know what caused it? I can take a guess. Humour me, said Ramdelior as he sat down and took Bliss off his back with his tail. Bliss went to stand on the edge of the crater. Since these islands have volcanoes everywhere, it's safe to say that one of them erupted here. Ramdelior snickered. Am I way off? Ramdelior nodded. Then it must have been a gigantic meteor or something. Do you even know what a meteor is? asked Ramdelior as he turned to face Bliss. Well, you told me about them when I asked you about those moving stars. Ah, right. But I never told you something like that could cause something like this. I'm extrapolating. Extrapolating, said Ramdelio as he turned back to the crater. You know what I mean. Those are hard words. Why are some words more difficult than others? I don't get it. Those hard words are needed to describe the more... How should we put it? More precise or delicate ideas. Makes no sense to me, she shrugged. They could have just said extrap. If they'd done that, it would be hard to grasp the deeper meaning of the word. Hard words are meant to make you stop and think about what's being said. And you know this how? A good guess. I'm not convinced. Ramdelior smiled faintly. Listen to me carefully, Bliss said Ramdelior, striking a more serious tone. When you were just a few months old, we stood at the centre of this crater. I was nearby, drifting in and out of sleep, watching you play with some flowers. Next thing I knew, you were stung by a bee, and mere moments later, all of this happened. The world disappeared underneath my feet as I ran to the waterfall. You're far more powerful than you think. This is why you must learn how to control your live stream. I did this, asked Bliss, sounding incredulous. I was just a baby. How could I do something like this? I can barely move small objects without getting hurt. Shouldn't my live stream be getting stronger as I get older? I mean, that's one of the things you've taught me about the flow. Typically, yes. That's how it is. The flow user gets so intimately acquainted with their live stream that it amplifies and bends to the user's will. Often, the flow gets so powerful that it begins pulling flow from nearby objects or creatures. But in your case, Bliss, well, you started with powerful flow, and you've become a stranger to it. I've never seen such a thing before. Maybe the flow isn't for me after all. Maybe I'm meant to live like a normal human. 
She sighed and went to sit down next to Ramdelior. That actually sounds nice. Meeting other humans, being around other humans. Soon we'll head out of this place and into the nearest town. There you'll see many, many humans. Other Newlians as well. Others like you? Are they blue and fluffy also? Do other humans look like me? Ramdelior chuckled. <laughs> not at all. We come in all shapes and sizes. But even though we might not look the same, deep down we are. Bliss was awed. Bliss, I need you to try and control your live stream at least a little, said Ramdelior as he turned to Bliss. If you want to leave this place soon, then I must know without a shadow of a doubt you can fend for yourself. There will be a time when I'm no longer around, when I can no longer watch you. And when that time comes, I want you to be ready. You're saying that as if it's going to happen tomorrow, said Bliss with teary eyes. I don't want anything to happen to you. I don't want to be by myself, even if that means I'll never get to see another human. It might not be tomorrow. It might not happen at all. But it could happen. I just want you to be ready if it does. I'm not going to let it happen, said Bliss as she hugged Ramdelior's neck. Then you must learn about the flow. Wait a minute, said Bliss as she let go of Ramdelior and stared at him. Ramdelior did all he could to keep his expression serious. How do we arrive at this? asked Bliss incredulously. Were you planning this all along? How long have you been planning or coercing me into saying that so you can say that I must learn the flow? Ram, this is a problem. You're way too smart. Stop thinking so far ahead. Give me a chance to catch up. I have no idea what you're talking about, said Ramdelio with a blank face. He was trying hard not to laugh. We should get going. The sun is going to set in a few hours, and I still haven't started to prepare supper. Ramdelio got up and began walking back the way they had come, and Bliss was quick to hop on his back. Let me guess what we're having, said Bliss, imitating Ramdelio's sarcastic tone. Is it some form of, I don't know, fish? You've guessed it, <laughs> said Ramdelio as he chuckled. Are we at least having it cooked over the flame this time? I'm so tired of soup. That wasn't the plan. But I can make it like that for you tonight. Yay! exclaimed Bliss as she clapped twice. They made their way back to camp, and Ramdelior began preparing supper almost as soon as they got there. There was nothing special about their camp other than a nice rock where Ramdelior could prepare the fish near a small stream. The place was also conveniently open, particularly the cooking area. They ate their supper in a matter of minutes with neither one of them stopping to talk. Bliss seemed to enjoy everything Ramdelio cooked, as she hardly ever complained. Well, she would say something when they ate the same food a few times in a row, but that didn't happen too often. After supper, they sat near the fire, staring into the flames. That was good, said Bliss. Are you ready for a lesson? said Ramdelio, as he grabbed a nearby rock with his tail and set it next to the fire. With a sigh, Bliss scooted away from the fire to face the rock fully. This is why I didn't want to say anything, said Bliss, as she took off her hood, revealing her long, violet hair. Bliss had long outgrown the clothes she had worn when escaping Elementana. Now her clothes were a rudimentary combination of her baby clothes stitched together with the blankets she had been wrapped in. It wouldn't be too long before she needed an alteration. She was growing quickly. Bliss tried to keep her clothing interesting by adding flowers or feathers that she found lying on the ground. I thought you were going to learn about the flow for me, said Ramdelio as he lay down, preparing for what could be a long session. This will be a breeze for you. Right. Bliss, try to move the rock into the fire. Bliss looked at the rock, and then at the fire. The fire flickered as it jumped towards the rock, almost forming a bridge, but not quite touching the rock. The rock itself did not move. Bliss sighed. 
So, you looked at the rock, said Ramdelio, as he broke off a nearby twig with his tail. And then the fire. And you thought that the fire had a better chance of moving to the rock than the rock to the fire. Something along those lines, right? Something like that. The flow lives in everything. And live stream is command, control over the environment around you. Belief. If you don't believe it can happen, then it won't. Sometimes it's that simple. Tell me how the rock could move to the fire without you having to pick it up yourself and toss it there. Wind? asked Bliss doubtfully. Could be, but then you would have to control the wind in such a way that it won't put out the fire. Keep going. If another rock or the earth underneath it pushed against it? That's better. But why don't you try it using a command or a chant? That way you can further reinforce your belief. OK, said Bliss as she straightened her back. Will it help if I point at it? If you point at it, then you will be narrowing it down in your mind's eye. So yes, give it a try. Here goes nothing. Bliss pointed at the small rock with her index finger. Move. A small boulder rose from underneath the rock and hurtled away from them with dazzling speed. At the same time, Bliss's hand whiplashed to one side. Ouch, 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 cried Bliss as she lifted her arm to look at her finger. Tears were beginning to well up in her eyes. Ram, this is not good. It's way better than I thought you would do, said Ramdelio as he extended his tail and wrapped it around Bliss's hand. Heal. Bliss's taut expression changed to one of relaxation. Though he wasn't a healing gnarl by any means, Ramdelio had command over several minor healing spouts that could heal bruises, cuts and even sprains. As long as the wounds didn't run across an entire body, he could do something about it. Did you see where that rock went? said Ramdelio, perhaps sounding more excited than he should. I lost sight of it. I thought I had it, but no, it was just a shadow. Look at the hole you made. <laughs> it should take at least a year for a flow user to learn to move something that size, let alone throw it as far as you did. So I did good? asked Bliss as Ramdelio retracted his tail. The truth was that Bliss had done dangerously well. She was wielding tremendous power without even knowing it. Ram thought that she'd be able to move the rock, but he hadn't thought she would manage more than a barely perceptible wobble. He had never seen a power like hers. This resembled the power that had emanated from her when she was just a baby. <laughs> I'd say so. Yes, said Bliss with a grin. But I need you to think smaller. A lot smaller. Bliss's grin disappeared as she stared blankly. What I mean, said Ramdelio, as he started covering the hole the small boulder had left with his tail, is that when you move an object, it doesn't need to fly out of here. Think of lighter, more meticulous ways to do it. Think of something that you see in nature every day that moves ever so slightly but at the end of the day, it still moves. Flowers and plants do that, right? They move with purpose, towards something, right? That's a good example. Ramdelio picked up a second rock and placed it on top of the hole he had just covered. Now, make this move without destroying our camp. Think small. Try to control that power of yours. Try to feel when to stop. But it's going to hurt again. Perhaps, but it might hurt less since this time you're only going to use a tiny portion of flow, right? Ramdelio wanted to push the point further. OK, I'll give it another try. Bliss stared at the new rock, but did nothing. Well? asked Ramdelio. Wait, I'm thinking about how I'm going to get it to move just a little bit. He nodded. Bliss pointed at the rock once again but she hesitated. He nodded slowly, letting her know that it was okay to proceed. Move, murmured Bliss, her voice barely a whisper. Roots of all sizes, but no larger than one of her own limbs, began to protrude from the ground. The roots made their way slowly towards the rock and began to move it upon contact. 
That's perfect, said Ramdelior. Now make it rise. Bliss opened her palm and made a rising gesture. The roots faithfully followed Bliss's hand, rising upwards. Bliss winced, but she kept going until the rock was way above their heads. She grinned as she squinted with one eye. Bring it down slowly, and we'll call it a night, said Ramdelior. Bliss lowered her hand, but instead of the vine coming back down, it began to bend. She stopped and flipped the palm of her hand so it would face the ground. Then she began to lower it once again. Now the roots began to recede back into the ground. Bliss kept lowering her hand until the rock was right back where it had started. It still hurts, said Bliss as she held her arm close to her. But she also had a faint smile. Though not as bad as before. Not even close. Ramdelio didn't know what to make of Bliss's pain. He knew it wasn't normal for someone to feel pain as they used the flow. And again, nothing about Bliss, absolutely nothing about her, was normal. He only knew that he needed to make the best of it. There were only two things Ramdelior knew for certain. The first was that something out there was calling them. Ramdelior's dreams of visiting the place covered in flowers kept intensifying, feeling more and more real. To make matters worse, just a few days ago, Bliss had been included in his dream. Though his dreams of that place were short-lived, as he woke up, as soon as he reached the round hut at the edge of the cliff, they were happening more frequently. He needed to find out if that place actually existed, though he didn't have the slightest idea how. The second, and something that never left Ramdelior's mind, was why they had ended up there in the first place. They were being chased by someone who could possibly be the most dangerous man alive. He knew that it was just a matter of time before Gavril found them. He didn't know how exactly or when, but he knew that time was not on his side. Ramdelio had learned to recognise resolve in a human's eye, and Gavril had that, and much more. He needed desperately for Bliss to learn to control her livestream so they could leave this place. Ramdelio hadn't mentioned the dangerous man to Bliss yet, even though she was probably old enough to understand. Bliss was bright for her age. In his long life, Ramdelio had seen many kids grow up and had some idea of how they matured and picked up skills. Bliss was special. She was sharp. She absorbed the world around her with seemingly little effort. Do you need me to heal it? asked Ramdelio as he swayed his tail slowly. No, I think I'm fine. It's already going away. I would ask you for another demonstration of that high life stream of yours, but it's getting late. Also, I was thinking that tomorrow we could find another place to camp. Maybe towards the edge of this place. What do you say? You mean we get to explore? Ramdelior nodded. Yes, Bliss said as she made her way towards Ramdelior's back. Let's go somewhere new. I can hardly wait. Ramdelior blew softly on the fire, quenching it using a mild form of flow. Good night, said Bliss as she floated on Ramdelior's back. Sleep well. Just one more day, he smiled as he got comfortable. And, muttered Bliss, I shouldn't take things for granted. Chapter 7 The Rot They neither live nor die. Sleep is but a distant memory for them. Hunger does nothing to their already depleted bodies. All they have left is the will to follow the path set forth by the first conquerors of the world. They follow the strong, those who are willing to take the world for themselves. They are the rot. The next day, as the sun rose, they left camp in search of a new place to stay. Ramdelio wanted to stay further away from the Pasok and at the same time not get too close to any nearby towns or villages. They were travelling at a moderate pace, not walking, but also not running. His conscience was beginning to weigh on him for not telling Bliss the truth about their situation and why they were there. Today that would change. Even if Bliss was still too young to understand fully, he would let her know everything. No more hut, 
What's for breakfast? asked Bliss as she lay floating on Ramdelior's back facing the sky. How hungry are you? Didn't you eat well last night? But I'm still hungry. I get hungry, that's what I do. I'm not like you, who can eat several days worth of food in one sitting. I'm not going to stop to cook something. It's already going to take us half a day to get to the new place, if not more. Why don't you have some fruit? There's plenty of that everywhere. Mmm, fruit. Bliss rubbed her shin as she stood and crossed her legs. Where can I find that yellow fruit you brought me one day? The sweet one that has a thin layer with brown dots. Oh, you mean the master of the fruit? Asked Ramdelior as he began to look around. Is that what they're called? Yeah, that's what local traders used to call them in my old town. I guess that's what I'll have then. I see some up ahead. Why don't you practice your live stream as we pass by? Bliss groaned. You did well last night, said Ramdelior as he strode away from the river and moved closer to the tree line. It's the same thing. Just think small flow. Do I really have to? asked Bliss as she hung back with her head tilted backwards. Why can't you get it for me? You're much better with live stream than I am. Like, much, much better. I don't want to feel pain so early in the day. Please get it for me. She hugged Ramdelior from the back of his neck. Please get it for me. It took all the strength of will Ramdelior had not to get the fruit for Bliss. No, managed Ramdelior. Bliss stopped hugging him and went back to floating on his back with her legs crossed. But why not? asked Bliss. You've gotten it before for me without me even asking. Why can't you get it for me? It won't take you long. I have several reasons. But at the very top is that you must learn how to be self-sufficient when it comes to your live stream. We need to work on it every chance we get. Also, I physically can't get it for you without having to stop and climb up one of those trees. What do you mean? asked Bliss as she cocked her head. I've seen you use live stream before. You use it all the time. Why can't you get it without having to stop? I can't control live stream the way you do. I don't have had to. While I can use spouts I've learned throughout the years, I'm not connected to the flow like you are. Atsu? What is that? Put simply, Atsu is the flow of the objects around you. It's what makes it possible for you to move things and bend things at will. It's like a third invisible arm that connects with the flow of the thing you're trying to move with your live stream. Like how you use your tail? Exactly, said Ramdelior as he slowed down his sprint. More on that later. Now, you have to focus on getting your breakfast. And you have to get it right. I don't see many of those trees up ahead. Let's turn this into a test. You'll only have one shot. If you get it right, then you get to eat the master of fruits. If you get it wrong and we pass it, I won't stop or turn around. You'll have to eat whatever we find up ahead. He wanted to add some pressure. Do you even know where we're going? Of course I know where I'm going, lied Ramdelior. He didn't know exactly where they were going or where they would end up. He was relying solely on his senses, his instinct to guide them to the right place so they could rest. Never doubt a watcher. It doesn't look like you know where you're going. And why doesn't it look like I know where I'm going? Because you're heading in and out of random places, no straight lines. I'm just finding the best route to the place, lied Ramdelior again feeling his face warm up. We'll talk later. The master of fruit trees are coming up. Now is your chance. Okay, said Bliss, as she got on her knees on Ramdelior's back and faced the trees. I can do this. Yes, you can. Remember to think small. Your life stream is overwhelming. Ramdelior felt Bliss extend her hand towards the tree that held the delicious fruit. She took a deep breath. The tree wasn't the tallest tree in the valley, but it wasn't small either. The fruit hung at least six of Bliss's body lengths from the ground. Come to me, 
murmured Bliss as she made a soft pulling gesture with her right hand. The fruit snapped off a thinner branch and fell straight to the ground. Ugh, Bliss said with exasperation. No, no, none of that, said Ramdelio, glancing back for a moment. He saw Bliss with the corner of his eye. She looked frustrated. Just a little bit more intent. Mean it. Take a deep breath. Calm down and try it again. Bliss followed Ramdelio's advice and extended her hand to the upcoming trees. Come to me, said Bliss and made a pulling gesture. The fruit broke off the branch once again, but this time it floated to Bliss, wobbling as it made its way towards her. Control it, said Ramdelio, as he saw that she was using the wind to bring the fruit towards her. Bliss moved her left hand around her right, forming an invisible sphere as she moved her right hand towards herself. The fruit stopped wobbling and headed straight to Bliss. What do I do now? asked Bliss, as the fruit was just within arm's reach. Grab your breakfast, said Ramdelio. If I do that, they will fall. Can I have a little help? I made it this far, please. Ramdelio moved his tail and formed a circular basket with its tip, much like he used to carry Bliss when she was just a baby. The fruit fell into Ramdelio's tail. To be clear, said Ramdelio, you could have gotten them. You only needed to figure out a way to do it. No, it was already starting to hurt. It was becoming distracting. I was having trouble concentrating. If I had used my live stream for a little longer, that fruit would be on the ground. You get a pass this time, but know that I expect more from you. But does that mean I can eat now? Ramdelio chuckled and nodded twice. It took nearly half the day, but Ramdelio managed to find a place that could be their new camp for the foreseeable future. It was similar to their last camp, with large stone slabs near the river and a somewhat open space. Although it wasn't as nice as the last place, it was nice enough. We've really downgraded, said Bliss, as she got off Ramdelio's back and stretched. It's not so bad, Ramdelio said, as he broke off a nearby tree branch with his paw. Just a little crowded. You'll learn to like this place just like the last one. Soon you won't remember what the last place looked like. If you say so. So does this mean we're closer to human villages or towns? What's the difference between them anyway? Will there be others like me and you? Villages are smaller and more remote than towns, but still quite large. There will be many like you, yes, more than you can imagine. Whoa. Ramdelio felt a sharp pang in his chest as Bliss asked that question. He felt bad for keeping her from seeing other humans. But it had to be done, right? Things had to be this way. He wasn't strong enough to fend off everything that would come her way if they mingled among other humans. If they left for a human village now, word would spread quickly about the child with violet hair. Even if they covered her hair, who knew what methods of detections that dangerous man had in place? It was risky. Then again, what good was he as her watcher if he could only watch over her on his terms? Things had to change, Ramdelio knew. I'm going to see what I can come across for dinner, said Ramdelio as he headed into the river. I'd be amazed if it's not fish, honestly. Oh, come on, said Ramdelio as the water reached his belly. It can't possibly be that bad. I'll let you choose how I cook it. Weren't you the one that told me a while back that too much of something is bad for you? You mean when you wanted to eat honey all day long? Yeah, that time. Bliss sat down by the river's edge. This and that are two completely different things, Ramdelio smirked. I'm serious. My point is as valid as yours and you know it. We'll get back to this subject once I catch our supper, said Ramdelio, as he got ready to sprint into action to catch a few incoming fish that he spotted down river. Why don't you take a bath in the meantime? There's a waterfall over there. 
he pointed with his tail to where he thought the waterfall was. Grab some flowers and get yourself clean. We've been travelling all day. Not going to happen. Why not? I took a bath yesterday, and I don't feel like getting cold right now. Then learn to heat up the water. Can we just eat? I'll take a bath tomorrow or something. Suit yourself. If you can't sleep later, don't blame me. It didn't take Ramdelio long to capture a dozen good-sized fish, and before it got dark, they were both eating. Bliss had chosen fish soup while he ate the rest whole. The red stuff was so good. It goes perfectly with the fish soup. I think I want to have fish soup more often if it's that good. Was that narwhal fruit, the one that grows near the ground? Ramdelio pointed at a nearby narwhal bush. Oh, said Bliss as she lay down on the grass-covered ground and stretched. It was good. Before you get too comfortable, said Ramdelio as he went to grab a branch to start a campfire. I have a story to tell you. Already? Isn't it too early to tell stories? I'm not sleepy yet. No, no, this isn't that kind of story. This isn't a story to help you fall asleep. Bliss got to her knees and cocked her head. Help me gather some wood, said Ramdelior, placing the first branch in the centre of the camp. Bliss got up and ran to the nearest tree. Live stream only, said Ramdelior, as he headed back to fetch another branch. Bliss groaned, but she complied, moving small branches towards the pile that Ramdelior had started, using only her live stream. She complained at first, but as she made more trips to and fro, pulling the branches with less and less effort, her complaints stopped. Once they were done, Ramdelior lit the pile of branches with a basic fire spout. Am I going to learn those kinds of spouts too? asked Bliss. These kinds of spouts? asked Ramdelior, pretending not to know what she was talking about. What's the difference between this and what you were doing earlier? Instead of answering right away, Bliss thought for a moment. Earlier, said Bliss, as she rubbed her fingers together, looking far beyond them. I was only moving objects, using Atsu to help me move them from one place to another. It was the same with the rock and the master of fruit, but a little different. But, but, the kind of spout you used changes the object. It heats it up. Bliss was more intelligent and observant than Ramdelior had given her credit for. He had assumed that because she was just a five, no, nearly six-year-old child, she wouldn't be paying attention to the world around her. Children that age, from what he had seen back in Alimentana, only wanted to play and have fun. Yet there she was, sitting by a fire and grasping concepts that some new flow users would have a hard time recognising. Simply knowing that Bliss was able to understand flow made Ram Delior sigh with relief. He was confident that she would be able to understand what followed. If you're able to understand the difference between using Atsu and spouts, then you're already learning. You don't have to learn a weak spout from me. You'll be able to make your own. I sometimes think you make things hard on purpose. Ram Delior smiled slightly. See, I knew it, said Bliss. We'll talk about this later, said Ramdelior, as he felt his expression change into a serious one. You did well in flow today, but there's something else I want to talk to you about. He patted the ground across from him next to the fire, using his tail. Bliss didn't say anything. Instead, she sat down where Ramdelior had suggested while he also got comfortable. Have you ever wondered why we're here? asked Ramdelior softly. The truth was that he didn't want to have this conversation with Bliss, but he had to. She needed to know. Or where we came from? Bliss looked hesitant. The truth is the right way, said Ramdelior, trying to reassure Bliss. Yes, yes, I wonder every day. Then why haven't you asked? I've always been scared of the answers. Are you scared now? Yes, but I want to know. 
Why just us? Why are we here? You tell me stories of entire human villages, towns, adventures to faraway lands, creatures. They seem so impossible from where we are. But I know your stories are true. Why don't we get to experience those things? Bliss's answer tore a hole in Ramdelial's chest. He decided that they had to leave the valley and head into one of the nearest settlements. They wouldn't hide any longer. Will you tell me? asked Bliss quietly. I've lived a long time, longer than most humans and Nulians. I don't know why that is, but... Bliss rested both palms on her cheeks as she placed her elbows on her knees. Using Livestream has always come easy to me. I can see a spout being used and copy it for myself. All I have to do is read it properly and memorise it. I'm also stronger and faster than most Nulians. But ever since I can remember, my life lacked purpose. Part of me had always been empty, lacking something. I used to wake up every day thinking that today would be just like the rest, monotonous, dull, filled with nothing. I wanted there to be something. I wanted to wake up one day and have all that change. Some faint thought at the back of my mind always told me it would. And it did. All that changed when you were born. I suddenly had the answers to all the questions I had been asking myself all those years. You gave me purpose. Bliss only listened. On the day you were born, a dangerous man came looking for you. And he brought destruction with him. The town of Elemontana, our old town, fell within an hour. Without knowing exactly what I was looking for, I ran into the town looking for something. And that's when I found you. You were being carried away by your parents to what they thought would be safety. But that dangerous man was on their tail, toying with them. I knew then that your parents would never make it out of the town without my help. So I presented myself. Ramdelior, Fury and Scorcher of Worlds, the Last Watcher. He pronounced each one of the words with precision. Is that your whole name? Ramdelior nodded. Your parents entrusted you to me after they met the dangerous man, and soon after I sent them to safety. I confronted the dangerous man, but every moment I spoke to him, I risked your life and my own. He is far stronger than I am, of that much I'm certain. That man would stop at nothing to hunt us down. By chance, on that fateful night, I was faster than him, fast enough to escape. Since then, we've been running, hiding, living our lives far away from settlements until you can control your life stream. What he wants from you and why, I'm not sure exactly, but it can't be anything good. Bliss's mouth was open as she listened to Ramdelior's story. I believe, continued Ramdelior, that once you can control your life stream fully, he will no longer be able to harm you. Bliss hesitated. I, I, said Bliss. Ramdelior waited for her patiently. I have questions, managed Bliss. Ask away. I'll answer as best I can. Who was the dangerous man? He didn't have a name. His name was Gavril. An eerie feeling washed over Ramdelio as he pronounced Gavril's name out loud for the first time in over five years. The sensation made Ramdelio's fur stand up most noticeably on his tail. Are you okay? asked Bliss. Did something just happen? I felt like something just happened. Something definitely happened. Ramdelio opened his senses and dug deep into the world of flow. Raising his head, he tried to comb the world around him, searching for any signs of the dangerous man or that rotten smell that he remembered so clearly from when Alimentana fell. There was nothing. The valley seemed as it always had, at peace. I just realised, said Ramdelior as he lowered his head, that I hadn't spoken that man's name since that night we left our old village. I guess saying his name out loud brought back vivid memories of that night. You mean Gavril? 
The hairs on Ramdelior's back and tail stood up once again, just as they had the first time around. Although he couldn't pinpoint why, he knew that it wasn't a good thing. It was almost as if by mentioning the dangerous man's name, he was calling to him. Yeah, that's what I meant, said Ramdelior, trying to shake the feeling off. Why don't we call it a night? And whatever questions you still have, we'll get back to them in the morning. I still have questions, but also I'm sleepy. Bliss made her way towards Ramdelior's back. Tomorrow I'll get answers, right? You can also get them now if you want. I was only making a suggestion. Yeah, but your suggestion of sleep seems much better. Night-night. Good night, said Ramdelior as he got comfortable. The way Bliss had reacted to his revelation took a mountain of weight off Ramdelior's shoulders. Maybe Bliss was too young to understand the gravity of the events, but something told Ramdelior that she was happy. Happy with her life and the way things had turned out. Throughout the night, Ramdelior drifted in and out of sleep. The faintest breath of wind or creak of a branch jerked him awake. For some reason, he found it difficult to fall fully asleep. The early twilight came around, and with it, the faintest trace of a rotten smell. He woke up fully and began sniffing his surrounding, pointing his nose into the air. It was there, the unmistakable smell of rotting flesh, like the smell that had blanketed Alamantana five years ago. The Legion of the Dead was coming for them. Bliss, hissed Ramdelior. Wake up, Bliss, wake up. We have to go. Bliss was a heavy sleeper. She didn't stir. Bliss, hissed Ramdelior, a little louder than last time, and this time he used his tail to shake her awake. Bliss, wake up. What is it? asked Bliss in a low voice as she shifted to her side and swatted Ramdelior's tail. So early. The sun is still not out. Can I just sleep a little longer? You have to wake up. Ramdelior shook her again with his tail. We have to leave now. It's not safe here anymore. They've come for us. What do you mean? asked Bliss, half getting up while floating on Ramdelior's tail. Shh, keep your voice down. Ramdelio stood up slowly. I think the same creatures or people that came for you the night that you were born are making their way through the valley. We have to get out of here. Then we'll go, said Bliss solemnly. Let me know what I need to do. For now, try to be quiet. Ramdelio moved from the camp and into the thick forest. Don't make any sudden movements. We need to get out of here as quietly as we can. I'll keep a lookout for them, and you tell me if you see or smell something. I'm not sure if they know our whereabouts or not. But they're here. All right, I can do this. Yes, you can. Ramdelio moved swiftly through the forest, expertly avoiding branches, fallen bark, twigs, and anything else that could make a noise. He made a point to only step on soft soil, sometimes having to leap long distances to reach another soft patch. They travelled this way for nearly an hour, but the rotten scent kept on getting stronger. I can smell it now, whispered Bliss. It's pretty disgusting. It's nature, said Ramdelio as he slowed his pace, trying to search for a way out with his nose in the air. What do you mean? Those were once people who should have been buried and left to rest in peace, but now the flow keeps them from truly resting while their bodies rot away to bones. Why? They say their land cursed them with being unable to die until they reclaim it. They were once conquerors, warriors. I think the dangerous man found them and is using them. Ramdelio spotted an undead staring right at them from behind a group of tall, thin trees. When the undead saw that Ramdelio had seen it, it took a step towards them then began running, opening its mouth in a scream, though no sound came out. The rest of the forest rustled, and Ramdelior sensed movement all around them. Hold on tight, said Ramdelior as he turned around. They see us now! Bliss stopped floating on his back, sat down, and held on to his fur. As soon as Ramdelior felt that Bliss had a secure hold, he began running. He weaved through the forest with outstanding speed 
this time paying little attention to the noise he made. Ramdelion knew that he could easily outrun the undead. What he didn't know was how many there were, and if they were alone. That worried him. He wasn't ready to face Gavril, not with Bliss as vulnerable as she was. Then, as if he had summoned it with his thoughts, he heard the snarl of something much, much faster than the undead. That something was gaining on them. What was that? asked Bliss. I don't know, and I'm not trying to find out. Hold on tighter if you can. Ramdelior felt Bliss use her life stream to steady her grip on him, and once he knew she was secure, he bolted. He began running as fast as he could, trying to find the rainforest's edge. It wasn't long before he did. He slowed as he neared the edge. What's wrong? asked Bliss. Look ahead. There was a legion of undead waiting for them just beyond the forest line. Among them wove six of the lizard-like creatures he had seen on the rooftops of Alamentana. They were trapped, with an unknown creature rapidly gaining on them, he was sure, and undead surrounding them. I have a plan, said Bliss. You have a plan? asked Ramdelior incredulously. Trust me, it will work. Knowing that Bliss wasn't afraid, or at least that she could still act, gave Ramdelior all the confidence he needed to move forward. I'm all ears, said Ramdelior as he exited the tree line. Run straight at them and don't stop, said Bliss as she got on her knees on Ramdelior's back. That's your plan? Run, said Bliss as she took a deep breath. Ramdelior ran, pushing his body to the limits of what it could do. As he closed the distance, he noticed larger roots and vines breaking through the ground a few bodies lengths ahead of them. As the undead began to rush them, the roots and vines turned into large walls, clearing a path for them. The life stream made walls, actively grabbed the undead and lizard-like creatures, and threw them far away. They left the legion behind within moments, and there was nothing in front of Ramdelior but open green fields and fresh air. Bliss cried out. Stop using life stream, said Ramdelior. We're in the clear. Why does it hurt so much? Ramdelior slowed his pace to wrap his tail around Bliss and began to heal her arms. As he healed her, he could feel the extent of her wounds. This time, some of her arm tissue and muscle fibres had severed. He could only imagine what kind of pain she was in. It's over, said Ramdelior. You'll soon feel better. Bliss took a deep breath, then exhaled slowly. She was probably feeling the effects of Ramdelior's healing spouts. So how did I do? asked Bliss. You did more than good. Ramdelior sighed in relief, knowing that Bliss would be all right. I have to say that I'm impressed. I didn't know you could control so much life stream. I didn't know either. But I had a feeling I could. See, I told you that I had a plan. Please, having a feeling and having a plan are two different things. I don't think you had a plan. They chuckled, but Ramdelior's laughter ended when in the distance he heard a creature's bellow. It must have been that unknown creature that was chasing them through the forest. So, where to now? asked Bliss as she began to float on Ramdelior's back, a clear sign that she was feeling better. I'm not sure. Ramdelior doubled his speed. For now, we'll get as far away from them as we can, look for a village of some sort, and lie low. So you mean I get to meet other humans? Ramdelior nodded. Chapter 8 No Heart Hardened are those who are willing to suffer in order to obtain what they want most. When hurt and pain become a way of life, little else can stand in the way. Gavril kneeled in front of the elaborate tomb he had constructed for Elioina. He had been there for quite some time. Snow fell quietly all around him, forming a light layer on his shoulders and head. Gavril was accustomed to visiting his beloved's tomb every day as the sun rose and set. Sometimes he spent mere minutes in silence, reliving the day he had lost Elioina. 
but others he'd spent hours on end, engrossed in suffering. It was a way of reminding himself that he had to do better, he had to be better, because he wasn't going to let the world suffer like him. No heart was the name of the structure Gavril had built over the ten years since he had lost Elioina. It had been constructed out of black volcanic stones. It had six lean square towers surrounding the main structure, twice the height of the walls that connected them. Crude but solid windows were set generously around the walls at even intervals. The centre building had a roof made almost entirely from glass. The main gate was as black as night, made from a thick metal slab. The dark building contrasted severely with the snowed-in surroundings. The area where Eloina's tomb was located was the most isolated area in Nohart. Gavril didn't like any of the creatures or Nulians lingering around no heart to get close to her tomb. After learning that the Child of Power and its Watcher had escaped his legion and the monster he had sent for them, Gavril was furious. He knew that he had to do more, so he called upon the worst of the worst that the Seven Worlds had to offer. The Child of Power must not live long enough to control her life stream. She must not. Epiphus puffed quietly into existence next to Gavril. He said nothing, and waited until Gavril spoke to him first, as he usually did. Gavril noticed him, but said nothing. Epiphus took one step towards Gavril, letting him know that whatever news he brought, it was more urgent than usual. You know, said Gavril, with a tranquil voice, I really ought to go. I should be the one hunting them, instead of relying on incompetent fools. My lord, you would lose, said Epiphus. Your power grows, but it's still not enough to beat the Watcher. And you think sending a lesser foe will suffice? I am quite sure the Watcher's true powers will not awaken unless he is threatened. I suspect he knows you're his greatest threat. He has looked into your eyes. He knows what you are. Your current strategy has the best chance of a positive outcome. Then we need to do more, said Gavril as he stood. He continued to contemplate Eloina's tomb. I cannot have any more failures. Our time is running out. If what our seers report is true, the child's use of her life stream is growing. Encotropets, or seers, as Gavril called them, were small creatures that followed Gavril's servants and reported back to him. The seers were small, a mere flash of light with wings no bigger than a human nail. Gavril had hundreds of thousands of seers scattered throughout the seven worlds and the no worlds. We are doing more. Soon the child of power and its watcher will be overwhelmed. We know where they are heading and we know where they are. Now that your pond has located them, we won't lose them. Though it's a little behind. Two days to be exact. Ah, yes thought Gavril. That marvellous, flow-imbued, good-for-nothing pond. It had taken it entirely too long to pick up the life stream of the child and its beast, and now that it had, it wouldn't let it go. What about the monster? said Gavril, as he turned towards the main building and began walking. Is it still on their trail? The Jerio Lord? Yes. However, it doesn't follow closely. Perhaps it's a day or two behind. But they will surely rest and he will not. The Jerio Lord was a monster-like Nulian Gavril had acquired from his meeting with the Tartaran ruler, an enormous but nimble creature, a true predator among Nulians. Good. A large door that led inside the main structure opened for Gavril as he neared it. What about the hunters? They are already here. They've been waiting to see you. And I must say, their flow is truly impressive. Combined, it rivals your own. Have them wait no more, said Gavril as he entered. The inside of no heart was an opposite compared to the outside, warm instead of cold and dead. Inside, torches lined the walls, keeping the place warm and dry. Creatures of all kinds roamed freely, though they always gave way to their master as he walked through. There is one problem, my lord, said Ipiphus as he began to float next to Gavril. A problem? asked Gavril, as he tilted his head ever so slightly. 
He knew that Epiphus didn't use that word lightly. What kind of problem? They turned onto a long corridor that led into the main chamber of No Heart, where Gavril had his chair. Like most rulers, Gavril had his own chair. His chair had an elaborate design made out of spout stones, small stones with markings on them. The stones didn't have live stream in them anymore. They were merely an intimidation strategy for whoever stood before him. To obtain a single spout stone, one had to extract the live stream from a Nal or Nord. Yes, my lord, I'm afraid so, said Ipiphus. I felt and studied the flow, and I can conclude that there are at least two more of you out there. Two more who, like you, are also looking for the child of power. The news hit Gavril like a bucket of cold water, waking him up from his daily monotony all at once. He had never considered that there could be more of him. The same entity, the fallen, the one that had made him what he was, had also made two others. It made total sense. After all, if one didn't succeed, another would. Gavril's shoulders tensed up, as if an additional burden had been added to his already arduous load. Though he knew clearly that he would do whatever he must to see his beloved once again, he wouldn't be the one to fail. I guess your plan is the best plan, after all, said Gavril, as he entered the main chamber and sat down on his chair. The hunters were already there, waiting in the centre of the room. It would allow me to be free to take care of other matters. What do you mean, my lord? We'll continue this once I'm done here. Gavril made a dismissive gesture as he sat down. It's nothing of importance, my friend. Hunters, come forth. I hear you're the best the strange world of Pantheus has to offer. Or, better said, the worst. You could say that, said one of the twin blue humanoid figures as both kneeled in front of Gavril. Rise, said Gavril. There's none of that here. I'm not a ruler nor a lord. He looked at Ipiphus and then back at the twins. Nor a deity. I am but a man. We would not dare disrespect you in your sanctum. We know of you, and we can see what you've done. Their eyes rose slightly towards Gavril's chair. On the contrary, disrespect would be you not honouring my wishes. Rise. The blue twins stood up at once. Are you Niles? Wait, don't answer, said Gavril, as he took a good look at the blue twins. They were tall, lean, muscular women with blue skin and dark blue markings all over their bodies, or at least where their skin was exposed at their shoulders, elbows and knees. They wore heavy fur suits with an extra layer around the shoulders. The extra layer probably turned into a cloak of some sort in cold environments, but Gavril wasn't sure. Each had a massive weapon, but they were not the same. One looked like a giant cleaver, while the other looked more like a giant leaf or shield. Both wore stone-like jewellery all over their bodies, but mainly around their necks, wrists and waists. Gavril suspected all the jewellery contained powerful spouts that either strengthened or protected the twins. Where is, said Gavril with half a smile, of the warrior class. Hi, where is, better said. The blue twins smiled back and nodded. What are your names? asked Gavril. I'm Cry, said the twin with the giant cleaver. This is Shy. Cry gestured to her left. My sister. I suppose Ipiphus has already told you why you're here. Yes, said Cry. We're aware. Bring that child to me. You can do as you like with its watcher. May your hunt be swift and direct. Do not let the watcher get the upper hand. Do not, and I repeat... Do not let anything or anyone get in your way. Do you understand? And what of the payment? asked Cry. Gavril smirked and then looked at Ipiphus. Ipiphus disappeared from his spot next to Gavril and appeared next to the twins, holding a small but hefty sack of gold coins and a piece of paper. You're free to take the payment in full, said Ipiphus, or partial. But if you do so, you must sign in blood. Failure to bring the child of power here will end your lives. The choice is yours. 
We will collect the payment once we have the child, said Shai. Cry shot a look at her twin. It seemed as if they did not agree, but neither of them said anything else. Very well, said Ipiphus, as he appeared again next to Gavril's chair. Is there a problem? asked Gavril as he leaned back in his chair. Famine has plagued our coven of late, said Cry. Our lands don't welcome new seeds. We have been cursed many times over by the neighbouring covens. They fear our power. Our payment would bring means to start trading once again. Famine, said Gavril, as he leaned towards the twins and spoke softly. Famine, you say? Famine, war, disease, and disasters will hit the Seven Worlds a thousand times over if you don't bring that child to me. The Seven Worlds have yet to experience the true meaning of devastation. Don't worry about your coven or the lands therein. I will see that trade resumes. I give you my word. Worry about one thing, and one thing only. Worry about bringing me the child. The twins nodded. The hour is now, said Gavril, as he stood up from his chair. Do what you must to succeed. Be on your way. One of these creatures will see you out. Many creatures, large and small, began swarming around the twins as they walked out. Gavril strode from the main chamber and made his way to the observatory, where he spent most of his time. Do you think they have a chance? asked Gavril as he stood next to his pond. The observatory was much different than the main chamber. It was mainly lit by natural light from the glass ceiling. There were lesser creatures lingering around, and plants adorned the edges of the room. At the centre of the room was a large circular pond, only a few palms high. They do, I believe, said Ipophus. They have the best chance of anyone thus far. Gavril nodded and turned his attention to the pond where he saw his own reflection in the serene water. Two day behind, you said, asked Gavril, as he turned towards Ipiphus. I'm not sure, but I believe it has to do with the form of life stream the child is emitting. It's much more ancient than the pond's own. Perhaps, as they traverse the land, the life stream they leave behind becomes one with the Atsu around it. When we attempted to follow them all those years ago, I had a similar problem. The child's life stream was overwhelming. I knew the trail was there, but I wasn't sure exactly where, as it took a great deal of space in the flow. It wasn't until some sort of life stream faded away that I knew where to go, but by then it was too late. Show me, Gavril said slowly, as he turned to the pond and stared into the serene water. The rest of me. Gavril's pond was no ordinary pond. This pond was alive, and it was ancient, dating back to the origins of flow itself. The pond began to swirl slowly, forming a map of the seven worlds, then zooming in until a mountain range intersected with rivers was visible. The place was east of Ikra, south of Arelum, and north of Tartarin. The pond got closer still, until it was showing a large settlement. Gavril knew of that place. He often heard tales of rivers of gold and floors of precious stones, elaborate and lavish buildings. It was the trading hub of the Seven Worlds, Anchor. He snickered as he watched a single droplet rise from the largest building in the town. Its ruler? He turned towards Ipiphus, then turned back to the pond. And the other? The pond erased the image and showed a map of the area above the Seven Worlds, where a small droplet rose from the middle of nothingness. A no-world. This one is lost, said Gavril as he shook his head. Show me the child. The pond erased itself and made a slight screeching sound. The images it showed didn't look nearly as smooth as the first two. Even so, the pond managed to show a place near Riffelen on the outskirts of a valley. Then it disappeared abruptly, splashing Gavril. Gavril sighed and turned towards Ipiphus. Perhaps, said Ipiphus, as he looked at the pond, then back at Gavril. Asking to see the watcher instead of the child would yield better results. It matters not. We'll let the hunters hunt. 
Meanwhile, I'll make myself useful and head to anchor. My lord? The others, like me, they were also touched by the fallen, were they not? Do they possess what I possess? Ipiphus closed his eyes and thought for a moment. Gavril knew that he was trying to connect to the flow. Exactly the same, said Ipiphus as he opened his eyes. No more, no less. Though I believe that each of you is fundamentally different, leveraging your strengths in different ways. Then they too are getting stronger as time goes by. Ipiphus nodded. Then I'll go, said Gavril, as he looked out through one of the windows, where he could see Elioina's tomb clearly. I will not let anything get in the way. I'll head out at once. I'll use a galleon. I should reach anchor in a few days. Take care of this place for me. Send out one of our closest tradesmen to see about the wary's coven. I want them taken care of. Famine will not reach those who were able to help. A galleon, my lord? You let the last one go when we got back here from Tartarin all that time ago. Galleons were flying fish-like creatures that resided near mountain ranges. If tamed, they could travel long distances without having to stop for food, water, or rest. They were the second best way of getting around the Seven Worlds. But there was a catch. To tame a galleon required a great deal of skill, as they would often fight back like their life depended on it. With their sharp claws, steely wings, and long tails, they could easily cut someone in half. Unless that someone was Gavril. I'll go up to the mountains and get another. And if there are many of them at once? Then I will end up with many of them. My lord, allow me to come with you. Any one of these creatures can take care of this place. I'll just send word to our tradesmen before we leave. I cannot ask that of you, said Gavril, as he began walking towards the nearest walkway. It's too dangerous, my friend. I don't know what to expect. You aren't asking, said Ipiphus, as he floated next to Gavril. I'm offering. My abilities will serve you well. Gavril nodded in agreement. Chapter 9 Humans Some Nullians have to wait their entire lives before they reach their full potential and can fully experience their life stream. For Ramdelier, surviving in a place where he wasn't welcomed had been enough. After running for four days and three nights, Ramdelior finally began looking for a place to stay. He stopped sensing any kind of danger just two days after leaving the valley they had spent five years in. Throughout their travels, they only stopped to go to the bathroom. They relied on Bliss's life stream to keep them from growing hungry. As the wind blew past them, Ramdelior caught the distinctive smell of a small village. A thousand smells wrapped in the fragrance of burning wood. Goods were being baked, food was being made, and Carabao poop was being scraped from the floor. We're getting close, said Ramdelior, as he turned towards the hill where the scents were coming from. When we get closer, you'll need to get off my back and walk. Why do I have to walk? protested Bliss. I can float without even thinking about it. Humans know about Nulians, right? Flow is not a secret, so why do I have to keep it a secret? Okay, first, you'll be walking because that's what other humans do. Like you, they walk without having to think about it, and they aren't trying to hide it. Second, we don't need to call attention to ourselves. If this is a big enough village, we'll pass by unnoticed, which is what we need. I thought I'd be able to meet other humans. Bliss crossed her arms and legs. So far, I'm not liking this plan of yours. Ramdelior tried hard not to laugh. Although he couldn't see her floating on his back, he could still feel what she was doing, and he glanced at her from the corner of his eye enough times that he could imagine how she looked. And you will, said Ramdelior, trying to control his tone. Not calling attention to yourself is the best way to become approachable. If we go in and you're floating on my back, we're the stranger Nulian with a girl on his back. No one is going to want to talk to us. But if we go there like any other Nulian and a five-year-old... Almost six. Right, almost six. Though you aren't even halfway there. 
But anyway, humans and villagers would worry less about us. Plus, one of the first things we have to do is get you a new set of clothes. As they reached the top of the hill and began to descend, Ramdelior spotted the settlement. The village was bigger than he had originally thought, but not as big as a town like Alamantana. The village was surrounded by trees, which soon gave way to large bodies of water. They must be near the great seas. But which one? Clothes? What's wrong with my clothes? I happen to like the way I look. Humans, particularly those from villages, don't usually look like birds. What do you mean? I think my clothes are pretty. You'll see soon enough what I mean, said Ramdelior as they neared the village. Do you see that over there? Is that where we're going to find the humans? Bliss leaned forward over Ramdelior's head. Will we be staying there? Like to eat and take a bath? Humans and Nulians live there. As for staying there, I'm not sure yet. I have to see what kind of village it is first. And a bath? That's surprising. I thought you didn't like those. Bliss smiled. It wasn't long before they could see movement in the village. Ramdelior came to a full stop. Here's where you get down. If it can't be helped, Bliss said as she floated off Ramdelior's back. They made their way to the village, walking at a normal pace, though Ramdelior found himself slowing for Bliss as she struggled to keep up. He didn't blame her, she was not used to walking long distances. Back in the valley, the most she ever walked was to the nearby river and back. Ram, you walk too fast, groaned Bliss as she tried to match his speed. No, it's not that I walk too fast. You aren't used to walking, and that's a habit you must change. This is a normal walking pace for most humans, including children like you. Fine, said Bliss as she struggled to keep up. As they entered the village, Bliss was wide-eyed, looking around at everyone and everything. Ramdelior noticed that unlike Alamantana, this village was alive. Small fires burned everywhere, giving the place an additional layer of warmth. Humans and Nulians intermingled throughout the village. The sight of humans getting along with Nulians was completely new to Ramdelior. He instantly felt welcomed for the first time in his life, even if no one was paying attention to them. Things have changed, said Ramdelior as he looked about. And they have changed for the better, it looks like. Do I really, really have to dress like that? Asked Bliss in a low voice. There's no colour, no life. Everything looks the same. That's exactly why you have to dress like that, said Ramdelior, as he turned towards Bliss and saw a huge contrast between her and the people from the village. She was bright and vivid, a riot of colours dotting her dark feathered dress while the villagers wore different shades of grey or brown. Yeah, we have to change those clothes. Ram, what are those smells? said Bliss, as she took a big whiff of air. It smells like food, but ten times better than what you cook. Smells aren't everything, said Ramdelior. You'll see. Can we have some? Once we find new clothes for you. OK, let's hurry then. As they walked about the village in search of human clothing, a small boy with horns followed them. Ramdelia wasn't alarmed, as he didn't feel any ill will coming from the boy. Even Bliss seemed to notice the would-be shadow in the crowd of people around the marketplace. Ram, I think someone is following us, whispered Bliss, holding one hand up to her mouth, trying to be discreet. Maybe you should talk to him. He is obviously following you. Do you see how the feathered dress makes you stand out? All right, I will, said Bliss, still covering her mouth. Bliss turned around without a single shred of fear, ready to confront anything that came her way. When the horned boy saw Bliss turn around to face him, he froze. The boy turned from a would-be shadow into a blushing statue, unable to move. Ramdelior felt Bliss using Livestream in the form of Atsu on the boy, but she might have unknowingly done so. Since no one was in immediate danger, he thought he'd leave Bliss to her own devices to try and figure it out. 
Bliss walked towards the horned boy and stopped a body length away. Stop! Why are you following me? asked Bliss as she turned towards Ramdelio, as if asking for approval. Ramdelio nodded. The horned boy didn't move, frozen mid-stride. Hello, said Bliss as she put her hands on her hips and took a step forward, right eyebrow raised. I'm talking to you. There was no movement from the boy. Say something, said Bliss. Well, go on, say something. She crossed her arms. As soon as Bliss said that, the horned boy let out a loud gasp of air and began coughing. Well, asked Bliss. <coughs> that was terrifying. I couldn't move at all, said the horned boy, adjusting his posture. I just froze. I don't know what happened to me. Wait, was it you? Did you freeze me or something? Are you a flow user? Bliss looked taken aback. Don't tell me you don't know if it was you or not, said the horned boy. That's even worse. Bliss turned towards Ramdelio, who was close by but far enough away that he wasn't part of the conversation. Ramdelio nodded at Bliss. He guessed that she was asking him if it had been her that caused the horned boy to freeze in place. I know it was me, said Bliss, as her cheeks turned rosy. I can control my flow, you know. I don't know about that, said the horned boy sheepishly. But that's not the point here. You haven't answered my questions. Right, said the horn boy, snapping his fingers. Are you a fairy? Like from the wood in the north? Ramdelio had told Bliss about the many different creatures and newlians of the world, though he wasn't sure she remembered all of them. Most of the time Bliss fell asleep when he told her stories. Bliss turned towards Ramdelio and he shook his head. Nope, nope, Bliss said as she relaxed her hands by her sides. Not a fairy. Then what are you? Ramdelio coughed, grabbing Bliss's attention. She gestured at him, as if telling him that everything would be all right. I'm just a human, said Bliss innocently. Humans can't use flow. Are you a mage or a wary? Ramdelio hadn't told Bliss about the five different kinds of flow uses that existed. Even so, she still turned towards him and he nodded. Yes, said Bliss. Which one? A gnarl or a wary? My guardian told me not to tell you, said Bliss, as she gestured towards Ramdelio. When the horned boy looked at him, he smiled, though the action seemed to scare the boy. I guess I'd better be going then, said the horned boy. No, not yet, said Bliss. You asked me a bunch of questions, now I have questions and I want answers. Where did she learn how to talk this way? OK, OK, just don't freeze me again. It's not a good feeling. First off, what is your name? Um, murmured the horned boy as he looked down. I don't have one yet. According to my clan, I haven't earned one. Having a name is sort of like a rite of passage. Do you have a name? I'm Bliss. Bliss? That's nice, said the horned boy as he looked up. I haven't heard a name as simple as that, especially not around here. Next question. Why do you have horns? Oh, these, said the horn boy, grabbing his horns as if he had forgotten he had them there. That's because I'm a dragon, the horn boy sighed. Well, no, not really. Um, it's complicated. Basically, I'll be a dragon someday. My clan is all I have. Being raised by dragons rubs off on you. I see, Bliss nodded as if she understood, though Ramdelio knew that she would be asking him all about it later. All right, last question. Why did you think I was a fairy? I've never seen anyone as colourful as you. Violet hair, coloured feathers in your dress. And I've never seen a fairy, so I thought you were one. Ramdelio saw a large dragon approaching from the marketplace. It was an earth dragon. It walked on two rear limbs and had no wings, but it was every bit as menacing as the flying ones. Everyone made way for the massive beast. Though Ramdelio didn't feel an imminent threat coming from the dragon, its presence made him want to move closer to Bliss. I guess I really should be going, 
said the horn boy as he turned towards the dragon. They're already looking for me. I think we're leaving now. The dragon stopped as soon as it noticed the horn boy turn towards it. Talk to you some other time, said Bliss. The horn boy nodded and ran towards the dragon. Bliss walked towards Ramdelior. Before you say anything, said Bliss as she neared, I do agree about changing my clothes. Finally, the voice of reason. They spent the next hour trying to find suitable clothing. Most of the shops in the area focused on armour or trade clothing. There was little for casual wear. There were also one or two shops that sold potions and food. They walked for a while longer until they reached a small shop at the end of one of the pathways. A lady was outside the door, trying to attract customers. Stop making your own clothes, yelled the lady to no one in particular. We have everything you need for whenever you need it. Underwear, outerwear, cold wear, all wear. Looks like we've found what we've been looking for, said Ramdelio. Come on in, darlings, said the lady as she walked in behind Bliss and Ramdelio. She kept walking deeper into the shop and went behind the counter. Look, look around. If you see anything you like, just let me know. The shop was filled to the brim with clothing. It looked like there wasn't an empty space in the entirety of the store. Ram, whispered Bliss. Psst! Ram! Ram! Psst! Ram turned towards Bliss. Can I choose any of these? asked Bliss as she pointed to a rack of extravagant dresses fit for an important lady attending a banquet. Psst! They're really pretty. Bliss, you only have to say psst once, and that's only to grab someone's attention. But can I? I was thinking of something along the lines of this section. Ramdelio pointed towards the darkest section of the shop, where the rain and heavy weather cloaks were kept. Plus these look like they cost bags of coins, and I only have a few. What do you mean bags of coins? asked Bliss, deflated. Well, if that's the case, you should look over there, said the lady as she gestured towards a small section of cloaks that looked old and frail. She had also lost her enthusiasm. These newer ones will end up costing you much more. Also, don't take too long. I need to get a real customer. Ramdelio sighed. Bliss turned back and forth between the cloak and her own dress. Each time her face grew sadder and sadder. It's only going to be for a little while, said Ramdelior. You'll end up making your own anyway. Sure, honey, whatever you say, said the lady sarcastically. Bliss looked like she was on the verge of crying. She must have understood what the lady meant. Would you take a trade? asked Ramdelior. The lady eyed him up and down. In addition to whatever coins I can come up with, that is. Ramdelior thought of the spices he had back in his cave. Most of the containers were almost empty, but he did have some unopened. At the same time, he thought about all the times he could have simply made a portal to go back and get them so he could use them to cook dinner with Bliss. He wanted to bite his tail off, <laughs> but this wasn't the time for regret. Right now, what mattered the most was Bliss's happiness. What do you have to trade with? I doubt you have anything of worth. I have plenty of spices. How? Where? I can't smell anything. You don't have a bag with you? I can retrieve them from my place, no problem. Ramdelior made a small circle that turned into a portal to show the lady that he could control flow. What do you say? Everyone needs spices. Right, said the lady with a disappointed face. I forgot all about those parlour tricks. Damn Nulians. I'll need to see what you can come up with before I tell you what you can get for it. Ramdelior closed the first circle and drew a bigger circle in the air, opening up a larger portal back to his old cave. Seeing his old cave brought back many memories. Most of him was happy that he'd left, but a minute part of him nonetheless wept. He only wanted to be good enough, good enough for the cards he had been dealt, good enough to take care of Bliss. I hope you're doing well, old man. I hope that you were able to escape. He looked around his old cave, adjusting the portal to get closer to the items he was looking for. 
For the most part, the cave was as he had left it, but it felt abandoned already. He found the coins first. There weren't many of them, only three coppers and one small silver. He then moved the portal towards the old fire pit, where he had a variety of almost empty spice jars and two full ones which he grabbed. He pulled everything out all at once, requiring both of his paws, and placed them on top of the lady's counter. The portal disappeared shortly after. The lady brushed the three coins aside as if they were nothing, though Ramdelio had a pretty good idea of their worth. Usually, a copper coin could buy three servings of a daily meal. A small silver coin could buy meals for a minimum of four days. The shop lady eyed the spices carefully as she opened the jars. Ramdelio saw her mouth beginning to water as her jaw moved up and down. All of these, said the lady as she pulled the jars and the coins towards her. And you can choose any one of those. She gestured towards the heavy weather cloaks and clothes. The same ones Ramdelio had suggested for Bliss. Hurry, I must get more customers. Two sets? asked Ramdelio. These aren't low quality, said the lady as her face turned red. She was clearly getting irritated. They're finely cut from whole materials. Please don't insult my work. You can choose only one set. I could say the same to you, said Ramdelio easily, keeping calm. Those spices aren't cheap, and they aren't easy to come by. They come all the way from Ikra. The lady examined Ramdelio's goods and brushed two of the copper coins to the side. Here, said the lady as she moved the two copper coins to the edge of the counter. Do we have a deal? We have a deal, said Ramdelio. So, any one of these? asked Bliss as she waved her hand over the dark cloak section. She was bubbly and visibly excited at the outcome. Any one of those, said Ramdelior with a smile as he took back the two copper coins with his tail. After trying on a few different options, she ended up picking a heavy dark grey cloak with matching underclothes and brown boots. She also picked out wrist wraps and gloves that matched the boots. When she left the changing room with her new cloak on, the only thing that distinguished her from other humans was her violet hair. Bliss looked happy. She had a wide smile on her face. So, how is it? asked Bliss as she turned for Ramdelio with her hands extended to the side. Perfect. Are you done yet? asked the lady, tapping the counter impatiently. I need to go reel in my next client before it gets too late. We're leaving, said Ramdelio as he walked towards the door and Bliss followed. So far, my impression of humans, said Bliss as they reached the main road of the market. It's not what I expected. Don't worry. Humans are complex. You'll learn that not all humans are the same, and that some are nicer than others, though a bit rare. So, what do you want to do now? I'm hungry, said Bliss, sniffing hopefully. Can we have some of that smell? It smells delicious. Chapter 10 Others At times, it seemed as if the whole world was against him, determined not to let Remdelier fulfill his sense of duty as the last watcher. But he had something else his enemies did not. Resolve. Ramdelior and Bliss spent some time sniffing their way around the busy market in search of the food Bliss wanted. They had several near hits, but they were ultimately a miss, as the smell persisted above the rest. Ramdelior's heightened sense of smell had detected the correct food parlour as soon as they began looking, but he enjoyed spending time with Bliss, and all of this searching helped to build up Bliss's sense of independence. Ramdelior didn't want Bliss to solely rely on him to solve all her problems. I think it's that one, Bliss said as she gestured towards a lonely hole in the wall on the opposite side of the road. Ramdelior pointed his snout where Bliss was pointing. It's definitely that one, said Ramdelior, pretending to inhale. Bliss ran to the place and Ramdelior followed calmly, taking his time and enjoying the moment. Hello, little one, said a large but well-defined woman. 
Ram Delior could hear clearly, even though he was still across the road. We'd like some of that delicious food, please, said Bliss, her voice bubbly. We, you say, eh? asked the lady, confused. We would be her and me, said Ram Delior as he came into view. Well, come on in. We have the village's best food right here. Ram Delior hesitated. In Almantana, Newlians were not welcome inside eateries. Newlians are always welcome, said the lady. We aren't like those other villages. For us, food is food, and food is for everyone, eh? Ram Delio and Bliss entered the hole in the wall and chose a table in the corner of the small place. Welcome, said a large man from behind the counter. He looked genuinely happy. Ram Delio assumed he was the cook as he wore an apron that spanned the length of his body and a head cover. Welcome. We have the best food in the village, eh? That's my husband, Calabast, and I'm Inane, said Inane, as she gestured at her husband and then at herself. So, what can I get for you two? I'm Bliss, and this is Ram. Bliss imitated Inane's introduction. He's my guardian. Inane smiled, but it wasn't a forced, disingenuous kind of smile. It felt like a real smile. The couple looked happy to have them there. What can some copper coins get us here? Ram Delior asked. That can get you plenty, said Inane. Basically anything you like. A single copper coin will pay for three meals. Both of you can eat with just one and come back tomorrow if you'd like, eh? Randelior hoped that Bliss was paying attention, because there was already a large contrast between Inane and the lady from the clothing shop. Ramdelior moved his tail towards Inane and unfolded it, revealing the two copper coins. Oh no, dear. Inane made a dismissive gesture. You can keep that for now. First, let's give you some delicious food. If you don't like it, then you don't pay. Let's start with that. So, what can I get for you? Ramdelior saw that Calabast was paying close attention to their discussion. If that's a fact, said Ramdelior, then we'll get the house special. That's what's already cooking, right? You're right, said Inane. That's the house special. Apple, wine, beef, stew. And to drink, what kind of wine? What is wine? Bliss asked. Something that you shouldn't be having, said Ramdelior. Water is fine. We have honey-sweetened lemon water. That's better. So, we're all set. I'll be right back with your water bowls. Apple beef it is, shouted Calabast, raising his hands in the air, somewhat startling Ramdelior. Sorry about that, said Inane. He just gets really excited about food. <laughs> Ramdelior nodded and Inane walked away. I don't understand, said Bliss. I thought we were getting honey water. Why is she bringing water? To wash our hands and faces before we eat. Oh, like when you tell me to get ready to eat. Exactly. Meanwhile, Ramdelior extended his tail and moved one of the coins towards him. I'll make you a gift. A gift? Bliss's eyes widened. With the tip of his nail, slowly and precisely, Ramdelior marked the copper coin on its backside, where there was no marking of the coin's value. Three slanted lines, and one line that crossed through the first three and curved towards the bottom of the coin. Take it, and put it in one of your pockets, said Ramdelior. What's a pocket? asked Bliss. Pockets are places on your clothing where you can store stuff. Ramdelior placed the other coin on the table, and using his tail, he pointed at two of Bliss's three pockets near her belly. Those are pockets. That explains a lot. I thought they were half-sewn patches. He chuckled softly. Bliss grabbed the coin and inspected the markings Ramdelior had made on it. It's the beginning of a spout that identifies me, offered Ramdelior. It's unique to me. Whoa said Bliss, as she inspected the markings up close. I'm going to keep this forever. 
Bliss dropped the coin inside her right belly pocket after inspecting all three of them. Two on her belly and one on her thigh. I have pockets. So what else can I put in there? Anything you like. But I'd refrain from putting in food or things that can go bad. Maybe just whatever is valuable to you. Bliss nodded with a smile. The bowls of water came. They washed and Inane removed the bowls. Soon after, the food arrived and they dug in. They ate without talking to each other, with only a few comments here and there. You know, it's nice not to eat fish for a change. I somewhat miss it. The food was gone in no time, with Ramdelior finishing Bliss's leftovers as she sipped on the honey water. It felt nice to sit down and eat. Ramdelior only wished that they could find a way to do this more often. Bliss deserved as much. She deserved to grow up like any other child. She had done nothing wrong. He couldn't fathom why someone like the dangerous man was looking for her. But he was not only looking for her, it was much worse. Sure, Bliss had powerful life stream, and most of her life stream was latent still, and she had been called the Herald of Flow by the Guardians. Ramdelio had no idea what any of that meant, but something told him that she would learn to control her life stream. He also knew that no matter what, he needed to take care of her. He needed to make it through one more day, and as many more days as it took to see Bliss had a chance at a normal life. What? asked Bliss, as she noticed Ramdelio staring at her. He shook his head, snapping out of his deep thoughts. Nothing, said Ramdelio, as he felt himself blink back into the moment. Are you done? We need to find a place to sleep soon. How's everything going over here? asked Inane from a few steps away. Let me take this away for you. She grabbed the wooden bowls and utensils expertly. Is there anything else I can get for you? No, not really, said Bliss. We need to go find a place to sleep. You don't have a place to stay? asked Inane, carrying the dishes as if they were nothing. Come to think of it, I've never seen you in the village before. You aren't from around here, eh? Where are you two headed? We're just heading to the next village over, said Ramdelio. You mean Tessa Rouge? That's several days away. You'll really need to take some supplies with you. Let's see here. Inane looked like she was thinking. She paused and then turned towards Calabast. It looks like we have some travellers, eh? Do you think we can help them out? That hostel in the central village is rough. Sure, why not? said Calabast, with enthusiasm. We have plenty of space upstairs. No, that's fine, said Ramdelio. We wouldn't want to be a bother. You wouldn't be a bother at all. We're happy to help. My husband and I have been in your situation before, and I know how hard it can get sometimes. Can we stay, Ram? asked Bliss. All right, why not, said Ramdelio. There was a commotion outside. Things were being broken and people were running. Many shadows passed the windows and doors of the hole in the wall, though Ramdelio and Bliss couldn't see what was happening from the side they had chosen to sit on. Bliss got up to see, but Ramdelio pushed her back down into her seat with his tail. Is that normal around here? Ramdelio asked in a low tone as he turned towards Inane. No, not at all said Inane, her face scared, as Calabast ran to her side with a large knife in his hand. Leave me alone! I don't... The man screamed as his words were cut off. Ramdelior began to get up, but Calabast made a gesture telling him to remain seated. Get behind me, darling, said Calabast to his wife. Inane stayed put, right next to Calabast. Something was walking towards the hole in the wall, something large and dragging chains. Ramdelio tried to smell whatever was coming towards them, but he couldn't recognize the scent. It wasn't anything that he had smelt before, but it was Nulian. Of that he was sure. Inane and Calabas's faces turned pale as the Nulian stopped in front of the entrance of the hole in the wall. Pardon me, said the Nulian. I'm looking for a child and possibly some sort of guardian travelling with it. 
You see, this child is dangerous, and it must be dealt with. There's none of that here, said Inane in a raised voice. There is no need to yell, said the Nulian. I can hear you just fine, and I'd like to believe I'm a reasonable being. We were just closing, said Calabast. So, if you don't mind. If you are just closing, pondered the Nulian, then who were you talking to just now? There's at least one other creature in there with you. Show me its face, and I'll be on my way. Like I said, Calabas gripped his large knife tighter. We were just closing. Whatever happens, whispered Ramdelior, turning towards Bliss. Stay here, and don't say anything. There was movement outside, and chains rattled violently. Ramdelior knew that at any moment Inane and Calabast would be attacked. Instead of waiting for that to happen, he got up from the table and opened a portal in front of Inane. Just as the portal opened, a slew of heavy-looking chains came flying into the hole in the wall. But to no avail. The chains were swallowed effortlessly by Ramdelior's portal. As the creature outside pulled back the chains, Ramdelior closed the portal, snapping the chains in half. He then ran outside. That was when he saw it. A golden armoured Nulian, the size of the entire hole in the wall. It had the body of a large bird without wings, and chains hung from its armour. Thousands of chains. Its head was covered with a bird-like golden skull, though there were no eyes in the holes where its eyes should be. Ramdelior faced the Nulian head-on in the middle of the road, outside the hole in the wall. There you are! <laughs> said the Nulian, followed by a slow, heavy laugh. I knew there was someone in there with them. I'm not going crazy after all. You don't happen to have a child with you, do you? A child skilled in the way of flow? If I did, Ramdalior said, as he took a step towards the Nulian. What makes you think I'd tell you? Ramdalior knew well that this wasn't an average Nulian. He had been enhanced by hundreds of spouts, and he reeked of dark flow. Even so, Ramdelior knew that backing down wasn't something he'd be doing today. Ho ho ho, said the Nulian. You have some guts. I don't get approached like this very often. Or, better said, ever. Cut the crap. Why are you here? I'm Anchufa Boliguaris, from the great trading grounds of Anchor. And Chufa took two steps towards Ramdelior. I was sent here to collect a child. You see, this child is of great importance to my ruler. Not to mention the bounty on its head would pretty much set me up for life. Are you its watcher? On hearing the last word, something within Ramdelior, something primal, compelled him not to lie, even if lying meant protecting bliss. Ramdelior's body felt hot and his heart began thumping. He was ready for battle. I am, said Ramdelior slowly. If that's so, said Anchufa, as the chains began to rattle, then there's no need for further acquaintance. I agree. Ramdelior darted towards Anchufa as chains flew at him from all angles, causing him to duck and weave. The chains got close, but they all missed, sending debris flying about as they hit the ground or nearby structures. Each time Randelior dodged a chain, the next chain got closer to him. For a Nulian of his size, Antufa was fast, really fast. This isn't going to work. The way this is going, those chains are going to catch up. I need to find a good angle of attack. What's the matter, watcher? asked Antufa as he ran to meet Randelior. Are my darlings too much for you? Ramdelior said nothing. Instead, he kept looking for openings. And he found one. And Chufa's underbelly looked exposed, unguarded. Just as Ramdelior began to move towards the Nulian's underbelly, and Chufa appeared in front of Ramdelior, headbutting him into a nearby structure. What happened? How did I not see that coming? Ramdelior thought as he dug himself out of the wall. Did he just appear out of nowhere? Or was he there the whole time? Didn't see that coming, did you? 
And Chufa asked, as he stopped in the middle of the road with his chains rattling all around him. Chances are you won't see any of it. And Chufa headbutted Ramdelio again, once more seemingly out of nowhere. This time it wasn't an average hit. This time the force sent Ramdelior flying through someone's home and out the other side, where Anchufa was already waiting for him. Pain raced through Ramdelior's body, though it was nothing he couldn't handle. His heart began to beat faster and stronger as he got up. I'd stay down if I were you. There's no use in getting up. Anchufa's chains rattled with intensity. You are no match for me. As Ramdelior straightened up, he was knocked down once again, sending him hurtling towards the hole in the wall. But this time, Ramdelior did not fall. He used his powerful paws to steady himself, and this time, he saw something. Strings, thousands of almost invisible strings attached to the ends of the chains. Ramdelior smiled as he cracked his neck. Why are you smiling? asked Anchufa, infuriated. I've heard of your kind, and to tell you the truth, I almost doubted your existence. You see, in my long life, I've never seen one. Now that I have, I'm kind of disappointed. Disappointed? asked Anchufa, moving his golden body into an aggressive stance. I'll show you disappointed. The chains darted towards Ramdelio, but he dodged easily. He now knew, or at least had a better idea, of where the chains would be. Fire, whispered Ramdelior as he ran around Anchufa, leaving a wall of fire behind. The fire burned a bright orange red. He stopped once he had completed the circle. I'm not sure how long I can keep this up, Ramdelior thought, as he began to feel the fire draining his life stream. Casting fire was easy for Ramdelior, second nature to him. Out of all the elements, fire was the one he could call his own. Making fire wasn't the problem, but keeping it burning when it had nothing to latch onto, nothing to consume, that part was difficult. Whatever I'm going to do, I have to do it quick. You think a little fire is going to save you? Anchufa asked, angrily, as his chains rattled. That's right, you're a fire demon. How cute! Perhaps you weren't listening to me, Ramdelior said calmly as he looked into the darkness outside the flames. You were too busy focusing on how much of a disappointment you are. I'll remind you, I have you figured out. What are you saying, fire demon? You're an Eleon, right? An Eleon will have uncountable strings that bend anything to its will. The strings can bring inanimate objects to life, though sometimes those things can be filled with terror. In all the seven worlds, only an Eleon can be called a true puppet master. I'm mainly disappointed about the terror part. Your doll is not all that terrifying. You know nothing about me, yelled Anchufa as his doll moved menacingly, chains rattling. That's when Ramdelio saw them clearly. The strings, thousands upon thousands of strings, curved above the flames and converged into a single point directly at the doll's back. Just as Ramdelior thought, the strings weren't fireproof. I got you, said Ramdelior as he ran towards where he thought the real Anchufa would be. Impossible, said the Anchufa doll from within the fire circle. With his right paw, Ramdelior slashed a single point in the dark. He struck something, and as he did so, that something flew to the other side of the road, bouncing off a building's wall. He was completely visible by then. The charade is over, said Ramdelior, as he saw the Alayan puppet master clearly. The Alayan was a short, stubby creature on four legs with a few dozen tails. It wore heavy golden armour, making it tough to discern what was underneath. How? said the real Anchufa as Ramdelio walked towards him. Your strings gave you away, said Ramdelio from a body length away. What does your ruler want with the child? Like I tell you, said Anchufa as he managed to lean on the wall. Dog? Ramdelio smirked, 
but the smirk disappeared when he caught Anchufa looking at something from the corner of his eye. He turned around. It was Bliss, standing to the side of the hole in the wall's door, peeking out. It's over, said Anchufa, as he made his doll attack. The doll ran towards the hole in the wall, no longer caring about the flames, with every one of its chains pointed at Bliss. As it passed through the flames, parts of the doll fell off, including some chains, but for the most part, it kept going. Bliss could really get killed, Ramdeliel thought in the split second before impact. He felt a forgotten, but at the same time, familiar surge of life stream. His heart pounded, his breathing got deeper, and he ran. He ran as fast as his body permitted. His heart burned, and he ran with all his heart. He reached the hole in the wall moments before the Anchufa doll. But instead of waiting for impact, Ramdelior struck. He buried his powerful claws in the ground and sprang towards the doll, tackling it. As the doll fell, the chains still rose towards Bliss. But Ramdelior was fast, fast enough to take care of every one of the chains. One of the chains was faster than the rest, but Ramdelior still caught it, though it had been too close for comfort. The chain came to a full stop just two body lengths away from Bliss. Ramdelia caught his breath in front of the hole in the wall. He smiled when he saw that Bliss had called up a wall of roots in front of Calabast, Inane and herself. Moments later, the roots began to recede back into the ground. That's exactly what I want to see from you, thought Ramdelior as he turned towards the doll's remains. Do not depend on me always being there even though I always will be. Ramdelior carefully inspected Anchufa's doll as he walked over it, looking for any strings that might be active. There weren't any. Feeling confident that the doll wouldn't get up again, he walked towards where he had left Anchufa. As he walked, he noticed a glow of light behind his head, just like the time he took down the Tartarans. He dismissed it at once, focusing on Anchufa but the Nulian wasn't there. Only his golden armour remained. And Chufa had fled. It was obvious from the footprints and the trail of blood leading away from the armour. Ramdelior climbed to the top of the tallest home to try and spot Anchufa. There was nothing, not even villagers outside. The roads between the homes were dark, and most homes' torches and spill lights were out. Ramdelior sighed in relief, even though he couldn't find Anchufa. As he relaxed, he noticed the glow behind his head disappear. He made his way to where Bliss and the other two waited for him outside the hole in the wall. Bliss ran to meet Ramdelior. Are you all right? said Bliss as she hugged Ramdelior's neck. I'm fine. Using his tail, Ramdelior moved Bliss onto his back. Come on, let's go apologise to these two. Are you all right, eh? said Calabast his hands trembling and his face covered in sweat. It's not every day we see a monster on this side of the village. It's not ever, said Inane, also shaken, her face red. What was that? More to the point, what are you and who is she? You see, said Calabast, we've always believed in doing the right thing, and I know you're good folk. We wouldn't want any harm to come to either of you, especially her. Honestly said Ramdelior with a sigh. It's best if you don't know. It's safer that way. But don't worry, we won't be staying here. Truth is, we don't know if someone else will come knocking or not. I sincerely apologise for any damage we might have caused. Ramdelior looked at the slight damage to the door. Then he saw Calabast looking towards a large hole that Ramdelior had left in the middle of someone's home. Others might need your help more than we do. On the bright side, it looks like the doll's armour is made from precious metals. I'd say that is enough to compensate for any damage done here. Calabast looked hesitant. We'll get going, said Ramdelior as he half turned away. Bliss? Oh, right, said Bliss, as she snapped back to attention. I apologise too. I didn't mean to bring any problems. Ramdelior's heart broke in half hearing Bliss say those words. She didn't deserve that. She had done nothing wrong. She didn't deserve any of this. Thank you for the food, said Ramdelior as he began walking away. 
Bye now, said Bliss innocently. We might not see each other again. Again, Ramdelior felt an ache in his heart. As they walked by the hole Ramdelior's body had made in someone's home, Bliss took it upon herself to fix it. She patched up both holes using roots. The result looked solid, and it added some charisma to the home. Ouch, murmured Bliss. Does it hurt a lot? Nothing I can't handle. You're getting quite good at it. Ramdelio turned towards someone staring at them from across the road. Others were coming out to see as well. But next time, you should stay where I tell you. What do those two things have to do with one another? Lower your voice. Even if you think you might be able to help me, don't. But no buts, refuted Ramdelior. He tried to walk through the village as if nothing had happened, but it was obvious that people were gathering to stare. Never ever. That doesn't seem fair at all. Unless the day comes when you master your live stream, then I will reconsider. Until that day comes, you stay where I tell you to stay. That's so unfair, grunted Bliss as she crossed her arms. Bliss, said Ramdelior in a calm, soft voice. My job, my only purpose in life, is to protect you. Let me protect you as best I can. Just to let you know, that day will come. I will practice and practice until I know everything that there is to know about flow, live streams, spouts and spills. You have a long way to go, though I know you'll get there, and I'll help you every step of the way, if you listen to me. Ramdelior felt himself grin, knowing that he had made his point. There's still a lot you don't know about the world of the flow. Just have a little patience. Your time will come. Fine, said Bliss, resolute. But I will get there faster than you think. I'd welcome that. Say, I do have a question, said Bliss, as she rested her hands on her knees. What was that fire that appeared on the back of your horns? You looked scary. My fire crown. What is that exactly? That happens when life stream is racing through my body at a higher rate than I can consume it. So it burns off life stream? I wouldn't say burns off. More like keeps it primed at all times for faster use. And what else can you do with it? That's a lesson for later, said Ramdelior. And you're supposed to teach me about flow? Ramdelior chuckled at the snappy comeback. But the truth was that Ramdelior himself wasn't sure what he could really do with his life stream. He didn't know how far he could push his body. Every time he tried to recall other occasions when the fire crown had appeared, a wall of fuzz surfaced between him and his memories. Come on, said Bliss, as she lay back, floating on Randelior's back, and crossed one leg. I'm really going to take forever. On the bright side, the stars are beautiful tonight. Yeah, they are, said Randelior, as he too looked up for a moment. There may be much I don't know about myself, but that's because I'm the last of my kind. There's no one else like me I can learn from. The same goes for you. You are the only stubborn girl with purple hair I know of. Hey! But when it comes to flow and the way it works, I've been around long enough to learn most of it. There are things I don't know, but they're few and far between. Start teaching me everything, said Bliss, getting back up. I need to know these things. All in due time, said Ramdelior, as they neared the edge of the village. There are some things that even if I explain them to you, they wouldn't make sense until you experience them for yourself. If you say so, Bliss yawned and lay back down. So where are we going now? I've been having this dream for a long time. It's a place covered in flowers hidden in the mist of the mountains. Something in that dream is calling me, I think. No, not think. Feel. I feel that we'll find all the answers we need. Where is this place? And why is it covered in flowers? I don't know. Then how will we find it? Bliss began to doze off. But I hope we do. And if we do, I hope it has a nice bath. I've been needing one for a while now. 
I don't know. But that's where we're going. The answer will come. Ramdelio and Bliss disappeared into the night. Chapter 11 Anchor Hardened are those who fear not what lies ahead. They fear nothing, for they know that the worst is yet to come. Gavril will seize every moment for himself until the day he can call himself victorious. It took Gavril and Ipiphus longer than expected to reach the great trading grounds of Anchor. It hadn't been easy for Gavril to get another galleon. It turned out that they were particularly aggressive at this time of year. Nevertheless, he had managed to subdue one. Gavril's galleon landed a short walk away from the trading capital, just as the sun was beginning to set. They stretched as they got off the mighty sky fish. What will you do with him? asked Ipiphus as he continued to stretch. Let it go free. Gavril cracked his neck and walked over to the galleon's snout. Who knows how long we're going to be here? This place doesn't look particularly welcoming. Anchor was surrounded by a vast desert, with nothing but dunes as far as the eye could see. My lord, won't it be difficult to get another galleon? Not to mention the nearest mountains are weeks away. But not impossible, said Gavril, as he pet the galleon on the side of its enormous face. Compared to Gavril, the skyfish was dozens of times larger. After all, what's the point of being able to do something once if you can't do it again? Don't worry. Getting this one was a lesson well learned. Next time, instead of trying to run down the entire throng, I'll just head for the biggest one. Isn't that right? Gavril slapped the galleon softly on its cheek, and the galleon took a deep breath. Come on, you're free to go. The galleon looked straight at Gavril, as if it was trying to make sure it understood correctly. Yes, said Gavril, with a dismissive gesture. You're free to go. There is no more bond you must honour. Go free, and hope that we won't run into each other again. Go! The galleon turned around and took to the sky, leaving a cloud of dust behind. We'll find a way to get to the mountains, said Gavril, as he dusted off his shoulders. Maybe we can ride on a sandworm or two. But never mind that. I want to know what has happened. Are the twins nearing them yet? I'll call for seers though it might take them a while to get to us. That's fine. Gavril turned towards Anchor and began walking as the dust settled. It looks like we have a long walk ahead of us. Tell me, Ipiphus, what do you know about Anchor and its ruler? I don't know much about it, my lord. The little I know is about its flow and how it works here. Which is? You can buy, trade and sell any of it. Even powerful spouts and spills? Yes, my lord. Spills so powerful that they can wipe out entire villages. Though I only learned this recently, and it might not be the entire truth. So, this is how the end of the world starts. By way of greed. Giving anyone that can pay for it the power to take life away. Perhaps we ought to take a detour, said Gavril. I'd like to try and find some of these potions myself. Keep your senses open for them. I will do so, my lord. I know I've asked this of you before, but can you please stop calling me my lord? I'm not your lord, and you're my friend. What will it take? It's a bad habit, my... Hey, hey, hey. Gavril shook his index finger from left to right. We've just talked about it. I'll try my best. Good. I'm good with that. They began walking towards the large line forming at the gates of Anchor, their steps and conversation unhurried. A seer flew in, seemingly out of nowhere, and landed on Ipiphus's shoulder. The seer got close to Ipiphus's pointed ear and began to whisper. Although Gavril could hear the seer saying something in a low voice, he couldn't understand. I have some news, said Ipiphus, as he turned towards Gavril. Well, there's no need to keep it from me any longer. It looks like an Elaion got to the child and its watcher a few hours before our monster. A puppet master? That's interesting. And? Well, it was no match for the watcher. 
Of course it wasn't a match. But the Elean survived. If the Elean survived, it was only because the Watcher didn't want to kill it in front of the child. Did one of the others send it? It appears so, said Ipophus, as he conferred with the seer. The seer says it was covered in golden armour. And what of our own monster? It's still trailing them, now only a day away. Have it pull back. Have it meet with the twins. If an Alayun couldn't take down the Watcher, our monster will fail too. It's the simple truth. As you wish. What of my legion? They're trailing a few days behind it, picking up numbers as they travel the land. Good. From here on out, nothing gets to the child and its watcher except us. Have everyone on the lookout. End whatever gets near them. I'll relay your message. Epiphus held the small seer in the palm of his hand and brought it near his mouth, where he whispered an unintelligible message. Then he let it go. It's done. As they neared anchor, Gavril and Ipophus began to fall in line with the hundreds of humans and Nulians entering the trading capital. Gavril was beginning to see a little of everything. Giant Nulians pulling a line of carts, traders of all shapes and sizes, gnarls and nords, as well as ordinary humans. In a crowd of many, Gavril was sure they wouldn't stand out. Anchor was large, stall upon stall, shop upon shop and crowded beyond anything Gavril had ever seen. He could hear at least a dozen different languages being tossed around. The large trading ground teemed with life, with humans and Nulians moving about, and beggars and workers of the night at every corner. If you see anyone take an interest in us, said Gavril in a low voice, as he weaved through the crowds, in a way that's not normal, let me know. Ipophus nodded as he puffed in and out of the crowd's way. They were making their way towards the largest structure in Anchor, the ruler's building, when Ipophus stopped. What is it? asked Gavril. Remember those powerful spouts and spills we talked about earlier? Gavril nodded as he too stopped and looked at Ipophus. A large portion of them are located in that direction, Ipophus pointed towards a side alley. No. Not a portion. All of them are located over there. It's dangerous stuff. Gavril turned towards where Epiphus was pointing and began walking. As he approached, he noticed the transformation. Slow and then rapid, from everyday items to flow and potions. Everything a Nord, wary or Nile would ever need could easily be found here. But as the stalls began to get more serious, so did the security. Flanking the alleyway entrance were four guards decked out in heavy golden armour with scimitars hanging at their waists. Do you think it's safe to assume that those are the ruler's people? Gavril asked as he kept walking. I'm not sure, but I think we will soon find out. As Gavril approached the guards, they began to look nervous, holding the hilts of their swords. Don't take another step, one of the guards yelled. This is a restricted area. Only those with official ruler business are allowed through. Don't worry, said Gavril, as he extended his arms to the side. I come by way of the ruler. Present your pass, said one of the guards, as he unsheathed his weapon. The other three followed. Is this really worth your life? asked Gavril, as he approached. Does the ruler pay you that well? The guard's Adam's apple bobbed. Gavril darted towards the guards, disarming them with ease. To Gavril, it was as if the guards were just standing there, holding their weapons, unmoving. He grabbed all four of their scimitars and plunged them into the ground, stopping only at the hilt. The force of Gavril taking their weapons sent the guards stumbling all over the place. It took them a few moments to realise what had happened. As realisation kicked in, two of the guards fled, while the others backed off unsure of what to do next. Do you know what goes on in there? asked Gavril, as he looked at the scared guards one by one. The guards shook their heads. Keep your lives, said Gavril, as he proceeded into the alley. Run to your ruler. Tell him someone is here to see him. The guards didn't hesitate and took off running towards the big building. 
You'd think they'd have this place better guarded, said Gavril, as Ipaphus joined his side. It's perhaps become commonplace. Commonplace? Gavril felt his jaw tighten. He felt his anger rise like the heat from a fire as he walked down the alley and saw people trading large amounts of coins for potions or summoning runes. All it takes is wealth to control the lives of those who don't have it. Things weren't like this before. Greed is running rampant throughout the Seven Worlds. People, rulers, chieftains are becoming slaves to coins. But in the end, this is but a glimpse of the things I saw coming, of the unspeakable dealings that will leave millions at the edge of despair. I will stop it from happening. It will not happen. Most of the traders were heavily cloaked, spoke in whispers, and avoided eye contact. But they didn't fool Gavril. He knew who they were from their presence alone. He didn't need to know anything else about them. Find the place with the strongest flow, said Gavril in a low voice. Ipaphus nodded as they kept heading deeper into the alley. Not long after, Ipaphus finally spoke. I believe it is here. The stall attendant turned at the sound of Ipaphus's voice and eyed Gavril suspiciously. I'm looking for something strong. A world eater, maybe. The stall attendant turned halfway back and yelled something in the language Gavril didn't understand. He's calling for backup, said Ipaphus openly. The stall attendant glared at Ipaphus, but he didn't seem to care, brushing off the dirty looks as if they'd never happened. Backup? Why would he need backup? asked Gavril as he shrugged. I'm just a simple merchant. Three brutish Nulians stepped from the building behind the stall and made their way around the stall to stand next to Gavril. He didn't take his eyes off the stall attendant, completely ignoring the brutes. The Nulian brutes were a mixture of flesh and rock with broad shoulders and arms, their feet short and stubby. They wore light, iron-like armour, and they each carried a heavy sword. They looked tough, tougher than many Nulians Gavril had seen, but they also looked slow. Where is the ruler's pass? said the stall attendant in the common tongue, his accent heavy. I haven't got one, said Gavril, showing his palms. I came here straight from my village in the north. All people who enter here must have a special pass from the ruler. You must leave now. Come back with pass. The ruler himself told me I could come here whenever I so desired. You see, he owes me quite a bit. I have special privileges. Where did the ruler tell you such things? Gavril knew the obvious answer would be to answer the ruler's tower. But a large part of him wanted to get caught. He knew he wasn't particularly good at lying, and for what he was planning, he needed all the people to leave anyway. He told me himself when he visited my home village up north, said Gavril, in Atrania. Gavril paused, knowing that what he said next would send the attendant over the edge. Last full moon. The ruler hasn't left his tower in years, said the stall attendant with clear irritation. He then said something in the language Gavril couldn't understand. Gavril turned to Ipaphus. He's asking the brutes to throw you out of here, like... Ipaphus hesitated. Like? asked Gavril, as he faced one of the brutes, standing up to his full height. Now is not the time to omit things. Like the trash you are, said Ipaphus. Translate this said Gavril, as he readied himself to confront the brutes. They will lose the ability to use whatever tries to touch me. Epiphus translated, and the brutes looked at each other and took a step forward. Gavril didn't move. Perhaps they didn't understand, said Epiphus. Then put it more simply, said Gavril. Tell them I will kill them. They don't need to be doing this kind of work. Ipaphus translated, but the brutes only looked at each other and laughed. Have it your way, said Gavril, as the brutes got too close for comfort. I was trying to save. One of the brutes pulled out his massive sword and took a swipe at Gavril, 
but the brute's speed was no match for Gavril's. He saw the hit coming and easily moved out of the way. As he did so, he sank his right fist into the brute's elbow. There was a snap and the brute's hand fell limp, letting go of the heavy sword at the same time. The brute cried out in pain, but still, almost as if the other two hadn't seen what happened, they attacked Gavril. Both of the brutes met the same end as the first. Gavril easily dislocated the elbows of their dominant hands. The first brute tried to reach for his sword with his uninjured hand, but Gavril easily stopped him by stomping on his hand. Gavril twisted his foot on top of the brute's hand, causing the hand to crack. The brute cried out in pain. How many lives have you taken in your lifetime? asked Gavril as he began to feel his adrenaline rise. How many have suffered what you're suffering now? The brute shook his head as if he understood. Don't lie, said Gavril as he twisted his foot. The other two brutes were hesitant, inching closer to Gavril. He glared at them, and they remained in place. He's not lying, said Ipiphus, as he stared at the brute intently. If you want to keep your lives, Gavril eased off. I suggest you leave. Ipiphus translated. The brutes looked at each other, said something, and began to leave. The stall attendant yelled something at them, but they made a dismissive gesture. As the people in the alley saw the brutes leave, panicked whispers began to spread. Other brutes came out of the back of their own stalls, only to look at Gavril and turn the other way. Soon the alley began to empty. Even a few of the stall attendants were beginning to leave. So, what now? said the attendant, puffing out his chest. You will force me to help you? Take what you want. Take anything. It's what you wanted. Things aren't always the way they look, said Gavril as he reached over the stall and grabbed the attendant, tossing him to the ground. Listen to me carefully. The attendant looked shaken but paid close attention to Gavril. Do you know what these are for? Gavril gestured towards the array of spills and marked rocks. There were flasks of all shapes and sizes, some filled completely and others half full. Some flasks were made from stone and others from metal. There were also many stones with spout markings. Gavril recognised a few of them. It was overwhelming to look at, as no space on the stall had been left unfilled. The spills were Gavril's main concern, as they were typically a mixture of life stream and spouts in a liquid solution that enhanced their power. The attendant nodded as he got halfway up. I have one follow-up question, said Gavril, as he took a step closer. What happens next depends on how you answer it. Why are you here? I have no choice, wailed the attendant. The ruler has threatened all of us. He knows my family. At first, I thought I was selling simple potions like other stalls. But one day, I found out they were spills and complained to the ruler. He almost killed me. There is always a choice, said Gavril, as one of his hands turned into a fist. The attendant nodded hard as tears began to fall down his cheeks. Yes, you're right. There's a choice. Do what you have to do. At least this way, my family won't suffer much. The attendant got up and turned towards Gavril, but he kept his head down. I'm ready to face the consequences of my impotence. Gavril sneered. He means it, Ipiphus said. Go on, get out of here, said Gavril as he turned towards the many spills and rock spats. If it's not safe for you here, leave Anchor, as you should have done long ago. Take your family with you. Give them a good life. If you don't, I'll find you. The attendant said nothing, but turned around and began walking. Raise your head up high yelled Gavril. It takes courage to do the right thing. Also, don't make me change my mind. The attendant raised his head and broke into a sprint. Epiphus, said Gavril, as he looked at the potions. Do you feel anything here that can help us get rid of all these? Gavril heard a commotion not too far away. He could hear a large group marching towards the alley. He knew that it had to be the ruler's guards coming for him. He'd be surprised if the ruler himself left his tower, so he didn't worry too much about it. 
Perhaps this will help, said Ipophus, as he appeared on top of the table, knocking over several flasks. He grabbed a strange stone flask with several knobs on it. This is a containment flask. It won't hold everything, though. Perhaps we'll have to dump some of it once it fills up. Dump. Portal flow, said Ipophus as he pointed at one of the knobs. Location. He pointed towards the two knobs below the first. Suction and power. He gestured towards the bottom two. It should work. Do it. Maximum power. You might want to hold on to something, said Ipophus as he tinkered with the knobs. Gavril nodded as he held on to the stool. Something much, much larger, said Epiphus as he held the stone flask above his head. Gavril looked around, then snapped off a large beam that held the tarp above the alley in place. He took a few steps back, then thrust the beam into the ground. The beam went right in. Gavril tapped on it. It sounded rigid and solid, then held on to it with one hand. Epiphus shrugged. Gavril frowned. Ipophus shook the flask, and a portal the size of an ordinary human door opened right in front of it. It began pulling everything towards it with an unforgiving force. The force was so great that it forced Gavril to hold onto the beam with two hands. Everything around them was being sucked into the portal, even the stalls themselves. Though the portal adjusted in the blink of an eye to accommodate larger objects, it never got smaller than its initial size. It didn't take long for the alley to completely empty of stalls and potions. It also didn't take long for the flask to start pulling things from other parts of the marketplace. I think we got most of it, yelled Gavril as a cart flew into the alley. Ipophus shook the stone flask and the chaos stopped. Gavril shook his head and dusted his clothes off as everything fell silent. This flask must have been made by a grand mage said Ipophus, as he carefully adjusted the knobs. Lifetimes ago, this kind of flow shouldn't be around. Gavril doubted that anyone who had brought this flask would have known how to use it like Ipophus had. Still, this kind of flow shouldn't be for sale. And yet it is, said Gavril, as he turned towards the sound of the commotion. It looks like we have company. A large group of guards and some lightly armoured Nulians came running in through the main entrance, while a smaller group came in through the back. All wore a sort of golden armour, but one of the guards stood out from the rest. It was a guard that was part of the smaller group that came from the rear. Instead of gold, he wore bronze armour with blue ornaments. He wasn't the ruler, that much was clear. Gavril didn't feel a high-level threat coming from the bronze guard. But even so, there was little doubt that he was the one in charge. Take that flask far away from here, murmured Gavril, as he lowered his head to look at Ipophus. If I don't find you, come and look for me, but stay away from harm. Ipophus nodded and puffed out of view. Four of the Nulians gave chase, but it didn't take long for them to disappear from view. They were headed in the same direction as Ipophus, but Gavril wasn't worried. His friend was far more powerful than many would give him credit for. Interloper! shouted the bronze guard as he stepped towards Gavril. Interloper? Gavril extended his arms in a questioning gesture and began walking towards the bronze guard. This is absolutely my business. Chapter 12 The Place That Isn't a Place Getting them to come was harder than expected. It took Remdelier far too long to finally realize that we were calling them. However, meeting them was like a breath of fresh air. The world did have a chance at survival after all. The flow had been right. After their encounter with the puppet master, Ramdelior and Bliss traveled for the whole night. Well, Not so much Bliss as Ramdelior. She had been sleeping, floating on his back as she usually did, though she had everything to do with Ramdelior not getting tired. Ramdelior had been trying hard to remember details of his dreams of the place covered in flowers. It seemed that the more he tried, the more elusive the place became. 
But he needed to find a way to get there. He was sure that if that place existed, he would find answers there. Ramdelio stopped to take a sip of water from a nearby stream. He thought that maybe water would help his memory. At this point, he was desperate. He knew that they couldn't keep running from something for the rest of their lives. He needed to find that place, or at the very least, find out if it existed. Are we there yet? asked Bliss, as he stretched and got halfway up from his back. Are we where? That place that smelled so pretty, said Bliss, as she rubbed her eyes. Wait, we aren't there. Smelled pretty? You mean to say you had a dream about it too? Ramdelio stood still, paying close attention to what Bliss was about to say. I don't think it was a dream, said Bliss, as she rubbed her head and got off Ramdelio's back. It was more as if I was there. We were there. I could touch things, smell things. There was a round hut at the end of the cliff. Bliss leaned into the stream and cupped water in her hands, taking a sip. But this isn't it. Do you know where it is? asked Ramdelio. The place you dreamed about. It wasn't a dream, retorted Bliss. Bliss, you were sleeping while I was running. Although you're floating on my back, I can still feel your weight. And I can assure you, you did not go anywhere. Hey, what are you trying to say? said Bliss as she chuckled, half getting Ramdelio's taunt. Okay, fine. Let's call it the place we somehow go during our dreams, but we don't go. Ramdelio shook his head as he sighed. What? asked Bliss with a smile. That's not how naming stuff works, said Ramdelio as he turned away from the stream. When naming things, you have to use a word or make up a word that stands for all of those things you've said. Come on, get on, we better get going. Bliss jumped on top of Ramdelio's back and went back to floating. So, do you know where it is? asked Ramdelio as he broke into a mild sprint. Nalafa Uwawaro? The exact location of the flowered place implanted itself into Ramdelio's mind, though there was something wrong about it. It was not a place that he knew, nor was it a place that existed, at least not in this world. I think so, said Bliss, with one hand on her shin. But it's in a different place, a place that doesn't belong to the living. Ancient flow from the spirit realm, muttered Ramdelio. What is that? asked Bliss. It's nothing that you should be concerned about right now. Ramdelio ran with all his strength to the place that had been marked so clearly in his mind. They would be there by the middle of the night, he was sure of it. In just a small amount of time at full speed, Ramdelio could cover vast distances, distances that would shock the average traveller's mind. In a day, he could cover a distance that would take the average carriage a month to traverse. He moved gracefully through the green fields of Rafelin. Nothing could stop him. Well, nothing apart from the one thing that could. I'm so itchy, said Bliss, as she moved about on Ramdelior's back. And before you say anything, I know, I know. But I didn't know this before. Lesson learned. From here on out, I will take a bath every chance I get. It only took Ramdelio a few moments to scan the horizon and find a place he thought would surely contain a waterfall or two, or at least a river. He veered away from the path and headed towards it. So, are we going? asked Bliss as she clapped. Can she sense that we went off track? Bliss, you never cease to amaze me. Not before you've finished your self-taught lesson, said Ramdelio. What else have you learned? Bliss thought for a moment. I shouldn't take things for granted. Good. We'll take a small break up ahead, and maybe we'll have a quick bite. I just thought of something. Isn't there a way I could use a spout to clean myself? I mean, there has to be something like that, right? There are plenty of spouts out there that would work the same way as you would take a bath. For example, you could use your atsu to summon some clouds and make it rain. Or you could manifest water out of air. But for that you'd need to know what condensation is and how it works. 
and I don't think that would be a five-minute subject. There are other ways, but those that I've mentioned are safest for someone like you. What other ways are there? Ramdelior sighed, but deep down he was happy with Bliss's curious mind. There is also cleansing, said Ramdelior, mindful of what he was saying. Spouts which make you clean, making all impurities leave your body. Though that kind of spout requires substantial control over your live stream. With the amount of uncontrolled power you have, you could end up removing your own skin if you're not careful. Hey, complained Bliss, I'm getting better. Yes, but the kind of spouts we're talking about are precise, controlled and exact. There's no room for error. Even I would have a hard time using them. Is it that hard? It's hard, but not impossible to learn. The healing Niles usually dedicate their lives to learning this kind of spout. With it, they can cure wounds, heal the sick and also clean themselves though I'm guessing that self-cleansing is one of the first things they learn. I see, said Bliss, as she rubbed her shin with her index finger and thumb. Maybe next time I'll take a closer look at it. Right now, finding water feels like the easiest thing to do. It didn't take long for Ramdelior to find the stream they had veered off from earlier, along with a small waterfall. Ramdelior looked around as he stopped, taking a good whiff of the air making sure the area was clear. Here you go, said Ramdelior. Bliss slid down Ramdelior's back and headed straight for the stream. Make sure you hold on to the edges, said Ramdelior. You aren't such a good swimmer. Ram, said Bliss with annoyance as she pulled up some nearby flowers. I can do this. I've done it hundreds of times before. I can do it again. If I somehow begin to drown, which is not going to happen, I'll empty the stream. Jeez, said Ramdelior as he turned and headed down river. I'm just reminding you. I'm going to look for some food. Hurry, because I won't be long. See you, said Bliss, dismissing Ramdelior. When it came to finding fish, Ramdelior was in his natural habitat. He could feel the tiny vibrations the fish made as they swam through the water. He knew where the fish were as soon as he stepped in the river or stream. He also knew how to move so that the fish wouldn't be alerted to his presence. He had grown up catching fish. It was one of the few foods available to him that he didn't have to pay for. In his early teens, he had sold fish. He used to get up early every day, as peace blanketed the world, to catch fish. On any given day, he'd end up with two to three hundred fish and each one of them had been hand-caught. He only stopped selling fish after some of the local fishermen complained and rallied against him to make him leave. They said he was taking too many of the fish for himself. Ramdelior sighed, trying to erase the memory from his mind. No, not erase. He didn't have any hard feelings towards the fishermen. He knew that they too had to feed themselves, and probably a few others as well. Clearly, though, They could have talked to him to try and remedy the situation instead of ganging up against him as they did. He thought of the whole situation as less than intelligent, so he'd rather just not think about it at all. He caught two fish the moment he entered the stream. They were easy prey. There was a third fish, a larger, much older one, hiding at the water's edge. Ramdelior could only feel the fish's presence as it blended in with the bedrock perfectly. Ramdelior closed his eyes and concentrated on trying to feel irregularities in the stream. The slightest push, touch, feel of something not belonging. He took a deep breath and slapped the rock next to his front right paw. But it didn't turn out to be a rock at all. It was the larger fish. Ha ha! said Ramdelior with delight. I got you! He got out of the stream, picked up the three fish with his tail and headed towards Bliss. As he reached her, he saw that she was still taking a bath. I thought you'd be done by now, said Ramdelior, as he placed the fish on top of a rock. You weren't gone that long, said Bliss, as she washed her face. I still have to wash my hair, but I'll be out soon. I'll go get some branches and start the fire. Soon they were both eating, though Bliss had used her life stream to fashion a makeshift chair and table from cleverly arranged rocks. 
So, how's the fish? asked Ramdelior, as he ate his fish how he usually did, on the floor, grabbing it with his paws. For Ramdelior, two fish would not get him even halfway full, but he was determined to make them last. Does it taste better up there? Is it as good as the food we had last night? No, said Bliss, with her mouth full. No what? Ramdelior cocked his head. Her answer could go any which way. It was his own fault for asking too many questions at the same time. No to everything, said Bliss, as she swallowed and grabbed a leaf that had some water in it. No, it doesn't taste better eating up here. But I like the feeling of the table. And no, it's not as good as the food we had the other night. <coughs> it's not? asked Ramdelior, with a cough choking. How so? Ramdelior began to run a list of the steps he had taken to cook the fish. It had all been the same as before. There were even some added leaves to elevate the flavour of the tender meat this time around. Why wasn't it good? Well, what I mean, said Bliss, as she took another bite, is that your food is much better, much, much better. Bliss chewed a few times before talking again. The food from the other night was good also, but there was something missing. Even though it was new to me, and I had a break from all the fish, it wasn't as good. Ramdelior sighed. Why is that? asked Bliss as she swallowed. That's because they cook to sell, and I cook to eat. Sure, they might have some better spices than I have at my disposal and what not, but they don't have love for the food they're making. Well, no, that's not entirely fair. They don't have love for us. We are just someone who they're trying to please, instead of someone who they want to give their best to. But that's how things should be. You just don't go around giving the best of you to anyone you meet. If you do, you'll be drained. And if you're drained, you can't give your best to those who deserve it. Bliss said nothing. She just continued eating. They ate the rest of the meal in silence. Ramdelior tried to make his food last, while Bliss ate in a hurry. Why do things get more complicated the older I get? asked Bliss as she got off her makeshift stone chair and began to put the stones back where she'd got them. They aren't getting more complicated. We are always just learning the things we cannot see at first, that's all. Bliss nodded. Are you ready? asked Ramdelior as he got up from his spot. I am. Do you really think we'll find that place that doesn't exist? Ramdelior chuckled and neared Bliss so she could hop on his back like she usually did. What's funny? The place that doesn't exist. <laughs> when you put it that way, how can I tell you that we'll find it? You know what I mean, said Bliss, as she poked the back of Ramdelior's neck. Do you think we'll find it? I sure hope so, said Ramdelior, feeling the pressure build up once again. Bliss needed to find that place. He needed to find that place. They headed off once again to the place that wasn't a place. On the way there, Bliss played with her life stream, dozed off, and even asked Ramdelior to stop a few times for bathroom breaks. In all fairness, Ramdelior also took advantage of the opportunities to lighten himself, so he didn't complain much. Why are things so far away? said Bliss, as she stretched before getting back on top of Ramdelior's back. I can only imagine how long this journey would be if we had had to walk. Do others travel this far? They do, said Ramdelior, as he started running once again. Though they usually travel on the main road, also known as the Ruler's Road. It's usually the shortest way to go from village to village. But at regular carriage speed, the journey would take an entire month at least. There are other ways to travel, but most of them are not available to everyone. Ruler's Road? asked Bliss curiously. You mean to say that someone owns the ground people walk on? And that person is called a ruler. Bliss sometimes got caught up on the smallest of details. Ramdelior loved that about her. He knew that if, with any luck, he succeeded, she would grow up to be someone who wouldn't let the world pass her by. It's complicated, said Ramdelior as he sped up. But in short, yes, 
The majority of people think there are seven worlds and two no worlds in this great sphere of ours. Pantheus, Atrenia, Kappa North, Kappa South, Tartaran, Irelum, Rifelon, where we are now, and Ikra, where we are from. Then near the dark and frozen oceans, there's the no worlds. For each one of the worlds, there's a ruler, someone making the rules for their world. The no worlds have no ruler, as there is no one there. Wait, why do you say most people think? asked Bliss. Because others, mainly scholars of the lines of maps, call the sphere itself the world, and what people call worlds now, they call land masses. And which are we? asked Bliss. There's no such thing as the seven worlds and no worlds. You can see that everything is connected. So it's just one world? That's correct. A single world? How odd, how small sounding. And yet everything is still so far. I have another question. You don't have to announce that you have a question. You can simply ask. Are rulers good or bad? Asked Bliss. It depends. I've heard of both. Bliss spent the rest of the way there questioning Ramdelior, picking his brain for the details of everything he knew. Ramdelior was happy to oblige. He found her questions interesting, and it broke the monotony of running. It was past nightfall when they neared the place that wasn't a place. We're getting near, said Bliss, instead of asking another question. You feel that too? Yes, it's overwhelming. Nothingness. It was hard to describe what Ramdelior felt. An empty space, a dark space, pulling him in. But at the same time, it wasn't. The more he looked around, the less he found. The area was barren. There were no trees, no flowers, not even rocks. Just plain grass, as far as he could see. He tried to get closer to where the nothingness was coming from, the darkest part of the field. Then he felt something. He tried to take a closer look, but it was pitch black. Ramdelior had always been able to see clearly at night, but this place was different. It was as if the area they were in was sucking in the light. With both paws, he felt along the ground, trying to make sense of what he was feeling. There were engravings. No, not engravings, they were too large for that. It was a channel, many channels. There's something here, murmured Ramdelior. Why is it so dark? It's never this dark, not even at night. I can't even see my hands right now. I'll try to make some fire, said Ramdelior. And moments later, a small fire appeared on the tip of his tail, though it did little to help the darkness. That's all. Mm, that's odd, said Ramdelior, as he wagged his tail slowly, observing how the fire behaved. It should be a lot bigger than that. It feels like it's a lot bigger than that. At least I can see my hands now. Ramdelio took a step back and moved the flame closer to the ground, hoping to see what he had felt before. The flame wasn't even near the ground when the channels began catching on fire. He put out his flame on his tail and hurriedly took a few steps back as he watched line after line of channels catch fire. They were forming some sort of large-scale spout writing. What are they doing? asked Bliss as she stood up on Ramdelior's back. It looks like a spout, but I can't read what it says. It might be an ancient spout. Keep your eyes open. It's only in the darkest dark the true light can exist, a whisper said. Who's there? asked Ramdelior. Oh, it's you two, said an old but friendly voice. I've been waiting for you for quite some time now. Hold on, I'll let you in. One moment, please. Herelliu, have you seen the key to the realm of the living? Ramdelior heard movement and things being rearranged. I can't find the darn thing. The key? What key? Asked a male voice that also sounded old, but much further away. He sounded busy. There are so many keys, the key to this, the key to that. The key for the visitors from the world of the living, yelled the friendly voice. Ah, that key, said the male voice. No, I have no idea. Damned old fool, 
muttered the friendly voice. He never knows where anything is. Ah, here it is. The flames disappeared, bringing the area back into darkness. Take a few steps forward, said the voice. Walk towards the centre of the markings. Ramdelio hesitated. Come on, I won't hurt you or her. You know this because if I had any ill will towards you or her, you as her watcher would know. What the voice was saying was true. Ramdelio didn't feel any kind of ill intent coming from the owner of the voice. But how could he be sure? It could be a spout making him feel that way. He had to be careful. Ramdelio took a few steps towards the centre of the markings. That's it, said the voice. Just a little bit more. The voice made him hesitate. Ramdelio, Fury and Scorcher of Worlds, the last watcher, said the old voice, this time with a not-so-friendly tone. Do you really believe that there's danger for you here? Why is your heart not beating? Your heart could see through any spout. Stop this nonsense. Let me help you, and especially help Bliss. How does she know my name? Ramdelio thought. How do you know my name? asked Bliss. I know many things, said the voice, and I can help you both if you step forward. Can we trust her? asked Bliss. We have to try, said Ramdelio. Something didn't feel right. Ramdelio was missing something. But what was it? He didn't have time to sit down and figure it out. He knew he had to act fast before this lady, whatever she may be, lost her patience. I hope you're right, thought Ramdelior, as he took a few more steps forward. Good, said the voice. I'll see you on the other side. The world flipped upside down, then right side up for Ramdelior and Bliss. What once was night was now day. Then the place Ramdelio had dreamed of for all those years was there, in front of him. But this time, it was real. A million different fragrances hit them as a gust of fresh air passed by. As they looked about, he only saw one thing. Flowers of all shapes and sizes, an unquantifiable amount of flowers. The one thing was clear. They weren't wildflowers. They had been placed there with purpose. It was a garden stretching as far as the eye could see, beauty in all its splendour. Whoa, whispered Bliss. Just like in his dreams, there was a walkway that led to an old rounded hut on a cliff. Unlike his dream, this time he was sure it was real. A sense of calmness washed over Ramdelior. He felt the weight of the world melt off his shoulders. No one could harm them, and nothing could follow them there. They were safe. For the first time since he had met Bliss, he felt... normal? The feeling made Ramdelio question himself even more. He knew it wasn't right for him to be feeling this way. There was something he had missed. But what? It couldn't have been something big. It had to be a small detail. From the rounded hut at the end of the cliff, a tall, thin woman emerged a dress made of flowers, her hair long, white and wavy. Welcome to my garden, said the woman. She was the owner of the old friendly voice that had spoken to them earlier. It had to be her. It's been quite some time now. The woman walked towards them with an elegant but slightly sinuous gait. I am Hazer. It's nice to finally see you both after all this time. Chapter 13. Flowers We gave them all the help we dared give, but in doing so, we might have doomed them, for we took from them what they did not have. Time. The lady who called herself Hazer kept walking towards them, and yet Ramdelior didn't feel any form of threat. Even so, he got into a defensive stance. Hazer sighed, rolled her eyes, and kept walking towards them. Wait, said Ramdelio, as he got in front of Bliss. Don't get any closer. Did you forget the part where I told you this was my garden? Hazer gestured towards Ramdelio, moved her arm upwards, 
and picked up Ramdelio. Ramdelio was suspended in mid-air at least three or four body lengths from the ground. He couldn't move. Whatever flow Hazer was using, it was powerful. More powerful than anything he had ever encountered. Yet, he still did not feel threatened. Bliss gestured towards the ground and called up thousands of vines and roots. Some surrounded her and some reached up towards Ramdelio. There's no need for that young Bliss, said Hazer as she waved an arm and the roots began to subside back into the ground. Although I'm impressed, no one in the long history of my garden has been able to call upon their flow here. You're truly something special. Put him down, said Bliss with conviction as more roots broke through the ones going back into the ground. Very well, said Hazer as she gestured towards Ramdelio lazily. But time is precious here. Try not to interrupt this time. Ramdelio fell to the ground at once, though he managed to land on his feet. When Bliss saw that he was safe, the thousands of roots retreated into the ground breaking it in the process. That will take some work to repair, said Hazer, as she looked at the cracked ground. She then turned towards Bliss and moved closer. Ramdelior took a step towards the lady. Do you not learn? said Hazer. You are as stubborn as you've always been, ever since you were born. I will not hurt you or her. I don't believe I could even if I wanted to. I just need to make sure she is the herald of flow. Hazer moved in closer, got on one knee, and extended her right arm. Take my hand, young Bliss, and allow me to help you. Bliss looked at her hand, hesitant, then looked towards Ramdelior. He nodded. Bliss reached out to touch Hazer's hand. As she did so, Hundreds of symbols appeared all around them, forming a sphere above them, illuminating the already well-lit area. Ramdelior recognized some of the symbols. They were representations of flow. There were also many he didn't recognize, though he suspected they were the same as the rest, only ancient. What caught Ramdelior's eye was the large symbol that stood above the rest. It was intricate in design, with many stems and symbols within itself. It glowed violet, just like Bliss's hair, and it had a presence of its own. This is your life stream, said Hazer softly. Every one of these symbols is a part of the flow you control, the flow that's a part of you. Some of it you already know, some you have yet to discover and some you might not want to discover. The larger one above the rest is the indication I was looking for. Your life stream is as old as Flo itself, older even than me. Come, there's much to talk about. Hazer let go of Bliss's hand and stood up as the symbols disappeared. I am relieved you're here. There is hope for this world after all. Darkness will not win. Thank you for coming. I've waited years for this. You are every bit as special as I thought you'd be. You're a keeper, said Bliss softly, as she looked up at Hazer. Your role in all of this is to remember everything, the past of all that exists. Exactly, said Hazer. Ramdelior looked towards Bliss, wondering how she knew who Hazer was. He surely hadn't known. As for you, said Hazer, as she turned towards Ramdelior. He turned towards her, meeting her condescending gaze. You are quite the opposite, Hazer raised her brows. I've been calling out to you for years. Every time you fell asleep I was there, trying to call you here. But no, you didn't bother to listen. You were preoccupied with trying to find your place in the world when all you had to do was live to know where it was. Your place in the world has always been right where you are. But you're stubborn as stubborn can be. Even just a while ago, when I urged you to move forward, you hesitated. You've really tested my patience, 
and I can tell you it is not infinite. To think that such a large roll has fallen on the shoulders of a Nulian like you. You're thick-headed. You wait until the last possible moment to act. You're too weak sometimes. I worry about you. Ramdelio tried not to let Hayes's comments get to him, but he couldn't help it. He knew she meant it. He lowered his head. But I can see the potential within you, said Hazer with a sigh. It is in part why you outlive the six others like you. You were the one chosen by the flow itself to watch over Bliss. Your heart is pure. You're strong for a Nulian, and you aren't a coward. I know that you will do anything in your power to keep Bliss safe. Come, we have much to talk about. She turned around and began walking her sinuous walk towards the rounded hut. And time is precious. Ramdelio and Bliss followed. As they walked, they could see that there was no end to the flowers. Everywhere they looked, apart from the short walkway, there were flowers. Why so many flowers? asked Bliss. Each one of these, said Hazer, as she extended her arms, is a memory. Some have been, and some are yet to be. The coloured flowers contain a memory of an event that has occurred in the world of the living. The ones without colour are flowers that have yet to find a memory of their own. My other half and I take care of all these. We make sure they don't wilt, so the memory is kept alive. Heriliu is somewhere out there in the field, tending to those flowers that need a little love. I will join him later on. Ramdelio and Bliss looked around as they continued walking. Most of the flowers were white. When they looked back towards Hazer, she was not there. They stopped. Where had she gone? Ramdelio hadn't heard a door open or close. Things work differently here, said Hazer from somewhere inside the rounded hut. Even our stream of flow, the one you were pulling from earlier, is different from the one in the world of the living. In this world, you think, and you should become. Think of yourself inside here, and you'll be able to come in. They looked at each other, then at the rounded hut, and in the blink of an eye, they were already inside. Inside the rounded hut, there were more flowers, but they didn't look at all innocent. They were large and dark, with jagged edges. They faintly resembled dragons. The smell inside the hut was also different. While the smell outside was pleasant and relaxing, the smell inside was anything but. It was strong, penetrating, and icy. What are these? asked Bliss as she half covered her nose. Are they still flowers? They are, answered Hazer as she gestured more emphatically than necessary. Though these are a special kind of flower, for within them are memories that have turned the world upside down. The origins of flow are within these flowers. They're the reason I've called you here. Ramdelio began to feel nervous. His heart skipped. It was starting to sound beyond him. Was he really going to find out how flow began, how he came to be, how everything came into existence, just like that? Ramdelio knew just how much of a big deal it was. The world he knew, the world he had existed in for 300 years, was about to reveal its origins to him. Do not fret, said Hazer, as she stared at Ramdelior. You're meant to be here. If you weren't, then you wouldn't be here in the first place. Remember, I have been calling you for years. Hazer then turned towards Bliss. Some of this will be difficult for you to understand. What you don't understand... Simply remember, it will all make sense to you one day. Ramdelio didn't feel scared. No, not at all. What he felt was more a sense of importance. Bliss nodded. In the beginning, there was nothing. Then there was life, said Hazer as she gently touched three of the flowers in the centre of the room. The three large flowers released a fine dust that began to circle and linger in the centre of the room, forming an image of the seven worlds and no worlds. The world was a calm place, continued Hazer. The images from the flower dust continued to change as she told the tale. 
Here, animals and humans lived in harmony, and life was pure. That was soon to change. One ordinary day, with a sound many times louder than thunder, a gate opened slowly, cutting the entire sky in half. Through the gate, a dying entity entered the world. Its enormous power affected every living thing. Plants died, and then they were reborn. Animals and humans fell on the ground, unable to move, because of the relentless and overpowering pressure coming from the entity. The entity only had moments to live. It looked upon the world and decided to give away all its remaining power. For itself, it was already too late. Ramdelior was engrossed in Hazer's tale, and had to remind himself to breathe every so often. By the looks of it, so was Bliss. The entity looked upon the reptiles of the world and turned them into many breeds of dragons. Then it gazed upon the plants and gave some conscious life the ability to speak and think. Then its gaze fixed upon all the flying creatures, and it gave them the ability to fly even higher and longer. Then it turned to the great oceans and made their already beautiful creatures even more beautiful. One by one, new breeds were born. Power flooded the world, creating and expanding many life forms, spreading equality. This is how all Newlians and the ancient ones, such as myself, came to be. Hazer gestured towards Ramdelior and then herself. However, things were much different when it came to humans. Hazer paused and touched a flower behind the three large ones in the front. Much, much different, continued Hazer softly. When the entity looked upon the humans, it was overwhelmed by a feeling it had never felt before. Despair. Humanity had been born with a hole in its heart, a hole that could never be filled, a hole that would call down upon the world the very thing that had killed the entity. With mere seconds to live, it crafted a plan. Its plan was simple. In fairness, it would allow humans to have its power as well, but not all at once. Its power would have to be learned, and that day remembered. What happened that day, the connections that were formed, the stream of power that now flows through the world, is now called flow. After depleting all its power, the entity simply disappeared. The gates behind it closed as if nothing was ever there. Ramdelior and Bliss nodded slowly. There was one last thing, continued Hazer, her tone grim. If the time should come when darkness began to make its way through the hole in humans and into this world, to protect it, the entity left its true essence and power to be given to the first human born without a hole in its heart. That human was you, Bliss. You are that very entity that granted the world its flow. Your presence here brings news to the world that there is hope that we can fight the darkness that is coming. You're the herald of flow. Ramdelior watched as Bliss's shoulders slumped. But do not worry, said Hazer as the dust disappeared. You aren't alone in this. You have Ramdelior, handpicked by the ancients to be your watcher, a being so powerful that within his name lies the promise to scorch the world as the last of his kind. Although it is a bit overdramatic, his name was given to him to spark fear in those who get in his way. It's had mixed results, but he's managed to deal with it quite nicely. But a wary told me my name, said Ramdelio, when I was just a pup. Ah, yes, said Hazer, the ancient wary in the mountains of Ikra. We have been working on the arrival of the Herald of Flow for over five hundred years when we first saw signs of the darkness. There were seven more like you, but you're the last one. The rest were sadly killed in the war. Ramdelior felt a pinch in his heart, knowing that at one point there had been more like him. But now was not the time to dwell on emotions. The war? asked Ramdelior. 
You're not the only ones on the front lines. There is an unspoken war being fought by those who want to do the darkness's bidding and those who want to protect the world. There are more Nulians and humans, Narls, Wearies and Nords on your side than you can even imagine. But there are many more on the side of darkness. Ramdeliel was trying his best to understand, but it seemed as if every word that came out of Hazus' mouth was heavier, denser with consequences. He didn't want to take anything that he was hearing lightly. What can I do? asked Bliss, her voice low. She did not look at all like her normal self. Survive until you've mastered your life stream, said Hazer. Once you have control over it, the darkness that's coming has no chance. Using your life stream still hurts, correct? You have been trying to act tough around Ramdelior, but inside you're in pain. Ramdelior hadn't realized that Bliss had found a way to hide her pain from him. His stomach sank to the floor. He began to remember all the times that Bliss had said she was fine. Don't worry, said Hazer as she looked at Ramdelior. Her pain is manageable, as she's using less and less livestream to do more and more. But that's not the way to control your livestream. She looked towards Bliss. There's only one reason you're in pain, and that is because you lack focus. There are too many things calling upon your livestream at the same time. Focus, and you will conquer it. Chant what you want to happen until you can control it. Bliss nodded. These people and creatures after us, and Gavru, said Ramdelior, his voice somber. What role do they play in all of this, and what is the darkness you speak of? Great question, said Hazer, as she turned to grab a vial of water that was resting on a table nearby. She started to water the large flowers, slowly and delicately. The three you mentioned are misguided, enticed and plain evil, respectively. The one you called Gavril has been heavily misguided. He follows his heart, as wrong as it may be. He is the one you must watch out for. Don't underestimate him. They are part of the darkness's plan to rid the world of its only hope before she can control her life stream. Hazer turned towards Bliss. The only being that can truly oppose the power of the coming entity is another. I don't know much more about the darkness, but I assume that we will find out soon. Ramdelior heard Bliss swallow. Where do we go from here? asked Ramdelior. Seek shelter, Hazer said as she looked at them both. Train, learn. Expand and ready yourselves for the events that are to come. Let those who can help, help you. We are in this together. If we're to see this world survive its ultimate fate, we have to help Bliss. We'll do whatever we can, whatever is in our power to help from here. Ramdelior nodded as a new sense of duty washed over him. From here? asked Bliss. You said a few times, the world of the living. Does that mean this is the world of the dead? Something along those lines, Hazer said, as she stopped watering the plants and made her way to where they had come inside the hut. I like to think of it as the world in between, before the final rest. That reminds me, you must head out now. We've lost precious time. What do you mean? asked Ramdelior. Come. Hazer disappeared from inside the rounded hut. I'll explain as I see you off. They followed, appearing outside the rounded hut, back in the field of flowers. Time fluctuates in this world, unlike the world of the living, said Hazer as she walked hurriedly in her sinuous way to where she had first met them. Time sometimes slows down or speeds up, depending on how many memories we collect from those who have gone their way to the final resting place. Since you've been gone, eight years have passed. Eight years? asked Ramdelio and Bliss simultaneously. You must go now. They nodded. The world will be a much different place once you step out. It has gone mad searching for you. Head to the great deserts of Ikra. Seek the stone grounds. Follow the birds to the oasis. Be careful. What do you mean? 
asked Ramdelio. You'll soon find out, Hazer said. We'll be with you every step of the way. The world around them turned dark. There's one more thing, said Hazer, her voice fading. Chapter 14 Ruler of the Seven Worlds Hardened are those who do not break under the pain of battle, but instead use the pain to keep moving forward. Even those powerful enough to topple rulers need to be reminded what they're fighting for. The bronze guard looked hesitant as Gavril approached him, but to his credit he stood his ground. It wasn't every day that people stood up to Gavril. Soon the rest of the guards began approaching Gavril, thoroughly surrounding him. The guards seemed to increase in number for every step he took. Are you willing to die for your ruler? asked Gavril as he approached. Because if you are, I can arrange that for you. It'll take relatively little effort. Don't underestimate us, animal, said the bronze guard, voice tense, standing to his full height. Secure him! Gavril smirked as the now hundreds of guards took out their shackles and chains. It's going to take a little more than that, said Gavril. We have a great deal more than that, said the bronze guard, as they began throwing the chains towards Gavril. The chains glowed as they accelerated towards him, latching onto him with force. Soon, the entirety of his body was being restrained by chains and shackles. This is new, thought Gavril. A searing pain drenched his body, so excruciating that it would have rendered anyone other than him inert. I haven't seen anything like this before, and it's strong as well. They really took their time making these. They feel as if they were made just for me. Gavril felt as if he could get out of the chains and shackles if he really wanted to, but he also knew where all of this was going. Getting out of such contraptions would also take an exorbitant amount of energy on his part, a lot more than he was willing to waste before seeing the ruler. So he opted to wait. The bronze guard walked up to Gavril as the restraints tightened and took a smoking black dagger from his waist. Gavril knew that the black smoke meant the dagger had been covered in a form of poison hundreds of times over. It was probably as deadly as any weapon got. What were you saying earlier? asked the bronze guard, dagger in hand. Are you willing to die for your ruler? asked Gavril, looking straight into the bronze guard's eyes. Just by looking at his eyes, Gavril knew that the bronze guard had climbed up the ladder based on true merit. In all fairness, he was probably a formidable warrior. But he wasn't someone who could stand in Gavril's way. There was also a sense of arrogance coming from the bronze soldier, and that was something he wasn't fond of. Out of the two of us, said the bronze guard, you are the only one that might die here. I am Chirilas Pyrilas Tyrilas Tyrilas, High Guard and Substitute Executioner of the Ruler of the Seven Worlds. Gavril laughed out loud. What's so funny? asked Chirilus, putting the dagger to Gavril's throat. I've actually heard of you. You're that dragon slayer, aren't you? You've actually managed to slay a dragon. Don't mock me, said Chirilus, as he pressed the dagger into Gavril's neck. I am not mocking you. I'm genuinely curious. Slaying a dragon, any dragon, is a monumental feat. For someone like you. You're lucky the ruler wants you alive. Chirilus pressed the knife ever so slightly harder into Gavril's neck. Otherwise, I'd show you exactly how I did it. Let me ask you this, said Gavril, his gaze fixed on Chirilus. Are you sure that you can cut me? Gavril moved his neck into the dagger's blade, pushing the weapon back. Always make sure your blade can cut your opponent before you threaten him. Gavril took a step forward, pulling with him the hundreds of glowing restraints and at the same time startling Chirilus. Otherwise you'll find yourself in a nasty and quite embarrassing situation. Are you all inept? screamed Chirilus as he put away his dagger as if nothing had happened. Tighten his restraints! They were tight, sir, said one of the guards. 
Then tighten them more, said Chirilas. You're obviously not doing a good job. Gavril smiled. We'll see if you keep that smile of yours in front of the ruler, said Chirilus as he pulled out a vial full of purple liquid. He opened it with one hand and poured a few drops onto the other, then put away the vial and rubbed his hands. He made five hand gestures in the form of a spout, and a large gate opened above them. He isn't as forgiving as I am. Gavril tittered as the gate swallowed them. As the gate disappeared, they were already inside the main hall of the ruler's tower. The hall was heavily decorated with gold. The ruler's seal adorned every other pillar, and even the floor seemed to be made of gold. Hundreds of golden guards lined the walls. But what captured Gavril's attention was the man sitting down at the end of the hall. He too wore golden armour, but his was heavy and covered in spout markings. They weren't just any spout markings like most rulers had. Gavril knew these were powerful. No doubt he was the ruler. The room was filled to the brim with guards, including the ones that were holding on to Gavril, though a path was clear all the way from where the ruler sat to where Gavril stood. In the seven worlds, a guard near the end of the hall announced, his voice loud. The already quiet hall became silent. There is but one ruler that rules them all, continued the guard. A deity among mortals, spout caster of the ancients, the demise of all that is evil, changer of worlds, ruler of rulers, Solomain Bakaranain, the great. Solomain looked lazily towards the guard who had spoken, and the guard took a step back. He then looked towards Gavril with a bit more interest. So, you are the other, said Solomain. I expected more from someone like me. A lot more. What are you, a simpleton peasant? I'd have trouble associating you with anything else above that. Gavril looked at Solomain, but didn't answer. Solomain made a lazy gesture at the bronze guard who was standing next to Gavril. Churilus grabbed some rings from his side satchel and threw them onto his right hand, which began to glow. Without hesitation, he struck Gavril across the face three consecutive times. The hits were powerful, dazing Gavril slightly. You know, said Gavril as he spit out blood, I was planning to let you live, but you're quickly changing my mind. Answer the ruler, shouted the bronze guard as he struck him once more. What I am, or not, said Gavril, as he turned towards Solomain, is none of your business. Chirilus struck Gavril once again. Do that one more time, said Gavril, as he turned to Chirilus. And it will be the last thing you'll ever do. The bronze guard pulled back his hand as if to strike Gavril again, but he was stopped by a lazy gesture from Solomain. Everyone is allowed to speak their mind, I suppose, said Solomain. Whether they live after that would depend entirely on what they say. Gavril smiled at Chirilus and nodded towards Solomain. Looks like he saved you from throwing your life away, said Gavril. Chirilus said nothing as he took a few steps back and turned towards Solomain. So, you've come to my domain asked Solomain, with a bit more effort than before. You have come to anchor the greatest trading crossroads in all the seven worlds to cause trouble, destroy decades of spout and spill trading, and you have tried to insult me, the ruler of the seven worlds, I ask you. How do you think things will turn out for you? Gavril sniggered. Kneel before greatness, said Solomain, with a sweeping gesture as the rest of the world has. Perhaps you will keep your life. Gavril's restraints began to tighten, pushing him down. It didn't matter how much they pulled on his restraints, Gavril was certain they would not make him kneel. Let him do it on his own, said Solomain. Release him. Chirilus shot a look towards Solomain, and they both nodded. 
You heard the ruler, said Tirulus. One by one, the restraints around Gavril began to fall away. Not the brightest of ideas, said Gavril, but I'll take it. I'll be saving some of my life stream. Unlike the rest of the rulers, said Solomon as he stood up from his chair, I don't rely on others to do my bidding. He began walking slowly towards Gavril. I didn't become the ruler of rulers by luck. I clawed my way here, disposed of and slew everyone and everything that got in my way. I've also rewarded those who have made it easier for me. He looked towards Turulus, who nodded. Solomon then looked back at Gavril. I will do everything I can to hold on to the power I have, the wealth I've accumulated, and the promises made to me. I have seen the future, and I have seen what awaits this world when I succeed. Make no mistake, one way or another, I will rid this world of anything that opposes me. Promises made. Could he be talking about what I think he's talking about? Were we promised a different thing? What a way to secure an outcome. Kneel, said Solomon as he neared Gavril. You called this place the great crossroads of trading, said Gavril as he looked down. What's great about the dozen or so beggars near the gates? They rely on the almost non-existent generosity of others to put food in their stomachs. I'm sure sometimes they go days without eating, while you look like you've never missed a meal in your life. Chirilas got agitated, but was quickly swatted away by Solomon. Let him say his last words, said Solomon. And what of those who are selling their bodies, demanded Gavril, who are so often putting their lives on the line to satisfy the lust of those who think they can buy anything, only to be beaten and tortured? thrown away in the streets once they realise what they have done. And what about those old enough to have endured a lifetime in your great trading crossroad, who are treated as if they don't belong, as if they're always in the way? Worst of all is the liberty you have taken to trade, powerful, dangerous, forbidden flow to the highest bidder. I can only imagine how many lives have been lost. Solomon snickered. There's nothing great about you. Or anchor, said Gavril. You're one to question me, said Solomon. I am ruler of rulers. Why make sheep out of my people when they can be lions? There's a reason why anchor has grown the way it has, and it's because of the resilience of its people. They don't need me to hold their hands. If they end up having a miserable life, it's our own fault. The world won't treat them any differently. The strong prey on the weak. That's how life is. I'll ask you once again. Kneel before greatness. Kneel. We both know, said Gavril, as he looked up at Solomon. That's not going to happen. Then this will be your end. That won't happen either. Gavril saw Solomon's hand twitch, and he braced for impact. Solomon struck Gavril with the back of his hand across his face. Even though he braced for it, Gavril wasn't expecting him to have so much power, and he nearly lost his balance. The hit felt as if a wall of bricks had suddenly landed on his face. Kneel, said Solomon, his expression calm. I will end your rule, said Gavril, as he stood up straight and spat a mouthful of blood to the side. Solomon looked bewildered. Thanks for waking me up, said Gavril, as he cracked his neck. I might have needed that. Solomon took another swing at Gavril, but this time he cleanly missed. Gavril grabbed him by the side, launched him onto his shoulder, and swung him across the hall. Gavril followed as Solomon hit one of the thick pillars, engraving himself in the granite stone. Before Solomon could free himself, Gavril barreled into him, causing the pillar to break, falling on top of Solomon. Gavril moved back and waited for the dust to settle. He looked around the room to see if any of the guards would be joining the fight, but the rest of the room had not moved. Gavril then looked towards where he had buried Solomon. A laugh issued from the rubble. Solomon emerged from the cloud of dust 
his armour glowing with the activated spouts. Gavril could feel the spouts' presence in the room. They were pulling on the guard's energy, and they were even trying to pull on his own. They were powerful spouts, and from the way they made him feel, he could tell they weren't good news for him. Aside from the constant pull, there was a constant push, a repelling spout of some kind, and there was also a coldness emanating from Solomain that could only mean a reinforcing spout. Don't tell me that's all you've got, mocked Solomain. There's only one way to find out, said Gavril. They rushed at each other, but Solomain seemed to be reacting much faster than before. His movements were strong and precise. They reached each other in the blink of an eye. As Gavril went in for a hit, Solomain caught his arm. You're mine now, said Solomain, as he tightened his grip on Gavril's hand. Using his free hand and legs, he struck Gavril multiple times across his gut, ribs, chest and neck. Gavril did his best to avoid being struck, but he was at the mercy of the powerful ruler. Solomain struck Gavril repeatedly in the same spot, each time sinking his arm deeper and deeper into Gavril's gut. He then tossed Gavril across the room as if he were a rag. Gavril tried to remain on his feet, but the pain in his stomach had weakened his body. He coughed up blood. Now you know what real pain feels like, said Solomain as he walked over to Gavril. Now you know what not accomplishing anything in life looks like. Now you know who will be responsible for your death. At the mention of pain, Gavril thought of Elioina and how she had been torn away from him. How every day he lived in torment at the thought of what could have been, what should have been. The real definition of pain flooded him. He knew that nothing in all the seven worlds could hurt him as much as not being able to spend another moment with her. Gavril laughed as he rolled onto his back. Solomain stopped. <laughs> this isn't pain, said Gavril as he got back to his feet. This is a mere reminder, an awakening to what pain truly is. This doesn't come close. My death will not be at your hands, I can promise you. Solomain looked taken aback as Gavril spoke and turned to face him once more. You accumulate riches. Gavril rubbed his shoulder, warming it up. You put on armour, cover yourself in spouts, prey on the weak, and then call yourself powerful. It's safe to say you've never looked death in the eyes before. It's safe to say you've never, and I mean never, faced anyone like me before. Gavril dashed towards Solomain, pushing his body to the limits of what he knew it could do. The world came to a standstill as Gavril closed the distance between them. As Gavril neared, Solomain tried to activate a spout, but Gavril was too fast, too determined. He grabbed Solomain by his neck and slammed him into the floor. The impact sent pieces of gold and rubble flying all over the main hall. But Gavril didn't stop there. He picked Solomain up again and slammed him harder than before, rupturing the hall's floor. I won't suffer you to live, said Gavril as he got ready to deliver a final blow. Harden! Gavril's fist lit up and a circular symbol formed in front of it. Menanast Acantorus Mundos! Harden Menanast Acantorus Mundos was one of hundreds of spouts Gavril had at his command. It meant Harden, piercer of worlds, and it could pierce through anything, including spouts. As Gavril uttered the spout, Solomain's eyes widened in what looked like recognition. He tried to move, to shake Gavril off but he wasn't going anywhere. The hole Gavril had placed him in was just wide enough to trap him. Gavril struck Solomain square in the chest, releasing a burst of pent-up energy that sent them flying towards opposite ends of the hall. The explosion was caused by the thousands of spouts that were active on Solomain's armour, Gavril was sure. At this point, most of the guards had fled from the main hall. Only a few of them remained, from what Gavril could see as the cloud of debris cleared. How dare you! screamed Solomain from the opposite side of the room. His figure glowed through the settling smoke. How dare you! I am ruler of rulers! You are my ruler, said Gavril as he took a few steps forward. But then he stopped. 
Gavril saw something he was hoping he wouldn't see. He shook the hardening spout off his hand and let out a sigh. As pieces of Solomain's shattered armour fell to the ground, Gavril saw that his body was covered in spouts as well. This is going to be a lot more difficult than I thought. If he's made from the same stuff I am, I'm going to need to take a different approach. I can't take things lightly with him. One false move on my part could be all he needs. The only thing I have to my advantage right now is speed. He moves a lot slower with that heavy armour and all those spouts. Gavril took a deep breath, trying to centre himself. And then it came to him. The dagger. You're nothing! yelled the ruler as he took a step towards Gavril. Gathering his strength, Gavril rushed towards Turulus and went straight for the dagger at his waist. Turulus tried to get out of the way, but Gavril was just too fast, too resolute. The spout-poisoned dagger was his, and he would brook no opposition. You idiot! yelled Solomain. Not sure who you're referring to, said Gavril, as he appeared within an arm's length of Solomain. It's going to take a lot more than a dagger to get through. Gavril darted towards Solomain, grabbing him with one hand and holding the dagger to his collarbone with the other. Spouts prevented the dagger from fully piercing Solomain's skin, pushing the dagger back as Gavril attempted to drive it in. Dark smoke formed at the tip of the dagger as spouts collided. Their struggle began to make their surroundings quake. Master! yelled Turulus as he neared. Stay out of this! managed Solomain. I must not! said Turulus, grabbing another guard's blade. He walked up to Gavril and took a swing at him. Gavril felt the blade cut his back from end to end. But again, it didn't even come close to what real pain felt like. He ignored the attack as he focused on piercing Solomain's spouts, even as the winded Chirilus prepared to swing once again from the opposite direction. Impossible, said Solomain, as his spouts began to crack. What are you? How are you different from me? Why? I guess you'll never find out, said Gavril, as the tip of the blade made it through the layers of spouts, piercing Solomain. I will not let this happen, yelled Solomain, and then disappeared. Gavril fell halfway to the floor and almost pierced himself as the dagger no longer had anything to press on. Solomain had disappeared. He looked around the room for any sign of Solomain, but there was nothing. Moments later, he felt a slash along his back. If you want to die that badly, said Gavril as he stood up fully and turned around slowly. I can really help you. Long live the ruler of the seven worlds, said the bronze guard. I am not afraid of you. I admire your bravery. Gavril put away the dagger, even if it's misplaced. There's no chance of you winning. You know that well. And yet here you are. The only thing that's missing is the why. You've just seen with your own eyes that your ruler is not loyal to you. And you continue to serve him? You know nothing about me. I can still kill you. I'm not sure how you're planning to make that happen. Gavril took a step forward. I'm curious. Jurilus took a step back and punched his belt, breaking something and activating some sort of spout that made his body glow slightly. Normally spouts that made the body glow enhanced the physical attributes of the person using them. It was nothing special, or at least nothing that could actually take down Gavril. That's how you're planning to kill me? Gavril shook his head. You're going to have to do better than that. A lot better. Chirillus looked at the rest of the guards in the room, and they closed in, surrounding Gavril. Each guard punched their belt, activating the same body enhancement spout, although their glow was much less noticeable. Sound the horns! yelled the bronze guard. Horns sounded outside the hall. Gavril could hear a large commotion, and he knew that soon the hall would be flooded with eager but foolish guards. He didn't want to cause so much bloodshed. He had done more than enough over the years. I'll tell you what, said Gavril, as he took another step forward. Tell me where your ruler went, and I'll forgive you for this. Gavril gestured towards his back. I'll let you and everyone in this room live. You'll never find out, 
said the bronze guard, tightening his grip on his blade. Why do you insist on protecting him? asked Gavril, frustrated, raising his hands slightly by his sides. Unless you have something to lose as well, unless part of what's out there in the streets of Anchor is your doing, you're the ruler's most loyal servant, and you're loyal because it's convenient to you. You're just as greedy as he is. After all, what business does a dragon slayer have being a lowly guard, even if he's the highest ranking guard of a corrupt ruler? It all makes sense now. Did you know that? Gavril looked at the rest of the guards. Did the rest of you know that while you're barely getting by, he's making coin out of the misery of others? The guards all looked at Chirilus. Shut up! Chirilus stood his ground, although he was beginning to sweat. I'll do what I have to do. What happens in Anchor should not matter to you. But it does. And now I won't have to feel bad when I kill you, said Gavril, as he made a fist with his right hand. Harden! The circular symbol appeared, glowing in front of Gavril's fist, though this one was much less intricate than the one he had used on Solomane. He didn't see a need to complete his piercing spout. A fraction of its power would do against Chirilus. In one swift motion, Gavril swung at Chirilus, hitting him square in the chest, pulverizing him where he stood. Even his blade shattered into a million pieces, and those pieces shattered a million times more until there was only dust. It's all connected, murmured Gavril as the guards around him dropped their weapons one by one. M -m monsters stuttered one of the guards. It may have been that he had never witnessed that kind of power, even though their own ruler had just as much of it as Gavril. The guards turned around and ran towards the exits, yelling unintelligible words along the way. Gavril sighed. There was a slight puffing noise behind him. He didn't bother to look who it was. He already knew. Again, said Gavril, you're a little late. I could have used your help. That ruler. He's powerful. The spout he had inscribed in his armour and body is one of the most powerful I've seen. It was able to stop me. I failed. That's quite a wound you have on your back, said Epiphus as he floated nearby. Should I attempt to heal it? It's fine. I can feel my body healing itself. I'm afraid that if I don't intervene, it will calloid. I'm not afraid of a little scar. Gavril noticed Ipiphus didn't have the flask he had used to get rid of all the potions back in the alley. And what of the flask? Those wounds don't fit my definition of little. The flask is in a safe location. I buried it beneath the ground, far from here. About his spouts, I need to get through them. And you would have. Ipiphus examined the area where the battle had happened as he moved in front of Gavril. It looks like they were barely holding on. Another hit would have cracked them. And underneath those spouts, there's another one of me. It's going to be a tough battle. The one who prevails is the one with the greatest will. Gavril sneered. We have to leave here before there are any more casualties, said Gavril as he looked around, attempting to hear what was going on outside the walls. Most of the guards are unsure what to do now that their ruler and second-in-command aren't here. I doubt they will take it upon themselves to come inside and try to apprehend you. They are not insane. Gavril smiled as he started walking slowly towards one of the larger doors. Can you track him? asked Gavril. I've been trying, said Epiphus, as he matched Gavril's pace, floating next to him. Wherever he is, it's not within the Seven Worlds or No Worlds. He is well hidden. Gavril sighed. And this place, what of it? We've left it without a ruler. I doubt he'll be coming back knowing that he still has a mark on him. Surely someone is already poised to take the ruler's place. A seer? Asked Gavril as he stopped and looked up slightly to where he thought the seer would be arriving. Ipiphus also looked up. Moments later, a seer came flying into the hall and landed hurriedly on Ipiphus's shoulder. The seer leaned into Ipiphus's ear and whispered, Gavril didn't understand what the seer was saying, but from Ipiphus's facial expressions, he knew it wouldn't be good. Gavril said nothing. We have a problem, said Ipiphus. A big problem. 
Go on. It looks like the child and its watcher have disappeared completely. The hunters and our monster have lost their trace. Even our great pond has no idea where they've gone. There's no more disruption in the flow. Gavril's body became awash with feelings as the words left Ipophus's mouth. His breathing intensified, his heart pounded and his muscles tightened. His dream of perhaps seeing Elioina once again was slipping out of his reach and there was nothing he could do about it. He felt the control he had over his power slowly fading away. Like how this ruler disappeared? asked Gavril. Not at all. While we don't know where this ruler is hiding, I can feel him hiding somewhere not too far away. But the child and its watcher, their story is much different. Even though I couldn't locate the child, I used to feel her influence on the stream of flow. It was vast, something that was always there. Now there's nothing. It's as if they have disappeared from this world completely. Gavril said nothing as he took a deep breath, attempting to control his feelings. What are your orders? Gavril said nothing. Your orders? asked Epiphus, as he called the seer to his hand. They will not hide from us, said Gavril with conviction. You and I will head back to Noheart. Recall the twins, our monster and our legion. There's no sense in looking for something that can't be found. We will regroup, we will expand, then we will spread. We will wage war if we have to. But she will not hide from us. He will not hide her from us. And what of this ruler and the other like you? They'd be wise to get out of my way, said Gavril, as he felt something inside him begin to break. Pity them if they appear within my reach. Next time, I won't be as forgiving. Chapter 15 Burden Hardened are those that thrive even in defeat, for they know that their time will come. The time when they will make a difference in the world is inevitable. Gavril had never considered himself a savior, a hero, or even someone who could make a difference in the world. He'd known he was an honest man, a kind man, someone who'd be willing to help, but that was all. Prior to that fateful night, the night when Elioina was taken from him, he had only aspired to be the Lord of Kari. That was all. There was no grandiose aspiration in him, no greed or hunger for power. And yet here he was, one of the few who could really make a difference in the seven worlds and no worlds. There were moments when he doubted himself. He doubted the whole scheme of things. How could a child be of such importance? How could a child make such a difference? And why must she die by his hand? But soon after came the faint whispers inside his head. You'll never see her again if you don't do what is asked of you, said the whispers. The child is not a force of good. The child is a force of all that is bad in this world. Only you can make a difference. You must not fail. He carried a burden too noble for anyone less than a deity. It was the middle of the night as he made his way out of anchor. He had expected to see more people in the streets, but it was quiet. He could see that some people were hiding. But what were they hiding from? Their ruler was no more, so they had little to fear. Surely he wouldn't be stupid enough to try and make his way back to anchor, would he? Do you think the galleon already made its way to the mountain? Asked Gavril, as he continued walking at an unhurried pace. It's more than likely, said Ipophus. They are fast creatures. Gavril grunted, but he did not hurry his pace. I'm starting to regret my earlier decision, said Gavril. But it's all right. I could use a walk. You aren't yourself tonight, said Ipophus. Did the battle with the ruler shake you up that much? Not just the battle, but also this thing inside me, this power. It's getting harder to control. It wants more of me. No, it demands more of me. Epiphus said nothing as he looked at Gavril. Not to worry, said Gavril, as he half turned to Epiphus. 
It's under control for now. May I offer a suggestion? Of course. If anyone can offer a suggestion, it's you. Find your own weakness before someone else finds it for you. Only through its weakness will you be able to fully grasp what you're dealing with. Be as relentless with it as you are with your enemies. If at all possible, take absolute control of that power. The day will come when you need every last bit of it and more. You really think so? You really think I'll need more? Without a doubt. I think I needed to hear that, Epiphus. I really did. They walked in silence for some time, progressing far into the dunes. But they were still quite a distance from the mountains where Gavril would be able to find the galleon. They spotted a flash in the far distance to the right of the mountains. It was massive, and for a second or two it formed a perfect half-sphere just above the horizon. Is that what I think it is? asked Gavril as he continued walking. Flow. Powerful flow. This might be our doing. What do you mean? The flask. Oh, don't tell me, said Gavril. Yes, it appears to be so, said Epiphus, as he closed his eyes and stopped floating next to Gavril. Gavril stopped walking as well, but turned back towards where they had seen the flash of light. Yes, I'm sure of it now, said Epiphus, as he opened his eyes. It looks like someone found it. How can that be? I used a spout to bury it deep underground. How could anyone find it? That's a question we'll have to answer later. For now, how far is it? And how fast can we get there? I skipped there. Ippophus shook his head. It's pretty far away. I used most of my skipping powers to get there. Can you skip us there? I'm not sure. I've never tried skipping anything other than myself. Ippophus, we need to get there, and we need to get there now. I'm sorry, but I'm just not sure. Can you try? That I can do. Although my life stream will be entirely depleted after we skip, I will be useless for quite some time. Don't worry. I won't let anything happen to you. Gavril felt Ippophus' life stream latch onto him like a gentle but strong rope. This might feel a little strange said Ippophus, as a misty white smoke began surrounding them. Gavril nodded, and then puffed into Ippophus's inner world. Gavril felt his body disappear for an instant. He was neither conscious nor awake, although he felt like he was moving a great distance, if only because he was still able to think and feel his place in the world. They puffed back into existence on the other side of the dunes near a forest. Gavril's head was spinning, and he was on the edge of hurling. You weren't kidding, said Gavril, as he tried to shake off the feeling. I'm sorry, said Ippophus, as his short feet touched the ground. Gavril wasn't used to seeing him stand. He was always floating about. Had the skip affected him that much? How far away is it? asked Gavril. It's still quite a way in that direction, Ippophus gestured towards the forest. But with your speed, you'll be there in a short time. You mean we? I don't want to slow you down. You don't have to, said Gavril, as he moved towards Ippophus, picked him up, and hoisted him onto his back. Hold on, old friend. This might be a bumpy ride. Gavril ran deep into the forest with Ippophus on his back. It didn't take long for them to find what they were looking for. Gavril slowed as he approached a group of twenty Nulians and humans. Five others lay unmoving on the ground obviously dead. Were they the ones who had set off the flash earlier? The group had made a large hole in the ground, and they were carrying stuff away from the hole in sacks. It was clear they had found the flask, but why didn't they just take the flask and run with it? It looks like they've only figured out how to open it, said Ippophus, his voice low. Who goes there? said one of the five Nulian hogs. Nulian hogs were rather distasteful creatures in the eyes of many, often thieving, thugging, and bullying their way through life. They were large, and they were dangerous. Gavril knew he would have to be cautious. After all, they did have a large amount of spouts and potions at their disposal that could be used against him. That's if they knew how to use them. You stay there, said Gavril in a low voice as he lowered Ippophus to the ground. 
rest, and stay out of trouble. You've done enough, old friend. I believe the stronger spouts and spills are still inside the flask, though I'm not certain. My life stream is nearly depleted. Gavril nodded, then stood and faced the group and began walking towards them. Hold it right there, one of the hogs said as he drew his spiked club. Three more of the hogs followed as the rest of the group continued going in and out of the hole. This is my property, said Gavril as he kept walking towards them. I'd like to take it back. Funny, I don't see your name on it, said the hog as he sniffed at Gavril. If I were you, I'd run the other way. That's if you appreciate your life. I don't usually put my name on things. What are you? asked the hog, hesitating for the first time. Last chance, said Gavril, as he continued walking. I'm usually not this nice. Leave now. Not a chance, scrawny man, the hog gestured towards his group. There's a whole lot of us, and only one of you. Good, they haven't noticed Ipithus. That makes things a lot easier. Dealing with thugs, with mercenaries, with those who used their power to stand above the rest of the world was the easiest part of what Gavril went through. Compared to the pressure he felt on his shoulders to save the Seven Worlds, a skirmish was laughable. Gavril smiled as he dashed towards the hogs. Although they were strong and powerful Nulians, the hogs were rather slow and uncoordinated. To Gavril, it felt like they were moving in slow motion. Before the first hog was able to swing his spiked club, Gavril ran up to him and removed the club by slapping it out of his hand, then punched him in the gut. While the other two approached, Gavril jumped on top of the hog, kicking him in the back of his head and hurling him to the ground. While he was in the air, he made a barrier wall behind him between the nearby trees and pushed himself off it and into the two hogs. He managed to grab both hogs, one in each hand, and slam them together before flinging them into the ground. Gavril stood up at once, dusted off his trousers and shoulders, and glared at the astonished group. Who's next? asked Gavril as he stepped over the hogs and walked towards the group. One of the humans in the group tossed a spill at Gavril. He caught it easily, but moments later it exploded into a fiery tornado. The searing hot wind and fire sent him flying into the sky. He felt his clothes and skin burn as the flames got closer and closer to him. Encasement, said Gavril, forming a cross with his hands near his chest. A blue crystalline form of energy with several markings appeared all around him, separating him from the heat of the flames. Although he couldn't feel the fire any more, he felt its power through the amount of flow the shield was pulling. It was powerful all right, powerful enough to destroy a small village. As the flames ran out, Gavril pulled back the shield and landed back near the group of scavengers, parts of his clothes still smoking. Impossible! yelled one of the remaining hogs. We saw you being taken by the fire, said one of the humans. That's not the only thing you'll see and not believe, said Gavril as he dusted himself off. I suggest you don't try that again if you want to live. If you prefer to die, of course, I'd be happy to oblige. What are you? asked the same hog as before, already taking a step back. Gavril said nothing and began walking towards the group. For every step he took, the group took a step back. He smiled. So, where were we? asked Gavril. And what else have you stolen from me? You, you're... One of the humans stuttered as he let go of a sack he was holding. You mean these are yours? Why else would I be here? asked Gavril, feeling himself half smile. The group collectively dropped the sacks of potions and ran. Please forgive us, yelled one of the humans as he ran away. Please forgive us, forgive us. Gavril shook his head as he reached one of the sacks and opened it with his boot. The powerful flow flask sat inside, motionless, useless. What to do with this? murmured Gavril. That fool Solomane didn't know what he had. He was too arrogant to think that his own strength would ever be challenged. Moments later, Ipiphus came out from behind a tree, walking instead of his usual puffing about. 
Perhaps you may want to keep it, suggested Ipophus. What makes you say that? We tried burying it, and that didn't work. I doubt we could bury it deep enough that no one could find it. Gavril glanced at the hole in the ground. By his calculations, it was three times his own body length. I don't know. I think we can do better than that, said Gavril, as he crouched in front of the sack, his hands resting on his knees. But there's no point. Burying things doesn't work. Even if we go deeper, all they have to do is dig a little more. Perhaps it might be of use to you. Gavril half turned towards Ipophus. It is powerful flow, after all, and to get rid of it the hard way would mean unleashing it all on the world regardless. Maybe it would be best to use it in a controlled manner. Think about it. You'd be able to create almost anything that comes to mind, with a little of my help. Smoke out the child and its watcher from wherever they're hiding. Do you think it would come down to that? asked Gavril. As much as it pains me to say this, I believe it will take everything we have. It will no doubt cause pain and suffering. Much more than what we've already caused. Much, much more. A necessary pain. Sometimes suffering is necessary. Without suffering, we couldn't appreciate the good things. Gavril coughed as he got up. How can I do that to the world, Ipophus? I'm not the bad person in all of this. I'd become something much worse than the ruler of Anchor. I'd be a tyrant at best. You said yourself that it would be best if no one got in your way, said Ipophus as he tried to float but failed. You were already determined not to let anyone stop you. The villagers, the people of the Seven Worlds, they aren't just anyone. They're the one thing I'm trying to save. Sometimes I wonder if it's really worth it. You won't see her again, whispered the faint voice in Gavril's head. This world will be no more if you keep thinking it's not worth it. Don't you understand what's at stake here? Didn't you see the future that awaits the world? Rulers hold on to their power because they're feared by the people. A well-liked villager has never come to power. They're well-liked because people and Nulians consider them equals. How can someone like that rule? With their first order, they'll seem weak instead of powerful, and they'll begin to be hated instead of revered. Gavril's shoulders grew heavier. He hated the idea, but he knew that his walls were closing in. Gavril shook his head. You know that what I speak of is true. If you want to extend your reach, you must force it. People need to fear something. People need to know someone powerful beyond their wildest dreams is in control. They need to know about you. The Seven Worlds needs to know about you. Know about the tyrant Gavril Darkenforth, Archer of Night, the Forsaken One, the Inhuman. Ipophus nodded slowly as he began to float once again. I wonder if Elioina would approve of what I'm becoming, muttered Gavril as he looked down better said, of what I've become. She would approve of you saving the world. Gavril looked at Ipophus. Let them fear you. Rule with a soft hand over the people. You would do better than most rulers. I can't argue with that last bit. The people will turn them in. They have no choice but to do so. You'd give them no choice. Gavril said nothing. He knew what was being asked of him. He would have to surrender, let go, forget the last bit of humanity he had left. A necessary sacrifice? You're the new ruler of the Seven Worlds, said Epiphus as he kneeled in front of Gavril. The ruler of rulers. Accept your place in the world, for it is the only way. Control your power, if you truly believe you're this world's best chance of survival. On one condition said Gavril, as he picked Ipophus up by the shoulders. You, my friend, kneel to no one. Chapter 16 Time It was their greatest setback. We took the little time they did not have in order to give them the tools they needed to succeed. 
The question we faced was a simple one. Would they be ready when the time comes? Bliss's head was pounding when she awoke. They had emerged from the place that wasn't a place at around the same time at night they had gone in, but things were much, much different. More so for Bliss than for Ram. Aside from the throbbing headache and feeling like she had just woken up from a long sleep, Bliss's cloak no longer fit her at all. And there's one more thing, Heza had said, her voice trailing off. Time. How much time has passed? Why was everything a blur? We weren't in there for that long. At least, it didn't seem long, but even if it had been a long time... Bliss looked at her hands and noticed how much shorter her cloak was. The edge of her cloak was a full hand's length away from the edge of her palm. Her toes had ripped open her boots, and the hem of her trousers was just below her knees. Humans don't grow this fast, do they? And these feelings, these memories, what are they? A slew of memories and past thoughts flooded Bliss's mind. Things that she had never physically done, yet they were so real, so vivid that she felt like she had done them all the same. Entire nights, wandering the world with Ram, meals, meeting new people, and creatures across the seven worlds. It all seemed so real, but it wasn't. What's happening? asked Bliss as she turned towards Ram. Did you hear the rest of what Heza used to say? He was still shaking his head slowly and blinking rapidly. I'm not entirely sure, said Ram, touching his head with one of his paws. I'm not sure about the last bit, at least. It was so long ago that she last spoke to us, wasn't it? Years and years ago. I feel like we've lived so many years all at once. I think so, said Bliss, still confused. This is so strange. Did we just skip time without the skipping part? If I remember correctly, she said that time works differently in the world of the living. For every moment spent in her world, five or six moments would pass in the world of the living. What does that even mean? asked Bliss with frustration. It could mean anything, right? How can you define a moment? Ram looked at Bliss, cocking his head to one side, then the other, as if he was trying to figure something out. If these memories mark time, said Ram, as he sat down. Eight years have passed. Eight years? Bliss's mouth hung open. How can eight years have passed? We weren't in that place for very long. No wonder something was off, said Ram. When we first got to this place some eight years ago, I had a feeling that I was missing something, that something was wrong. This was that something. I should have seen it earlier. So, how old am I now? Asked Bliss, her eyes beginning to water. You're close to fourteen years old, give or take a few months. It's hard to tell right now, everything is so fuzzy. We ought to get going. Ram looked around. I'm starting to get the feeling we're being watched. Fourteen years? Bliss could hardly believe it, but she knew Ram was right. If there was one thing Bliss knew about him, it was that he didn't speak without being sure of something. Even when he doubted himself, he almost always turned out to be right. She also felt as if many years had passed, although Bliss wasn't entirely sure what eight years would feel like. Then, Bliss's mind jumped to a more pressing and immediate matter. Figuring out exactly how much time had passed could wait. What am I supposed to do with this? asked Bliss, as she raised her hand, showing Ram that her cloak only reached her elbows. Fix it said Ram, as he got up and walked towards Bliss. Get creative, we have time. For now, let's go. Ram waved his tail, gesturing for Bliss to get on. Something tells me we have a long day ahead of us. Bliss hopped onto Ram's back, as she always did, and even though she was bigger than before, she still felt small compared to Ram. She felt smaller still when he broke into a sprint, leaving this part of the world behind. Where are we heading now? asked Bliss. Heza said to seek the stone grounds. I figure we start there. 
I have heard of such a place, near the western border of Ikra, though I'm not sure whether the inhabitants are friends or foe. If you aren't sure, why are we going? It's the only way to find out. I guess you're right, murmured Bliss. Besides, don't you want to see new places? Asked Ram, as he half turned his head, smiling. Bliss was surprised. She had been longing to see and experience other parts of the world, though it was so far from the surface of her emotions that she had never bothered bringing it up. Yet, Ram somehow knew this. Was it because he wanted the same thing for himself? Just coincidence? Or did he know her that well? Whatever it was, she decided to let the thoughts go and focus on more pressing matters. So, what is this made of? asked Bliss, as she pulled on a thread from her ripped cloak sleeve. Now you're thinking. It's made from cotton, and other materials, but mainly cotton. Remember that fluffy flower that grew in the fields where we used to live? That's cotton. So, if I had those flowers, I could remake my cloak? It's not that easy, but yes. I think I can walk you through it. Though there might not be any cotton flowers anywhere near here. We can also stop by a village and buy another one, can't we? We don't have any coins. Bliss had dealt with the concept of coin exchange only twice in her life. She had almost forgotten that in order to get something, you must give something in return. But then, she thought about it some more. They did have some coins, or rather, a coin. The small copper coin Ram had given her had to be in one of her pockets. She searched her cloak and found the copper coin with little effort. She pulled it out. We have a coin, said Bliss, as she held out the coin on the palm of her hand. Ram turned slightly, then shook his head. What? asked Bliss. Isn't that a coin? It is, but it's not nearly enough to buy you a new cloak, especially since you're almost doubled in size. If I were to guess, an ordinary cloak for someone your size would cost a small gold coin or two silvers. If you want to buy it using copper only, then I think four or five of those would do the trick. Bliss looked at the small copper coin and put it back in her pocket. How do you get coins? asked Bliss. Can we get some more? You get coins the same way merchants got our little coins. It would take a full day's work to get coins, and it could take longer still if the nearby village isn't big. Bliss sighed. She knew that whatever it may be, time was something they did not have. So, back to the first option then? asked Ram. Yeah, I think it's best, said Bliss, resigned. So, are there cotton flowers around here? Not that I know of, and by the looks of it, we won't be reaching a cotton field in quite some time. So, what are we going to do? I'll teach you how to find them. You can do that? Is there anything you can't do? There are many things I can't do. For example, I can't fly. I'm also lousy at trying to control water. And spill recipes are not my thing. But among the things I can do, finding things is one of them. It's how I found my way to the Passox, remember those? Are you talking about the door that was near our home? The one we passed by a few times? Yeah, I remember them. And the stories you told me about them. Good, so you do have a brain. Hey. They both chuckled. On to your lesson, then, said Bram in a more serious tone. All right, said Bliss, sounding apprehensive. Don't worry, this is not as complicated as learning a spout. I'm sure you'll be able to do it with just a little practice. I'll do my best. All life and all things are connected through the stream of life, and that in itself is connected to the flow. They're intertwined from beginning to end. You can immerse yourself in the stream of flow, right? I think so. When you do that, you can see what is connected, and when you start moving it, that is Atsu, remember? When you use life stream, you're pulling force from the flow. And in response, it pulls from you. Much, much less, but it still pulls. There lies the connection. Bliss nodded. Close your eyes. Immerse yourself in the river. Feel the atsu. And start looking for that one thing you need. Bliss did as Ram told her. But there was nothing. She could feel she was fully surrounded by flow. And she did feel that at any given moment, 
She could pull it all from the stream. But what she didn't feel was other life. Don't lose your patience, said Ram, as if somehow he knew she was about to give up. It takes some practice the first time around. Bliss tried to look around while she was submerged in the stream, but there was nothing else, only her and the flow. There's nothing, said Bliss with frustration, opening her eyes. That's exactly where you have to look. What is that supposed to mean? Close your eyes and try it. Try looking where there is nothing. Look deeper. Seek out life instead of flow. Bliss closed her eyes and once again submerged herself in the flow. She concentrated harder and tried to do as Ram said. And this time, there was something. It was fuzzy, shapeless, but it was something. Hey, I see something, said Bliss, her eyes closed but her face lit up with excitement. Omen, said Ram, voice soft. Seek it out. Ask for it to be revealed to you. It... it looks like the place where we used to eat. Now, don't let it go. Somewhere near there is the field of cloud plants. Bliss saw her vision of the field fading. Her mind was wandering away. There was so much to see in the stream of life that it was hard not to look in a different direction. She shook off her curiosity and tried to focus, though she found it harder this time around. Take your time, said Ram, his voice soothing. Breathe. Relax. Know that what you're looking for will always be there. Bliss followed Ram's instructions, and the things around her became clearer. She was able to move about with ease inside the stream of life. I see it, yelled Bliss. I see the cloud flowers. Now pull a good chunk of them towards us. Pull? How do I pull these flowers towards us? The same way I make things move? That's as good a guess as any. It should work. No, not should. It feels like it's going to work. But I wonder just how many of these little clouds I'll need. Bliss drew a line with her mind around a large portion of cloud flowers. Then she pulled mentally towards them. A violet portal appeared above the line Bliss had drawn, enveloping the flowers all at once. Moments later, the portal disappeared along with the flowers. Is that it? Where will the flowers go now? Will they come here? Bliss thought, as she looked around while still inside the life stream. I think you might have overdone it, said Ram as they slowed down. Bliss opened her eyes and saw a mound of cloud flowers accumulating not too far away from them. The flowers kept on pouring from the violet portal without slowing. Correction, said Ram. I am sure you've overdone it. Bliss felt her face get warm. She wasn't sure if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Ram chuckled, and Bliss sighed in relief. I have to say, said Ram, I'm thoroughly impressed. Okay, so what do I do now? Separate the cloud part from the stem. Clear all the sticks and burrs. Remove the moisture. Then, when you end up with just the cloud part, weave it together. Easy enough, right? Uh, right, said Bliss, her tone doubtful. Don't worry too much about it, said Ram as they stopped near the tree line that led into the forest. I believe you can do it. Otherwise, I wouldn't have suggested it in the first place. This looks like a nice place to rest for a while anyways. Ram sniffed the ground, moving in circles. It might be a while before we can get going again. This is far enough away from where we were, that we can almost call it a new place. Take your time, but at the same time hurry up. I want to get to the Passock early tomorrow morning. Rest? Bliss asked as she got down from Ram. You mean you're actually tired? Am I heavier or something? The answer to all three of those questions is not at all. Ram smiled as he lay on his belly. But sometimes you have to take a break. Besides, my head is still a little fuzzy from earlier. Bliss nodded and got to work right away on her cloak. Her first attempts at making a cloak were pathetic at best. That's if she was using the word correctly. With all due respect to Ram's teachings, the amendments to her cloak were hideous. They were either too thick, too thin, or they simply fell apart. 
Too large and too small were common errors as well. Although Bliss kept failing, each attempt was getting her closer to her goal, and her enthusiasm never left her. Occasionally, she would hear Ram laughing from the tree line. Stop laughing, <laughs> said Bliss, although she laughed along with him. I can't help it. That last patch made my eyes hurt. It took me a while to try and figure out what it was. At one point, it was looking like it was alive. Just tell me what I'm doing wrong, said Bliss, as she stomped her foot once. Well, you can't make something appear and fit you perfectly if you don't know your measurements, said Ram, a bit more seriously. Also, weaving the clouds together tighter might help. Measurements? Bliss asked, with a blank expression. Ram Delier cocked his head. Oh, that's right, he said, as his long tail began to sway back and forth. You know nothing about measurements. Bliss frowned and nodded slowly. Ram got up from under the tree and began explaining it all to her. He took his time and taught her everything he knew about taking or guessing measurements. The conversation lasted for quite some time. The sun was already rising, and all the while Bliss listened intently. Once Ram finished, he went back to rest under the tree and Bliss tried again. With each try, she got closer to making the perfect alterations. At one point, she was so close that even she was having trouble telling the difference. Done! crowed Bliss, when her last five reiterations got her as close as she would ever get to the original cloak. Done, done, done! <sighs> I did it! New turn shoes and all! Nice work! You even made it the same color as the one you had before, though a little lighter. I figured I could just borrow some of the color from the original. Looks good, said Ram as he approached Bliss. Except for that spot right there. Ram pointed at one of the sleeves using his tail. Yeah, that doesn't look too good. Bliss looked at her sleeves frantically, trying to inspect them from every angle. Ram chuckled. Ram, complained Bliss. You aren't serious, are you? No, not at all, Ram said with a smile. Not funny. It took me so long to make this. Come on, let's get going, Ram waved at Bliss with his tail. Time to leave this pile of cloud behind. Wait, said Bliss, as she checked her pocket where she kept the copper coin. I'd better make sure I have it. Bliss pulled out the coin, showing it to Ram. I think I must have redone my entire cloak in the process, and I don't want to lose this. Ram nodded. Bliss placed the coin back in her pocket and got onto Ram's back. He took off, running in the same direction as before. How hungry are you? asked Ram. It's strange, but I'm not hungry at all. Well, at least not yet. I feel like I could get there later on. Same, if you get hungry, let me know. Maybe we can look for a good place to stop and eat. All right. As Ramdelia ran, Bliss looked at her cloak and the addition she had done, and she wondered if other flow users could do the same. Ram? Yes? I have a question. I'm all ears. Earlier, when I was making my new cloak, I felt many kinds of atsu that I could have pulled from the stream. I felt like everything was available to me. Is it the same for all flow users? Can they also make cloaks? No, flow is different for every user. I want to know more. Ram turned his head slightly towards Bliss, then turned back to the front. Very well, said Ram. I think you're old enough now to understand what you didn't before. Pay close attention. I will. There are four forms of flow users in the seven worlds that we know of. Ram corrected his course slightly. The first is the Nulian, a being different from a human. Nulians are born of the flow and can use the flow. A Nulian's life stream can vary in potency and ability. Usually, a Nulian's inherent or latent life stream focuses on one aspect of flow. That is what I and most creatures can speak are. I find it easy to use life stream, and easier still to use fire spouts, and learn new spouts and refine them. Other Nulians might find it easier or more difficult. And, though Nulians are born from the flow, we have little connection to Atsu. Bliss listened intently. Then, there are the Nollies, born with latent life stream, their own way of connecting to the flow. 
they usually learn how to use Lifestream on their own, in their own way, often creating spouts of their own and documenting the process. Unlike Nullians, they are not limited to one aspect of flow. They can use most kinds of flow, though they have limits. They have a deep connection with Atsu and can access it with ease. The lower tier Nollies we call casters, though some casters are extremely powerful. You keep using the word latent. What does that mean? Latent means something is there, but hasn't fully formed yet. All right, that's what I thought. Keep going. Then, there are the Nawets and Wearies. They can use Lifestream, but have a hard time making their own spouts and spills, unless it's what they do, in many cases dedicating their lives to the craft. Nawet is a term for flow users, who learn to use flow and cast spouts in a studious fashion, with rules and limits. They pass down books of spouts and spills to keep their legacy going. They are often trained as warriors and have many skills tied to their name. But the main difference between Nollies and Nawets is that Nawets have no access to Atsu. I have yet to meet those two, right? Meet, perhaps, but I'm sure you've sensed them. There were a few of them in the small town we passed through before going to the place that was not a place. Why didn't they help us? And Trufa was truly a dangerous Nulian. They might have been low-level Nawads and Nollies, and besides, they didn't know what was going on. I see, and what of the fourth kind? Then there are the Ancient Ones. You've already met one of these. Heza? Ram nodded. Before meeting Heza, I thought Ancient Flow was something that had been here long before humans or Nulians. Now... I believe the Ancient Ones are remnants of whatever it was that brought the flow to this world. Little is known about Ancient Flow and how powerful it is. All I know is that the Ancient Ones have a strong and undeniable connection to the stream of flow. And then there's you, and the Dangerous Man. Bliss felt a chill down her spine at the mention of the Dangerous Man, who had been on their tail all these years. Even though Bliss had never met him, she knew he was there. He was always there. There was a dark and powerful essence about that man. She brushed the emotion aside, as she realized that Ram had not included her in any of the four forms of flow. Wait, said Bliss. I thought you said there were only four forms of flow. There are, and parts of each one fit you. Though, I don't know how much exactly. Not to mention that you could be something else entirely. A new form of flow. What about the dangerous man? Is he like me too? No, not at all. He is the opposite. He is darkness, destruction, a taker of life. Bliss said nothing, as she turned over everything that Ram had said inside her head. She knew that the situation was serious, that the prospect of her living a normal life was far from her reach, that a burden many times the size of her own capabilities had been placed on her. Yet... She was okay with it. She felt like she could manage the situation, like everything was going to turn out all right, because she had Ram. There might be a village up ahead, said Ram, as he began to veer left. No, correction, there is a village up ahead. Is there really? The thought of there being a village up ahead completely interrupted Bliss's train of thought. Yes, I'm sure of it, said Ram, as he took another whiff and corrected his course. Do you want to go? Of course Bliss wanted to go, but something told her that Ram was only offering because he knew that it was what she wanted. She wanted to see what other people, other Nulians were like, what they did on normal days. And maybe, just maybe, she could feel like she belonged, even if it was just for a moment or two. What about what Heza said? asked Bliss. About the world going mad searching for us? Yes. Regardless, we need to know what she meant by that. We also need to know if we can count on these villages on our way to the stone grounds. If things get ugly, we'll get up and leave. We need to know this. Then we'll go, said Bliss, as she felt her heart begin to beat faster. She was nervous, no doubt about it, but she wanted to go. Ram nodded. Chapter 17 Eyes as much as they tried to blend in, 
they would fail each time. Not because they stood out from the crowd, but because they were meant to touch and better the lives of those around them. For Bliss, walking for long periods of time felt strange. She was accustomed to floating on Ram's back most of the time. Walking felt like something unnatural, something she shouldn't be doing. As she walked, she could feel every pebble, every crack and crevice, and even the unevenness between steps, something she hadn't been able to feel before. What are all these things I'm feeling? thought Bliss, as she stopped and looked at the soles of her turn boots. They look the same, I think. What's wrong? asked Ram, as he stopped a few steps ahead of Bliss and looked back. It's really not that much further than last time we walked. It was that much further, thought Bliss, as she put her foot back on the ground. The village hadn't even been visible when Ram told her to get off and begin walking. But for Ram, Someone who had been walking the seven worlds for over three hundred years? Such a distance was trivial. It's not that, said Bliss, as she felt the ground through her turn boots. All right, so then what is it? I don't know. I mean, I'm not sure. I can feel more, even through my turn boots. I feel everything. The ground, the wetness of the mud, the sharpness of the rocks. Ram turned to fully face Bliss and closed his eyes. It looked like he was trying to read something as he cocked his head. Your life stream is growing, beginning to flare throughout your body, said Ram. As he opened his eyes and walked towards Bliss, it may be maturing, adapting to your new body and what it's capable of. What am I supposed to do now? asked Bliss, as she looked at her hands and began to feel what the breeze felt like as it passed through her fingers. Flow is a tangible thing for us users, said Ram, as he sat down in front of Bliss. We can push and pull, we can gather it or disperse it, but we cannot make it disappear unless one of two things happens. We either run out of reserves in the reservoir within us, or our reservoir overflows, in which case, the extra life stream returns to the flow. Life stream is constantly flowing into us. Some of us have bigger reservoirs than others, and in your situation, you might have an entire ocean of your own. Bliss knew what reservoir was, a large accumulation of water before the river changed height. She also knew what an ocean was, an even larger accumulation of water, with no end in sight, or something along those lines, but she got the idea. Ram had pointed both of them out on one of their fishing trips. The differences between the two were huge, and yet, here was Ram, lightly comparing the two. That's a big difference, said Bliss. Ram shrugged. What happens when the flow reserves run out? asked Bliss, as she began walking again, stepping on the ground more tentatively than usual. They will slowly fill back up, but, as always, it would depend on the connection the flow user has to the life stream. Can a user use all the reserves at once? Ram hesitated. What's wrong? asked Bliss. Promise me that you'll never do that. Ram looked tense, worried. So, you can do that? Bliss, look at me, said Ram in a solemn tone Bliss hadn't heard before. Promise me that you'll never try to do that. Bliss flushed and nodded once. No, you have to say it. I promise, said Bliss, her voice low. I'll never try to use all of my reserves at once. Good. Now let's get going before someone from the village spots us dawdling. Aren't you going to tell me why I shouldn't use all my reserves at once? Lifestream can be taxing and toxic to the body, especially when you abuse the power it grants you. I've never come close to using up my reserves, but I know those who have. The flow user goes into a deep sleep. Usually, it takes a few weeks to recover, but there are stories of those who never recover. I can only assume that with the amount of life stream you have, emptying it all at once would cause something along those lines, if not worse. Bliss said nothing. She could sense a deep worry coming from within Ram, and she didn't want to add to it. As for your extra sensitivity, find the reserves within you and recall the life stream that's pouring out. Pull on it, 
Keep it away from places you don't need it. It's going to take some getting used to, but once you practice a little, it'll be second nature. With her mind, Bliss searched within herself for her Lifestream Reservoir. She found it instantly, glowing a bright violet, taking up most of the empty space, overflowing on all sides. She pulled the small cascades back and turned them into one large one that swirled up the same way it came. The extra sensitivity went away instantly. It worked, said Bliss, as she took a look at her hands, unable to feel the texture of the wind. It didn't last very long, though. She felt her reservoir begin to overflow again, and her sensitivity returned. You'll have to keep at it, said Bram. It's going to take some practice. So, Lifestream can enhance your body also? said Bliss, as she stepped on the ground with more confidence. Like strength and speed? Yes, but it's a skill that has to be practiced. You'll have to know what muscle to enhance, what bone to harden, what joint to lubricate. High warriors practice this form of flow, and they can become especially good at it. Practice, Bliss murmured, as she looked at her hand once again trying to control the movement of the life stream more precisely. Otherwise, you'll only feel more. Exactly. But there's also a drawback. A rather large drawback. And what's that? Asked Bliss, as she let her hand follow the movements of her body and made a mental note to practice using this form of life stream. There's a hard limit with this form of life stream. There's only so much a body can do, regardless of how much control someone has over that form of life stream. Overdo it once, and you'll end up with instant muscle and nerve damage. If you do it many times, not even a healer can fix it. And what happens when a healer can't fix it? They would have to rely on life stream for the rest of their life, just to make that body part function normally. Bliss soaked in all the knowledge about how flow worked. This was as deep as Ram had ever gone into the nuts and bolts of Atsu. A part of her wondered why. He had waited for so long. But the rest of her, the more mature Bliss, knew the answer. She knew that if Ram had explained these things earlier on, she would not have understood it. He had only given her exactly the right amount she needed to hear. We're nearing the village's gate, said Ram. Let's change the subject. The last thing we want is someone hearing us talk about flow. What will we talk about then? Anything but flow. We can also not talk. Just pretend you're tired from a long journey. No one should bother us. Bliss threw on her hood when she was certain no one was looking. The village felt much different than the one before. Of course, it had been a long time ago that she had visited a human village, and she only had one other memory to compare her experience with. But still... This was odd. It wasn't what she had expected. There weren't that many people outside, and those that were kept to themselves. The place felt dark, and there were guards. Plenty of guards. There seemed to be one at every corner. Why are there so many guards? Asked Bliss, her voice low. Good question, whispered Ram, as they passed the main entrance. I'm not sure if there's a ruler nearby. Villages didn't function like this before. At the most, there would be one guard patrolling an entire village. What has changed? The guards peered at them as they walked deeper into the village. They're looking at us, whispered Bliss. I know. Let's head to the town square and sneak out of here. Bliss nodded. Although it wasn't the same cheerful and lively experience she'd had before, she was still happy they had gone. To Bliss... Everything was a new experience, and she took it in stride, good or bad. She wanted to learn about the world, to learn what was around her. They reached the village square, and things began to look up. Life was beginning to appear. There were people laughing, newly and speaking with humans, and there were fewer guards. Bliss could only see one of them, and that's because they passed right by him as they entered the square. Though she was reasonably sure that Ram had spotted a few more, as he hadn't let his guard down. He was eyeing the place. Then, Bliss saw something odd. Something that she hadn't seen before. Something that held her complete attention. At the realization of what she was looking at, she felt her face flush and couldn't help but look away. In the garden to the side of the square, hidden behind a cluster of bushes, 
Two humans were sitting close to each other, holding hands and touching with their lips every few moments. What's wrong? asked Ram, as Bliss froze, looking down. Why are they doing that? Why is who doing what? Ram cocked his head. Them, said Bliss, without pointing and without looking up. Oh, said Ram a few moments later. He'd probably seen what Bliss had seen. That's normal, although not so common out in the open like they're doing. Usually couples keep that sort of thing private. That is what people do when they're in love, Bliss. Couples? Love? Asked Bliss as she looked down, still feeling flushed. There comes a time in people's and Nulian's lives when they feel a special and sudden bond with another. They'll feel as if they cannot continue living without the company of that other special one. In short, that is called love. A couple is what happens when two become one, when they become inseparable. Though this is a subject for another time, you're too young to understand this. Bliss suspected that she was old enough to understand, but she didn't want to discuss the subject any longer. She nodded and turned towards Ram, lifting her head. We should get going. I get the feeling we stick out in this crowd, said Ram. Those guards haven't taken their eyes off us. Bliss took a look around. Ram was the only brightly colored Nullian in the square. Though his shade of blue fur wasn't so far from gray, it was still enough to make them stand out compared to the dark cloaks around them. She nodded. They made their way through the square as inconspicuously as they could, but as they entered one of the main walkways that led away from the square, two guards followed them. Ram shook his head and let out an audible sigh. Two more guards joined the two behind them, while a larger group of them blocked the street in front of them. Ram stopped walking, and Bliss stopped next to him. The group of guards in front of them approached. Each guard was heavily armored from head to toe, though their armor was made of leather instead of steel, and it wasn't heavily decorated. Each one had a long lance and a sword at the waist, and Bliss could sense a form of flow radiating from the tips. Identify yourself, beast, the closest guard said. Who are you, and what are you doing here? And who's the girl? Yeah, she's quite odd, isn't she, Ajo? said another one of the guards. She's too pretty for a sorry village like this. Do it now, said Ajo, grabbing the hilt of his sword. We are no one important, said Ram, his voice calm. It was obvious that he didn't want any trouble, or better said, he didn't want to kill these men. We were just passing by. We don't want any trouble. Just passing by, said Ajo incredulously. That's obvious. Don't make me ask again, beast. What are you doing here? Just passing by, repeated Ram. This village is on the way to our destination. It was an easy stop for us. Show us your stamped passes, yelled Ajo. Stamped pass? asked Ram. Don't act silly with me, beast, said the guard, lowering his lance. The rest of the guards followed suit. Either you have it or you don't. Either you're traveling by the ruler's law, or you're not. He said the last three words in a menacing tone. Ram sighed, but held his ground. He didn't look shaken or concerned. Bliss had little doubt that if the guards knew who Ram actually was, they wouldn't be standing in front of him in such a confrontational matter. In fact, they wouldn't be standing in front of him at all. You'll have to come with us, said the guard, his tone gritty and explain to our captain. Let's see just how much he likes this. We'd rather not. We have somewhere to be, said Ram with a sigh. Beast, you are under the ruler's law. You'll do as you're told. The guard got into an almost crouching stance, lance fixed on Ram. We will use force. Ram looked over at Bliss, frowning. Bliss shrugged, but then nodded. We'll be happy to talk to your captain said Ram, his voice calm. Happy is the last thing you'll be once you meet her, said the guard, as he lowered his lance and motioned for them to follow. Chapter 18 Ruler's Law They had awoken to a much different place, a dark place, a place filled with restrictions and sadness. 
the inhabitants of all seven worlds were no longer free. Would things have turned out better if time had not been taken away from them? Perhaps not. Destruction will follow its course until it has achieved its goal. Ramdeliel knew they had to be somewhere, but they were also not in a hurry. The stone grounds wouldn't move any further from them, even if they took a little longer to get there. Besides, he wanted to have the distraction. It felt like it had been so long since he was last part of the world. Though this time, the world seemed a little darker. A small visit to the local ruler wouldn't hurt, he thought, as he followed the group of guards. Bliss walked quietly next to Ramdelior, her steps gentle and her strides precise. The guards had already silenced them a few times as they walked. Apparently, talking while walking meant they weren't taking the situation seriously. Though it was true, Ram had opted not to further irritate the guard, despite his skewed belief. The guards took them to the eastern edge of the village, where an even larger group of guards was waiting for them next to a horse pulling a cart. Though the cart wasn't any ordinary cart, this one was carrying a large metal cage on its rear. Ramdelio could see there were already people inside it. Ramdelio took a look around, but there wasn't any ruler's tower in sight. That meant they would be travelling, by the looks of it, for a few days at least. Look what I've got here! yelled Ijo as soon as the guards near the cart were in earshot. You found a dog? yelled one of the guards near the cart. Not just any dog, said the guard, his voice lower now that they were nearer. This one is a talking dog. A Nulian? That's right, said the guard that was escorting them. And he's got a friend. They were wandering around the village without a ruler's pass. Oh, the captain will be pleased. We don't often find rule breakers. How far is the ruler's tower? asked Ramdelio. Be quiet, beast. You speak only when spoken to, said Ijo, raising his hand. I swear I'll have you seeing stars in no time. I'm sure your captain will like that, said Ramdelio, his tone sarcastic. The guard lowered his hand, grabbed his lance, flipped it, and struck Ramdelio with its hilt. Though the hilt had a metal ball with spikes all over it, he barely felt it. The guard's expression turned to one of confusion as he looked at his weapon and then at Ramdelior. The rest of the guards broke out into laughter. <laughs> what happened, tough guy? asked the cart guard, wheezing with laughter. Shut up, said Ijo, as he flipped the lance back to expose the steel blade. I'll show you. I wouldn't do that if I were you, said Ramdelior, meeting the guard's eyes his voice serious for the first time. The guard hesitated, then lowered his lance. <laughs> Pathetic, said the cart guard. This is why you'll never move up in rank. You'll always be a lowly village guard. Shut up, Lowry, said the guard. Let's see how you deal with them. You act so high and mighty just because you're a rank higher than I am. You'll see. Dealing with them will be easy the cart guard said as he opened the large metal door of the cage. By the ruler's law, get in if you don't want your punishment to get worse. Ramdelior could roll his eyes at the guard's statement, but he didn't want to provoke the situation further, at least not with these people. He knew that an altercation would end badly for the guards. Bliss wasn't in any real danger, so this part of society was perfectly acceptable, although a bit ugly. Without resistance, they made their way to the cart. Ramdelior used his long tail to form a step for Bliss. The last thing he wanted was for them to know that Bliss was a flow user. As she stepped on his tail, he slowly lifted her until she was level with the door of the cage. Bliss stepped in slowly and greeted the rest of the prisoners with a timid hand gesture. The prisoners did nothing. Once Bliss found a spot to sit down, Ramdelio hopped on, shaking the cart and taking up most of the space in the cage. He smiled at the prisoners, but they looked away. How unfortunate, said Lowry. 
I was hoping to get a few more prisoners today. There just had to be one big dumb beast to ruin my quota. You better count for at least three humans, beast, or regardless of your fate meeting our captain, I'll see you again. He smiled darkly at Ramdelior, then whistled and made a circular hand gesture at the rest of the guards. We're leaving. We have no more room. The cart moved slowly at first, but after some time it began picking up speed as it headed northeast. Further away from the Pasok, Ramdelio and Bliss had originally come from into this part of Rafelin. As the cart moved, no one talked. It was hot and humid, and they weren't moving fast enough for the wind to make a difference. The five other prisoners looked exhausted, defeated, and not all that friendly. Despite Bliss's repeated attempts to strike up a conversation, she'd gotten little response. It was nearing twilight when one of the guards got up from his seat at the front and made his way back to the middle of the cart. It was Lowey. He began opening some sacks and pulled out a loaf of bread with a full roll of cheese. The five prisoners stared at the guard, their eyes pleading. What? Don't tell me you're hungry, said Lowey. All the food you stole from the merchant wasn't enough to fill you up. Sir, please, said the oldest looking of the five prisoners. I've told you, I'm an honest man and so are they. The merchant reported us because we did not want to work without pay. It had been too long already. The man wasn't lying. Ramdelio could usually tell when someone was lying or being ambiguous with the truth. There was a subtle difference in their posture, expressions, nervousness, but most of all in the way their heart beat. Ramdelio didn't go around listening to everyone's heart, but he was good at focusing in on one or two people. For the most part, he didn't mind people lying, but in this case things were different. These people were on their way to see the ruler. Their lives or their freedom were in danger. Yeah, yeah said Lowey, as he turned around and began making his way to the front. Well, it's not my fault you aren't getting food. I'm just following the rules. As for your little story, tell that to our captain. Who knows, maybe if you're lucky, you'll get to explain that to the ruler himself. Ramdelio shook his head and then turned to look at Bliss. She was calm. As he took a closer look, he saw that she was working on something. Her fingers were also moving quite suspiciously. What was she up to? He thought about asking, but he decided to wait and see what would happen. For a little while, nothing seemed to be happening, yet something was. Ramdelio saw the other five prisoners sit up a little straighter. Warmth returned to their faces, and they looked more alert, almost as if they had just had a full meal. Was Bliss using her life stream on them, nourishing them? It was sort of like what Ramdelio felt when she rode on his back, but in their situation, it was much more direct. The five prisoners were staring at each other in disbelief. There is something out there that watches over us, murmured the oldest of the prisoners. The prisoners all stared at Bliss. She turned away sheepishly though Ramdelior saw a hint of a smile as she looked away. By the looks of it, they hadn't stared at her, thinking it had been her who had helped them. They were curious whether she had been helped as well. He snickered and lay down, getting ready for what could be a long journey. We need to be positive, murmured the oldest of the prisoners. Things will return to the way they used to be. Maybe better. The rumours are true. Something big is happening, but now we know that at the same time, something is watching over us. Interesting, Ramdelio thought. And all this happened when we were in that place that isn't a place. What did Bliss call it? Nelifer Uwuwaro. Yeah, that's right. But it seems like so much has changed in so little time, even if by little I mean seven or eight years. Ramdelior drifted in and out of sleep as they travelled. Apparently Bliss and the other five prisoners were doing the same. Sleep only became more prevalent as the sun sank and the area around them cooled. 
It had to have been the middle of the night when Ramdelion noticed the oldest of the prisoners looking up at the sky, though he couldn't know for sure, as the constant, relatively slow cart movement caused him to feel disoriented. It was a clear night, and the stars were particularly visible compared to other nights. Thousands of shiny sapphires blanketed the sky, glistening, dazzling. The moon was also imposing, its white surface illuminating their surroundings, even though its crescent was slowly disappearing. They're almost shining as bright as they used to shine, said the oldest of the prisoners, his voice still quiet, but not like before. It's almost like there is hope after all. Perhaps things will return to normal. Bliss perked up, sitting up, stretching and holding her neck. She then turned and stared at the sky. She must have heard what the prisoner had said. What happened that made you lose hope? asked Bliss, her voice low but direct. The fall happened, said the prisoner, eyeing Bliss. Are we supposed to know what that is? asked Bliss. Ramdelia was surprised at Bliss's bluntness. He had taught her better. He had taught her manners. Yet here she was ignoring those lessons. Was she doing it on purpose? Everyone knows what that is, said the prisoner. Well, we don't, said Bliss. You aren't from around here, are you? Bliss shook her head. Even so, you should know no matter where you're from, said the prisoner, looking away from Bliss and back at the sky above. How you don't know is beyond me. Well, I guess you and your friend are lucky not to know, to say the least. The fall has affected all seven worlds. Things are not the same, not by a long shot. One by one, the rulers of the seven worlds fell, and one by one, our way of life changed. Humans and Nulians are no longer free. The seven worlds have turned into a dark place. All humans and Nulians must report to someone, must obey someone, must work for someone. We now have masters and mistresses. The wealthy ended up on top, while the unfortunate, many at the bottom of the chain, live by the grace of their masters, treated as disposable, treated as a virus. But I saw the village square, said Bliss. People didn't look that bad. They looked pretty normal to me. Normal, in these times, is a luxury. Also, you didn't look hard enough, or better said, deep enough. You glanced at the surface of things. Every one of those people that you saw in the square has their own servants, their own personal footrest. If only we were so lucky. Ramdelior felt a chill run down his spine. He was starting to get angry as well. How could things have changed so much? Why did this happen? Why did the rulers fall? I thought we were on our way to see the ruler now. One by one, the Divine One replaced the previous rulers with puppets of his own. The seven rulers of the seven worlds report to one. They obey one. They kneel to one. Since then, things have changed, and the worlds have become a darker place. Food and coins have steadily flowed into the villages, but we folk, the prisoner gestured at the others in the cage, never get to see it. It gets hoarded and watered down by the merchants or important people in the villages, worse than before, much worse. Now at the slightest complaint from us folk, they'll simply send us away in one of these carts to see the ruler. For complaining? asked Bliss. No, said the prisoner gravely. For hiding something suspicious, seeing something, talking about something. I don't understand, said Bliss. They'll simply tell some lie to the guards, and off we go to the ruler. Sometimes folk come back, but other times we aren't so lucky. The Divine One is looking for something, and he's desperate to find it. The prisoner looked hesitant. We've heard rumours. We know what it is he's looking for. It's obvious. There it is again, the Divine One, Ramdelio thought. To whom is he referring? Hazes said the world had gone mad looking for us. 
This is what she was referring to. Someone has gone to great lengths to try and find us. Or maybe it's just a coincidence. Obvious, asked Bliss. They're looking for hope, said the prisoner with a sigh. They're looking for the one thing that can change the seven worlds and turn them back to the way they were, or better. Ramdelio looked at Bliss. She looked so pure, so well-meaning. He knew that she had a good heart, that she could really change the world if she wanted to. He saw it all now. It was beginning to make sense. Ramdelia was doing his best to raise her, to mentor her and shape her into a good person. She could really make a change in the world. Maybe we're just naive, said the prisoner. Maybe this is why we're servants and not merchants, because we believe that somehow the worlds will become a better place. I believe that, said Bliss, her tone genuine. She glanced at Ramdelior. It's always nice to believe, said the prisoner. It makes moments like these feel a bit better, tolerable. Not too long ago we were starving. Now we feel like we've had a full meal. Something is out there watching over us. Something will save us. For now... Let's try to get some sleep. Tomorrow will be anything but easy. Bliss nodded. Ramdelio watched the prisoners and Bliss go to sleep, or at least attempt to. As for himself, there was no way he'd be able to sleep any time soon. He had too much to think about, too many things to figure out. He knew what his burden entailed. He just didn't know if he was strong enough to take Bliss there, to help her succeed. But if not him, who? Who else could take his place? No one. Whatever strength was required to achieve a better world, he had to have it. There was no way around it. Dawn came as Ramdelior drifted in and out of sleep, and the ruler's tower appeared on the horizon. It looked larger than other ruler's towers he had seen before. This one had several smaller towers surrounding it, though they looked new added on after its original construction. The limestone was a lot cleaner and brighter than the central tower. It won't be long now, said the prisoner, looking refreshed as he attempted to stretch in the cramped cage. Of course, the cage was only cramped because Ramdelio took up almost half of it. Yes, it won't be long now. I suggest that you ignore their questions. Though it will be painful, it's by far the best way to go. But once you start answering, they won't believe a word you say, regardless of whether you're telling the truth. The other four prisoners nodded slowly, barely heeding the conversation. What happens after? asked Bliss as she stood up and stretched, leaning her back on Ramdelio. Bliss was still short enough to be able to stand up in the cage, though her hands were already touching the ceiling. After they ask questions... No one really knows, said the oldest prisoner. Most people don't go back to the same villages, and those who do don't want to talk about it. Nothing good happens, that's for sure. The cart came to a stop behind the towers. There was a large group of guards already waiting for them. All of them were armoured and armed with lances. It's about time you showed up, shouted one of the guards within the waiting group. To the flames with it, shouted Lowy. We did the best we could. Quit your blabbering. The best you could isn't going to be good enough, shouted the other guard. Va, replied Lowy as he spat to his side. The place smelled like a poorly kept guard robe. It was damp and muddy. The foul stench caused Bliss to cover her nose. Ramdelior was used to foul odours, as he hadn't exactly grown up in the best of places. Aside from the smell, thousands of footprints were visible going towards the towers, but not many came back out. The captain has been waiting for hours, said the guard who had been shouting earlier. She isn't happy. This might be the worst I've ever seen her. Good luck, my lad. Well, it isn't my fault. I've done all I could to be it on time, said Larry. We even left early yesterday, but this dumb Newlian has been slowing us down. If it wasn't for it, we'd have been here ages ago. 
Yeah, yeah, nothing is ever your fault. Well, anyway, tell that to the captain. The guard turned to his side to make way, along with the rest of his group. Speaking of which, you'll get to do it sooner than we thought. The group of guards quickly made way for someone coming from within the tower's bailey. It was a female figure, tall and slim, and she wore no armour from what Ramdeliel could see. She had a cloak covering most of her body, though he doubted any kind of armour was underneath. She was too slim. The guards tensed as she strode casually past them. This has to be the captain, Ramdelio thought. Flow user, whispered Bliss. Ramdelio looked towards Bliss, head cocked. I'll tell you later, said Bliss, her voice barely audible. Ramdelio looked closer, and to his surprise, he was able to feel the slightest use of flow coming from the presumed captain. She was using some sort of fear spout, and Ramdelio started to feel the effects of it tugging on his emotions as she got closer. He was easily able to ignore it. To him, fear had always been something you pushed aside, though it didn't look like it was the same for the rest of the prisoners, who shrank back even more. Bliss shook her head as she looked at them. She looked completely unaffected by the captain. Lowy! yelled the captain. Yes, Captain, said Lowey as he stiffened. I was expecting you at sunrise, said the captain as she drew closer. We came as fast as we could, said Lowey, but lugging that giant newlin around, he gestured towards Ramdelio, wasn't helping the horses. Silence, said the captain as she slowly turned towards the cage. She left Lowey behind and began walking. Her face paled when she got a glimpse of Ramdelio. Though she tried to hide it, he saw recognition in her eyes. Could it be that she knew who they were? Creaker! yelled the captain. Come here now! One of the guards from the back of the group ran up to the captain. Yes, captain, asked Creaker. Let the ruler know, said the captain, her voice low, sweat beginning to show on her forehead. We might have found what we're looking for. Right away, Captain, said Creaker, as he scurried away. Surprisingly, the Captain kept walking towards the carriage, despite her sweaty forehead and hesitation. Perhaps she didn't want to show fear in front of the rest of the guards, although they were too scared of her to notice. Take those five others to the back with the rest, said the Captain, as she gestured towards the other five prisoners in the cage. Good luck, said the oldest of the prisoners, as he readied himself to be taken away. I hope it watches over you. Bliss and Ramdelio nodded slowly. Two guards from within the group began unloading the prisoners swiftly. You there, what is your name? Asked the captain as she approached Bliss. Bliss looked towards Ramdelio. He shook his head slightly. She stood silent. What's the problem? Asked the captain, attempting to look strong, though at least to Ramdelio she was failing. You don't know how to talk? She doesn't do well with strangers, said Ramdelio. I didn't ask you, beast, snapped the captain, making sure the others around her heard. But since it's so easy for you to open your mouth, why don't you tell me who you are? What was your business in Appalachiac? Appalachiac, Ramdelio thought. That must be the small village where they found us. No business, said Ramdelio his voice calm. We were just stopping by to get some food. We're nomads. We stop by villagers every time one is in our path. Who are you? asked the captain, teeth gritted. Don't make me ask you again. I'm just a simple Nulian. Enough, the captain interrupted. Since you're unwilling to tell me, perhaps you'll be more inclined to tell our ruler. Perhaps said Ramdelio. Take them away, said the captain, visibly irritated and shaken by Ramdelio's simple comment. She looked like she was used to being obeyed, used to being the one that scared others, and now those things were turning on her. The captain watched, arms crossed, as the guards took Bliss and Ramdelio into the towers. She didn't take another step. She looked pale, as if she was barely holding on to her emotions. 
Ramdelio turned towards Bliss and saw a slight smile on her face. Had Bliss been using Livestream on the captain all this time? None of the guards dared to get close to Bliss, and much less Ramdelio. As they walked, the closest guard to them was a good two body lengths away from Bliss. As they moved deeper towards the central tower, they saw more people, who were increasingly cleaner, more well kept. They looked as if their days weren't as hard as those of the people outside the towers. Even the mud had stopped a while ago, Ramdelio noticed. Why is there so much difference? asked Bliss, her voice low. You noticed? It's hard not to, said Bliss. Before entering the ruler's towers, said a guard near the entrance of the central tower, interrupting Bliss. Listen and follow instructions. Failure to do so may result in execution by the ruler's hand. You are not to speak unless spoken to, and you must answer any and all questions. Answering vaguely will be taken as failure to answer. You must stay ten paces away from the ruler at all times. The ruler may pass judgment at any time while you are in his presence. You are now entering his absolute domain. The guard glanced at them. Do you understand? Ramdelio and Bliss nodded. Let the prisoners in, shouted the guard, right hand raised. The large, heavily decorated wooden doors opened, revealing a great hall lined with pillars. A banner hung on the far wall, depicting a condor carrying a stone in one claw and a rope in the other, with its wings and body twisting. It gave the room an eerie feel. Hundreds of guards were lined up against the wall, and there were other well-dressed people present. At the end of the hall, there he was, the ruler. He wasn't like anyone Ramdelio had ever seen or heard of before. The first thing that stood out was the plain white mask the ruler wore. Red swirls covered the mask, extending from its eye holes onto its cheeks. He was hooded and cloaked, and his attire was black, its edges accented with gold. He sat in a heavily decorated chair, slouching. He looked bored. In Ramdelio's mind, rulers shouldn't look like ordinary men, not like something that did not belong to the Seven Worlds. Three others stood next to the ruler. Each of them had a staff and had colourful stones woven into their clothing. Those have to be high nords, Ramdelio thought. If they aren't high, they must be close to it. I know some of those stones must be packed with spouts. Enter, said the guard, gesturing towards the hall. Ramdelio and Bliss glanced at each other, nodded, and started walking forward. The smell of wet mud quickly went away and was replaced with a fragrant, flowery aroma. Of course, it was nothing compared to what they had smelled in a place that wasn't a place. The well-dressed people began gathering in groups and whispering to one another, though their low voices weren't low enough to escape Ramdelio's superior hearing. He didn't care much about what they were saying. His attention instead was directed at the ruler and the four high nords next to him. Welcome to my rule, said the ruler in a smooth voice, easily heard across the room, as if it was somehow amplified. He didn't move as he spoke. I've been looking for you two. That's if you two are really who we think you are. One of the guards stepped into their path and stopped them from getting closer to the ruler though they were a lot more than ten paces away. By Ramdelio's calculations, they were thirty or so paces away, in the centre of the room. Ramdelio sat on his haunches, while Bliss took a step closer to him. Why don't you go ahead and tell us? said the ruler, his buttery voice sounding welcoming. I'll give you your first chance at redemption after having violated one of my rules. We've done no such thing, said Ramdelio his voice casual. You haven't? asked the ruler as he snapped his fingers. A heavily robed man walked into the hall carrying a large book. He stood near the centre of the hall, keeping his distance from them. He cleared his throat loudly and opened the book. By the ruler's decree, bellowed the robed man, though his voice was low compared to the ruler's own amplified one. The prisoners have violated Rule 19 of the First Code. 
No person, Nulian or human, should travel without a permit unless it's the ruler himself. Ramdelio shook his head. What's the matter? Are you displeased with my rule? Who gave you the right? <laughs> Who gave me, the ruler, the right to make my own rules? Ramdelior nodded slowly. He wasn't after a simplistic explanation. He hoped that the ruler would see through the question. How did he justify his superiority to others? In Ramdelior's mind, no one was above another. I see, said the ruler. Normally, the punishment for questioning a ruler's authority is death. But you're already dead once this is over, and I'm in a particularly good mood now that the world is about to change, and it would all be thanks to me and my rule. So, back to your question. The ruler shifted in his chair for the first time since he had begun to speak. Who gave me the right to rule? Well, the Divine One himself, the bringer of the end, the one who cannot be questioned. Ramdelior felt an eerie sensation run down his spine. Who was this Divine One? And who gave him the right? asked Ramdelior. Yet another strike on your life said the ruler, sounding amused. He needs no right. He simply does, for he is divine, brought forth by the fallen itself. Ramdelio stood up, while Bliss touched the back of his neck softly, as if to let him know she was there with him. Who told you to stand up? asked the ruler as he leaned forward. We're leaving, said Ramdelio, his voice calm. We don't want any trouble. The ruler snapped his fingers once again. By the ruler's decree, bellowed the robed man, the prisoners are in violation of Rule 5 of the Second Code. No person, Nulian or human, shall leave the Great Hall prior to their official dismissal or sentencing. Do you see now? The ruler asked, his voice sounding clearly throughout the hall. We don't need to live by your rules, said Ramdelio, as he took a step towards the doorway. Beast and youngling, said the ruler, his voice growing sombre. What are your names? Ramdelior knew that he could simply lie, but what would be the point of that? He hated the idea of hiding behind a lie, and the chances of the ruler believing his lie were slim at best. At the same time, lying wasn't something he wanted to teach Bliss. In this case, telling the truth would serve best. He was sure it was them the ruler was looking for. But what would happen when they realised it? He needed to know. I, said Ramdelior, half turning back towards the ruler, am Ramdelior, fury and scorcher of worlds, the last watcher. I am Bliss's watcher. Tension whiplashed through the room. The high nords on each side of the ruler stepped forward, their staffs pointed towards them. The guards near the walls moved towards the centre of the room, weapons drawn, surrounding Ramdelio and Bliss. The well-dressed people scurried away, disappearing into the back of the hall. The ruler himself stood up. Audacious, said the ruler. I'll give you that, though I don't know if I should be offended or not. We're leaving, said Ramdelio, as he looked straight ahead towards the door. The guards in front of him quivered. You won't make it out of here alive, said the ruler, as markings all over the walls began to burn. The markings on the wall could only mean one thing. Spouts. Layer upon layer of spouts. How strong were they? He was about to find out. Don't let anyone get near you, said Ramdelior. Bliss nodded. Ramdelior readied himself, crouching, heightening his senses, calling on the life stream within him as the room closed in on them. Despite the proximity of the guards, the high nords were the first to approach Ramdelior and Bliss. They swung their staffs in unison as they moved against him, something that made him smile. As long as he was the prime target, Bliss was out of danger. On top of their staffs was a rotating major spout, ready to be deployed. Ramdelior dashed to meet the incoming Nords. He pressed against the floor, breaking the slabs of rock as he ran. A little overkill, he was sure, but he wanted to make a point. 
He quickly reached the speed he thought would be necessary to charge the Nords, and as he neared them, he jumped, turned his body in mid-air, and kicked each of them with his rear legs. His momentum sent the high Nords flying towards the wall. As he landed back on the floor, he saw that some guards had tried to approach Bliss, but they were nowhere near a match for her flow. She made a rotating rock formation from the chunks of rock Ramdeliel had displaced when he ran. Ramdeliel felt a slight smile on his face. You incompetent fools! yelled the ruler, his voice no longer amplified. Ramdeliel was beginning to doubt that the Nords were indeed of the highest class. A high Nord would have done a lot more at this point. Though they were getting back up from something that would have killed an average human, it was still not enough to justify their title. I'll be the one to end this, said the ruler, as he made his way towards Ramdeliel. Ramdeliel turned to fully face the ruler. I've been imbued with the power to destroy you, said the ruler, as the lines around his eyes began to glow and spouts began to appear all over his dark cloak. The spouts glowed bright orange while the lines on his mask were closer to red. Those weren't combat spouts. Those were spouts of pure destruction. And they looked powerful. Part of Ramdeliel wondered if the ruler truly knew what he was about to do. You'll destroy your tower, said Ramdeliel as he took a few steps back towards Bliss. And you'll kill everyone in it. A small price to pay, said the ruler as the spouts glowed brighter. Ramdeliel searched for spouts of his own, something that could protect them from a large blast. He knew that nothing he could find would be adequate, at least not any more. It was too late. A proper deflection spout would take longer than the moment they had. Your rulership, said one of the gnarls from the wall. Be quiet, said the ruler as he slowly raised his hands towards Ramdeliel and Bliss. Ramdeliel jumped towards Bliss, calling upon one of the few protective spouts he had left. Dark blue lines began to appear before them, forming an intricate pattern. Triangles for strength, circles for protection, tied together by larger squares. Bliss stopped her spinning rock perimeter and got closer to Ramdelior. Reject, chanted Ramdelior as the lines solidified and burned a rich blue. Enquiotus! That won't work, said the ruler. Stay behind me said Ramdelior as he braced himself. The guards around them scurried in all directions, trampling each other as they tried to get out of the way. Eruption, cried the ruler. For the smallest moment, an all-engulfing yellow beam of light appeared before Ramdelior, heading his way. As he watched it, it took a sharp turn to the right, passing through the thick wall as if it wasn't there at all. Ramdelior realised at once what was happening. Bliss had redirected the energy blast. He turned towards her and saw a slight smirk on her face. He then turned towards the ruler and the gnarls behind him. As for the gnarls, they looked dumbfounded. But they were heaving sighs of relief, and Ramdeliel guessed that the ruler had the same expression behind his mask. How? asked the ruler. How is this possible? No one and nothing can stand up to my blast. How? A massive explosion, visible through the large hole in the wall, interrupted the ruler. No doubt it was the release of his beam. Moments later, the ground began to shake, and the building began to look a lot less sturdy. Ramdelio pulled back his protection spout, knowing the ruler wouldn't attempt anything else any time soon. Now, if there isn't anything else, said Ramdelio, we'll be heading out. Come on, Bliss, let's go. He began walking towards the door. We're done here. We have some prisoners to free. No one walks away from a ruler, screamed the ruler, his voice no longer amplified. No one! Ramdelior paid no attention and continued walking. Beast, return to my presence at once! The ruler continued as debris began to fall from the ceiling. Sometimes the flow and its absolute power changes people, said Ramdelior, speaking only to Bliss. In this case, it wasn't for the better. Bliss said nothing as she kept walking alongside him. Beast, I'm warning you, bled out the ruler. Fine, 
Walk out. Walk into your tomb. Others will come. You won't have a moment of peace. You'll... The collapse of the building interrupted the ruler. It's the bad thing about Flo, continued Ramdelior, speaking only to Bliss as they made it to the outer belly. Whatever malice, ignorance, arrogance and self-importance the user has is amplified at the taste of power. Only those who are pure of heart stay the same. More on that some other time. For now, let's go free the prisoners. Chapter 19 Emptiness Hardened are those who live a life they do not want to live in order to get to the life they do. They will endure pain, struggle, bathe in misery, get lost in the loneliness of the world, so that one day they don't have to. It had been eight years since Gavril last heard anything about the Child of Power or its wretched Watcher. Eight long and miserable years. Eight years in darkness. It mattered not what he did. As his monsters, hunters and seers, the entire conquering of the Seven Worlds had not produced a single sighting of the Child. Gavril had conquered all Seven Worlds, and he did so relentlessly. With his galleon, he had gone to every village, every town, every populated area, and to every ruler, and brought everyone to their knees. Now he was considered divine, a deity among the living. People trembled at the sight of the flying beast. Some rulers were smart enough to recognize the power that stood before them, promptly stepping down from their rule. But others weren't so fortunate. It only took him four years to conquer the Seven Worlds. Most rulers were weak and had not planned for the day that someone such as Gavril would come. He had set up the New World Edict quite simply. Rulers would be in place and allowed to rule their lands on three conditions. One, they would seek out the child, whether it was by cataloguing everyone under their rule, seeking out oddities, or simply searching. Two, if the child was found, they were to bring her straight to no heart. Slaying the child of power wasn't out of the question for the rulers, as long as they could provide evidence that the child would have fled or would be impossible to bring to Gavril. He didn't know what would happen if the child was slain by someone other than him, but he was willing to find out rather than continue with the torment. Three, Nothing moved from place to place without explicit permission from a ruler. Anyone would be able to ask for another traveller's right to travel, and anyone who failed to produce such a document would earn themselves a visit to the ruler. Gavril knew these simple rules would make it nearly impossible to travel through the land. Every ruler, every high officer under the new rule had a clear description of the child of power and its watcher. Though he had so much power over the seven worlds and its people, whispers of a child of power were all that ever reached the walls of no heart. It never amounted to anything. Most whispers were from hopeful rulers trying to gain favour from the one they now called the Divine One. Whispers, he said with a sneer. That's all they are. Gavril had stopped visiting his beloved's tomb. He felt he was not worthy to be in its presence. The memory of Elioina kept getting harder and harder to hold on to. With every passing moment that the child wasn't found, his memory of her faded. And so did the hope of ever seeing her again. Lately, he could hardly feel his heart beating. It was as if he was turning into stone, being forgotten, hidden away in the main hall of no heart. Nulians and creatures of all shapes and sizes still roamed in the main hall, but Gavril paid no attention. How can I find that child? Where are they hiding? Why have I been burdened in this way? Why does it have to be me? Why did it have to be her? If Elioina hadn't died, would she be happy right now? Would she be by my side? Perhaps we would have a large home near a creek. Would she have liked that? Ugh, 
said Gavril with disgust, the feeling of incompetence swelling up inside of him. Who was he to hope? Who was he to wonder when he couldn't even accomplish the one task that would perhaps give him a normal life, but more importantly, bring her back? He was nothing until he could accomplish what he set out to do. Then another moral dilemma appeared in his mind, something that had been at the back of his mind all along, but he had never paid close attention. Yet how could he not? It wasn't a small matter. In order for me, he said in a low voice, to have a normal life once again, to see the one I love, I have to take another's life. How have I not asked this before? What kind of monster am I? You're the monster this world needs, said a dark figure appearing before Gavril. You now sit on the throne of all the worlds. You alone have the power to change the course of this world. Who are you? asked Gavril, hardly paying attention. And why shouldn't I kill you where you stand? I'm your guiding spirit said the dark figure, as it finished materialising. It wore dark clothing, but it was not like anything Gavril had ever seen. The stranger's clothing was strange yet elegant, and looked as if it didn't belong in this world. Light grey-blue markings defined its edges. The stranger had long silver hair, and his skin was the same soft grey-blue of the markings. Try if you must, but you can't kill me. Everything that has a beginning has an end, said Gavril as he met the stranger's gaze. I'm sure I can figure out a way. The stranger looked unfazed at Gavril's comments, something that he took note of. I don't doubt you can, said the stranger, but that's not why I'm here. Then get on with it. Why are you here? Let me start by introducing myself. I am Ezzy's. Bringer of light. Though I must say, I am really no one when it comes to this war. But I'd like to see your side win for once. Too many times your side has lost. War? This has happened before? Ezis looked at Gavril, but said nothing. You might recognize me from other places, continued Ezis. I've been the voice inside your head. Since day one. Gavril stood up from his seat and began calling upon his power. He felt it swell up in his chest and arms. Thousands of spouts poured into his mind and he took a step closer. He felt power radiating from Ezzy's, though a different kind of power. One that wasn't entirely present. Did you not hear that I am on your side? said Ezzy's. I clearly remember saying that just now. You were there the day she died, weren't you? Gavril's fists trembled with power. He was ready. Did you have anything to do with it? Though he knew that Ezzy's wasn't entirely present in his physical form, he also knew that something of the being was, that something was attached to this world, and that something could get hurt. No, said Ezzy's flatly. I don't control the great power that's on its way here. Gavril cocked his head. Besides making you weak, loneliness makes you quite forgetful, said Ezzy's, as he folded his arms behind him. Do you not remember the devastation that will happen if that child is left alive? Gavril nodded slowly, remembering the imagery that had played in his head long ago. He backed down as he saw it all over again. Drought, hunger, death. War on a scale that was hard to comprehend. Yes, that's right, said Ezzy's, as he began to pace slowly, never looking away from Gavril. How do you think that happens? This world still has a sort of innocence to it. The forces within aren't capable of such destruction. Sure, there will be a few skirmishes here and there. But nothing would ever compare to the hole that will be dug in the hearts of every living thing in your seven worlds, and no worlds, if the child is left alive. How can that be? How can it not? Let's see. 
How can I put it? Ezzy's paused for a moment, then continued pacing. The power that's on its way here does not like to have rivals. That child, when she comes of age, will be a formidable rival for such power. Though she will eventually lose, as everything else eventually does. Ezzy's last words hung in the air before he continued. If you destroy the child before her power is fully realised, there will be no reason for the power to visit this world. And the destruction? The power isn't exactly one of peace and harmony, said Ezzy's as he came to a stop in front of Gavril. Peace and harmony is what already exists here. It will corrupt this world. I just came to remind you of that. Ezzy's took one step towards Gavril. Whatever happens to these worlds of yours rests solely on your shoulders. Gavril felt the immense weight of Ezzy's words pile up, nearly breaking him. His head felt foggy, almost as if he was falling under a spout. The moral dilemma was slowly fading away. What had to be done in order to save the world must be done. You've been given all the tools you need to accomplish your task, said Ezzy's, not to mention the promise of that one thing you desire the most. Ezzy's began to fade away. By the way, it won't be long before you receive the news you've been longing for. I do advise you not to rush into things. At this point, your loneliness has gotten the better of you. Recover before you do something rash. You'll only have one opportunity, as you only have one life. I hate to say it, but that Watcher is more capable than you think. Eliminate him before the child's powers mature, and you will win. What news? Gavril asked, but Ezzy's was no longer there. Gavril didn't know what to feel. Part of him was hopeful, part of him believed that he was doing the best he could to save the world. But another part of him, a deeper and less understood part, knew that something was wrong. It all sounded too good. Too easy, too simplistic, too perfect. And Gavril knew that nothing was ever as it seemed. Shutting down all further thoughts on the matter, Gavril returned to his chair, or throne, as Ezzy's called it. An all-too-familiar puff materialised to the side of the main hall, revealing a rather enthusiastic Ipophus, though his expression sharply changed once he looked about the room. What's wrong? asked Gavril. Something was here. Is that so? Ipophus cocked his head, rubbed his nose as if to clean it, and took a deeper whiff of the air around him. His facial expression turned to one of disgust. He didn't belong here, said Ipophus. Yet he was here. At least a part of him was. How was he here? The same way you use Flo said Ipophus, turning towards Gavril and scrunching his nose. He was pulling a stream of flow from our own river. Gavril snorted. May I ask what he wanted? Ipophus asked as he floated towards Gavril. You shouldn't have to ask, whether you may or not. I wasn't sure if it was a personal matter. Regardless, I'd appreciate forwardness from you next time. Whatever might be in your head, my friend, anything at all, just let it out. Not saying what you really think, leaving things unsaid, will only lead to regret. His name was Ezzy's, and he wanted to show me once again what the world would look like if the child was left alive. A pitiful creature, really. I couldn't sense anything else but intent from him. It was as if he was entirely consumed by the current situation. A moment of silence passed. The girl is no longer a child. Ipophus's words hung in the air. What? asked Gavril softly, almost as if he didn't want to ask. Part of him feared hearing something else come out of Ipophus's mouth, yet here was Ipophus bringing him something other than a whisper. Could it really be news about the girl? It is as we predicted, said Ipophus. Time has passed for her as it has passed for us. She has grown. 
Where? managed Gavril. She was last seen in the rule of Anicia. They'd come from Appalachiac, in the world of Raphelon. Their power, or better said, the girl's power, grows. Neither the four Nords that guard the tower, nor the ruler himself was able to stop them. Of course not. Where are they headed now? It's hard to say. They've disappeared from all eyes that were around them. Again? said Gavril, feeling his anger boiling and his body losing control as a sense of urgency washed over him. Though this time not in the same way as they did before. This time the girl's presence is clear. She's somewhere out there. You can sense her through the flow? Yes, her impact is undeniable. Gavril calmed himself. I'm sure that with a little effort, said Ippophus, as he turned to face the adjacent room where the seeing pond was. We can find them. We'll be a day or two behind, like old times, but unlike old times, our reach has extended. They won't be able to hide. For the first time in eight years, Gavril felt himself smiling. It was a slight smile, but a smile nonetheless. Everything was back on track. It wouldn't be long now before he could see his beloved. No, it wouldn't be long. Your orders? asked Ippophus. Gavril thought for a moment. Every muscle in his body was aching to go finish the job himself. Every thought he had told him that he would have to be the one to finish what he started. But he also knew that he would have only one chance. The girl's watcher wouldn't be taking any risks. The end was near. Everything, said Gavril. Ippophus turned towards Gavril and cocked his head. Send out everything we have, Gavril said. The monster, the twin wherries, the rot, full force. Let the world they run in, they hide in, become hell. Though spare the girl, let's focus on getting rid of her watcher. It will be done. Chapter 20 Ikra Spouts are quintessential elements of flow. They're the direct connection between raw power and raw achievement. However, control over spouts, their precision and potency, doesn't come naturally to most flow users. Some can manipulate them at will without so much as a second thought, while others can only dream of it. Through the Pasok, Ramdelior, with Bliss floating on his back, made it back to the land they had first fled from. Things looked different than Ramdelior remembered. Everything was dark and wet. The place felt colourless, lifeless. It was as if life was leaving the land. But then he looked closer and realised the place had simply been trampled, stepped on. Had others discovered this place? Ramdelio realised that so much time had passed since he was last here. As he moved further away from the Pasok, his mind eased as the mud dissipated and snow began to appear. This is where we came from, said Ramdelio, as he sprinted along one of the paths he knew. It's not an improvement, said Bliss, as she put up her hood. And it's a lot colder. Do people really live here? What is this grey-white fluffy stuff? Yes, people really live here. If it was safe, I'd even take you to Almentana, the town where you were born. But that might not happen any time soon. As for the grey-white stuff, we call that snow. It used to be all white, pure and clean. Sort of like a cloud, but on the ground. I'm not sure what's happening to this place. Is it all like this? No. Ikra only has snow a few times a year, and it's only like this because we're high up in the mountains. Soon it's going to disappear. You'll start to see more green the farther down the mountain we go. Is it also going to warm up? asked Bliss. No, that's a different story. Let's just say that having fur around you while you're in Ikra will really help. Bliss smirked. As they went down the path and Ramdelior chose to travel away from his village, his home, the place where Bliss was born, 
he began to remember those he was leaving behind. I wonder if the old man and Bliss's parents survived that night. They should have. That dangerous man surely left the village alone once he saw that Bliss was no longer there. I wonder what you're doing, old man. I could really use some of your advice right about now. Things have been difficult lately, old friend. Too much rests on my shoulders. I feel as if the world is homing in on us. Perhaps I should go back home. Go to where I belong and face the end. I won't be able to keep her hidden for long. And what of her parents? Should I look for Bliss's parents? They want to see her, right? She wants to meet them and... Maybe when all of this is over, said Bliss, interrupting his thoughts, as she looked towards a faraway place, a dot in the land that was Ramdelial's old village. Maybe I'll get to meet them, but as long as I'm with you, things will be all right. The comment put Ramdelio at ease, and his mind relaxed once again. Then he realised something he hadn't noticed before. The impulse he'd felt moments earlier to go back to the village was abnormally strong. As powerful as Ramdelior was, he wasn't immune to spouts, especially well-placed ones. Did we enter a luring spout and not notice? Ramdelior thought. It was a strong one too, carefully placed and executed well. I sense high-level flow in the area. Did you feel something unusual? asked Ramdelior. Something out of the ordinary? Some flow, perhaps? Come to think of it, said Bliss as she rubbed her chin. There was something odd about the area. Something different, but not obvious. I believe there's some high-level flow around here. Keep your eyes open. If you see, hear or feel something out of the ordinary, let me know. But shouldn't I be able to feel if it's flow or not? asked Bliss. If it was a spout or not? Not when they take their time to open the spout carefully to conceal it. Whatever it was back there, it was a higher form of flow. Perhaps a luring spout. Then Ramdelior began to feel an all too familiar feeling. One that he was hoping not to feel any time soon. He was hoping to at least get a few villages further or well on their way to the stone grounds. This was too soon. He felt like they were being stalked. What is it? asked Bliss, sensing a change in Ramdelior. Something is watching us, whispered Ramdelior, looking back at Bliss so that she could hear. I'll make it to the clearing up ahead. Keep your eyes open. He turned back to face the trail and ran. It won't be long. Whatever or whoever it is, it's up ahead. They reached the clearing without a problem. The feeling came and went, but it was always there. They stopped in the centermost part of the field. The trees that surrounded the sizable area looked like tall grass from afar. From here, Ramdelia would be able to see anything that approached them. Bliss leapt from Ramdelior's back to survey her surroundings. This is a whole lot of nothing, said Bliss. Don't let your guard down. We still don't know what we're dealing with. If something does decide to come out into the open, I need you to stay back and watch. But, protested Bliss, I can... No buts. I know you can help. In fact, there will be a time when I'll need that help. But it won't be today. We don't know what they're planning or what they have up their sleeve. I need to keep you safe and out of harm's way. Ramdelior softened his voice. Do you understand? I need you to help me with this. Bliss nodded. If something does get past me, continued Ramdelior softly, use your flow to get away. Get as far away as you can, then look for me. Only then, not any other time. Do you understand? Bliss nodded again, though it was easy to see that she didn't like it much. It won't be long now, said Ramdelior as he stared out into the tree line with enhanced eyes. Before long, Ramdelior saw movement in the tree line. The movement was hardly noticeable, even with enhanced eyes, but he was sure it wasn't just the wind. Then a small golden dot appeared out in the open. It jumped into the sky and made its way towards them. An all-too-familiar figure landed before them, shaking the ground as its armour formed a large two-legged bird. 
The chains that hung from it stiffened and rattled as the large skull-like face turned towards Ramdelio. I was hoping to catch you somewhere in the mountains, said Anchufa, its voice deeper than he remembered. Uneven terrain, trees, that would have been ideal. But this, the large bird skull looked around, will have to do. There isn't any more time left. Last I remember, said Ramdelio, as he took a step forward, things didn't go too well for you. This time, said Anchufa, swelling up the pieces of its armour where the shoulder blades should be transmuting into an organic shape with several hands sticking out. Things are a little different. Thanks to you, I've discovered my full potential. Though Anchufa's form had changed, Ramdelia could not sense much of a difference in his flow level. The creature was still absurdly dangerous and he knew that he'd have to be careful of his every move. But that wasn't what worried him. No, he was worried about the spout they had encountered earlier on the trail. Part of him wished they had run into whoever placed that spout instead of Anchufa. Ramdelio glanced over to Bliss, and she took a few steps back. Anchufa's chains rattled, and his newly formed arms tightened. It doesn't matter how far back you go, or even if you disappear entirely. He looked over at Bliss, taking a step closer. I will find you once I'm done with him. Ramdelior ran and drove his horns straight into the creature's chest, pushing it far back and away from Bliss. The creature's hands wrapped around Ramdelior's body, compressing him. He knew that he was moments away from pain, so he reached inward to enhance his body in order to break Anchufa's grip. Nothing happened. Ramdelio's body stayed the same while Anchufa tightened his iron grip. His inner reservoir was covered by a dark veil of nothing, making it impossible for him to reach his power. Flo won't be able to help you now, said Anchufa, as his chains went wild. Ramdelio turned his attention towards breaking the golden plates that were lodged onto his horns as he felt Bliss getting closer instead of further away. He shook his head, making sure he made eye contact with Bliss. He then took a breath. Whatever amount of air the creature's grip allowed would have to be enough. Instead of relying on his life stream, Ramdelio began to crawl his way out, digging into Anchufa's armour with his powerful claws. The sharp edge of the golden armour brushed against his body as he moved. Where do you think you're going? Anchufa asked as he tightened his grip yet again. Ramdelio didn't bother to answer. Instead, he focused on getting out. Claw after claw, he moved up and slipped from the creature's grip. With only five of the creature's hands still holding him down, he made one last push, freeing himself. Anchufa tried to go after Ramdelio, but he was in control now, and to make things worse for the creature, the flow had returned. His reservoir was there, filled to the brim, waiting to be used at any moment. It gave Ramdelior a reassuring feeling of power. He easily evaded Anchuva's attempts to grab him once again, running and jumping around the field. Even without flow enhancing his body, Ramdelior far outmatched Anchuva in speed. It's those arms of his, Ramdelior thought. They were negating my flow, a flow nullifier. I always thought those were rumours, exaggerations within the law. Yet here it is. If I'm not careful, the next time he gets hold of me could be my last. Fine then, said Anchufa, giving up the chase. We'll just have to do this the hard way. The chains stopped rattling and his armour began to transmute yet again. His legs got stubbier and shorter, and the front of the creature's body fell to the ground and grew two short, stubby front legs. The six white arms grew, while the chains began to interlace behind the arms as they separated from the body. The end is coming for you. This is my relinquishment. Ramdelio knew then that Anchufa was ready to die, but not without defeating him first. A relinquishment was when a flow user broke their inner reservoir and used all their life stream at once. There were two differences between a relinquishment and simply using up all the life stream in the reservoir. 
First, all livestream would be directed towards an attack, which meant no defence, no enchantment of the body to fend off attacks, and no spouts to protect oneself. Second, breaking the reservoir meant the livestream doubled in strength, and ye could use more of it faster. Though once the livestream was used, it was gone forever. This was a technique known to the most experienced flow users, and they only found out about it when they reached their limit, or were entirely aware of said limit. Ramdelior hoped never to tell Bliss about it. He hoped she would never have to use such a technique, as the user rarely survived. Ramdelior dodged an attack from Anchufa, then another, then yet another. I told you, said Anchufa, as he moved to follow Ramdelior through the field. This will be your end. The creature's attacks were moving Ramdelior further and further away from Bliss. Each one forced him to cover a large amount of land, and the further he got from Bliss, the more he worried. He didn't want to be too far away from Bliss, but he also didn't want to be too close. The barrage of attacks was edging closer, nearly grabbing him once again. Ramdelior knew that he couldn't keep the same evasive strategy up for much longer. But the creature's newfound power had taken him by surprise. He needed time. He had an idea, but it was a long shot. If it worked once, thought Ramdelior, it'll work again. I need a little bit more time to get used to his speed. Fire, said Ramdelior, as he turned away from Amchufa and ran, leaving a trail of blazing fire behind. Then there was nothing. The barrage of attacks had stopped. The silence of the moment caused Ramdelior to stop and look back at the creature. To his surprise, Anchufa was tied down to the ground with a rather enormous amount of tree roots. Ramdelior looked towards Bliss. Although he couldn't see her facial features clearly, he could almost feel her smiling in the distance. Bliss had her right hand pointed towards Anchufa. I told her to stay still muttered Ramdelior as he turned towards the creature, still maintaining the fire trail. We'll have a nice long talk later. But for now I shouldn't complain. She bought me an opening. Ramdelior took a deep breath and called on his strength, readying his reservoir. All things burn, said Ramdelior, as fire erupted from his horns in a compressed cyclone, curving to the front of his head. The creature yelled as it tried to get free from Bliss's hold. Ram! said Ramdalior as he darted towards Anchufa and the world around him became a blur of motion. Wind roared in his ears as he covered the ground between him and the creature in mere moments. Ramdalior pierced the creature's chest, igniting the creature from the inside. Then he placed a tall ring of fire around the creature. He felt the fire pull on his reservoir. But unlike their past encounter, the fire had plenty of fuel on its own. No! yelled Anchufa, riddled with pain. No! It was a lot harder to see the strings of flow controlling the creature in broad daylight. Ramdelio thought he might have seen one or two, but even with his enhanced vision, he wasn't sure where the puppet master was hiding. Are you ready to come out yet? said Ramdelior as the fire disappeared from his horns and stopped trailing him. Let's finish this. Ram, said Bliss as she looked around. I don't like this feeling. A new spout was opening on them. But where was it coming from? It certainly wasn't coming from Anchufa. That creature wasn't capable of producing this kind of flow. All thoughts of winning, of living a normal life, of surviving the battle were disappearing. The new spout was working. Ramdelior ran towards Bliss. Look at me, said Ramdelior as he neared. Bliss turned reluctantly, her breathing agitated. We'll never win. This is something you can stop. It's a spout. Then it all came crashing down on them. More disillusionment, anguish, hopelessness. Whoever was controlling the spout knew they had been noticed. There's something else here, said Ramdelior as he scanned the tree line, looking for someone else beside the puppet wielder. I need you to do something. I can't. I'm not strong enough. I can't beat this. Bliss, listen to me, said Ramdelior slowly. 
Focus on my voice and my voice only. Ease your breathing. Bliss closed her eyes and took a deep breath. Look deep inside of you, said Ramdelior, his voice calm. Feel the Atsu around us and send everything that's not supposed to be there away. Don't let them win. Bliss's shoulders loosened, her breathing normalised, and a slight smile returned to her face. Now, this is a spout, continued Ramdelior in a normal tone. A powerful one at that. I've never felt anything like this. But it is something you can take down. Bliss opened her eyes and nodded. Look towards the tree line, said Ramdalior as he turned away from Bliss. It's likely there are several spouts concealed behind one or two. Bliss turned towards the tree line and began scanning it. I see them now. There are fourteen spouts coming from that direction, said Bliss as she pointed eastward, almost in the direction they had come from. There's also one over us. She pointed towards the ground, and all the spouts went away, revealing their foe's hiding place. There were four individuals, one of whom was Antufa, though he had a behemoth cleaver through his chest. He wasn't moving. The sword belonged to one of the identical individuals. Next to the identical individuals was a tall, grotesque creature, Nulian for sure, that resembled a rock and a lizard at the same time, but was neither. One of the twins, the one with both hands free, stepped forward, clapping twice. Bravo, the twins said in a feminine voice. Though they were far away, Ramdelio could hear her clearly. She must be using a communication spout. You managed to take down all of our spouts. They took us a long time to set up. But at least now we know that we've found the right prey. The Divine One will be pleased once we're done with you. Stay here, said Ramdelior to Bliss as he stepped towards the individuals. Remember what I told you. So, the rumours are true, said one of the twins as she pulled the behemoth cleaver from Antufa's corpse. You're always the first to charge. Ramdelior snorted, but he hesitated as he caught a whiff of something he had hoped he'd never smell again. Rot was slowly surrounding them. The stench made him want to bath. It would still be a few more moments before Bliss smelled the putrid smell. What's the matter? said the cleaver-wielding twin. Don't tell me that a few thousand rot soldiers are enough to unnerve you. But you shouldn't worry. They're here just in case you try to run away. Things are going to get much, much harder, thought Ramdelior. If only I didn't have to worry about Bliss, I could fight far better. No, that shouldn't be the way I think about it. I need to focus. Bliss is not in the way. He glanced at Bliss. She was already covering her nose. He smiled. It's because of her that I will fight better. I'm just not that fond of the smell, said Ramdelior as he continued to step forward. It's a price we all have to pay said the cleaver-wielding twin. Before we start, wouldn't you like to know the names of those responsible for your death? No, I'm fine without it. Well, that's not very polite of you. I'll tell you anyway. I'm Cry, said the twin with the giant cleaver. This is Shy. Cry gestured to her left. My sister. And this is Monster, a Jerio lord. A Jerio lord? The Nulian was ugly, but Ramdelia wouldn't go as far as calling him a monster. I'm glad you asked, said Cry. Monster, why don't you start things off for us? The Jerio lord roared and sprinted at Ramdelior. As he ran, parts of the ground made way for him and others stuck to his feet. It was as if he was part of the ground. An earth creature, Ramdelior thought. Regardless, I need to make this quick. Ramdelior ran towards the Jerio Lord, getting a feel for his footing. Even though the Jerio Lord was a lot faster than he looked, Ramdelior knew he could outrun it. It was the high wearies he was really worried about. 
As he and the creature neared each other, the Jerio Lord thrust one of his hands onto the ground. Instinct took hold of Ramdelior, urging him to jump. As he did so, a massive hand came up from underneath the ground, trying to grab Ramdelior, but he was already too far up in the air. In midair, from the corner of his eye, he saw the high wearies running towards Bliss. I knew it, thought Ramdelior as he landed behind the Jerio Lord. He was only meant to be a distraction. Undeterred, the Jerio Lord turned around, breaking its hand off and simply growing a new one. He moved towards Ramdelior. But this time, instead of burying his hand in the ground, he buried his whole body. Eight limbs surrounded Ramdelior as he landed. The limbs formed a cage. The newly constructed cage looked impressive and downright indestructible, though it did have one obvious flaw. Towards its upper limit, the limbs became imperfect, leaving a big enough opening for a decent-sized Nulian to slip out. I got you now, said the Jerio Lord. Fire, said Ramdelior, as he leaped out of the cage, leaving a trail of fire behind. You'll have to do a lot better than that. The Jerio Lord roared, enraged, retracting his limbs and giving chase. But it was too late for the creature. Ramdelior had seen enough of him to know what he was all about. Ramdelior ran, pushing his body, burying his claws into the ground, aiming to put himself between the high wearies and bliss. In a matter of moments, he had reached them. Trailing a line of fire behind him, he did not stop in front of bliss. Instead, he went far past her, nearing the tree line. Burn! commanded Ramdelior as he turned and ran back towards bliss. The trail of fire Ramdelior had left behind erupted into a massive inferno, cutting the field in two. The fire barrier left Bliss and Ramdelior on one side, and the High Wearies and Jerio Lord on the other, though he wasn't entirely sure where the Jerio Lord was. Are you all right? said Ramdelior as he neared Bliss. This might not hold them for long. We should go. He was on edge, unsure of what was going to happen. Something about this fight bothered him. He wasn't scared. He was sure he could take them on. So what was it? Perhaps it was the uncertainty of Bliss having to join the fight. Hadn't he told Bliss not to get involved? He saw no other way. He wouldn't be able to watch her if it was three against one. It's another spout, said Bliss. Ramdelia looked at Bliss, confused. Above you, said Bliss, as she pointed with her index finger. Confinement. I think it's been forming since you were fighting with the creature. She made a pinching gesture and tossed the spout to the ground. There, I think I should pay more attention to those. Clarity returned to Ramdelior's mind, and with it a clear sensation of danger. We must leave, said Ramdelior. Bliss nodded. You heavily underestimate us, said a voice coming from the other side of the fire barrier. It was shy. Walking through the barrier with her shield in front of her, Cry followed a few steps behind. At once, Ramdelio took down the fire barrier. It made little sense to have it draining his reservoir if they could simply walk through it. There's no avoiding us, said Cry as she moved to Shy's side. The Jerio Lord roared behind them, moving in and out of the ground as it made its way to them. Earlier, I told you to use your flow only if they got past me, said Ramdelior, half turning towards Bliss. Well, they got past me. Don't fight them directly. Keep moving back until I can take at least one of them down. If you get into a situation that you can't get yourself out of, I'll be there. Also, we don't have much time. The rot are nearing the tree line. If they fully surround us, it'll be hard to escape. Bliss nodded. Chapter 21 Embers Many flow users feel that using their life stream is something to rejoice, to make, move, and bring to life something that wasn't there before, brought joy to their lives. But for the Herald of Flow herself, using her life stream had only ever brought her pain. Bliss's heart pounded with the anticipation of battle, but she trusted Ram. As long as he was there with her, 
things would turn out all right. She took a deep breath, trying to calm herself. But almost as soon as she took it, regret washed over her. The air around them wasn't fresh anymore. It reeked of the rot. Let's get serious, sneered Ramdelier as he got into a crouch. By all means, said Crie as she put both hands on her cleaver. Ram unleashed a series of powerful attacks on the two wearies. The thunder of his attacks clashing into Shie's shield echoed across the field. The sky darkened into night with each strike. Heat began to surround them. Meanwhile, the Garia Lord, with only its head showing above the ground, made its way to Bliss. That creature can only move underground because the soil is soft. What if, Bliss thought, as she extended her hand towards the Garia Lord, what if I make it a little bit more difficult for him? Here goes nothing. Pardon, whispered Bliss. A sharp jolt followed, running through her hand as it always did when using her life stream. But this time, she was expecting it. The Garyo Lord stiffened. Feedback ran through her body as the creature tried to fight its way out. But it was nothing she couldn't handle. A mild inconvenience. Now to help Ram, Bliss thought, raising her cloak to her face to take in a deep breath. Ram's fire attacks were useless against Shie's shield. It looked as if the shield absorbed and dispersed each one of his attacks towards the ground. It wasn't that Ram was focusing only on Shie. He was trying to attack Krie as well. But somehow, the shield always stopped his attacks. A grave situation was developing for Ram. Nearly all of his real strength came from fire. It was one of the reasons why so many called him a fire demon. If fire couldn't get through the shield, what could? Bliss extended her arm towards Shie and her shield, closed her eyes, and pulled. Nothing happened. Had Bliss's livestream just bounced off the shield? Shie glared at Bliss, prompting her to lower her hand. Bliss saw a shift in the fight. Ram stopped using flow and instead used a combination of physical attacks. He was getting closer to them, outwitting the giant cleaver and feinting an attack on Shie only to move closer towards Krie. A spectacle to behold, precise and powerful movements from both sides. But no matter what Ram did, how close he got to landing a blow, Shie's shield was always there. It was the perfect weapon against Ram. Bliss saw movement in the distance from the corner of her eye. The rot were getting closer. Their stench was getting stronger. She had to do something. But what? Sorry, but we have to win. Gavril really wants that girl. Shie said, as she blocked yet another of Ram's attacks. Will you shut up? said Krie, as she continued to swing the massive cleaver. Why would you apologize to the enemy? The way she swings that sword, Bliss thought. It's like it's made out of flowers or feathers. No. Concentrate. This is not the time to get distracted by how things work. What did Ram always say? Study the things you see, learn the thing you hear? What does that have to do with this? Will you shut up? Crie's words hung in Bliss's mind, repeating themselves. They fight as a unit. One blocks and the other attacks. But in mind, they are separated. Two different ways of thinking. Two different people. Bliss saw it then. The obvious flaw in the wearies. She smiled. Now, all she had to do was separate them for a moment. Bliss put her hands together and began walking towards the fight. Bliss, what are you doing? asked Ram, barely avoiding the cleaver's sharp edge. Do you have a death wish, little girl? asked Crie, quickly glancing at Bliss, then returning to focus on Ram. Shatter, said Bliss, extending her hands towards Crie. Enormous vines, rocks, and boulders rose all around her, breaking the earth that surrounded her except for where she stood. Bliss cocked her head, and the rocks and boulders darted towards Crie, but as Bliss expected, Shie was there to stop them. Bliss's attack struck the shield, causing a cacophony of crashes. Ram hadn't stopped attacking Crie, and for the first time since the fight began, he was gaining ground. Bliss wasn't finished. She moved her right hand to the side and turned it into a fist. There was much more she could still do. The pain flowing through her body was still tolerable, not nearly as bad as it used to be. Now, it felt more like an unease, a tightening of her muscles. I'll stop any crashes you aim at me, 
yelled Xie over the thunderous crashes. She looked angry as she tried to push against the barrage. Or my sister. Nothing will get past me. I know, said Bliss, trying to hide a smile. Rise. She raised her right hand halfway, and the ground between them rose up with it, dividing the battle in two, leaving Kriye and Ram on one side and Xie and Bliss on the other. As for the rock creature, well, he was now part of the massive wall that had risen from the ground. The creature's hand and arm stuck out from the wall towards the top. Not bad, right? No, yelled Xie as she slammed her shield into the wall. What have you done? Now, you're incomplete. Xie continued slamming her shield against the wall to no avail. Bliss had made the wall solid. No spouts or enhanced weapons could be taking it down any time soon. Now, Ram can concentrate. If he doesn't have me to worry about, and if he doesn't have Xie's shield blocking his every attack, he'll defeat Kriye. I'm sure of it. What? You think I can't kill you? Asked Xie between gritted teeth as she pulled a small knife from her belt. I'll do it by myself if I have to. She snarled at Bliss. I'll do it. I'll be the one. Strings, whispered Bliss, as she pointed her palm towards Xie. Xie fell to the floor as vines grabbed her ankles and legs, then made her way to her arms. The vines tightened, making Xie drop her knife and release her shield. Bliss whisked the enormous shield away with a gust of wind. Then, Bliss began feeling the pain return. She was nearing the limit of what she could do but she must continue if Ram was to have a chance. Bliss made her way towards Xie. She wasn't sure what she'd do now, but she'd seen Ram do this many times. He had always been the one to press on, to walk forwards, to finish what he started. Please let me go, said Xie, her voice breaking. I must help my sister. Her fight was gone. All that remained was the broken shell of a warrior. I need to help my sister. I need to help her. She won't be able to defeat that fire demon without me. I know, said Bliss quietly, as she approached. Behind them, behind the wall, explosions showed their crown and made the ground tremble, while something occasionally carved at the wall. The explosions sounded and muffled, their power dampened, and the carvings were less frequent, but they carried more power. That's probably her, said Chie. Looking up at Bliss for the first time, tears running down her cheeks. She's trying to cut down the wall. Bliss said nothing, as she stopped a body length away from her. I didn't ask for this. My sister didn't ask for this. We were forced. We had no other choice but to do what he asks us. Sister? Thought Bliss. Until this point, Bliss hadn't thought of them as sisters, even though they were identical. How has he forced you? Aren't you able to make your own decisions? No. There's always a choice. No, there isn't. At least not for us. Bliss cocked her head, waiting for more. If we didn't come for you, our tribe would have starved long ago. He offered us help on the condition... That you'll kill me? Interrupted Bliss. We tried to prolong it as much as we could. We could have found you sooner, but we didn't. We aren't horrible, I'd like to believe. Part of us wished that you would just disappear and stay that way. The comment hurt Bliss more than she expected. For all that time that you were completely gone, our tribe thrived, securing trade of our own despite everything being controlled by him. Things almost felt normal, as they should be. Our tribe had acquired a normal life. Him? Gavril. Bliss felt a chill at the mention of his name. He is growing out of control. He is not the same anymore. Each day that passes, he becomes more desperate to find you. I think it's only a matter of time before you have to face him. The rot grew closer, now well into the battlefield, though they looked hesitant. Bliss looked at them, her hand to one side, her life stream ready. They will do nothing, said Chie, as she looked over at the corpse army. Not unless I tell them to. Gavril put them under my control. They're mindless creatures. Xie turned towards Bliss. I can recognize when we've lost. Tell them to go back away. Back. Go back, said Xie, her voice faint. The rot began stepping back. On the other side of the wall, the sky turned red with fire. Then, a thundering, earth-shaking sore sounded. Then, it was silent. 
It looked like the fire had consumed one half of the world. Crie! cried out Shie. Bliss released the vines that held her. Shie, the formerly powerful High Weary, fell limp to the floor. Bliss heard yelling behind the wall. Then, she paid more attention. Bliss, you can call back your wall! Ram's muffled voice came through. Bliss relaxed her flow, and half of her wall came slowly down, but she made sure to leave the Gario Lord in place. The noise it caused was nothing compared to the crackling, thunderous sounds it made as it went up. Heat radiated from the other side, as the familiar, charred smell surrounded the area. Ram came into view, still smoking, the crown of fire behind his head. He was wounded, with slashes covering his body, but his face looked normal. In fact, it looked as if he was trying not to smile. The crown of fire disappeared when he locked eyes with Bliss. This was the second time she had seen that crown. Though this time around, it was larger than last. Had he been using that much life stream? Was Kree really that powerful? Bliss shook her thoughts away and ran towards Ram. Oh, Ram, said Bliss as she embraced him. Are you okay? Things hurt a lot less prior to someone squeezing me. Reluctantly, Bliss let go. She wanted to continue hugging him, making sure he was there. As far as she knew, he was the only one who didn't want her dead. Ram turned to where Kriye's charred body lay unmoving. Bliss followed, and so did Shie. Shie screamed at the top of her lungs, while Bliss turned towards Ram. I didn't, said Ram as he looked at Bliss. She's still breathing. Shie thrashed and moved towards her sister, embracing and gently shaking her. Please wake up, said Shie. She'll be fine, said Ram as he moved towards them. Bliss followed. All she needs is one of those fixer spouts, and she'll be as good as new. Oh, really? asked Shie with fury. And who's going to cast it? I figured you were, said Ram as he shrugged. It doesn't work that way, said Shie, glaring at him. We're a unit. We would both have to cast the spout. She's hardly alive. Bliss noticed the condition Crie was in. Severe burns covered her whole body, along with cuts and lacerations. It was a rather gruesome sight. Her heart broke. A deep, wrenching feeling was manifesting. Bliss felt bad for the two sisters, despite everything that had happened. Bliss looked at Ram. He shook his head slowly. Nothing I know would work, said Ram, his voice soft. I might be able to do something, said Bliss, as she neared the two, while Ram stood behind them. What can you do? asked Shie. Do you know any healing spouts, any fixer spouts? How can you possibly help? You're clearly too young to know any of them, and a healing spout won't help her. I can undo what's been done, said Bliss. Now move. Shie hesitated a few moments, then got out of the way for Bliss. Bliss kneeled next to Crie, closed her eyes, and took a deep breath. Within moments, she was inside the stream of flow alongside Crie's fading presence. She could see where the connections with the stream had been severed, and she could also see what had been done to her body. One by one, Bliss began to pull back all foreign and toxic substances, even the smallest traces. She then began to pump some of her own life stream into Crie's body, enriching it with regenerative properties. As the wounds began to heal on their own, Bliss began to reattach the severed connections to the stream of flow. In truth, Bliss wasn't sure what she was doing. She was following her intuition. Something told her that it could be done. Give it some time, said Bliss as she opened her eyes. She should be waking up any time now. Crie woke up, shouting and crazy-eyed, flinging herself at Bliss, but before she could touch her, Shie embraced her sister. Crie's wounds had turned into light scars across her body, barely noticeable. It's all right, sister, said Shie, tightening her grip. It's all right. You're still here. We're still here. No! shouted Crie, her right hand extended towards her massive cleaver. Our coven, our people, we have to do this. We still have them. Use them. Crie pointed at the retreating rot. Give the order. Look at me, yelled Shie, her hands cupping her sister's face. We have no chance, not anymore. They know how to separate us. It's over. 
A single teardrop ran down Kriye's cheek. Bliss stood up and took a few steps back towards Ram, her heart wrenching. Was there really nothing she could do for them? Was killing her their only way out? What will you do now? Asked Ram, moving alongside Bliss, embers appearing all around him. Return to our coven, perhaps, said Chie, turning towards Ram. Hide for the rest of our lives, if we get to live that long. He will hunt us as he hunts you. He doesn't tolerate failure. This will all be over soon, said Ram, embers receding. I don't see this ever ending, said Chie. He is stronger than you, and you're stronger than him. Your flow exceeds anything we faced before. But so does this. He's as unstoppable as you are unmovable. Ram cocked his head, and Bliss found herself doing the same thing. That almost makes no sense, said Ram. Don't you see? said Chie. An eternal conflict. The unstoppable versus the unmovable. Gavra will have no choice but to come and look for us himself, said Ram, turning halfway from the two sisters. I doubt he'll find something stronger than you. And his time is running out. It will only be a few more years before he fails, absolutely. When he comes, I'll be ready for him. Ready to stop him. Ready to end it all. Go back to your tribe and live. If the spouts you used on us are any indication, Gavra will have a hard time finding you or your tribe. Time he doesn't have to waste. The sisters nodded slowly. Let's go, said Ram, turning fully away from them. We still have a long journey ahead of us. He has someone in every village, said Chie, her voice low. Particularly those around the Pasok. They won't think twice about trying to strike you down, casualties or not. We'll keep that in mind, said Ram, as Bliss hopped on his back and began to float. Thank you, said Chie. Thank you for sparing us. Ram said nothing and began sprinting away. Some part of Bliss, a deep part within her, wanted to tell Ram to turn towards the village she was from. She wondered about her parents, what they were like, and if perhaps they still remembered her. Aside from Ram, they were probably the only ones alive who didn't want her dead. But what would happen if they did find them? Would Bliss abandon Ram to go live with them? Would she have a normal life? No. Probably not, she told herself. If anything, the moment Ram finds them would be the moment they die. If what the sisters said holds any truth, perhaps, someday, when all this is over, she would get to see them again. She sighed. Chapter 22 Stone Grounds the great builders of the world were entrusted with their safety, for they would await the end of the world, surrounded by stone. Ramdelio ran the remainder of the way to the stone grounds. Their stops were less frequent and quicker than before. He ran for three days and four nights, only slowing down for the barest of necessities. Ram wasn't taking any more chances. He knew that Gavril would be out looking for them in force. Is that it? asked Bliss, shading her eyes from the sun with her hand. It was warm out, warmer than usual for that time of year. It seemed that lately the climate had taken to extremes. Even the mountains of Ikra had been eerily cold. It has to be, said Remdelior, as a flock of birds flew overhead in the same direction they were heading. We've been running for a while now. But I can't see a village, said Bliss, leaning forward. Can you see something? Nothing, just stone. We'll have to keep going to know for sure. I wonder what that place is. It's not natural. How do you know that? Asked Ramdelior, knowing the answer full well. It's completely flat, and it's huge, bigger than anything I've seen before. For us to be able to see it from so far away and know that it's flat, it had to be made that way. What else? I can't see it clearly, but it looks like it's made out of straight lines. Nature doesn't build in straight lines. Do you know who could have made such a structure and for what purpose? I have a theory, said Ramdelior. Tell me, 
said Bliss, hanging on the words. Ram smiled. He enjoyed Bliss's company through and through. The great masons of the seven worlds, said Ram, glancing back at Bliss. Those who spend their lives building. Whoa, said Bliss, intrigued. There are such people. Tell me more about them. Hey, slow down there, said Ram Delior, turning back to focus on their destination. With any luck, we'll get to meet a few of them, and at the same time find out why Hazer sent us here. Bliss nodded and found a more comfortable position on Rem Delior's back. They reached the stone grounds a few hours later. From up close, the massive structure looked even bigger, with rows upon rows of perfectly levelled stones as far as the eye could see. The stones were cool to the touch, providing Ram Delior's paws with some much-needed relief from the heat of the desert. So what now? asked Bliss as she hopped down from Ram Delior's back. What are we supposed to do here? Aside from the intricately placed stones and equally intricate old world spout carvings on the stone, there was nothing. The birds had long outpaced Ram Delior, leaving him and Bliss alone. These look familiar, said Bliss as she kneeled and began to inspect the marking on the stones. Do you think they're spouts of some sort? They're old world spouts, said Ram Delior, taking a second look at the ground though it looks like they stopped working long ago. Old world spouts, echoed Bliss as she ran her fingers over the carvings. Hazer also mentioned an oasis, said Ram Delior as he looked around. But I don't see anything. Then from the corner of his eye, Ram Delior spotted something rapidly approaching. He turned to face the incoming shadows. He tensed and lowered into a crouch. We might get some answers sooner than we thought. Get behind me. Bliss got up and moved behind Ram Delior. The five shadows seemed to accelerate the closer they got. Moments later, as the shadows got larger, Ram Delior saw their shapes despite the harsh rays of the sun. Granus, muttered Ram Delior. Gran what? Granus, said Ram Delior, relaxing ever so slightly, but still holding his crouch. They aren't known to be violent, but we shouldn't lower our guard. If they get past me, what will you do? Ram, complained Bliss. What will you do? asked Ram firmly. I will get away from here, said Bliss, dragging the words and rolling her eyes. Use my life stream if I have to and all of that. Careful with your attitude. I'll have none of that, especially right now. We don't know if they're friend or foe, do you understand? Bliss nodded. The five Granus landed with a thump in a gust of wind, clearing the loose particles of sand around them. Although they were Nulians, the Granus resembled humans. If it wasn't for their grey skin, coloured hair, wings and tail, they could easily be confused with humans. They wore clothes just like the humans from the villages did, though their clothes were shorter. Ram Delior wondered if it were intentional, or if they were simply trying to fit into human clothes. Each one carried a small sack with a strap that crossed its chest. Messengers, Ram Delior thought. That would mean that their village is nearby. Nulian, said the foremost Granu. There is no need for that here. We come in peace. Is that so? asked Ram as he relaxed even further. Something told Ram Delior that the Granus before them were honest Nulians. It is so, said the Granu. We pride ourselves on keeping absolute peace around here. Is there such a thing? asked Ram as he abandoned his crouch and sat slowly. We have reaped the benefits of peace for the last thirty years. So who are you? asked Bliss as she took a step forward. And what is this place? I'm Inayas, said the Granu. This is Thena, Sibia, Grenchi, and Fotango. We are messengers from the Great Stone Village, at your service. Each of them saluted with a closed fist over their chest. As for the place, 
This is the zero-sum stone flats that surround our village. Wait, said Bliss, her eyes wide. You mean to say that you're the great masons of the Seven Worlds? Anias flushed, his skin suddenly rosier. You could say that, said Anias. Some of my people have dedicated their entire lives to the art of masonry. They would be flattered to receive such kind words. And who might you be? The Great Stone Village, said Ramdelio. Can you take us there? I'm sorry, friend, said Anias. But this is as far as you will go. Ramdelio locked eyes with Anias. Do not take it personally, continued Anias. Beyond this point, there is a strict rule in place that prohibits outsiders from getting any closer. What could be in there? thought Ramdelio. What would make them take all these extra measures? How long has this rule been in place? asked Ramdelio, standing up on all fours. Please do not force our hand, said Anias. It may not look like it, but the area is heavily guarded by our best warriors. You will be caught, and if they find reason, you might also be executed. To further make my point, reaching beyond these grounds will be impossible. We face worse odds, said Ramdelio, gesturing at Bliss to hop on his back. Nulian, said Anias, stiffening. This is a fight you can't win. Though Ramdelio felt no real hostility coming from the Granus, he did feel a sense of urgency to move on. My name is Ramdelio. Bliss hopped on top of his back and began floating. And I have to know what's in your village. So, if you don't mind. Anias said nothing, just cocked his head and inspected Ramdelio. His eyes opened wide, and he looked as if he had just realised something important. Ramdelio, said Sibia, as she took half a step forward. As in the Watcher of the Herald of Flo. And she must be the Herald herself. The five Granus kneeled before Bliss and Ramdelio. What are they doing? asked Bliss in a hushed tone. It's a sign of subservience, said Ramdelio in an equally hushed voice. Forgive us, said Anias. We didn't know we were in the presence of giants. We are not giants, said Ramdelio. Nor is there any reason you should be kneeling. But I would appreciate it if you could take me to your village. I believe there's something for us there. The five Granus rose to their feet, and Anias nodded. He turned towards Sibia and gave her a nod, and she nodded back. She then took a few steps back, stretched her wings, and flew back towards where they had come from. She'll go on ahead, said Anias. She's the messenger for all of Ikra. She'll warn the guards to stand down and call the village elders. They'll want to speak to you. We have all been waiting for your arrival. If you would follow us. Ramdelio snorted. The truth was that he wasn't sure what he was doing, but he did want to get it done. He was tired of running, of hiding. He was ready to face whatever came their way, and he suspected that Bliss felt the same. Even if this turned out to be a bad idea, or even a trap, Ramdelio would be a hard one to corner or pin down. But something told him that it wouldn't come to that. They darted towards the centre of the zero-sum stone grounds. After what felt like fifteen minutes of travel, they approached a large canyon. As they neared, he realised that the word canyon failed to describe what he was seeing. It was bigger than that. A void fit better. A void in the ground, perfectly circular. It was massive, almost as big as the distance they had traversed. And it had been handmade. It had been handmade. The walls from the centre of the void to the even ground up top were entirely sheer. No slope, no stairs, just a fall. At the centre of the massive void stood a village made of stone. They came to a stop as they neared the edge of the void. The distance between where Ramdelio stood and the lower level of the void was easily twice as long as any waterfall he had seen. There is a path down, said Anias, as he pointed over the edge. Though not very visible, 
We will also carry you down if you wish. Ramdelio looked over the edge of the void, where he saw a narrow walkway that led all the way down. Hold on tight, said Ramdelio, looking back at Bliss. She nodded, stopped floating on his back, and took hold of his mane. Then, without warning, he leaped down to the narrow walkway and began making his way down. He jumped wherever he could and ran wherever he couldn't. Within moments, he had reached the ground. The four Grandus arrived behind them. By the great river, said Anias. I, we have never seen anyone descend in such a way. Ramdelior said nothing. Instead, he darted off once again, this time towards the centre of the void, where he hoped to find answers. Wait, said Anias. We must give proper warning of your arrival. But Ramdelior couldn't wait, not any more. He wanted to. No, he needed to know why Hazer had sent them here, of all places. The four Granus struggled to keep up with Ramdelior, even though they had every advantage. Ramdelior finally came to a stop as they neared the great stone village. Inayas stopped beside them, winded, while the three remaining Granus went on ahead, flying over the walls that surrounded the village. We must observe the stone ways, said Anias, catching his breath. You must wait until the elders grant you safe passage. Bliss started floating once again on Ramdelior's back as he paced back and forth. We're almost there, said Bliss. We'll know soon enough. Was she trying to calm him down? Ramdelior took a deep breath and tried to relax. Bliss was right. There was no sense in pushing through this, even as he felt the weight of the seven worlds on his shoulders. Unlike most other villages they had seen, or at least the villages that were surrounded by walls, this village had no visible entrance. It was all stone. A loud click sounded, and the ground began to tremble as the wall moved upwards in a circular motion. Slowly, what Randelio assumed was the entrance of the town came into view, an unmarked opening in the stone wall in the shape of an arc. You have been officially welcomed, said Anias, standing with his shoulders back and his chest out, and gesturing at the moving wall. Welcome to the great stone village. Admiration washed over Ramdelior as he entered the Granu village. Bliss also gaped in awe, with her eyes wide open as she looked about. Everywhere he looked he saw space, well-organised space. Everything followed organisation and structure. Small, rounded gardens with a single tree in the middle dotted the village. Straight, small channels of water ran along every walkway. Even the marketplace, the most chaotic part of any village, was well organised, with granus falling into line, waiting for their turn. Everything was made of stone. Wood seemed sparse and was seemingly replaced by iron. Fires burned at every corner, keeping the temperature very warm. Most granus didn't seem to mind Ramdelio and Bliss, though they were clearly the only outsiders in the village. The ones who did, shot a glance at Ramdelio or Bliss and quickly returned to what they were doing. Odd, muttered Ramdelio. Did you tell them not to look at us? asked Bliss as she turned towards Anias. No, not at all, said Anias, half turning to look at Bliss. It's the Granu way. Our guests are few and far between. You aren't exactly easy to find, said Ramdelio. Aside from that, continued Anias, turning back to the path. We like our guests to feel at home, as if they're one of us. By ignoring them? asked Bliss. Exactly, said Anias enthusiastically. Nothing says you're welcome in a place like not caring if you are there or not. I guess that makes sense, said Ramdelio, in a reserved way. Later, once you've been welcomed by the village's elders, the Granus will be a lot more friendly. Then you'll be treated like family. I can already imagine the warmth, said Ramdelio. As they walked down the pathway with Anias in the lead, one building stood out from the rest. The building was easily five times the size of any home or stall in the stone village. 
It had a multitude of hanging gardens that made the building look as if it was part of nature. It was quite literally the only thing in the village that looked like a part of nature. Two sets of granus stood on each side of the entrance to the hanging garden. They aren't blocking the entrance, said Anias. That means we can enter. They were greeted by two older granus as they entered the building. They wore much different clothes. The male wore a loose, button-up vest with an almost regal look to it that extended past his knees. Around where his waist would be, there was a large belt, easily three times as thick as any Ramdelio had seen before. His trousers were neatly tucked into the bindings he wore around the lower part of his legs, and one shoulder was covered with a cloak. The female wore a simplistic tin-coloured dress with clear-cut lines, but the back of the dress was more complicated, making it look as if a flower was blossoming behind her. She too wore a cloak across one shoulder, but on the opposite side. Both stood up straight, their heads up and eyebrows raised. We've been waiting a long time for you, said the bearded Granu to the right. Anias, thank you for your help thus far, but I'm afraid this is where it will end. You can return to your daily duties. You may shut the door behind you. Anias nodded curtly and did as he was told. Despite the closed door and the absence of wall torches, the room was well illuminated. Ramdelio looked about to see where the light was coming from. Granu engineering, said the bearded Granu. One of the few things we get right. Bliss hopped down and stood by Ramdelio's side. So, we're here, said Ramdelio. What now? Now we do nothing, said the bearded Granu. I would say you're just on time to start doing nothing. Hazer guessed your arrival well. So he knows about Hazer, thought Ramdelio. That's a good sign. At least we know we came to the right place. But still, how can we do nothing? What do you mean we do nothing? asked Ramdelio. This old stone can be a little cryptic at times, said the female Granu, who had a surprisingly soothing voice. But let us start where all fruitful first-time conversations should start. This is Hall Hag Estonia. She gestured to the bearded Granu, then gestured to herself. I am Iras Estonia, and together with the chieftains of the village. It is with great honour that I welcome you to our humble village. Ramdelior and Bliss, said Ramdelior dryly. Hall Hag and Iras bowed their heads. You've been sent here by none other than Hazer herself, said Iras. Isn't that so? Ramdelio nodded. Hazer, continued Iras, happens to be one of the only great things we have on our side. We have been preparing for your arrival for over fourteen years now. We can only hope we've done justice to Hazer's instructions. How do you know, Hazer? asked Ramdelio. Perhaps the same way you do, said Iras. For years she called for us, appearing to us in our sleep, until one day we decided to seek her out. We then discovered what horrible things awaited the seven worlds. She told us about you, and how we must do everything in our power to keep you safe in the final years leading to the mastery of your life stream. She turned towards Bliss. She holds the key to saving this world. What a change in tone, thought Ramdelior. Bliss went from being the one thing that could cause the end of the world to the one thing that would save it. Relief washed over Ramdelior, taking a huge weight off his shoulders. He had always known he was doing the right thing by protecting and watching over Bliss. But hearing someone else say it, and to believe it as much as he did, was all that he needed to hear to press on. Bliss looked confused, or better said, it was as if she was trying to understand, but it looked like she didn't mind hearing what Iras was saying. Her expression was calm, with her brows slightly furrowed and a hint of a smile. Like Ramdelior, she too welcomed the news of her being the saviour of the world, rather than its destroyer. 
A lot has happened in the last eight years, said Hulheg. The one called Gavril has seized control of the Seven Worlds. Hazer warned us that he would come knocking on our door, bringing war and destruction with him. She also told us to prepare, said Eras. And that's what we did. There's only one place not under the control of Gavril, and that's these very stone grounds. We have resisted every attempt of conquest from the neighbouring ruling kingdom. Don't get me wrong, they have tried, but they have also failed. We have been lucky thus far. Nothing has been able to reach us. The zero-sum stone grounds, thought Ramdeliel. The great Gavril himself, said Hulheg, has tried to reach us with all his armies and flying creatures. But our sovereignty has stood even the most arduous tests. Sooner or later they all leave, unable to reach us, promising to come back. So he came here and left? asked Ramdeliel. That's correct, said Hulheg, though I suspect there was a lack of interest on his part. What he would have to go through to get to us was simply not worth it at the time. We suspect that will no longer be the case when the rest of the worlds has already been conquered and the only place you can be is here. Ramdelior felt a chill run down his spine at the comment. It was true. Gavril would eventually put everything together and come looking for them here. But things were different now. What would previously have been crushing news was now merely the reality of the situation. Ramdelior and Bliss, thanks to Hazer, had found someone that was willing to help them. But worry not, said Eras. Until that day comes, you'll be safe and welcomed inside these walls. We prepared as best we could. Nothing lasts forever, said Hulheg. Hazer has predicted the fall of the stone village. The zero-sum stone grounds won't hold forever. The best thing we can do is try, give it our best, and hope that our Newlian brethren, along with the rest of the Newlians and humans of the world, will outlast what's coming. For now, rest, my friend. Ramdelio thought he would never hear those words. Claim back life, said Eris. Show the little one the rest of what she needs to know about life stream. But above all else, Know that behind these walls, you're safe. Ramdelior let out a sigh of relief. Chapter 23 Behind Stone Walls Even those hardened by the hardship, loneliness and darkness of the world were not ready for what was to come. No one was. Gavril sat in his throne, consumed by hatred towards himself. He hated what he had become. He thought of himself as the definition of evil. Whatever happened to that respected farmer? Whatever happened to the gentleman his parents had raised him to be? Whatever happened to his life? Now he was a fully-fledged tyrant turned divinity across the seven worlds. Nothing moved unless he allowed it. He was the ultimate ruler in all the seven worlds and no worlds. And yet, they had disappeared yet again. They had disappeared yet again! He clenched his jaw. He, in all his might, had failed yet again. The strongest of his monsters, the greatest of his hunters, had proven to be little more than a hiccup to the Watcher and that wretched girl. Or could it be? Could it be the seven worlds were lying to him, hiding them right underneath his nose? Perhaps, but it was unlikely. Gavril knew that his hold over the seven worlds wasn't absolute, especially in the areas far from the rulers. Things still happened without his knowledge. But how could he make sure they didn't? Perhaps pathetic, said Ezis, interrupting as he appeared behind Gavril's throne. Gavril had stopped bothering to react to Ezzy's appearances long ago. In reality, Gavril didn't much care what the ethereal being had to say. It was like living with a pest that just wouldn't go away, there to make a bad day worse. All that power, 
continued Ezes, and nothing of substance has come with it. The ruler of the seven worlds can't track down a girl and her dog. Just when I thought my day couldn't get any worse, I get to experience a new low. You never cease to amaze me. Go torment someone else. You aren't welcome here. I know. Unfortunately for me, someone has to remind you of the horrible job you're doing at getting the girl. It would be better for both of us if you actually found her. I don't like much coming here to this sad, dreadful place you call home. I'd much rather be in my world. Gavril narrowed his eyes and looked over at Ezzy's. I'm here in the sense of talking to you. Ezzy's cleared his throat. Not in a physical state. You cannot reach me, not even through this disgraceful flow of yours. Thus, you cannot kill me. I'm just keeping an eye out for when things do change. Can you really blame me for trying? If only you tried that hard to get the girl, perhaps I wouldn't have to come here. Do you mock my efforts? said Gavril, his upper lip twitching and his brows furrowed. Or what? If anything, mockery is the only thing you deserve. Our efforts have been one failure after another. Your name and the word failure are synonymous with each other. I will kill you, Gavril thought. I swear it. On Elioina's grave, I swear I will kill you. You will die by my hand before the girl does. I've looked everywhere for them, said Gavril dryly. Have you really? The correct word you ought to be using is overlooked. You have overlooked everywhere for them. No one can reach them, said Gavril, trying to control his anger, knowing what Ezzy's was implying. Those dried-out granules, they are a hermit rule. They aren't part of the Seven Worlds. Yet they are a part of the Seven Worlds. The zero-sum stone grounds have not been breached. Scouts pass by daily. The same number of stones still lie there, waiting to ward off any trespasser. The only change was made by our repeated attempts to conquer them. Thousands of lives lost, only to remove a few hundred stones off the ground. There are millions of stones between the outer grounds and their village. Sounds to me like it's the perfect place to hide. And it's the only place you haven't looked. Not really looked. Gavril stood quiet, thinking. Many times he had thought about going into the stone grounds to conquer them completely, no matter the cost. But he had always been diverted, unwilling to pursue the matter. But why? Why did he have no interest in going there? It was an obvious place to hide. Could it be something else had an influence over him? A spout, maybe? What keeps you from going there now? Asked Ezzy's, standing in front of Gavril, hands clasped at his back and eyebrows raised. What really keeps you? You know, you don't have any more time left. That girl will come into full control of her powers any day now. What really kept Gavril from going? What an accurate question. Gavril turned it over in his head. There was reasoning to Ezzy's logic. After the High Wearies and the monster encountered the girl and her watcher, Gavril lost track of their whereabouts. It was as if they had disappeared from the Seven Worlds, but not in the way they had done before. Ipophus could still sense the disruption to the flow caused by the girl's livestream. But what he didn't know was where it was coming from. Even the all-seeing pond hadn't been able to locate them. Now that he thought about it, Gavril knew little about what went on behind those stone walls and the zero-sum grounds. I'm sure that if you really looked, continued Ezzy's, beginning to pace back and forth, you'd find a way inside. How many times have you asked that Yurachi pet of yours? Gavril snapped his gaze towards Ezzy's. What? You don't like me to call him that? That's right. You think of him as a friend, don't you? Wait. You think of him as your only friend. Why do you bother showing such emotion anyways? You cannot touch me. What if I really tried? Spat Gavril at Ezzy's. Ezzy's snickered. Right, said Ezzy's. 
as if you can do that sort of thing. You aren't one to try, as you haven't really been trying. I wonder if you know what really trying means. Anyway, ask that Yurachi friend of yours. He knows the old life stream well enough. Gavril eased back into his throne and said nothing while Ezzy's kept pacing back and forth. Are you going to walk back and forth all day? asked Gavril, annoyance in his voice. You are not welcome here. Are you just going to sit there, do nothing, make nothing, be nothing? I'll triple the scouts in the area. Pathetic. Did you not hear me earlier? You don't have any more time left. Either that girl dies, or the world as you know it will end. Why do you need scouts? Where else can they really be? You've scoured the seven worlds. Gavril stood up and walked over to Ezzy's. The ethereal being stopped pacing and turned towards him. He seemed amused, as if something unexpected had happened. I will go, said Gavril, looking straight into Ezzy's eyes. I will break that rule, if nothing else. Erase it from the seven worlds. And for your sake, I hope they're there. Ezzy's smiled and disappeared. Gavril let out a sigh. He hated letting himself get worked up by Ezzy's. Epiphus, said Gavril, his voice louder than usual. Moments later, there was a puff of smoke in front of Gavril. Epiphus waved away the smoke and began sniffing the area. Don't bother, old friend, said Gavril as he sat back on his throne. He was here. The torment lives on. He's showing up with more frequency, said Epiphus as he settled into his usual floating. Indeed he is. Perhaps we're truly running out of time. Or rather, he is running out of time. For someone who isn't a part of these worlds, he seems to be taking the issue a little too personally. I agree. Epiphus nodded. Regardless, we are running out of time. The girl will come of age and master her life stream. If what Ezzy's says is anything to go by, it'll be too late by then. We need to move. We have waited enough. We have allowed enough. What do you suggest? Mobilize everything we've got. Everything that's left. We'll descend on the stone grounds before the seventh day is over. Everything? Yes, everything. That includes the behemoth itself. Gavril and Epiphus had spent the last few years concocting a true behemoth of a monster, using every single spill and spout they had at their disposal. If we release it from its depths, it cannot be stopped. Calamity will fall on the world. Perhaps, said Gavril with a pained sigh. But we must. If we survive this, we'll point it to where it can't cause too much harm, at least until we figure out a way to control it. The behemoth cannot be controlled. It can only slumber or destroy. It's a literal force of nature now. And it will slumber once more, said Gavril calmly, interlacing his fingers. Of that I'm sure. For now, we'll need everything we've got. Prepare a summoning spout. We'll unleash it when the time is right. Very well, said Epiphus, nodding once. I shall see that it's done. Before you go, there's one more thing. And that is? We need to find a way to beat that blasted zero sum ground. Whatever it is that we have to do, however many spouts we have to prepare, we need to breach their sacred grounds. Epiphus nodded and puffed away from Gavril's main chamber. Not too long ago, said Ramdaliel, in the far western world of Kappa South. Wait, wait, interrupted Bliss, changing position to rest her back against the apple tree. Okay, much better. No more interruptions, said Ramdaliel, as he too changed position, lounging across the cool, shaded grass. Bliss nodded. In the furthest region existed an old rule unlike any other, ruled by a just ruler. His name was Agario Sala. The rule and nearby village were beautiful and filled with life stream. Birds that sang all day and flowers that spoke. 
Streets were filled with trees and plants that added the most delightful aromas. Scents that dug deep into a person's heart, newly and all human. The inhabitants of the rule used life stream freely as part of their everyday lives. It was a truly enchanting place. Agario Sala had lived a long and happy life alongside his consort. However, due to natural circumstances, they were never able to bring any children into the world. When his consort, Lady of the Winds, Mariel Sala, passed away due to old age, Agario Sala was left utterly alone. People in the rule cared for their ruler, and messages, flowers and songs poured into his tower, but none could fill the hole that was left behind. Agario Sala spent most of his lonely days staring out of the tower's rear balcony. From the balcony, he could admire the vastness and greatness of his rule. One day, as Agario Sala gazed out of his balcony, he saw something that he thought he would never see again. He saw love in the form of a young village miss. She had a beauty that far surpassed the beauty of any other in the village. Later that same day, he found out her name was Puna. Puna was deeply in love with her rule and the way life streams surrounded her. She lived in the world she had always dreamed of. She was simple, yet complex in her own way. Sweet, but not childish, and always barefooted, but well-dressed. She often spent her days lying in a garden of flowers, talking to them or nurturing them. She couldn't have asked for a better life. Most of the village lords courted her, but she did not fret. She knew that she was not ready for love, and they were not ready to make her feel what she already felt for her rule. After observing Puna via one of his loyal subjects, Agario Sala decided to take action. With each passing day, Agario Sala had grown more obsessed with Puna and her natural and unique beauty. He thought that the only way that he would ever have beauty like this is if he was beautiful himself, an equal exchange. Agario Sala visited the rule's most renowned potion mixer. He wanted to look young again. He wanted to be the most attractive lord in all the rule. However, the potion mixer told him that it was simply impossible, as he needed to give something of equal value in return. Agario Sala was too old to look that young again. Desperate, he offered anything in his rule, and nothing was off limits. Seeing his desperation, the mixer calculated just how much he would need in exchange. The only way Agario Sala would get what he wanted was to drain all the life stream from his kingdom. Blinded by Puna's beauty, he agreed to the deal. An equivalent exchange would take place. The next morning, a small flask appeared outside Agario Sala's chambers. Eager to look young and attractive, the king swallowed the potion without reading the note that was attached to it. Seconds after the flask was emptied, he began to shed his old skin, and from within a new, young ruler emerged. Looking in the mirror, Agario Sala liked what he saw. When the transformation was complete, all the life and bright colours in the rule disappeared. The rule was left without a single drop of life stream. What did the note say? asked Bliss. Bliss, let me tell the story, said Ramdelior. All right, said Bliss begrudgingly. No more interruptions. You may continue, Ramdelior grunted. The note on the flask read, the fault in humanity lies in the inability to understand the truly important things in life. To live is to love. To love is to live. When the rule's subjects saw him, they couldn't believe their eyes. Since the ruler had a prominent crest permanently engraved on his hand, there was no question that he was the ruler. Eager to step out of the tower and show his rule its new ruler, he left immediately to walk his grounds. 
When the people in the village saw Agario Sala for the first time in his new body, they couldn't help but gasp and admire. All the compliments made Agario Sala feel accomplished and content about the deal he had made. He knew that he had paid a steep price for his new body. Once reassured, he headed to look for his reward. Agario Sala found Puna crying loudly on the ground in one of her usual gardens behind the tower. He tried to console her, but it mattered not, for words couldn't quell her tears. Neither Agario Sala's good looks nor his treasures could cure Puna's broken heart. Unknowingly, it was Agario Sala who had broken her heart. He had taken everything she loved away from her. The colourful flowers, the delightful scent of the plants, and the lives of some of her best friends had all been taken from her. When Puna looked at Agario Sala, she saw nothing there. Soon people began to abandon the rule, and little by little it became empty and forgotten. Even Agario Sala himself left to find a better place to live. Ramdelio paused for a long moment, then stretched and changed position. Wait, 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 said Bliss, her voice cracking. Don't tell me this is the end. Well, yes, and it is a good ending if you ask me. How is that it? No, no, this cannot be. What happens to Puna? Bliss moved closer to Ramdelio. Did she find happiness again? The moral of the story was not the ending. Not all stories need an ending. So what was the moral here then? If I told you, you would miss it completely. It is for you to one day find out. Bliss sighed but gave up the fight and returned to leaning back against the tree. It had been a wonderful three years since they had first stumbled upon the stone village. Ramdelior felt fully rested and Bliss looked happier than ever, always smiling, always joking, and always in a good mood. She was seventeen, a young lady. She had gotten taller, her hair longer, the freckles on her face had almost disappeared entirely, and her voice had deepened, giving it a smooth, velvety sound. The last three years had been good for them. Their quality of life had changed for the better. Bliss had friends now, and a life of her own. But most importantly, she was only a few lessons away from fully grasping her power. Could it be that they would actually get away with it? That they would actually win? In the last three years, there hadn't been any sign of Gavril, the dangerous man, if Ramdelio could still call him a man. The rumours across the Seven Worlds had defied him into something greater than man or Nulian. Even so, there had been no word of him. Ramdelio shook away the thought of them living a normal life. He couldn't allow himself to think that way. He couldn't let his guard down. Gavril was still out there, and until Ramdelio faced him, he wouldn't allow himself to think they would win. Is everything all right? asked Bliss, as she began to braid her hair. You seem thoughtful. Is it him? When am I not thoughtful? Most of the time said Bliss, eyes narrow. Hey, that hurts, said Ramdelior as he chuckled. But I'm serious. What's wrong? You know you can always talk to me about anything, right? It's nothing. I'm just thinking about your next lesson. You know I can usually tell when you're lying. Don't you have to meet up with Fyira today, said Ramdelior as he sat halfway up. And what of your writing? How is that going for you? Writing is good, and no, not today. Bliss stretched and moved to lie down. She's on a supply run today. She's probably barely on her eleventh or twelfth trip. Twenty more to go. By the time she gets out, she'll be exhausted. Ramdelio had gotten to know the inner workings of the stone village well in the past three years. The village had been completely isolated from the rest of the Seven Worlds after Hazer gave the elders their warning. She had warned them about Gavril's attempt to seize power over the Seven Worlds. She told them their sovereignty would come into play when the time came to prevent the end of the world. Hazer had told the Granus how to keep their independence, and she told them how to build the zero-sum stone grounds. 
They were perhaps one of the most brilliant uses of life stream Ram Delior had seen. But it had come at a steep price. Zero sum is a state in which one person's gain is equivalent to another's loss. Each of the inhabitants of the village had given up all their life stream and that of their descendants for three generations to place 150 stones each. 50 for each generation with each stone bearing the zero sum marking on it. Each marking meant that anyone wanting to enter the stone village without the Granu's permission would have to sacrifice something of equivalent value. Most of the time, it meant the trespasser's life, depending on the potency of their own life stream. Most soldiers or gnarls that stepped on or flew over the stone grounds ended up blown into pieces. The old life stream didn't play well with the new. While it was a wonderful protection against any intruder, the move had left the Granu population without the ability to connect to their live stream. If an enemy were to breach the zero-sum stone ground, the Granus would have no way to defend themselves. Not all those who wandered onto the zero-sum stone grounds were instantly incinerated. The Granus themselves had to activate the stones. Even so, the village functioned quite normally aside from its inhabitants not being able to leave at their leisure. Winged Granus carried goods and waste in and out of the stone village. Most were volunteers, like Bliss's friend, Faira. From what Ramdelior knew, Granus hardly forced anything on their kin. There was a true sense of unity among them. The stone village had been a surprisingly comfortable place to live, despite the initial stiff appearance. Fresh air with a hint of flowers and fruit trees surrounded them, while the smell of baked bread was always just around the corner. The village was kept warm thanks to the fires burning at each turn. I was just thinking of hanging out with you all day, said Bliss, as she got up and dusted herself off. Are you sure about that? said Ramdelior, eyeing Bliss suspiciously. Your big lesson is tomorrow. Have you studied? It wasn't that Ramdelior didn't want Bliss to hang out with him. It was that he wanted her to survive without him if the time should ever come. Nope, said Bliss, nonchalant, her attention elsewhere. I don't need to. Embedding life stream into inanimate objects sounds like a stroll by the river. I'm all about sharing my life stream. Bliss, said Ramdelior, with a hint of annoyance in his voice. All right, all right said Bliss, turning towards Ramdelior. I promise to study before I sleep, she sighed, so I can be ready for tomorrow. Better, but still not. Ramdelior cut himself off as he stared towards where Bliss had been staring earlier. Bliss's gaze followed. Ramdelior's heart began to beat faster when he noticed the ground tremble and the fresh air slowly being replaced by a foul smell. Chapter 24. Mountains The zero-sum grounds was the Granu's greatest accomplishment. An impenetrable, explosive wall the size of many towns over. And yet, victory was still a long shot. For the forces that attacked them were the strongest the world had ever known. The stone village began to mobilize. They had practiced for this. There wasn't one Granu that looked lost in that moment. Ramdelior took one good look at Bliss. He wanted to remember her, to burn her image into his mind, so he'd be reminded every second of what he was fighting for. He didn't want to fail her. He's here, isn't he? asked Bliss as she locked eyes with Ramdelior. He's not going to win. I won't allow it. You won't allow it. Ramdelior sighed breaking away and turning towards the ground. Not a moment later, he felt Bliss's arms embracing his neck. She squeezed with everything that her little human body had to give. We will win, said Bliss, her voice broken. This is what we've been training for. We're ready for this. Ramdelior felt like his world was about to end. But he wasn't going down without a fight. He was going to give everything he had. They would survive. By everything that flows, they would survive this. 
Bliss would get to experience a normal life. He nodded, and Bliss let go. Ramdeliel noticed Hallhaeg walking towards them. So, it starts, said Ramdeliel, as he moved to face the Elder. So it does, said Hallhaeg, as he locked eyes with Ramdeliel. I came to ask only one thing. Please, said Ramdeliel. Are you ready? Ramdeliel knew not to take the question lightly. Was he ready? Was he ready to end everything here and now? Or should he flee, take bliss and run, run to the end of the seven worlds and on to the no worlds? Nothing could catch him. If he really wanted to, he could outrun anything. But what would happen to bliss? That was the real question. Was she condemned to live a life of running or hiding, never truly knowing what normal was? The last few years living here in the stone village had shown Ramdelior what life could be. What bliss could become if people would stop trying to kill her at every turn. She could live a normal life. She could have friends. No, not could. Will. She will have a normal life. She will, by all that flows, she will. Because his name was Ramdelior, fury and scorcher of worlds, the last watcher. And he would save her. Yes, said Ramdelior solemnly. Just what I was hoping to hear said Hallhaeg, nodding firmly. I now have hope of seeing my kin survive this. Let's give it everything we've got. Ramdelior nodded. Raise the wall! yelled Hallhaeg in a powerful voice that surprised Ramdelior. Prepare to uphold our oath! We will prevail! Movement erupted all around them as the walls of the stone village were slowly raised. Ramdelior didn't know what was pushing the walls up, but the movement of the massive wall that surrounded the stone village looked smooth and precise. And you? Ramdelior asked. As planned, I must move to spearhead our defence, said Hallhaeg, turning to leave. Before you go, said Ramdelior. Hallhaeg stopped and turned halfway. Thank you, said Ramdelior. For all that you and Eras have done for us, I will not forget. Ah, said Hallhaeg, waving one arm dismissively. There's no need to thank anyone here. We're all part of these worlds, and we must protect them. We each do what we can. He looked towards Bliss. She will be the one we'll all thank once this is over. The three of them nodded, and Hallhaeg headed towards a wooden command that was being erected. Ramdelior turned towards Bliss. No, said Bliss. Whatever it is that you're about to say, no, no, I don't accept it. Ramdelior was taken aback by her directness. I'm not, Bliss continued hurriedly, her eyes shut, going to wait at the back until I have to fight and defend myself. I'm not going to run, not any more, and I will help as much as I can from the start. Bliss, said Ramdelior, whatever happened, and no to that too. I don't want there to be a possibility of me losing you. If you lose, then I lose. But then it's the both of us, and that's okay. She opened her eyes and looked directly at Ramdelior. I don't need to live forever, Ram. I only need to live. To live is to love, and to love is to live, remember? And I'd be more than happy to spend the last moments of my life with you. Ramdelior nodded slowly as a torrent of feelings struck his chest. This girl had changed everything in his life, and it absolutely had been for the better. Come on then, said Ramdelior, as he gestured with his tail at Bliss to hop onto his back. We battle to win. Bliss smiled and hopped onto Ramdelior's back, and he sprinted towards the massive wall and began to climb it. Even for his powerful claws, the task wasn't an easy one, as the wall had quadrupled in size. When he finally reached the top, weakness almost overtook him. The task at hand seemed more and more impossible, with every moment that passed taking in the view. There was an entire army on the horizon. But he would press on, he would see this through. Now wasn't the time for a moment of weakness, he couldn't afford the luxury. 
On the far right, where the zero-sum stone grounds began, a vast army stood in formation. As he enhanced his eyes to get a better look, he saw that what awaited them wasn't only the army of undead, but also Nulians of every shape and kind. To make matters worse, among them were five dragons of the Brute class. A Brute class dragon was wingless, slow but powerful. Their thick scales were almost impenetrable. Though they could walk on all fours, they spent most of their time fighting on their rear legs. They carried oversized maces, a testament to their strength. Bliss hopped off and walked forward. She looked sure of herself and unwavering. Confidence and determination oozed from her. He smiled. Bliss had learned a thing or two from him. He only hoped that it was enough. Fire burned within him as his life stream began to stir. I see him, said Bliss. Ramdelio looked, but he saw nothing. Even with enhanced eyes, he couldn't see what she was seeing. Was she surpassing him already? Straight ahead, said Bliss. Behind the army. He's riding a mountain. Ramdelior focused more of his life stream into enhancing his eyes, being careful not to permanently damage them. Too much life stream concentrated in one part of the body was always a bad thing. Once it took effect, he saw what she saw. The dangerous man standing on top of a moving, walking, living mountain. The mountain looked much like a bull if that bull had a massive volcano on its back, covered in molten rock. The mountain moved on six short, stubby legs. Its face resembled the skull of a bull, filled with fire. What is that? asked Ramdelior in a low voice. In all of his three hundred years, he had never seen anything like it. Something that shouldn't be, said Bliss. Gavril finished summoning it minutes ago. I can feel the agitation in the flow. It's fighting with it. It's a mixture of thousands upon thousands of dark spouts. Bliss took a step forward. He won't be upsetting the flow for much longer. Ramdelior reached over with his tail and held her back ever so gently. He then shook his head, removing the life stream from his eyes. We'll wait, said Ramdelior as he pulled back his tail. When the time is right, we'll do our part. For now, let them do theirs. They've been preparing for this for many years. They won't be letting anyone through that easily. Winged granus began to line the wall, and the non-winged granus lined the perimeter outside the walls, facing the incoming army. Their movements were practiced and precise, and they had the area covered within minutes. Every warrior-class granu was present. A few thousand brave Granus were lined up outside the perimeter of the village, each carrying a stone mallet. The mallets were heavy, with wooden hilts. About half the winged Granus stood firm on top of the stone wall, keeping watch. Each of them had a belt around their chest that carried nearly forty glass flasks. Each flask contained a mixture of potions that exploded when they encountered fresh air. Three groups of ten Granus stood near the entrance, each carrying sharp, hook-like, curved swords. Scattered throughout the village were single Granu warriors. About fifty of them surrounded the garden, in which every non-fighting Granu, along with Eras, sat and kept quiet. Hall Hegg stood by himself at the wooden watch post that stood several body lengths above the stone wall. Between all of them and Gavril's army, stood the zero-sum stone grounds. Twenty million stones carefully laid out surrounding the fortified village of stone. Though the stone grounds didn't run all the way up to the wall, there was a trench, a wide, solid ring that surrounded the stone wall. If he wants a fight, said Ramdelior, a fight he'll have. Small communication spouts appeared, lining the perimeter. I feel great shame in keeping the ability to communicate freely on a battlefield, said Hall Hegg through the small spouts. So, he had managed to keep a communication spout when making the zero-sum stone grounds. Genius move, thought Ramdelior, though he could sense true shame coming through Hall Hegg's voice. And so, Hall Hegg continued, 
will the rest of my lineage. But it had to be done. Our enemy knocks at our door. Make no mistake, this isn't only our enemy. Powerful light blue explosions went off on the outer edges of the zero-sum stone grounds. It took a few moments for the sound to travel, and a few moments after that for the earth to begin to shake. They had made their first move. This is also our children's enemy, and their children's children, until we are no more. We must fight, and we must win, for the sake of the seven worlds and no worlds, for the sake of the Nulians and humans, for the sake of the Granus. A battle cry thundered all around them. The Granus were ready, and so was Ramdelior. Heat engulfed Gavril as he rode on top of his dark concoction of potions and spouts, and what was now perhaps the most dangerous creature in the Seven Worlds, a true behemoth, the Beast of Avar, as Gavril called it, had been created over the last three years, ever since the High Wearies lost and made themselves disappear. Gavril kept the High Wearies at the back of his mind, vowing to look for them and their clan once all of this was over. He wasn't fond of betrayal especially if said betrayal almost caused him to lose his beloved forever. But right now, there were other, more urgent things in his mind. Now he would end what he'd started. Ipiphus puffed into view next to him inside a glowing sphere spout. Is it wise to spend all that life stream? asked Ipiphus. This is but a warm-up, my friend said Gavril as he crossed his arms, the cooling spout that covered his body adjusting. News? Everything indicates Ezzy's was right. The Granus are preparing. We can see a heavy mobilization on their part, though it's not clear from where we stand now. Prepare the Genkan Hammer of Sorrows. Let's not waste any more time. These dry grounds will not let us advance any other way. Gavril was hesitant to use the Genkan Hammer as the consequences of its use were still unknown. According to Ipiphus, the ancient log-like floating device could break down any barrier, nullify any spout, no matter the cost. Gavril had pulled the device from the depths of the Sea of Terrors, where it had been locked away since the beginning of flow. Every logical thought about using the Genkan told him not to. But it was those same thoughts that told him what would happen if he didn't. Epiphus nodded, getting ready to disappear. Before you go, there's one more thing, said Gavril, as he half turned towards Epiphus. Epiphus didn't say anything, but looked at Gavril expectantly. The moment they appear, said Gavril sternly, the moment they decide they can't run anymore, inform me. And if at any time you think they're not there, that last bit caused a heavy sense of unease in Gavril's chest, prompting him to take a deep breath. If they disappear, inform me as well. I can't afford to chase something that's not here. Not anymore. It will be done, said Ipiphus, as he puffed away. It's all or nothing now, muttered Gavril in a low voice. Below, Gavril could see his army colliding with the zero sum stones. The ground exploded when anything unwelcome came in contact with them. Once a stone exploded, it would be gone forever, exposing the natural ground below it. But advancing at the cost of the existence of another was not something he would be gaining from, even if it was only rot. Gavril wondered how the Granus had created something so powerful. There were no spouts that he knew of that were this powerful. They must have given something up, something dear to them something that perhaps they did not own directly. All of this must have come at a great cost, said Gavril, his voice low. They will be in debt with the flow for generation to come, and it will all be in vain, all for nothing. I'll be the one to end this division of ideas. There's only one clear path to save the world, and that's the path I'm on. As he stared out into the battlefield, Gavril began to feel a pressure. No, not a pressure, a presence unlike anything he had ever felt before. Something bigger than him, bigger than anything he'd ever known. The presence made his knees buckle and an immense weight pushed him down, weighing him down from the inside. 
He dropped to the floor on his arms and knees, his cooling spout fading away. <gasps> what is this? he managed. Ezis appeared in front of Gavril, floating just a short distance from the Avar's beast's bull-like skull. This is your ineptitude playing out to its fullest potential, said Ezis, looking bothered. The Ziva Morris is now less than a day away. I told you years ago this day would come. Now you have only a few hours to finish what you started. The Ziva Morris? Gavril thought. Is that its name? The name of this being? This presence? This unmeasurable power? Gavril gasped for air as the heat around him became unbearable. This is a mere reminder of what's to come, said Ezzy's eyebrows up. Gavril's loathing for Ezzy's had never been as sharp as in that moment. If he could move at all, he would reach out to Ezzy's and pull that overdramatic ethereal being from whichever realm he was projecting himself from and teach him a thing or two about real pain. As he thought about it, Gavril realised that he could move, that he could pull more life stream. So he did, and he began to get up. Whatever had been blocking his power was slowly fading away. Stay there for a little longer, said Gavril, and we'll see what I can or cannot do. Stay here, said Ezzy's, one eyebrow raised, hands clasped behind his back. You don't order me, you don't command me, and you don't scare me. Then just stay there and we will see. Ezzy's sighed dramatically. I know you've said it before, said Gavril, standing up straight with his cooling spout replenished. I can't kill you but it won't hurt to try. Indeed, said Ezzy's dryly, turning away from Gavril. Unlike you, I don't have the luxury of trying something that won't work. His tone was full of contempt. Unlike you, I'm truly trying to save this world, and I must attend to other matters at the moment. I must ensure this battle is won. But make no mistake, Gavril, Archer of Night. The Ziva Morris comes, and when it gets here, every living thing on this planet will perish. It is but one power, the supreme flood of the universe. By the way, are you sure you really want to see her again? Gavril took a step towards Ezzy's, and he in turn took a step back. This was your final warning, said Ezzy's, looking uncomfortable. You won't get another chance to save her. Gavril stiffened as he remembered her, his reason for doing all this. Ezzy's vanished, and Gavril felt his full life stream return to him. Gavril shook himself out of his stupor. He needed to be present in the battle at hand. His time will come, Gavril thought. He'll be begging for his life before all this is over. I can still feel his presence. He's not yet disappeared from this world. Gavril shook his head, trying to focus. Ezzy's wasn't the problem. What he'd said was what he should be concerned about. What did he mean when he said he would ensure victory? Was he talking about the other two like him, entrusted to kill the child if he were to fail? Were they here? Gavril smirked. It matters not. I will prevail. Below, towards the centre of his army, Ipiphus summoned the Gen Can Hammer of Sorrows. A magnificent spout-filled device carried by two massive towers, one on each side, with dozens of large wheels. The towers were held together by the Genkan hammer itself, suspended in place by six enormous gold chains on each side. Hundreds of spouts began to appear around the Genkan hammer as it pulled back, lighting up the area. The hammer swung towards the zero-sum stone grounds, letting out an explosion of lights behind it that scattered randomly. A single swing of the hammer cleared the way, removing thousands of stones at once. It swung again, and the army began to advance. Swing after swing, the army of the dead advanced, further than anyone had ever advanced towards the stone village. Something felt wrong about the whole thing. They were advancing too easily. Was the Genkan hammer that powerful? What was it spurting out with every swing? 
It seemed to Gavril as if the blasts from the stones were being directed elsewhere. He thought about stopping the hammer, but those same thoughts told him that it was the only way he would get across the grounds. At any moment now, Gavril thought, they'll start their attack. They'll come out from wherever they're hiding. I just need to wait a little longer. Ipiphus puffed into view next to him inside a glowing sphere spout. He looked strained. What is it, my friend? asked Gavril. They're here, said Ipiphus, catching his breath. Seers have confirmed. The girl and the watcher are there. Gavril's heart raced as hope flooded his body. He was close now, close to obtaining what he'd been fighting for all these years. It would all pay off soon. Thank you, said Gavril. I was beginning to think I'd never hear those words. It will all be over soon. A Granu counterattack is imminent, said Ipiphus. Let them come, said Gavril. We'll see if the stories about their might are true, and they can actually do more than just build walls. You've been a great service to me, my friend. I will forever be deeply indebted to you. Leave this place. Go back to no hut. I'll return there once this is over. But my place is next to you, protested Ipiphus. That is so, and it is why you must leave. I suspect the other two like me are near. Ipiphus closed his eyes and took long sniffs of the air. Yes, they're here, said Ipiphus as he opened his eyes. They're directly behind the army on each side of the mountains. The last thing I need is for one of them to grab you and hold you hostage. Do as I say, my friend. This battle will take all of my concentration. Very well. May you succeed. And with that, he puffed away. Even though he was surrounded by what was now a vast army of undead rot, countless Nulians, dragons, and a behemoth of his own creation, he felt completely and utterly alone. Not willing to dwell on his feelings, he focused some of his life stream into enhancing his eyes. He'd never been particularly good at enhancing his body, especially the smaller, more delicate parts that required precision. But he managed. As he focused on the tall stone structure that presumably surrounded the stone village, he saw Granus taking flight towards his army. Things are about to get much, much more interesting. He shook the life stream from his eyes and began to prepare his body. He cracked his neck and stretched his arms from side to side. They won't be long now. Moments later, Granus flooded the skies above Gavril's army, dropping fiery explosives. Harden, said Gavril, as he made his right hand into a fist and focused in on one of the flying Granus. He crouched, gathered his strength and sprang at his target to intercept his path. But as he was about to swing and split the Granu in two, a spout with two horns behind it stopped him completely. Gavril felt a force push him straight to the ground. The Watcher had joined the fight. The punch that Ramdelio stopped in midair was a lot more powerful than he was expecting. Gavril was indeed a dangerous man, perhaps the most dangerous man alive. No, not perhaps, he was the most dangerous man alive, if he could still be called a man. War erupted all around them, with the Rot and Nulians focusing their attentions on the Granus in the sky. If it isn't the fire demon himself, said Gavril as he stood up and dusted himself off. Nice of you to join us on this glorious day. I've been searching for you and the girl for a long time now. Honestly, I was beginning to lose hope. And yet now you're here. It's almost hard to believe. This is as far as you'll go, said Ramdelio, as he took a deep breath and primed his reservoir. Take your army and go. Let us be. Oh, but this is where I start, said Gavril, as he extended his hands to the side. The Beast of Avar! He gestured towards the mountain that loomed over them, making its way slowly towards the Granu village. We'll wipe the seven worlds clean of the Granus and their village. We've done nothing to deserve this. It's not what you've done. It's what she'll do once she reaches her full strength. 
This world would suffer a great deal because of her. Gavril began moving towards Ramdelio, spouts appearing all over his body. Countless wars, famine, disease, droughts, horrors unlike anything we have ever seen. I intend to fix that today. By erasing her from this world, we will get to live on. You're wrong, said Ramdelior, with conviction as he took one step forward. About everything you've just said, your mind is lost. Our future is not predetermined. Our future is what we make of it. There's not one drop of evil in her, and she will not pay for someone else's delusions. Then we stand on opposite sides. We do. Embers began to appear around Ramdelio. Ramdelio stared at Gavril's hands, which were covered in glowing blue spouts. He was fast, faster than anything he had faced before. Fully expecting an attack, Ramdelio didn't find it hard to dodge. But Gavril did not stop. He pressed forward, running and swinging, each attack bringing him closer to Ramdelio. Ramdelio knew better than to take Gavril lightly, so he had to go on the offence. All things burn, said Ramdelio, and moments later he felt the familiar heat appear behind his horns. He headbutted Gavril as soon as the opportunity appeared, and the fiery ram to his chest sent Gavril flying far into the field. Steadying himself, Ramdelior shook his head, putting out his fiery horns. He focused on Gavril, who was having a hard time getting up. The flames had done surprisingly little to Gavril, which told Ramdelior that Gavril was using a spout of some sort. He had come prepared. Mighty roar, said Ramdelior, as he released a burst of fire aimed at Gavril. Gavril didn't move out of the way in time, and the fire engulfed him completely. Steadying his breathing, Ramdelior waited for Gavril to emerge from the smoke caused by the fire. A fully-fledged battle had broken out all around Ramdelior, but none of Gavril's goons were paying attention to him. It was almost as if Gavril had told them not to interfere. Still, Ramdelior did not let his guard down. A slow clap sounded before a barely visible Gavril emerged from the smoke. His body glowed, covered in spouts a good amount of them broken. You're going to have to do much better than that, said Gavril, as his clapping stopped and the spouts restored themselves. By the looks of it, not much more. Gavril poised himself against Ramdelio, but stopped and turned his attention to the right of the field. Ramdelio followed his gaze, and soon he saw what Gavril was seeing. Two figures approached them at high speed making their way through the field of rot, pushing them out of the way as if they were made out of paper. One of them wore white leather armour, while the other was covered in gold. At once, Ramdelior knew who they were. They were like Gavril. And they were here for bliss. Chapter 25 Fire Demon He was doomed from the beginning. Only a higher being can carry the responsibility of the world on his shoulders. To have made it this far was nothing short of wondrous. Ramdelior stood his ground, unmoving and undeterred. Before jumping into the battlefield to face Gavril, he had made up his mind. He would see this through and Bliss would survive. To him, that was all that mattered, and it gave him strength no matter the odds. The two newcomers ploughed through the battlefield and into the empty space occupied by Ramdelio and Gavril. The rot did not follow. The newcomers drew their weapons as soon as they entered the inner circle. The one in white unsheathed a bulky, dull-looking sword with spike markings running down its centre. The one in gold took out a spiked mace with the spikes themselves covered in spike markings. Ramdelior readied himself and watched for any slight movement that would indicate an attack. Your high wares killed my most skilled assassin, said the one in gold. They drove a giant cleaver through his chest. That would explain all the gold, thought Ramdelior. This was the man who had sent Anchufa after them. He too was covered in gold. They must have some kind of infatuation with gold in that rule. That's quite unfortunate said Gavril, 
as his spout-covered body stopped glowing. If he managed to get himself killed by the High Wares, then he wasn't very skilled, Solomon Bakaranane, the great, former ruler of Anchor. Kind of you to come out of your hiding place. Solomon spat on the ground and gripped his mace tightly. We don't have much time left, said the one in white. We need to work together to eliminate all obstructions. He looked at Ramdelio. So that this torment will finally end. Torment? thought Ramdelio. They are tormented? By who or what? And who might you be? asked Gavril as he faced the one in white. I'm Arama O'Day Leanester. He brought his fisted hand up to his leather-plated chest and banged on it once. Warrior of the great white plains of the No-Worlds. No-Worlds, said Gavril, right eyebrow raised. I'm surprised there's life down there, let alone semi-intelligent life. Orama glowered at Gavril. Gavril opened his arms as if welcoming a fight. Orama, said Solomon sternly, causing him to stop. Solomon then turned to Gavril. We can end this now, the three of us. The fire demon won't stand a chance. Ramdelio growled, embers appearing all around him. He stood between the newcomers and Gavril, but his embers easily reached beyond them. So, for now, continued Solomon, let's put aside our differences. Let's do what we must do to win. We all know what's at stake here. Indeed we do, said Gavril nonchalantly as he walked towards them. So, what say you? asked Solomon, extending his hands to the side. Let's end this, the three of us. That sounds good to me, said Gavril. All three turned to Ramdelio. Gavril was the fastest by far, quickly reaching him and passing him. Passing him? Gavril had passed him and made his way towards Solomon. Without missing a beat, Ramdelio turned towards Arama. The warrior from the No-Worlds was slow to react. It looked like he was still figuring out what was happening. All things burn, said Ramdelio as he lunged towards Arama. By the time Arama finally realized what was happening, it was too late. Ramdelio rammed the warrior straight in the chest, fire blazing all around. The blow sent Arama, leather armour already glowing with spouts, flying towards the army of rot, knocking a couple of dozen over. Ramdelior followed, knowing that he couldn't relent. Arama tried to slow his momentum by piercing the ground with his sword, but it didn't work. The sword merely cut the ground as he was pushed back. A few body lengths away, Arama lay on the ground. Ramdelior planted all fours firmly on the ground and began accumulating life stream. He knew that for his next attack, he would need all that he could get. Fire, Tempest! roared Ramdelior. His fiery horns got even larger, wreathed with an inferno of fire that burned everything it touched. Granus up above rapidly made way, while the rot stood in place, being eaten away by the fire. The flames and radiant heat grew, rapidly consuming the surroundings. Even Ramdelio, who was usually immune, was feeling the effects of the heat. Consume! Moments later, the fiery tempest stopped, and all that was left behind was charred ground and a dying man no longer in a white suit. Arama's white leather armour had burned away, leaving behind a frail, wounded man covered in the last of his spouts. He was still holding on to his sword, which was in good condition despite the fire. Ramdelio neared. Please, begged Arama. Please let me live. Would you have done the same for me? Arama stared but said nothing. Live, said Ramdelio, taking one step closer. So that you can continue hunting the one person who I am supposed to protect. The only thing in my life that has ever mattered so profoundly as to turn my life upside down. The one who has managed to make me better. Live so you can take away what I treasure most. Arama gripped the hilt of his sword and tried to pull it towards him. But the sword looked too heavy to wield. He had consumed most of his life stream. 
The telltale signs of excessive live stream consumption were all there. Slow, sluggish movements, trouble speaking, heavy breathing, and extreme weakness. I'm sorry, said Ramdelio, head held high. But you made your decision when you picked up your sword against her. For that, I cannot forgive you. Please. Consume, said Ramdelio, as he released drip-like flames that made their way towards Arama. No! yelled Arama with whatever strength he had left. May you be reborn into the seven worlds without hatred in your heart. Ramdelio then turned towards Gavril and Solomain, who were in the middle of a bout. Golden armor flew everywhere as Gavril landed his attacks relentlessly. Ramdelio crept closer to the fight, taking time to refill his reservoir. He'd used more life stream with Arama than he had anticipated. Though it was a relatively small amount of life stream compared to the hoard he kept in his reservoir, he couldn't afford to be careless. Everything in him was telling him that the real fight was just about to begin. Gavril grabbed Solomain by his left hand and pulled him back. Then, using both of his hands, Gavril slammed him onto the ground. The hard impact shattered the remainder of Solomain's golden armor. Solomain let out a pained squeal as the air left his lungs. Don't worry, said Gavril, standing over Solomain's unmoving body. I'll let you speak your last words before I send you back to wherever you came from. Gavril then turned towards Ramdelior. My deal with you stands. Ramdelior snarled slowly. Well then, said Gavril, have it your way. Destruction is inevitable. Pain is coming your way. He then turned back to Solomain. I told you a few years ago that you wouldn't outlive me. You should have taken that as an omen. You should have hidden until all this was over. And yet here we are, with yet another miserable attempt on my life. How can this be? asked Solomain, his voice broken and low. We're one and the same. I was given the same access to flow that you have. How can you be that much more powerful? Access to flow, thought Ramdelior as he stared and steadily built up his reservoir. It was nearly full once again. They were made by someone. Who could have such power? It's simple, really, said Gavril, standing up straight and extending his right arm. Arama thought to obtain... who knows what. Perhaps something pathetic since it got him nowhere. You fight to obtain riches, as if being the wealthiest person in the seven worlds and no worlds wasn't good enough. I fight for what's right. I fight for love. I fight to save the world. He fights for what's right, Ramdelio thought. Gavril truly believes he's doing the right thing. Why? You've killed so many, managed Solomain. Where is the right in that? I've never killed anyone who didn't deserve to die, said Gavril as he got ready to deliver a final blow. Harden! Gavril's fist lit up. A circular symbol formed in front of it, crawling up his arm. Menenast Acantaras Mandos Entorpetis Expertate! Ramdelior readied himself. It was clear that the final blow would be coming any moment now. With his spout-covered hand, Gavril struck Solomain square in the chest, breaking the rest of his armor and spouts. The ground underneath the unlucky man shattered, sending debris flying everywhere. There was no way he could have survived. To Ramdelior's surprise, for the briefest of moments a look of sadness washed over Gavril's face. The most dangerous man alive shook his head, then turned towards Ramdelior. Sir, where were we? said Gavril. Do you still think you have a chance? Surrender the girl. Let's not make this harder than it needs to be. You've lost, said Ramdelior, as he took one step forward, embers beginning to flare all around him. Do you not have eyes? asked Gavril, with his hands open at his sides. Look around you. 
The Jen Can Hammer will soon reach the stone village. The battle is lost. Soon the dragons will overpower the Granus. Soon my army will march up to the village gates and slaughter everyone in sight. Soon the Beast of Avar will leave nothing behind. How can you possibly win? You think your fire will make any difference against a beast forged from it? He gestured towards the moving mountain behind him. This is an impossible fight, and you know it. He was right. Ramdelior hadn't paid much attention to it, but with every moment they'd made in battle, they'd moved closer to the stone village. Is she really worth all of this? asked Gavril. She is, said Ramdelior with conviction. How can you be sure you are right? Gavril looked puzzled. His expression was one of pain. From the second I saw her, I just knew. I knew that my life would be hers, whatever happens. I knew I would do everything within my reach to protect her from all harm. I knew that I would care for her and watch over her until I was no longer needed. When I found her, I found my purpose. Gavril looked down, holding his head with both hands, moving slightly from side to side. He looked like he was in pain, trying to decide. He then let go of his head, shook it, and glared at Ramdelior once again. If it's worth it to you, said Gavril, as he took up a fighting stance, then you'll have all the problems that come with it. I can't take a direct hit from him, thought Ramdelior, not with the kind of spouts he controls. They lunged towards each other, fire ablaze and spouts ready. In the blink of an eye, they clashed, but this time Ramdelior had the upper hand. He managed to claw Gavril across his chest and back as Gavril missed his punch. Ramdelior then grabbed Gavril and sent him flying towards his army. Gavril cracked his neck, then darted towards Ramdelior, spotting Arama's sword and picking it up from the ground. Without hesitation, Gavril swung the sword at Ramdelior. He was good with the sword, deadly good. With every swing, he got closer and closer. Then Ramdelior felt a familiar feeling at the back of his head. A flame he hadn't called for appeared. The appearance of the flame behind his head granted that very strength he needed to move fast, to avoid Gavril's attacks, and to fight back. As Gavril swung non-stop, Ramdelior saw an opening and he took it. He bit Gavril's inner right arm, the same arm he'd been using to hold the sword. He dropped the sword at once. Gavril twisted free of Ramdelior's jaw and moved back a few body lengths. Gavril felt his right arm burn with pain where the Watcher had bitten him. It turned out that the enormous wolf like Nulian had equally enormous fangs. His breathing was agitated and he was consuming large quantities of life stream trying to evade and attack the powerful beast. Gavril realised that Ipiphus had been right all along. The Watcher was indeed more powerful than himself. But it didn't matter. There was still plenty that Gavril could do to change the course of the battle. He would win this fight no matter what and no matter the cost. You have strength, Fire Demon, said Gavril. I'll give you that much. But as I said earlier, how can you possibly win? The Watcher stood still, his crown of fire bright. I was hoping it wouldn't come down to this, continued Gavril. But I must win this battle. Dragons, come forth. Beast of Avar, destroy. Kill the Watcher. The battlefield seemed to quiet for a moment as the dragons moved towards Gavril, then erupted once again when the mountain beast roared and began to charge towards them. Gavril couldn't help but smile. Victory was drawing near. However, his smile didn't last long, as the Watcher hadn't backed down. If anything, Gavril could have sworn he had taken a step forward. Was he not scared? Did he not know that there was no way out for him? No way to win? Then Gavril noticed the approach of what the Watcher probably knew would come. A small dot made its way over the battlefield from the stone village. As the dot got closer, it began to reveal itself, starting with the colour of her hair. The girl landed next to the Watcher 
with a puff of violet smoke to cushion her fall. She was there. She was there. The girl who he'd been seeking for almost 18 years was there. Gavril almost couldn't believe it. Things were going to come to an end after all. Then he felt flow oozing from her, causing Gavril to feel heavy. His body was tempted to give in to the pressure. It was unquestionable. She was the direct connection between Flo and the Seven Worlds and No Worlds. Gavril's own life stream reverberated, threatening to leave his body. How can the blasted fire demon stand so close to her so casually? Gavril thought as he gathered his strength. It must only affect those who she considers enemies. Gavril's thoughts were corroborated as the dragons broke away from the army and approached them. They seemed unsure and abruptly unwilling to move forward. Suddenly, things felt as if they were out of Gavril's control. How can she have all that power? thought Gavril. I can't let it get to me. I must move forward with this. I have to win for my Elioina. I've been looking for you, said Gavril, calling on all his strength just to sound normal. I want to thank you for making things easier for me. Now I no longer have to go looking for you after I get rid of your watcher. Maybe I can cut corners and go straight for you. Gavril made a small red spout appear on his forehead. It was the spout for speed. He knew that the watcher would know about it, as it was a common spout. So, what do you say? Shall we? I'm not scared of you said the girl as a number of her spouts went into the ground. She was getting ready to turn her life stream against him, something that he couldn't afford to have happen. If she managed that, Gavril knew that he wouldn't be able to escape that easily. He just needed to be faster than she was, that's all it would take. Though he doubted he was faster than her watcher. Dried out rivers, he cursed in his head. What can I do? Then it came to him. He had an army on his side, and he intended to use it. The Watcher watched him closely. Gavril knew that if he moved to attack the girl, the Watcher would do everything in his power to block him. Talking was still his strongest weapon. It's not only me you should be scared of, said Gavril, hands stretched out to his sides. You've come to the dragon's mouth. I've brought an entire army with me. The Watcher crouched, his fire crown flaring, and the girl balled her hands into fists. Destroy them, said Gavril, as he gestured towards the Watcher and the girl with both hands. The army of Rot, the thousands of Nulians, and the Beast of Avar all erupted behind him and swarmed in towards them. Despite the girl's enormous presence on the battlefield, the dragons were now moving again. She was scared. Bliss, leave this to me, said the Watcher, as embers began to appear all around him. I'm not going to leave you alone, said the girl. You won't be, said the Watcher. The girl turned towards the fire demon. Out of both of us, said the Watcher. No, out of all of us. You're the only one who can take down the mountain. Can I trust you to do it? Gavril was incredulous. Was he really going to send the girl to face his most powerful creature? Then it all made sense. Though the Beast of Avar was powerful, it would treat the girl like any other threat. It wouldn't know to single her out. She could easily blend in with the Granus that were already attacking the beast. So, the Watcher wasn't only strong, he was also clever. And all of this? asked the girl as her vines began to toss Rot and Nulians back into the battlefield. There's much more to me than just fur, said the Watcher as his crown of fire began to extend to his back. I'll be fine. The girl stared at him. I promise, said the Watcher. And with that she leaped towards the Beast of Avar. Gavril was tempted to chase after her, to fulfil his promise and end his torment. But he also knew he wouldn't get far with her watcher still guarding her. I'll just have to stick with the original plan then, thought Gavril. Get rid of her watcher and then go after the girl. She may be powerful beyond belief, but she's inexperienced. I still have a good chance. 
a more than good chance. Gavril grinned and readied himself. One last time, said the Watcher. Stop this. There's no need for so much death. If your answer is still the same, then so is mine. Then you leave me no choice, said the Watcher, as he straightened and raised his head. At his full height, he towered over Gavril, and he didn't look small next to the dragons that neared him. My name is Ramdelior, Fury and Scorcher of Worlds, the Last Watcher, and this is All Turns to Ashes. The last four words hung in the air. The Watcher's fiery crown erupted, turning into a scorching mane. Fire covered his horns, curving down, then twisting in front of his face. His four legs exploded with fire of their own, and his claws turned the glowing red of hot iron. Was this the Watcher's relinquishment he was witnessing? No, it couldn't be. He wouldn't dare, not if he intended to continue watching over the girl after all of this. But if it wasn't, how could his life stream increase so drastically? The difference in power was so much that Gavril doubted he could even get near him. The dragons and Rot were hesitant, stopping halfway before reaching the Watcher. He's only one, said Gavril, as he called upon his spouts. There are many of us. He doesn't stand a chance. He moved into a fighting stance. Let's make him regret ever getting in our way. Gavril moved to attack, but fire covered the field as the Watcher moved from dragon to dragon, taking them down with a single strike. The Watcher roared and moved in a circular motion, burning the field of Rot and Nulians alike as they moved against him. Gavril was blown away by the powerful fire, his body spouts breaking under the enormous pressure. In mere moments, the Watcher had cleared a good part of the battlefield. He stood tall, breathing normally, walking calmly towards Gavril. This isn't going to stop me, Gavril thought. Is it? No, no, no. It's going to take a lot more than this. Gavril moved, but only to awaken his senses. All he could smell was the charred ground around him. Pain followed like a bucket of boulders, as despite all his spouts, he'd gotten burned on the right side of his body. Now burned and bitten, his right side was almost worthless. Regardless, he stood up and finished ripping off his burnt clothes, exposing most of his body. This is not going to stop me. Not by a long shot. What a great show, managed Gavril, as he attempted to clap but failed. You've single-handedly defeated far more of my own than the Seven Worlds armies ever did. I commend you for getting this far. I'll go as far as I need to go. You know that by now. You've lost. It's over. I think differently. Gavril scrambled to remember the sequence of his own relinquishment. Everything was so powerful, so fuzzy, that he had a hard time remembering how to unleash all of his live stream at once. You won't get much further than this. I hope you've said goodbye to the girl, because you won't get to see her again. Gavril then reached inside his inner reservoir and unlocked his life stream completely. The Watcher attacked at full force, fire flying everywhere. But it was already too late. Gavril had already let go of his hopes of living past the battle. There were no more dreams inside him, no more thoughts of normal life. It was only him and the Watcher. He was now as fast as the Watcher, matching and sometimes outpacing his every move. He felt strong, impervious to fire, impervious to pain. He had relinquished all forms of self-defense. He was pure power, pure strength. Do you see it? asked Gavril as he sent the Watcher flying to the edge of the charred circle with a punch. I am power itself! The Watcher tried attacking again, but it was no use. They were evenly matched. No, that wasn't true. With every punch that he landed, with every claw he avoided, a realization came to his mind. He outmatched the Watcher. And there was something else. Gavril had also spotted a weakness in the Fire Demon. He wasn't using any form of defense. The battle would be over soon. 
He didn't have much time either. His reservoir was nearly empty. Is that all you've got? yelled Gavril as he once again knocked the watcher to the side. You were never strong enough to protect her. You know nothing about strength or what I'd be willing to do to save her. Is that so? What I know is the simple truth. Whoever is willing to lose the most will win, especially when using a relinquishment. You didn't give up enough. The Watcher managed to get back on his feet, but it was too late for him. Gavril had already gained the upper hand. He was one strike away from ending the battle. Harden! Gavril's fist lit up, and a circular symbol appeared, engulfing his right arm. Meda nast acantares mandas entopitis expertate oleanesses. The final form of one of Gavril's most powerful spouts covered his right hand entirely, extending far past his right shoulder. The Watcher was done for. But something was gnawing at the back of his mind. Gavril took one step closer to the Watcher, and his thoughts became clearer. The thing he was worrying about revealed itself. Despite the battle turning in his favour, despite his now undeniable victory, the dark and sinister power was still making its way to Earth. The Watcher had gotten onto all fours, panting, trying to recover. The end of his life was only one hit away. And yet Gavril couldn't bring himself to do it. Something was wrong. Something was very wrong. Why was the Ziva Morris still on its way to Earth? It was so close now. Don't tell me you're going to back off now, Ezis said as he appeared next to Gavril. You're so close to achieving victory, to saving the world. Once you kill him, destroying the child will be as easy as drinking water from a river. The Watcher didn't move or even flinch at the appearance of Ezzy's. He couldn't see him, Gavril realised. He was the only one tormented by the ethereal entity. Why is he still on the way? asked Gavril. The Watcher cocked his head, as if he was trying to understand. Have you done your job yet? asked Ezzy's with irritation in his voice, though his expression was still cool. As far as I know, the girl's watcher is still alive, and the girl herself is out there with a group of granus, fighting your mountain creature and your entire army. You haven't finished. I've already gained the upper hand, said Gavril, his voice low. I've won. And yet it still comes. What are you saying? asked the watcher. It won't stop until the girl is no more, said Ezzy's. That was the deal. No, it can't be, said Gavril, growing tired. His relinquishment was quickly fading away. It's coming, regardless of my victory, is it not? I'd be doing it a favour if I destroyed the one person that can truly stop it, wouldn't I? It all makes sense now. Kill the girl, and nothing stands in its way. The realisation dropped on Gavril like a boulder onto a piece of glass, shattering him completely. Gavril released his spout and fell to his knees. All power, all sense of will drained from him. I'm sorry, said Gavril as he looked at the Watcher. I'm sorry for all of this. I may now be too weak to stop it, but at least I won't be getting in your way. The Watcher extinguished the flames that covered his body. The fiery crown was all that remained. Are you done with her? asked the Watcher. I am. What are you doing, you dried-out fool? Izzy's said, taking one step closer to Gavril. Don't tell me you've done all of this for nothing. Don't tell me you've waged war against the Seven Worlds and No Worlds only to kneel to a beast. Don't tell me you've killed tens of thousands of innocent people trying to get here and you're simply going to throw that away. Tens of thousands? asked Gavril, turning towards Ezzy's for the first time. 
I've not killed unless I've had to. And even then, it was only those who deserved to die. No more than I had to. No more than I was led to believe I had to. Ezzy's laughed loudly. <laughs> no more than you had to, <laughs> said Ezzy's in between laughs. <laughs> You've been the world's greatest killer. No one has managed to take more innocent lives than you. How? How do you think the Gen Can Hammer of Sorrows works? Gavril didn't dare to think about it now. He was too weak, too broken to even consider what Ezzy's was saying. For every one of those blasted stones the hammer breaks, continued Ezzy's, one innocent person somewhere in the Seven Worlds dies. What? asked Gavril incredulously. The pain of a thousand spears pierced whatever was left of his chest. His stomach twisted upside down, threatening to release its contents. He turned to look at the hammer, still moving towards the stone village. No, no, this is not what I wanted. It's a little too late for that, said Ezzy's smugly. The damage is done. Those who have died have died. There's no bringing them back. And to think you'll throw it all away. The sacrifices you've made, the lives you've taken, all for nothing. Forgive me, Elioina, for I have failed you. May we meet in another life. Anger built up in Gavril, an anger so vast, so all-consuming, that for a moment he felt his body explode with power, if only to complete one last task. No managed Gavril. No, I won't have this. You won't get away with it. Trying to understand what was happening, Ramdelior took half a step to the side. Was there someone there that he couldn't see? There had to be, or else who was Gavril talking to? If he was talking to himself, he'd be answering himself, but half of what Gavril was talking about was missing context. Gavril turned towards his invisible companion, and his body exuded life stream, with broken spouts reforming across his body. He then reached into thin air, half of his arm disappearing into some sort of portal. The area around them groaned with an unfamiliar sound as Gavril pulled out whatever he had reached for. Ramdelior prepared, reaching into his heavily depleted reservoir. And then he saw it. He saw the reason why Gavril had gone insane. The being who Gavril was talking to. The person stuck inside his head. The one who had been tormenting him. It all came together in Ramdelior's mind. Gavril pulled out a tall, green-skinned, Nulian-like man with long white hair and clothing unlike anything he'd ever seen. His clothes, if Ramdelior could call them that, were blood-red with golden trim. The Nulian-like man screamed as Gavril grabbed him by the neck and tossed him onto the ground with force. Gavril looked at Ramdelior, his face riddled with pain, then looked back. You'll regret this, the Nulian-like man said in a strange, reverberating voice. I'll regret many things, said Gavril, the spouts around his body glowing. I'll regret most of what I've done for the last 18 years. But this, this is something I won't regret. This is something I will savour until the very end. Something I should have done a long time ago. Ezzy's bringer of light. I'll show you what true light looks like. Gavril grabbed Ezzy's by his neck and arm and leaped into the air, gaining an impressive height far above the flying Granus. The skies, already black as night, darkened further before a massive bolt of lightning struck Gavril and Ezzy's in midair, sending them flying in a ball of fire towards the battering ram. The huge wooden structure never stood a chance, shattering on impact. The battlefield went silent. Gavril's army froze in place, dropping their weapons. All but one. The mountainous creature bellowed as fire erupted all around it. 
Ram Delior searched the field frantically, looking for Bliss, and he found her with relative ease. She was standing in front of the mammoth beast, unmoving and unfazed. Chapter 26 Event Casting doubt is one of the Ziva Morris's greatest accomplishments. How can anyone be sure what they feel if they aren't sure what they're looking at? The roaring march of Gavril's army had died down. Now, all that was left was Bliss and the mountain. As if to remind Bliss that it was still there, it bellowed a second time. Bliss had tried everything she knew on the beast, and nothing had worked, or even slowed it down. She had a faint idea of what she needed to do in order to stop the beast, but it would require much, much more power, not to mention space. She was still awed by the massive size of the beast. Ram and she had spent hours climbing such vastness. How could something so big even move? She looked back at the stone village, and what was once the biggest structure on the battlefield, it paled in comparison to the behemoth. I need to hurry, Bliss thought. This beast, creature, mountain, or whatever is, getting closer and closer to the stone village. If it keeps going, it's going to destroy the village. She started walking back as the beast kept moving forward. She waved down one of the flying granues overhead. Immediately, the granu broke formation and went to Bliss, landing with impeccable precision in front of her. Excellent, said the granu as he bowed. At your service. Take the rest of the granues and fall back to the city, said Bliss, her voice calm. But, Lady Bliss, we can't leave you here alone facing that thing. Please, Excellin. This creature won't be much of a threat, at least not for long. What I need is space. Things are going to get a lot more dangerous around here. Plus, she's not alone, said Ram, emerging from the battlefield. He looked battered and beaten, but unbroken. He was still the same old Ram. Bliss couldn't help but smile. Ram being there could only mean one thing. Gavril was dead. The one that had hunted her for the entirety of her lifetime was finally dead. She had always known that he would beat Gavril but she'd never expected to see him back so soon. Regardless, she was glad. You'll need to get out of here too, said Bliss, as Ram hurried over. But perhaps, not just yet. She looked away from Ram Delier and turned back to Exelin. Please deliver my message to the rest of your group, and I'm afraid that it extends to all granules in the field. Exelin nodded and flew away. What are you planning? asked Ram as they began walking backwards once again. I don't even know if it is possible, but can you stack spouts? Yes, spouts can be stacked and can augment one another. It depends on how you stack them and what you're trying to do, but it can be difficult to control. The mountain thrashed out, sending pieces of earth flying towards them. With a slight grunt, Bliss used her vines to move aside the massive pieces of earth. I've tried everything I know said Bliss, taking a deep breath. Nothing is working. That beast is dense, heavy. The Granus have had no luck either. Nothing seems to damage it. I can see that, said Ram, as they continued walking back. Whatever it is that you have in mind, now is the time to try it. The mountain was now uncomfortably close to the stone village. It looked as if it could lose its balance and crush it by accident. Bliss nodded. You might want to move away said Bliss, as she focused on the beast. Ram nodded, but did not move. Here goes nothing, said Bliss, as she extended her right arm and moved her body sideways. Life! A blue spout formed in front of Bliss's palm, sucking up all the moisture from the area and compressing it into water. Once she had about a bucket of water, she continued. Earth! Earth, roots, and other rocky debris levitated into the water. Mass. The mixture began to compress, forming a tight sphere. Remember to breathe, said Ram, in a low voice. Harden, continued Bliss, as she took a deep breath. Perfectly symmetrical spouts appeared around the sphere, glowing light blue. Mighty anchor. Hundreds of chain-like spouts appeared from the sphere, anchoring it to the floor. 
Bliss was beginning to feel the effects of her efforts. The stack of spouts was getting heavy and unstable. Her hand moved slightly in all directions. She took a deep breath and pressed on, keeping the sphere pointed towards the mountain as best she could. World Piercer, hasten! The sphere vibrated as a large yellow spot appeared between it and Bliss's palm. Hasten, hasten, and let nothing stand in your way. Rip open all that stands in your way. Four more spouts appeared, enlarging the original yellow spout. Destroy. Bliss's fear left her hand with a powerful blast, breaking the ground underneath and sending debris flying everywhere. A large explosion erupted within the moving mountain as the sphere hit dead on. A deafening screech boomed across the stone grounds as the mountain began to fall apart. Motionless and fireless, the mountain broke into millions of pieces, disappearing into nothingness. Mouth agape, Bliss couldn't believe what she saw. Don't look too surprised, said Ram. That was one extraordinary spout you had there. I've never seen anything like it. As the final bits of the mountain disappeared, everything went silent, and for the first time since the battle started, Bliss heard herself breathe. She also heard Ram's breathing, and she realized just how tired he was. He sounded like he was still trying to catch his breath. Can we finally say it's over? asked Bliss, feeling the weight of the seven worlds leave her shoulders. They had won, against all odds, against everything the enemy had thrown at them. They had won. She and Ram, especially Ram, could finally rest now, though the real work for her was about to begin. Throughout her time with Ram, going from village to village, world to world, she had seen how she could improve the way of life. She disliked the idea of rulers and the iron grip they had on land. She wanted people to live, to smile, to have the life she would like to have. One where no one would go hungry and people could feel safe. Where life would prosper and grow. Reach the unreachable. She turned expectantly towards Ram, with a smile on her face. Ram didn't answer. Instead, he fixed his attention on the sky above. That's when Bliss felt it. One thousand different feelings, one thousand different powers, and an overwhelming, overpowering presence making its way to this world. Ram? asked Bliss, heart pounding. What is that? That's the reason we're here, said Ram as his breathing eased once again. He was no longer trying to recover. He had gotten ready to use his life stream. The reason why everything has happened so far. Bliss, Ram turned to face her. Don't be scared. It will more than likely try to intimidate you, scare you into thinking you can't. Know that somehow you will defeat it. Perhaps not today, but know you can. Know that it is within your power to do so. Remember everything I've taught you. Keep what I've given you safe, and you'll be all right. I'll make sure of it. Ram, what are you saying? Tears dripped down her cheeks. Remember what I just said. Keep your head held high. Bow to no one, serve no one, and remember to live. You'll change the world with your powers. Hone your skills. Reach unimaginable levels of life stream. Be good, and be good. Ram, you're scaring me, managed Bliss, already sobbing. I'm sorry, Bliss, Ram said, his voice soft. I'm no longer sure what will happen from here on out. Ram? Far above, the sky ripped open with a resounding shockwave, leaving an aperture of fire as far as Bliss could see. Through the fire, a star-like object fell towards them and instead of slowing down, it was speeding up. We won't make it out of here in time, said Ram. You need to take cover. Bliss knew what she needed to do, or at least try, and it would require everything that she had. Wait, said Bliss, looking towards the falling object. I have to at least try. With a pained expression, Ram nodded. All powerful, said Bliss, as she raised the palms of her hands towards the object. Spouts formed in front of her hands and all around her. Bliss had made up her mind. She would use as much of the life stream in her reservoir as she had to, despite the pain that would follow. Push! The spouts expanded tenfold, 
The ground underneath her fissured, causing the nearby earth to sink into a crater the size of a small village. Debris, rocks, and slabs of stone floated all around Ram and Bliss for a few seconds, and then violently shot up towards the incoming object. Bliss screamed as the familiar pain from her childhood jolted back into her body. Bliss, said Ramdelier. I can do this, said Bliss, as more debris were created, and they sank further into the ground. Ram nodded. She continued to exhaust her life stream at a dangerous rate, creating debris and hurling them up. She knew she was in trouble, but even so, she pushed her body beyond its limits. Every muscle strained, every inch of her body screamed in pain. She was tearing herself apart from the inside. Bliss gave everything she could to push the object back. However, her inexperienced body gave up on her. She was slowly losing consciousness. She was too inexperienced and too young to handle the amount of life stream flowing through her. I've failed, murmured Bliss, and the world around her blackened as she pushed. One last time. Ramdelior caught Bliss before she touched the ground. She had given it her all. Though she had managed to slow down the object in the sky and push it back, it was still falling. If it wasn't for her, they would all have been pulverized by the impact. Now Ramdelior had time. Not much. But he could do something, couldn't he? If Bliss wasn't able to stop that thing, what chance did he have? Even if he relinquished his reservoir, at best he would only manage to slow the object, and Bliss would be left alone for nothing. It was clear that there was only one thing he could do. No, one thing he should do. He would save everyone, Bliss and the Granus, even the ones who were still in the city. It was a rather simple plan, but he had to move fast. Convey, chanted Ramdelio. Thousands of small communication spouts appeared in front of his snout and made their way to every Granu. Listen up, said Ramdelio, his voice firm. I can save every last one of you, but there are two things I need from you. One, take care of Bliss. Protect her if you must for as long as she lives. Two, as soon as you find yourself inside a cave, move out as fast as you can. There's not enough space in there for all of you. Consider it done, said Hallheg through one of his own spouts. We will protect her until the end of her life, or ours. We don't have much time, said Ramdelio urgently. Gather in groups if you can. The bigger the group, the easier it will be for me to find you. Home chanted Ramdelior for the first time in years, creating a portal that led back to his cave in Almentana. A dozen blue portals appeared in front of him, ready to transport. He saw and heard through the portals and moved them around, sweeping up Granus left and right. He started with the larger groups and worked his way down to the single and the stranded. Eras and Hallheg were the last. Once there was no one left, Ramdelior closed all the portals, apart from one. The one he would be using to send Bliss back to his cave. He moved the last portal towards him, and looked at Bliss one last time as she slept. He wanted to remember her clearly in the little time he had left. Make way! Make way! said Agranu from behind the portal. She's next! I can see her! The Granus had done a pretty good job of clearing the cave as soon as they arrived. There were only a few of them standing near the portal in the cave. Please take care of her, said Ramdelio with a long sigh as he moved Bliss through the portal. She's sound asleep. When she wakes up, give her some time and space. Let her to be the one to approach you. The Granus behind the portal nodded solemnly. Ramdelior closed the portal as soon as Bliss had reached the other side. He then turned around and faced the object that now loomed above him. There was still fight in Ramdelior and plenty of power, but he knew when to pick a fight. Instead of trying to fight an impossible fight against something so vast and using his live stream, 
The live stream he didn't use against Gavril. The live stream that he'd been hoarding ever since meeting Bliss. The live stream that almost cost him the fight against Gavril. He'd rather put it to good use. He'd give it all up in one last shot to protect Bliss. His final spout would be one that would last through the ages. He smiled as he looked up at the now visible chained figure. You won't have her that easily, said Ramdelio. Bliss, Bliss, can you hear me? What am I saying? Of course you can. What good would I be at using livestream if you couldn't hear me? Gavril is finally gone from the world. Now there is no one in the world looking to harm you. Now you can live on without fear. But listen to me carefully. Know that whatever comes your way, you have everything you need to overcome it. There are still a million things I wish I could show you. There are things I would love to experience next to you. But sometimes, someone has to stay behind and protect those who can't protect themselves. Sometimes we can't have what we want if we are to give someone else what they deserve. It was my own wish to protect you. It was my only purpose in life. Now that you're safe from Gavril, I can finally rest. I'll miss all the times you freeloaded from walking by floating on my back. And I'll miss teaching you new things. I'll miss taking care of you, getting you food. And I'll miss having you, Bliss. You were my life, my whole life. And I am glad that it remained that way until the very end. However, part of life is being able to detach from the things we love the most. Part of life is having those things become memories. And that's what I'll become to you now. A memory. Please enjoy the rest of your life, knowing that I wouldn't have it any other way. Please don't be reckless with your live stream. If you ever need me, I will always be in your memories. Protect those you can. Protect those who can't protect themselves. And protect the world. It really was a beautiful sight before I left, recalling everything we've been through. Thank you for letting me be a part of your life. Goodbye, Bliss. Keep me in your thoughts. Ever since you were a baby, you've been the biggest part of my heart. Always have and always will be. Reach into your pocket when things get hard. I'll always be there. Chapter 27 The Sum of All Darkness Nobody knew whether they'd be able to do it or not. In the end, we believe that Awatuari Elementia herself had a hand in it, choosing one as true of heart as Bliss, as someone as selfless as Ramdelier, to be the last watcher. Faith had been dictated in favor of life. When Bliss awoke to Ram's message in a cave surrounded by Grand News, she wished she had never awoken. Not to a world without Ram. He had been everything for her. A friend, a brother, a father. The only one she thought of as family. And now, he was gone. Taken from her. If anyone deserved to live, it was him, thought Bliss. As she rose from the cave's ground, this world was a cruel place. What had she ever done to deserve a life like this? Hunted from birth to the world's end, denied a normal life, and now ripped from the only thing who made things bearable for her, the good part of her life. Lady Bliss, said a nearby Granu. Bliss didn't bother to look where the voice was coming from. How long has it been? asked Bliss, her voice low. It's been a few days, Lady Bliss, answered the same Granu. Three, to be exact. Everyone leave her alone, said a voice from the back. Step back, give her some space. 
The last thing she needs is one of us talking to her. What she's going through is something that I wouldn't wish on anyone. Bliss didn't know how to answer, how to react. All she could feel was her body filling up with loss and regret. There was still so much she wanted to say to Ram. So much life to live next to him. Somehow, Bliss had thought they would end up safe, regardless of her ability to push back the object. Rim had always found a way to make it through, even in the hardest of situations. Reach into your pocket when things get hard. I'll always be there, Ram's voice had said in her head. Bliss frantically reached into her pocket, where she kept the coin Ram had given her. She pulled out the coin, but nothing happened. Ram didn't appear, not even through life stream. He didn't appear at all. She looked at the coin and flipped it over on her palm using her thumb. The gifts that symbolized who he was were still there. Three slanted lines, with a line that curved at the bottom, crossing each one of the lines. She remembered the moment he had taken the coin from her to mark it. She remembered it like it was yesterday, the warmth radiating from the kitchen, along with all the delicious smells in the hole in the wall. Things are hard, murmured Bliss as she fell back onto her knees. Things are really hard. I need you, Ram. I can't do this without you. That's when she felt it. A sharp, smug darkness coming from the north, facing the back of the cave. She stood up, teeth gritted, and turned to face the overwhelming feeling. The object that had fallen from the sky and was ultimately responsible for taking Ram's life was no longer just an object. It was an entire force of its own, much like flow, but instead of peaceful, calm, and giving, it was chaotic, dark, and taking things by force. It was the flood. It was overwhelming the world. Bliss felt the flood, clashing with the natural flow of the world. It was ripping the life stream apart. Forgive me, but I must go, said Bliss, pulling the coin back into her pocket. Then we will go with you said Halheg, stepping up to her from the back of the cave. We were told to take care of you. We promised Ramdelia we would do just that. Bliss felt pressure in her chest at the mention of his name. There was a void there now, surrounded by his every memory, threatening to collapse her chest at any time. Sorry, said Bliss, but where I'm going, there might be no coming back. All the more reason for us to go with you, said Halheg. We have to keep our word. There is no protecting me from what I think I'll find there, said Bliss, meeting Halheg's eyes. Those dark, aged eyes. There was weight behind those eyes. You'll have to break your word for now. But my lady, said Halheg, reaching out to Bliss. She ignored him and focused on the area where all the darkness was coming from. It wasn't difficult. It was almost easy for her as if the being wanted to be found. An invitation. She closed her eyes and used her life stream to transport herself there, something that otherwise would be almost impossible to do, especially as she'd never practiced using her life stream for travel before. She knew intuitively what she must do. Moments later, she appeared in what once was the village of stone. Now, there was nothing apart from a dark being in the middle of the leveled grounds. The flattened, dark area looked strange to Bliss. It smelled different, like it didn't belong. Rotten, burning, brewing with sharp odors. The being responsible for her life of being hunted was kneeling in the middle of it all. Anger flowed through Bliss, for here was the very being responsible for Ram's death. She marched forward, calling on her life stream to ready itself. She was determined to erase whatever this being was from existence, no matter the cost. As she feared, the rather large being began to take shape in the form of a human. He was rather slim, but had muscles in the same places a farming human would have, well-defined, almost perfect. He wore torn cloaks wrapped around the lower half of his body and his head. His chest was mostly bare. His dark skin was covered with spout-like white markings. But Bliss wasn't sure from a distance, or at least she didn't recognize any of them. Three horns protruded from its head, facing forward. 
that Being was chained to the gate behind him by hundreds of chains. The gate, three times the Being's size, had markings all around it, but especially near its keyhole and around the two handle rings. The whole thing reminded Bliss of a Passock, though a much more sinister one. The Being and the gate behind it emanated a thin but visible black smoke. Or was it fire? Bliss couldn't be sure from that distance. Ah, oh, the herald of Awa Tuari Elementia is here, said the being without looking up. Its voice was deep and otherworldly, like many voices talking at once. I find myself admiring that old power yet again. It has managed to put up a fight, despite being long dead. Awa Tuari Elementia? The name resounded within Bliss in a profound way. That name gave her strength, gave her courage, and gave her power. Come closer, said the being. I want to take a good look at you before I kill you. Bliss readied her life stream as she neared, conjuring spouts on the tips of her fingers. What's that? Do you think you can actually defeat me? said the being, as it raised its head for the first time, eyes still closed. You're but a fraction, a small fraction of everything a Watchwari was. She, in her entire vastness, could not defeat me during her prime. What makes you think you have a chance? Put those away before you get hurt. I can sense you're still days away from mastering your power. Perhaps then you might have stood a chance. Not now. Not even in my weakened state. What are you? asked Bliss as she kept walking forward, her spouts growing in size. And what are you doing here? You don't belong. Foolish child, you have no control over me or anything that these gates will bring into this world. I am the grantor of wishes, the filler of voids, the other half of the life stream you now have, the flood of all that lives. You are but a small speck of the light that once was, and without all the light, the world will be covered in shadows. I've come to claim what's rightfully mine, for I am Ziva Morris, conqueror of conquerors, absolute power. I am your god. Bliss felt repulsion at the mention of its name. It wasn't right. It shouldn't exist. Not here. Not here. Not in this world. Leave and never come back. The being opened its eyes, and within half a second, frozen particles of air were hurtling towards Bliss at immense speed, barely giving her time to move out of the way. As she moved, more frozen dagger-like particles of air hurtled her way. Bliss escaped the daggers by mere hair lengths. She had to rethink her approach. I have to be more careful. He's much more powerful than I thought. A direct attack won't work on him. What about stacking spouts? No, that won't work either. It would take too long. If only Ram was here, he'd distract him. He'd be fast enough. Stones in the river. What am I thinking? Pain swelled up in her chest as she thought about Ram once again. I have to be strong. He taught me how to be strong. Weak, said the being, with a smug, almost human expression. Pathetic, as I thought. Now imagine if I were to use my full power on you. Twelve circular symbols appeared around the gate behind the being. I can already call this world mine. Leave. This is your final warning. You're giving me a warning? Beams of concentrated light fired at Bliss from each one of the symbols. As she moved, a different symbol fired, adjusting its aim. You can't even stand, much less warn me. You couldn't hope to oppose me. Bliss did her best to move out of the beam's way, but most of them were dead on. The beam struck and pulverized whatever wall she erected in between. No matter how thick, how dense, or of what materials, everything she put between her and the gate's beams was atomized. You can't keep this up for long, said the being as he intensified the output of his death stream. I can sense the amount of flow you have in you. I can tell you will break soon. You're strong for you, but you're also weak. She took a deep breath and erected five thick, dense walls, hardened with spouts. They too broke. All it took was two extra beams. 
So they weren't all powerful. They too had a limit. But could Bliss block all twelve beams? That would mean sixty oversized walls just to gain a few seconds. Bliss found herself moving away from the being instead of towards it. That's not what Ram would have done. Again, the pain struck her chest. But how could she not think about him? No, she needed to think about him. Be reminded of what was taken away from her. She had to turn the battle around. But how? The being was much more powerful than her. And it was right. At this rate, her life stream would run out in no time. What was she doing wrong? She had to at least had a chance against it. Or else, what had Rim fought for? Then, she saw it. In between beams. A possible weakness. Every time a beam fired, it took a few seconds to recharge, leaving an opening to the being controlling the gate. Five more beams before the first symbol towards the floor fired again. She steadied her breathing and counted in her mind. Five, four, three, two, one. There it is. Supreme Anchor, chanted Bliss with one sweeping motion towards the being. Thousands of chain-like spouts reached up the being and wrapped themselves around him. The beams of compressed light stopped. Subject, said Bliss, and she gestured with both hands towards the floor. The being fell to his hands and knees. Bliss felt the faintest smile on her face as she forced the so-called flood to the floor. Slow, sinister laughter emanated from the being as it slowly got up, breaking Bliss's spout chains. Supreme anchor! chanted Bliss, desperation in her voice. Thousands more spout-like anchors surrounded the being, but even so, it still got up. Foolish child, said the being, as one by one the anchors ripped and disappeared. I've been dealing with chains since my inception. I hope not too many have given their lives to protect someone as weak as you, as their only hope to keep this world. If they did, they must have been slow of thought. You should have heard him cry in pain as my arrival ended his life. How dare you, said Bliss, her rage rising. How dare you mock those who have risked everything for me? How dare you mock him? A very human smirk was visible on the being's face. The symbols around the gate began to appear again, though this time, four more symbols appeared for each one of the twelve and grew exponentially behind the gate. I have to give it my all, even if it costs me my life, thought Bliss as she walked forward. I won't let him live on. I won't let something this powerful loose on the world. Ram told me not to use all of my life stream at once. I promised him I wouldn't, but the situation calls for much more than calculated measures. I'm sorry, Ram, but I have to end this being, here and now. After all, this is my duty. As the herald of a Watuari Elementia, thinking about the name of the being that had created flow in the world gave Bliss a newfound strength. What's this? said the being with a wide smile. You actually think you can beat me? I don't think. I know, said Bliss as she stepped forward. The being fired beams of light, but Bliss paid no attention. With her life stream running at full power, her spouts blocked them completely. And they weren't just any ordinary spouts. They were large, and there were plenty of them, forming a defense perimeter around her. She put her hands together and began to imagine an eternal prison for the being. The beams grew in power as the spout-like symbols behind the gates activated and began to break into the barrier. As soon as the beams made it through the first barrier spout, another took its place, but Bliss's barrier had broken far too quickly. I need more time, thought Bliss as she closed her eyes and concentrated. This needs to be right. The concentrated beams got closer to Bliss, and more of her spouts broke. She wondered if she would be able to take a direct hit from one of those beams. She only needed a little more time. Her combination of spouts would soon be complete. With most of her life stream gone, used all at once in one last effort to contain the being, making any more spouts would be impossible. She braced for impact as her last spout broke. She felt a strong pull on her cloak, followed by a sharp zipping noise. But after that, nothing happened. Had the being stopped firing? No, that couldn't be. 
The floor was still shaking, and the zooming sound the beams made when firing was still there. If anything, it had increased. What is this? asked the being. How is this possible? Bliss had the faintest inkling of what could be happening, but it was so far-fetched that she would need to see it to believe it. So, she opened her eyes. Ram's coin floated in the air between her and the being. The coin turned slowly, and from it, a complex but rather beautiful blue glowing spout protected Bliss from the attacks the being was unleashing. The amount of life stream emanating from the coin rivaled the being's own flow. Reach into your pocket when things get hard. I'll always be there. Ram's voice played in Bliss's head once again, as she saw the coin block the attacks. She smiled, and her heart warmed for the first time since she had awoken. Tears of love fell down her cheeks. Ram, you never cease to amaze me. How long have you been hoarding your life stream in order to do something like this? How many more reservoirs did you create inside of you in order to make this happen? Is this the reason you had such a hard time defeating Gavril? If you were a waterfall, you'd fall up instead of down and make it up the mountain if you so desired. That's how strong you were. Wildly enraged, the being let go of the chains and rose to his feet. He moved his right hand to the side, and a black sphere materialized. The dark sphere was a lot longer than the being himself. You thought of everything, didn't you, Ram? thought Bliss, forming a triangle with her hands. I will do it myself, said the being, preparing to throw the spear. Dark lightning-like spouts appeared all over the sphere and accumulated at its tip. You will not survive this. I will break you, and everything you are, everything you hope to be. You have lost. Consider it your end. He threw the spear at Bliss. With untamed power, the lightning-like spouts erupted in the blink of an eye, creating a storm. You're dead. This world is mine. The spear broke as it struck the coin's barrier. The lightning tried to reach Bliss, but the coin's barrier held true. Impossible! raged the being as he held out his hand once again to form yet another spear. Bliss knew that the coin wouldn't be able to take another direct hit like the one before. The coin was now spinning rapidly, glowing red. The cool blue spout had turned a deep violet. Thank you, Ram, said Bliss, her voice low. She extended her arms towards the being and separated her index fingers, leaving only her thumb still connected. Thank you for everything that you did for me. I'll never forget, and I'll never forget you. Erase! chanted the being as he got ready to throw another spear. This won't be your prison, said Bliss as she released her spout. This will be your tomb. Entombment! The ground around the being caved in, throwing him off balance, and he sank into a cavern, several tree links below the earth. Large pillars covered in spout markings carved themselves into the walls. You will forever remain, said Bliss, following the being's movements with her hands. Unreachable, forgotten, expelled from this world. For you are lost. You never happened. The pillars around the being reinforced themselves, and the ground began to swallow it all. Foolish girl, said the being, pointing at Bliss. You cannot change what has already been done to this world. You were too late. Four days too late. I will see you again, and when I do, your power won't be enough. Not by far. This world, and the power flowing through it, will be mine. Seal! Screamed Bliss at the top of her lungs, using up the entirety of her life stream. A sphere-like spout left her, and extended itself to wrap around the tomb clinging to the spout-covered pillars. Moments later, the ground sealed itself, covering itself up as if nothing had ever been there. You aren't my god. She took a step back and knelt on the floor, or whatever that is. With the last bit of her strength, she wrote on the ground, warning any travelers to leave the area, for beneath the earth lay darkness itself. She then felt a rush of pain running through her body before everything faded away. Epilogue 
Ipaphus knew that the dreadful moment when he'd have to say goodbye to his only friend would come. What he didn't know was how much it would actually hurt. He found himself feeling things that he thought he'd never feel. He sat on the stairs that led to Gavril's throne in Nohart. That throne had held the most powerful man alive, and all that power was still not enough to change the outcome. Ipaphus never really cared for the right or wrong of the situation, for it wasn't his own. Urachi were like that, always lonely and lost in the Seven Worlds. Gavril had changed that for him. He'd been his only friend, faithful and kind to the very end. The Nulians, who had frequented and lounged around no heart, had left, leaving behind a cold, empty structure. I miss you, old friend. May you finally find peace in the next life. Ipaphus's connection to the flow allowed him to know the exact moment Gavril had died. It brought a smile to his face, knowing that Gavril hadn't died alone and instead had taken that wretched ethereal being with him. A little victory after all. It was that same connection to the flow that alerted him to the evils that were yet to happen. Though the girl had been successful in burying that incredible source of power that had come to the Seven Worlds, he feared she had been too late. Some of its power had already leaked out into the worlds, flooding them with a new form of life stream. The real question was how much of its power had made it out into the worlds. Was it enough to topple the existing flow? He doubted it. But was it enough to send the world into darkness? Possibly. Likely, even. There was more to the current situation that he couldn't put his finger on. He had no access to the flood. He'd need to investigate further to find some real answers. But would he? Should he? What was the point in finding out things if the only person that needed to know it, as far as he cared, was already dead? He had no real hatred towards the girl, and as far as he was concerned, they were even, as she too had lost her only friend. But what of the rest of the worlds? Did he not care for them either? Would he let them face whatever was coming alone? There was no reason why he should interfere in the problems of the world. But whispered Ipaphus. That would mean allowing the worlds to fall into darkness, something Gavril fought so hard against. That was always his secondary motivation to do what he did, to preserve life. He sighed as he looked up at the black ceiling, his heart beginning to race. To preserve it, he thought. Even just letting whatever is left of the rot roam aimlessly would tear whole villages apart. Humans and Nulians alike. What a dry and unwanted situation to be in. But at the same time, I can't just sit by and let everything go to waste. Ipaphus sighed and got ready to puff himself away. He decided to make use of everything he'd learned next to Gavril. How to be strong, how to lead, and how to conquer. He wasn't going to let this world fall into shambles. There is a lot of work to be done. Somewhere out there, the girl is still alive, and I must find her. This world will hang by a thread, with her being the only thing stopping us from plunging into total darkness. So, how was it? Did you like it? Did you enjoy? I hope you did. I'm gonna be trying to upload more videos and other book related stuff to this channel so make sure you subscribe so you don't miss anything and until the next one